Do you remember what courses you took from him in 1957? I don't remember the date. I remember courses on Plato's Republic. I remember courses on the Gorgias. I remember a number of courses on Aristotle's politics, courses on Montesquieu, on Hobbes, on Locke, and some rather interesting courses on Locke's, I'm forgetting the book, uh, you remember the name of the book, on something on like natural law. I mean, usually people know Locke's second treatise, and they know Locke's essay on human understanding, but there's also this one on either the laws of nature or something like that, and a course that Strauss gave on that. But I'm sure I've left out all sorts of things. He may have been given the course on Leibniz. I'm not sure about that. Well, of course, Machiavelli, quite a few courses on Machiavelli. There was a certain period while he was writing his Machiavelli book where he would one quarter give a course on the discourses, the next quarter on the prince, the quarter after that on the discourses again and the prince, and he simply followed with one after the other for at least a year and a half, maybe two years, till that book on Machiavelli was written, Thoughts on Machiavelli. You really had quite a lot of experience with Professor Strauss uh, in the classroom and, and then also at, at St. John's. What was your first impression of Leo Strauss? Well, my first impression was I had seen that this man, Leo Strauss, was scheduled to give a lecture on natural right. By that time, I had read enough Plato and Aristotle to be really excited by the idea of natural right. And I should also say Max Weber, because this lecture began with a discussion of Max Weber. When I was a student, Max Weber was regarded as the greatest man of social science, and everybody had to read different things of Max Weber, which I did. I found them interesting, but I did not find them convincing. And Strauss, in the first three or four sentences of this lecture, summed up all the criticism I had ever had about Max Weber, and I was right from the outset greatly impressed by that. By the way, it was a somewhat uphill battle to argue in classes against Max Weber, but I had been doing that. Then, of course, Strauss expanded it to Plato and Aristotle and Hobbes and Locke and so on, and I just found the whole thing absolutely fascinating, and it was perfectly clear to me after that that I had to study with this man. I was in the Committee on International Relations, and although they had accepted, for part of the PhD requirements, there were a number of sections, they had accepted a section on political theory for me to be part of my doctoral preparation. I received a little bit of opposition when I told them that I wanted to study natural right with Leo Strauss, and one rather good and intelligent teacher began to give me an argument about why is natural right at all relevant to international relations? So I was forced to drum up an argument about why natural right was important for international relations as a standard for right and wrong in all political thinking. So you changed fields, in effect, in midstream. Well, I never officially changed fields. I got my Ph.D., with the Committee on International Relations, I thought it would be too much of a bother to really officially change fields. So I don't even know if my courses with Strauss are on my record. I suspect they are because I did have a field in political theory. Mm -hmm. So some of them. But for many years afterwards, and certainly all my years at St. John's were long past the Ph.D., I kept studying Strauss's works and kept talking to him whenever I had the chance. And we would see each other regularly, and I guess we sort of began to get used to one another. We became friendly. Apart from this one professor of international relations who was skeptical about the relevance of natural right to your work, what other reactions did you get from faculty around the university to your working with Professor Strauss? Well, it turned out 
when I made some kind of a proposal to the Committee on International Relations to include a political theory section, and the one man who gave me the hard time was also the man I could really talk to most, because in a way he gave everybody a hard time, and if you gave him a hard time back, he came to respect you. <laughs> so when I made my proposal, he was the only one who voted for it. As a matter of fact, I can tell you how I learned that. I went to his office about a week after I had submitted this proposal. And I knew the faculty meeting had just happened earlier that day. And I said, Do people take up my proposal? He said, yeah. And I said, well, how did I do? He said, they turned you down. I said, did anybody vote for me? Yeah. Who? Me. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of man he was. Nice man. Although he would frighten away a lot of students. What was Strauss like as a teacher? Strauss, first of all, you could just tell from Strauss's classes that Strauss loved learning. He got very excited about any new idea. He was beautifully articulate. And he would discuss the most difficult issues, but always in a beautifully simple language. And I know more than once in my first year as a student with him, I would go up to him with formulations, and I wanted to be scientific. And they would be somewhat stilted in scientific jargon, and I would tell him my ideas, and then he would reformulate it in his own simple language. And I would always wonder, at first I'd wonder, why are his formulations so much more powerful and clear than mine? And it took me, well, maybe some months of thinking about that before I realized that his language was altogether jargon-free. It was the simple language of direct experience, and then, if it was theoretical, it was properly theoretical. But even then, the theoretical language would always kind of refer you back to the fundamental experiences from which the ideas were derived. And I certainly hope that I changed the way I express myself after that. <laughs> I certainly tried, and I think to a certain extent I succeeded, but <laughs> I don't know how much. Beyond affirming your early criticism of Weber and extending that, what, in terms of your understanding, do you think changed from working with Strauss? I had always favored a, a more or less common-sense approach to these things, and that didn't change. But the thing that changed was a recognition that the great thinkers were much deeper and more complicated than I had ever realized they were, or that anyone had ever told me they were. I mean, I had taken courses on Aristotle with Richard McKeon, and he always put things in a kind of technical language of his own, and while I think if you asked him, he'd say everything was experientially based, he did not recur to ordinary experience in the way that Strauss did, and he did not formulate things in ordinary terms the way that Strauss did. They were more technical. So I simply learned that I had to study much harder than I thought I had to, that I wasn't nearly as smart as I hoped I was, and that the great thinkers were much smarter than I realized they were, and that I had to work much, much harder in order to get to them. So it meant that I had to take more time, and I had to read them much more carefully. That, I think, is one of the things that everyone gets first from Strauss classes, that you have to read much more carefully than you thought you had to at the beginning. So the biggest personal change was this recognition that you had bitten off more than you could chew and that you had to work a hell of a lot harder in order 
to even approach adequacy in dealing with these things. And while this doesn't sound altogether pleasant, that would be a mistake because the classes at the same time were very pleasant. He obviously enjoyed the classes. He joked. He was very good at making sort of high plane jokes. He sometimes missed low plane jokes. I know one or two people who used to tell him low plane jokes and he sometimes missed them. And he began every class by having a student read a paper on say a chapter or two of the book we were studying. Yeah, one of the things I left out when I said I was thinking of Rousseau, he asked me once he was going to do Rousseau's discourse what is the political discourse? Discourse on inequality. Yeah, the discourse on equality. And he asked me whether I would give a report on Rousseau's discourse on the sciences and the arts for the first meeting just as a kind of introduction to the class. Mm -hmm. And it was just before a vacation, so I spent the whole vacation working on that. And it was by that time I had caught on to how hard I had to work. And I worked very hard on it, and I was gratified by his saying something nice about my report. There was another time when I remember giving a report in his class on Machiavelli where I thought I may have discovered something that I never heard Strauss talk about, some intricate thing in Machiavelli, that, a rather nasty thing that Machiavelli had worked out. And I worked it into my paper without emphasizing it, just about two sentences of it, just so that Strauss would catch on to what it was. And I remember his comment was, Mr. Burns, that was a good paper, but not a very good paper. However, it's the first paper I've heard from which I've learned something entirely new. <laughs> so I was duly chastened at the same time gratified. He was very subtle about, you know, even in these personal comments about being fair and helpful to the students, but also he could be critical. If someone were to ask me, I would say that Lawrence Burns learned something about speaking directly in the language of experience, about some modesty about himself, and in relation to the great thinkers, and, and what a great thinker really is. Yeah, I think that would be a fair comment. And by the way, I think most of the students in his classes, there were a lot of bright people in those classes, and I think all of us went through rather similar experiences. Alan Bloom and I talked about this many times. Hillel Gilden, we were in a lot of classes together, and that was true for all of us, people who had not been thought to be dull or weak-minded people. Most of us had a pretty good opinion of our own intelligence, but we all soon had to revise that when we started to compare ourselves to Strauss and to the great thinkers that he was explicating. It was never just coming to admire Strauss, it was coming to admire and appreciate the great thinkers that we were studying, just seeing that our ordinarily intelligent efforts were not sufficient. What impact do you think Strauss has had through his teaching and his publications? Well, I gather, I think he's had an impact. I think it's never the sort of thing that becomes a mass impact. It can't be that. But I think now that he's gone personally, that his books are still having a growing impact on reading people and there simply have been more books written about Strauss than ever were before, so that people all over the world, it seems, at least from Europe... Well, I'll give you another example. Recently, a young Chinese man from Singapore came to St. John's, and he looked me up, and he told me that he had been very much caught up by... Leo Strauss's work from his teacher in Singapore. And he had asked around the college, well, who is it that knows something about Leo Strauss? And he was referred to me by a number of people. And so he came to me, and we now have formed a small study group. And I gave them as basic training a few chapters from Natural Right and History. And then we've been reading very slowly and carefully progress in return. And I think the first lesson 
that you get from reading Strauss, reading him carefully, is to learn to read carefully. What he writes is packed, and he had a very powerful gift for condensing his thought. And for there were times, for instance, when he would have a class, say a class on Hobbes. I see Hobbes' picture there. I'm thinking of Hobbes as I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. A class on Hobbes, and it would be a very good class. I would try and take as many notes as I could, but sometimes he spoke too quickly to adequately take notes. In the old days, this is before his heart attack, after his heart attack he spoke a little more slowly. The quality of the thought didn't change, but the speed of the delivery did. (laughs) And I forget what I was going to say. That's okay. How did I get into that? Well, you were talking about the fellow from Singapore and the reading. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he came, and then we formed a little study group, and we spend two hours reading together. Someone reads the passage aloud, just as we used to do with the books of Hobbes and Locke and Plato and Aristotle. And since I know Strauss better than anybody else in that class, and since I've got about 60 years more experience than anyone else in that class thinking about these things, I am the leader of the class. And what we sometimes, in a two-hour period, we might do a page and a half, we might do two pages, it might be three pages, but wherever there's anything that's not clear, either I raise a question, or, and frequently the students themselves raise the questions. I always like to let the students raise the questions first, but if they don't, then I do. And one can read him profitably that way, because there's a tremendous condensation of thought in all of the things that he writes. Oh, I know what I was about to tell you before. Yeah. So that sometimes he would take one class, and then I'd go see him in the afternoon in his office. And I'd ask him questions about the class. And we'd have another discussion maybe for an hour, an hour and a half. Or if I'd go late, I'd walk him home. And we would continue the discussion on the way home. He had a way whenever a really interesting thought came to him, he would stop walking. And we would sort of just be standing still in the street or on a corner or something, and he'd finish. And then we'd get to his house, and then standing in the vestibule to the house, we'd probably talk for another 20 minutes. Then we'd say goodnight. But he never got tired. And in his classes, I never got tired either. I just found them so terribly interesting and exciting. These long conversations in his office and the walk home, Was this at Chicago or at St. John's? Both. I remember uh, actually more at Chicago because he lived within walking distance of the college. He lived a block just before Ellis that way. I forget the name of the street. I've been away from Chicago for a long Mm -hmm. time, so I used to know all these streets very well. There's another story that I think you might find of some interest. I think it's a funny story. Once he was living on Woodlawn Avenue and he was moving... He had regular movers, but he wouldn't let the movers touch his books. He said he didn't trust them touching his books. He wanted his students to move his books. So he asked me to organize a bunch of students to move all his books. And that meant we got a few cars, and I think someone had a van. And after we moved the books, he invited all of us to a little bar around the corner, I think it was on uh, 61st Street, and that bar had a special room, a rather large room that was almost never used where people could order food and things like that. And so we all went into that room and had hamburgers and things of that sort and shakes, and if anyone wanted a beer, they could certainly have a beer. And then On the way out, since I had arranged that for him, because that Mm -hmm. happened to be a bar that I would occasionally go to, and I knew the owner and I knew the chief bartender. And as we were going out, Strauss, as was usual in those days, I said that was before the heart attack, was having a very rapid conversation with about four different people. And the conversation kept up as we were going out for him to pay his bill. 
And we came to the place where you pay the bill, and Strauss kept talking in the conversation. He reached in his pocket. He never folded his money. He simply had masses of mixed-up bills, and he just pulled out a large number of green bills, and kept talking, not look, and glanced quickly through them on this counter, and the owner of the bar looked at me. Strauss never even heard it because he was talking. Then. He said, Jesus, he treats that stuff like it's lettuce. And he was absolutely, if he were absorbed in a conversation, he simply treated, he really treated it like it was lettuce. Mm -hmm. And simply through this mound of bills, mound of green bills, and the guy slowly sorted them out. There were some tens and some fives and there might have been a couple of twenties in there <laughs> and a lot of singles and five dollar bills and he he sort of took them out and then he said thank you and then Strauss turned and saw there were still some bills left and just put his hand on top of them, munched them all together and shoved them into his pocket again and said thank you very much. <laughs> and he was always polite, but he really paid very little attention to practical affairs. I can say this, he was the most, in ordinary things, he was the most impractical man I've ever met. Which is not that he was stupid about it, he simply did not. Well, I'll give you another story that may maybe illustrates this. Once he asked me to walk with him to a dentist that lived somewhat far from where he lived. And it was a very pleasant walk, and he had scheduled it, so we started out a good 40 minutes before we had to get there. And again, many times when he'd get interested in a point, he'd simply stop, and he would explicate the point, and wouldn't move until he was finished, and then we would walk some more. We would still keep walking, but so long as the difficult point was over. And so we finally got to the dentist's office, I sat out in the waiting room, and Strauss was the only one in there with the dentist. And I heard the following conversation. The dentist would go, Oh, oh, Mr. Strauss, I told you that you should... I'm so stupid, Mr. Strauss. I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Silence. And then... Oh, I also told you about that. I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Well, the third time, the big O again, and the I'm so stupid again, and the dentist finally said, No, Mr. Strauss, you're not stupid. You just don't care. <laughs> and I think that was it. About everything that did not pertain to his studies and his thinking, I shouldn't say that he was careless about personal matters. He was not careless about it. He really treated everybody with respect and was quite friendly with all kinds of students and not just the good students. He would sometimes take time with students who weren't so good, take the time to really try and clarify things for them. He was a rather nice man to be around. There, there are all sorts of people who were so intimidated by his intelligence that they kind of made him into a very formidable character. But I don't think he was very formidable with most of the people that he knew. And actually, not just with students, but with secretaries, too, for instance. While I was his uh, graduate student, Doreen Hurley was the secretary of the political science department, mm -hmm. and she was very good. He always treated her with the highest respect, and as far as I could tell, they got along beautifully. She was very efficient. She also had l some organizing ability. I'm surprised to hear how much time Strauss had to spend with students in his office or taking walks. One's accustomed these days to university professors being too pressed for time to really spend so much time with students. I don't think he felt he was wasting his time when he was conversing because he was always working over things that he enjoyed working over. And frequently, no, I, I know what I wanted to say, and maybe this is the clue to the answer to your question. You would take a class with him, 
Then I'd go to his office in the afternoon and talk about what we had just done in class. And we'd continue talking. Then I'd walk him home. And then we'd talk about 20 minutes before his door in the home, mostly him talking, and most of me occasionally asking questions and maybe saying something, but rarely. And then the following day, he would always give a, quote, summary, unquote, of what he had said the previous class. It was never exactly the same. It was always deepened and expanded. It was never exactly the same. Mm -hmm. He had always learned more during the conversation. He had learned more in his study at home at night. And it always had a slightly different sense and a deeper sense than he had left it in class. He really had a way of going deeper and deeper and deeper. The extent of his reading and knowledge was very great, but it was clear that his chief aim was not extending the length and breadth of what he had read, but in deepening mm -hmm. what he had read, mm -hmm. and really concentrating on those authors that were most important and deepening his understanding and the understanding of his students about those authors. Strauss moved to St. John's, I think, in 1970. This would have been more than a dozen years from when you first met him. Seeing him as a professor at St. John's, a well, tutor. Well, see, he was never on the faculty of St. John's. He was appointed the Scott Buchanan Distinguished Something or Other of Something. I forget what. But he was never incorporated into the teaching faculty of St. John's. And every Wednesday afternoon, I think probably from 3 or 3.30 on, he would give a two-hour course. And as far as I was concerned, there was no difference in the quality of those courses than there were at the courses in Chicago. The only difference was this. When he was at Chicago in a regular political science department, he frequently thought that it was incumbent upon him to give a kind of explanation of why we are reading old books, why are we, why we are going to those old books, and why, and when that became spelled out, it turned out to be why the modern books were not adequate. And so frequently you got very deep and interesting critiques of modern philosophy, especially modern political and ethical philosophy, from those apologies, you know, why we're reading those books. Well, when he came to St. John's, he said, well, since I'm at St. John's, which is known as the Great Books College, I don't have to give an apology, say, for reading Xenophon or Plato. And in a way, I was a little disappointed because I used to find those apologies for why we're reading these old books fascinating because they usually involved very deep and interesting critiques of, of modern philosophy and modern political philosophy. But that was a minor disappointment, because the classes were pretty much the same thing. Seeing him with your position in life changed, you were no longer a graduate student, you're now on your own in the world, and I assume had not seen him for several years when he moved to St. John's. Did you have a different impression of him than when you had known him in Chicago? No. <laughs> he was still the same, in a funny way, impractical man. By the way, he knew that he was impractical. And once he did something that, as a hypercritical youngster, I thought really gave the wrong idea to those of his students who found out about it. And I said something to him, you know, not very directly, but you didn't have to be direct with him. He would pick up any kind of intimation. And he said, no, Mr. Burns. He said, after all, I am a very funny man. Did Strauss reflect on himself with you in other ways? Well, most of our conversations were about other people. Well, I'll tell you one. I'll put it in the form of a story, because I remember those best. Once he was giving a course on Rousseau, and I remember the student, it was a student I knew, he said to him, he was a foreign student, Mr. Strauss, what would you say if someone were to say that Rousseau, in some statement about Rousseau, three or four sentences, and Strauss said, 
I would say he was an idiot. The one who said that was an idiot. And this man, who is a foreigner, as they say, answered, those very words were said by your colleague, Professor, and I'm going to say X at this point, <laughs> Professor X two hours ago in this very building. Actually, it was probably this building. No, this is not the old social science no, building. The social science building is next door. Yeah. Well, no, but that's the new social science building. I forget where it was. It could have been there. Well, I don't know where it was. As I said, I said, those very things were said by your colleague, Professor so and so in this very building. And Strauss immediately said, you must have misunderstood my colleague. Years later, actually when we were back at St. John's, I once told Strauss that story. He'd forgotten all about it. And when I told him the story, he said, oh, I didn't know I could be so prudent. <laughs> so I thought it was nice. You must have misunderstood my colleague immediately. He has a reputation. He gained a reputation in the 50s for a bluntness of speech about the discipline of political science and the foundation of social sciences that others might have considered imprudent. Did he, what is your view of those controversies now looking back? I don't think they're important at all. He had a very carefully worked out critique of modern social science. When I was a student during those days, the ruling dogma of the social sciences was no value judgments, factual judgments, using the distinction of Max, of Max Weber. And that ruled the roost. And probably before I met Strauss, I was probably less politic in my own critiques of those things. And I always thought that he was fairly reasonable about that. I mean, once in a while, you'd get a kind of flourish like they fiddled while Rome burned, you know, things of that sort. But he was a very careful writer, and he didn't use things like that. They may have expressed deep passion, which I think he honestly felt, mm -hmm. but he was never overcome by passion. His wife would sometimes be vexed by his logicality, and she was a very intelligent woman, too. It's not that she was stupid, but just vexed by this persistent logicality. He was a very clear-headed man. One has the impression that in the 1950s his critiques of social science, as well worked out as they were, caused a rather harsh response from social scientists and political scientists. Yeah, I think that's perfectly understandable because for those who felt that they were following a tradition, if you violate the canons of the tradition, there must be something wrong with you unless they themselves have had the courage to themselves question the foundations of the tradition. And he was certainly questioning the foundations of a lot of traditional studies. I don't think he was ever intemperate in his criticisms. They were sometimes strong, but of course, if you take even the foundations of theoretical positions as holy writ, you're bound to be offended. And I think sometimes you had people who had worked very hard to fit themselves into this pattern. And here was a man who was telling them that they had, in effect, wasted their time. So, so they were bound to be somewhat bothered by it. But I don't think he was really concerned about it. And besides, everyone who knew him personally, including his colleagues, and I'm sure quite a few who never read a word of his books, but they knew him in faculty meetings and in discussions of students, the sort of things that faculty people have to do. And he evidently got along with almost everybody. If I think of all the people who were around at that time, he was, I remember even David Reisman's, whose, whose views are quite different from Strauss's. Reisman had an office not too far from Strauss's. I remember walking down the hall once. Reisman had sort of burst burst out of his office, and he saw Strauss, said, Hello, Leo! And Strauss went, Hello, Dave! And then he turned to me and said, That's Dave. He could more or less be one of the boys, but he didn't take any funny business about the serious matters, the serious theoretical matters. But in all other things, he was kind of relaxed and easygoing, except, as I've said, and I think I can say it a dozen times, 
and very few Americans can appreciate how impractical he was about all of the things that almost any American just takes for granted. Shall mm -hmm. I give you a story to illustrate that? Sure. Do you still have time? Oh, sure. Yeah, please. all right. If you have time, I have time. Okay. Once he invited a bunch of us to the restaurant Le Mix, which I think was on 51st Street, and he asked me to drive him. Well, I didn't have a car at the time, but I borrowed a car from a friend of mine who also was a sometime student of Strauss. And I drove him, and I think Alan Bloom was in the car, and two other people in the back with Alan. Strauss was in the front, and I was driving. And it was a very old car, and it was in the middle of winter, January or February. And we'd all had this nice meal. We had a great time at the meal. We had a, a big table. We were talking, and Strauss doing most of it. And we got into the car, and the car wouldn't start. And I turned it, <laughs> never turned over. <laughs> and Strauss was in the middle of this conversation. After about two or three minutes, he suddenly noticed that the car was moving, and I was doing that same thing over and over again. And I just sort of made a motion to him, I'm sorry, but it'll be all right eventually. I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> and... So finally, he sort of turned and said, Gentlemen, this is serious. I think we should be silent. And so silence prevailed. And all you heard was the turning of the motor, but never really cutting in. And then finally, and Strauss began to hunch forward tensely. Well, we were all a little tense by that time, because he had helped make us even more tense. And so finally, brum, 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 brum and the motor turned over. Well, all of us, with one exception, relaxed mm. and stopped being tense, and Strauss was still sitting there in that same tensed expression. And only when we started to move, he mm -hmm. relaxed. For him, he had no sense of how the automobile worked. You know? <laughs> uh, if it moved, only until it moved, not when it turned over, did he then relax like the rest of us. It was a rather interesting <laughs> event. Are you getting tired? I can go on if you want to go on. Well, let's just talk for a little while. Yeah, sure. Yeah. When Strauss came to teach at the University of Chicago, do you think he had any particular ambitions for his teaching? That's hard to say. I think that being at a prominent university like Chicago, where there are obviously a lot of intelligent people and a lot of intelligent students, that I think he hoped and expected that he would get good students. And I think he may have had long-range hopes for turning around political science a little bit, having an influence on political science, so that it would become more philosophical and less simply bowing to conventional notions of science that very few people ever examined carefully. In other words, a kind of scientistic tradition. I avoid the word scientific because I don't think it deserves it. So I think he thought that perhaps he would have some kind of influence in turning political science around. And if not that, at least having some kind of influence on how political and social things are studied. But I think he was keenly aware that the sort of influence that a good teacher has is always the influence on an individual, to get someone to think more carefully and more deeply and more adequately. And I think that was always his aim. He used to say, he said it a couple of times, before he enters any classroom, he always imagines that there's one student in that class with a mind and soul far superior to his own, and he tries to couch the class to what would be adequate for that student. So he always tried his best, and his best was really very good. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard at least one other student of his suggest that in his early years at Chicago, he really poured himself into his classes in a way that in the last half dozen years perhaps he didn't, that it seemed his attitude, according to this former student, he thought that his attitude towards his classes had changed. Did you see anything like that? 
I did not see anything like that. He did have a heart attack, and after the heart attack, he didn't have the same kind of physical strength that he had before. But in our personal conversations, I don't think it ever changed, except as I was getting older, especially in his later years, I realized he expected me to do a little more talking than I did when I was a young student. And so I would oblige. That was no problem. There was another man who was very much like Strauss, and that was Strauss's very good friend, Jacob Klein. And I noticed that with him, too, in his later years. But, of course, I was getting older, too. Klein lived a little longer than Strauss. In the early years, Klein was the only scholar that, who Strauss really spoke of with full respect and who he regarded as an authority on Plato. That was similar with Klein, too. When I first knew Klein, I would start with a question and he'd start talking. And usually it was very similar to what would happen with Strauss. We would talk for an hour, a couple hours, with him doing most of the talking. But then as I got older and he got older, I could tell that uh, he also expected me to do a little more talking. In his last years at St. John's, did Strauss, to your knowledge, reflect at all on his own impact or any legacy he might have left? Well, I think it's clear that he thought about it, and it was also clear that he always had hopes for at least bringing a change in political philosophy and maybe even contributing to some kind of a change in philosophy itself. But he really did not, at least to me, and we had all sorts of occasions for, for talking, he seemed to be always more concerned with what he was learning at the time, no matter how old he was. So that, for instance, when he was giving courses on Xenophon, we'd talk a little bit more about Xenophon. Giving courses on Nietzsche, we'd talk a little bit more about Nietzsche. Giving courses on Plato or Aristotle, talk more about them. It was clear that he thought the most important thing for real thinkers would be that the most important, not the only important thing, but the most important thing would be for them to understand that there are more depths in the classics, Plato and Aristotle, than most people had ever heard of or had learned about. But at the same time, for instance, if he, he gave some courses on Kant. If he gave a course on Kant, you had to try to think like Kant in those mm -hmm. classes. If you gave a course on Hobbes, you had to try to think like Hobbes. Aristotle played the same thing. You had to try to think the way they did. And so he was always caught up in trying to articulate those things, which is not to say that I think it's clear from his writings as well as from his conversation that he regarded the ancients as paradigms as paramount paradigms for thinking people. But he never pushed it. It was the sort of thing that you just let the evidence speak for itself. He was a very skillful speaker, but he was not. And if the art of rhetoric is somehow the art of communicating most adequately, he was a superb communicator. And he was not averse to noble or intelligent rhetoric, but he never propagandized. That was totally alien to his being. Some people complained about that without realizing that they were complaining about it. Once his wife complained to me about his, his being so rational. <laughs> <laughs> they complained about his not being sufficiently propagandistic? Now, that, of course, if you put it that way, mm -hmm. that sounds absurd. He did not really insist on anything. He tried to make everything that he said evident from its inherent evidence, that it has to make sense and it has to be clear and people have to be able to relate it to their own experience. And I think some people seem to complain because he did not sort of push what he thought to be right and what he thought to be wrong in the most clear terms. I think that's a mistake because in his writings, he sometimes will present the argument of someone that he is really criticizing and 
Very intelligent people read that same paragraph and say, that was Strauss's view on that. But it was really a view that he was criticizing because he presented the arguments and they didn't realize that after two or three pages later, he gave an argument that really showed what was wrong with that argument. But while he was making that argument, he presented it in the argument's best possible terms. And sometimes it was difficult to see what he was presenting as what he thought was correct and what he was criticizing as incorrect. I am familiar with that misreading of Strauss. It's very common. I feel in one sense this afternoon I've been asking the, the wrong kind of question about Strauss, asking how he regarded himself when he seemed not to spend a lot of time regarding himself. No, he didn't. But let me ask one more question like that. Did he ever reflect when he was with you on what in his life led him to become the kind of funny man that he did become, the genesis of Strauss? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I mean, well, there's some... I heard him say, not many times, especially in the earlier years, there are three men in the world, and I think he wrote this in personal letters, probably to Kozhev, himself, Kozhev, and Klein. Sometimes it, it sounded as they were the only real human beings in the world. But it was never put in such a crude way as I've just said it. If it were so, it was by implication. Kozhev he disagreed with, but obviously respected his intelligence very highly and engaged in long arguments with him, which I think for anyone who knows Strauss, you know that that is a tribute. And from early on, as I said, Klein was about the only person that he would sometimes defer to as an authority on Plato. Alan Bloom used to tell the story of Kozhev. Now, Kozhev was a very different man from Strauss. Alan Bloom told the story that while he was in Paris for a year or so, Kozhev was giving some lectures, and a group of his students felt that they really would like to take him out to a really fancy dinner. And they took him to a very fancy restaurant, and nobody said anything about paying. And as they were on the way out, Kozhev observed how much tip they were giving and simply said to the one who was sort of leading the practice, do you think that's enough? But then I want to tell another story about Kozhev. Evidently, he once said, and this involves Strauss and Klein, Mr. Kozhev, how do you compare yourself with Mr. Strauss and Mr. Klein. And I think he said, Ah, Strauss, il est le philosophe, he's the philosopher. And Klein, le sage, he's the sage. And yourself, Mr. Kozhev, yourself? Moi, moi, je suis Dieu, I am God. <laughs> <laughs> Strauss would never say things like that. You've been very generous this afternoon. Well, it's been a pleasure. I always like talking about Strauss. I hope we can do this again. Sure, sure. Fine. This is like Straussian people. This is an honest interest. Since we started our own website in which we have the audio files put up, we have gotten emails of gratitude from Colombia and South America, different countries in Eastern Europe. Really? From scholars in Germany and Italy and Spain. Strauss, quality tells. <laughs> and so... Well, Alan Bloom said that. And it's... I mean, there are certainly... There is a very lively anti-Straussian opinion in the American Academy. It's not healthy for a young graduate student to be identified as a Straussian. That's still true. But it's also true now that you have scholars in Germany, Italy, Spain, France, who take Strauss very seriously. And they're studying him, publishing books about him, holding conferences on him in Poland. And so, and in the United States, there is a kind of backhanded respect being shown to Strauss. When Christopher Nadon did his dissertation on Xenophon Cyrus, one of the things he found was that classicists were using Strauss's ideas, but they would never cite him. Mm -hmm. So they would cite enemies of Strauss, they would cite all kinds of minor classicists, but they would be incorporating Strauss's interpretations into their own interpretation, they would never acknowledge it. So in the U.S., things are changing, but it's not as honest or rapid as one might like. 
Do you happen to know what's happened to Chris Brold? Now I'm talking about Xenophon. He has moved to New Mexico. He and his wife have moved to New Mexico, Santa Fe, where David Bolton is, yeah. and they are working on some type of project together. I'm not he, sure. He and, and David. Yes. Uh huh. You're mentioning Xenophon, reminding me, because he and I read Monsieur Padilla with Bloom when I was a professor and then was a student, of course. We did this on a Saturday afternoon or something like that. Well, okay. Your first book was on the First Amendment? Yeah. Did that grow out of a dissertation? Yeah. Who was your advisor? Well, Bob Horn, <laughs> and Strauss was on the committee. I see. And Herman Pritchett, I presume, was on the committee, too. How did you first get to know Strauss? How did you first hear of him? Well, I came to the University of Chicago without knowing anything about Leo Strauss, probably never having heard his name. I was in a class with Bob Goldwyn, among others. In fact, it was a very good class with people like Herb Storing in it. And Goldwyn asked me whether I... He said something to the effect that I was not in a Strauss class. And I indicated that, yes, I'd probably take him next quarter or something like that. <laughs> Some foolish remark. Anyway, Bob Goldwyn knew him because Bob had the connection with St. John's. And then, of course, I did take a course with Strauss the next quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter and so forth. But that's the beginning. And what year was this? Well, this would have been 19. 50, 51, something like that, the um, beginning. Strauss arrived at Chicago, I believe, in 1949. Yeah. So he was still finding his way around campus. <laughs> I would imagine so, yeah. As I say, I had never heard of him, but Bob had because of the connection with St. John's. What connection with St. John's would have let him know about Strauss? Because Strauss had not taught at St. John's yet. Strauss had all kinds of connections with St. John's, so that people at St. John's would have talked about him when Bob Golden was a student at St. John's. Oh, Jacob Klein and... Yeah, Jacob, 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 yeah. primarily Jacob Klein. Right, yeah. right, right. I understand. Well, that's my beginning, of course. Okay, so in 1950 or 51, you were in a class with Bob Goldwyn, and he said, well, you should be in a class with this guy Strauss. And he yes. said, well, okay, I'll get around to that. I'll get around to that next quarter, and I did. I mentioned that because it's such a stupid statement. <laughs> I'll, I'll take him next quarter. <laughs> well, and in a sense, that was one's attitude toward professors. That is to say, you know, I had had the usual beginning of an undergraduate education, and I suspect, that even in the case of political theory, one expected to get everything from a professor in one semester. Mm -hmm. I'll take him next semester. Right. That, right. that will be it. And the absurdity of that, of course, in the case of Strauss, only came to me after I first got into the seminar with Strauss. So what was the first course on? I think it was a discourse, Rousseau's discourse on inequality. What impression did he, do you remember your first impression of him? I think so, yes. He was unlike any other professor I ever had, and he conveyed, I guess, he conveyed the seriousness of this subject. I'd had previous experience with professors in political theory, teaching this, that, and the other thing. More or less, Plato taught this, Aristotle taught that, the next guy taught something, and they all disagreed with each other. And now we're in this happy condition of living in a liberal democracy, and we have nothing to worry about because our interest in these old people, historical interest only, something to talk about maybe, but we can learn nothing from them. Well, one was quickly dispelled of that notion immediately with Strauss. One realized the seriousness of the subject, the importance of the subject, and, of course, in due course, one came to realize that Strauss was probably the best living defender of liberal democracy, but also at the same time, like Tocqueville, critical and able to see the difficulties and the weaknesses. I think I first became aware of that when Strauss lectured and gave his natural right and history lectures at Chicago, when he wrote, well, mentioned the attacks on natural right from certain Germans, as I recall. And one came into contact for the first time with some serious people in Europe 
who had some very serious things to say about natural rights, and specifically the natural rights of the Declaration of Independence. And one became aware of the fact that the basis of the United States is to be found in the Declaration, and one has to pay serious attention to what the Declaration said, and perhaps be aware of the difficulties of that statement of natural rights. And this guy, in passing, likened Strauss to Tocqueville, and I assume you knew what I meant. And here's Tocqueville writing about democracy in America, and he's really a great friend of democracy in America, but also out of friendship, and that, of course, is what was true in Strauss's case, too, out of friendship, mm -hmm. talks about the weaknesses. And uh, one became aware of that thanks to Strauss. So this impression of Strauss as a great friend of liberal democracy, this was something you formed early on, you think? Oh, sure. And uh, well, it was confirmed the next year, 1952, when he asked me to accompany him to the local precinct because he wanted to register to vote in the presidential election in 1952. And he wanted to vote for Adlai Stevenson, of course, like everybody else at the University of Chicago. Adlai Stevenson was our man. My father was a big fan of Adlai Stevenson, for whatever that is worth. <laughs> yeah. Well, how many of us would be happy? Well, I suppose some of us were disillusioned with Stevenson later on, but he made a very good impression then. Right. Yeah, Strauss wanted to vote for him, so I dutifully took him down to the local precinct, that, which I, he and I didn't live in the same precinct, but I found where his was. Mm -hmm. He was living on the Midway then, uh, south side of the Midway. 60th, yeah. 60th and Woodlawn or Dorchester? Uh, 60th, yeah. yeah. That, uh, anyway. uh, George Anastopla informed us that building was torn down a few months ago. <laughs> George went walking by the site and saw that Strauss's former apartment building was being torn down, yeah. and he got permission to take a brick. <laughs> <laughs> and he sent a note to, to Nathan and me. It was very kind of him, but it got lost in faculty exchange. We only got the note three or four, four weeks later, and he was encouraging us to go get bricks. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, since we started the Strauss Center, in particular, whenever a European comes and is interested in Strauss, they'll come to us in perplexity and they'll say, where is the plaque showing where Leo Strauss lived? <laughs> I said, well, you're in the United States. We don't do that kind of thing for philosophers. <laughs> Until 50 years later or something. So you took Strauss to the precinct and he registered to vote no. with the intention of casting a vote for Adelaide Stevens. That's what he said, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And I don't know, but I presume he went there and dutifully voted. Did he, in his Walgreen lectures and then in the book Natural Right and History, he, the Declaration plays, is mentioned very prominently. Yes. In Natural Right, of course, it's the, almost the first thing. In his teaching, did he describe the Declaration as no. the source of the no. founding? He could have done that in talking with his students. I suppose one thing you would be interested in is the origin of the volume, whatever the title is, The New Theory of Politics, or what is that called? I don't know. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. It's uh, Herb Storing. Oh, it has Strauss's epilogue at the end. No. I I'm sorry, I'm blanking out of the name, but I know I which one. I can't mean. think of the name either. I have a copy of it in the other room. But that started at a meeting with some foundation fellow, Rockefeller or something like that. And Strauss, in these conversations, was critical of the new political science, the behavioralism. And this foundation guy said, well, why don't you write something about it? And Strauss said, well, why don't you give us a grant to write something about it? So they did. And then the next question was put together a group of students and hand out the assignments. I was given voting studies. And Storing had, I forget what he had. But I'll go get the book. Bob Horowitz was there talking about, <laughs> Marty Diamond was there. And we met once a week in the summer. We met in Strauss's building over there in 50th and Woodlawn. And we talked, and Strauss commented. And Strauss's role, of course, was to focus on the work. And in the case of voting studies, he pointed out that the difficulty with all these other voting studies, and psychological ones and sociological ones, they simply 
abstracted from politics. They simply couldn't understand that even the American voter may have had some political reason for casting his vote the way he did. And um, what do you want? Uh, what's the title? Essays on essay, science. Essay on science. Yeah. the scientific study of politics. The scientific study of yeah. politics. Anyway, that's enough to be said about that. Well, that's very interesting. I don't think of Strauss as being aware of the content of voting studies. I think I, my office in this case was to, you know, I wrote something and it was a draft of something. And that brought it to the attention of Strauss that uh, there were actually people who said, on well, the case of sociology, there was, they had some formula. I now forget what it was, but it was a sociological formula to the extent that people voted because of their social, economic, something like that. And to exaggerate a bit, there were psychologists who were saying, and this is, I think, a slight exaggeration, but not much of one, people vote because of their toilet training. And Strauss, of course, pointed out that people probably have some political reasons for voting. And the best illustration of that that came slightly after, well, somewhat after the publication of this book. Yeah, when I was at Cornell, Cornell's located in Tompkins County, New York. Tompkins County, for its entire history, had voted Republican until Barry Goldwater. What year was Barry Goldwater? 60? That would have been 64, wasn't 64. it? 64. In 64, they voted for Democrat. Now, what happened in all these years, a great mass of people with different sociological or psychological people moved into Tompkins County, or they didn't like Barry Goldwater, <laughs> and for political reasons. Anyway, um, so Strauss met with the group of you and Story and Marty Diamond and I guess Bob Goldwyn. Bob Goldwyn and, yeah, and Bob Horowitz, yeah. Bob Horowitz. And he met with you weekly and discussed the contents of this book on the scientific study of politics. Well, he discussed the subject with us. And as I recall, each of us present, made some sort of a presentation. In my case, the voting studies, I had to explain, this is what the political science profession has come to. They say this sort of thing about, as to why people vote. And Strauss... Well, it wasn't Leo Weinstein part of that? No. Oh. He had been asked to, and he failed to deliver. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the remarkable things about Strauss as a teacher is, I mean, for instance, you and... Bob Goldwyn and Bob Horowitz and Martin Diamond and Herb Storing and uh, Ralph Lerner and Harry Jaffa and probably some other people I'm not remembering, all did remarkable work on American politics. Strauss never taught American politics. No, but he helped us in, in the following way. In the first word, while it's on my mind, he once taught a course jointly with Ed Banfield, and it was on some American subject. For some reason, I wasn't there, but I'm told by both Strauss and Banfield that it didn't work for some reason. Beyond that, Strauss met with each one of us as we were leaving to begin teaching and talked, simply consulted with us as to how we would teach our subjects. In my case, how to teach constitutional law. That interested him. He may have known the names of certain cases, but he certainly didn't know the details. But he knew about the importance of the Constitution mm -hmm. and the importance of focusing on the Constitution in some particular way. So he talked with me about that, and he talked with each of us about what we were going to teach. Did Ralph Lerner tell you about his experience at the, his Ph.D. oral? I don't remember that, no. <laughs> Well, it has to do with me, too, so I mention it. I don't know now who was in the committee and who was present in Ralph's oral presentation, but I can imagine who was there. And they asked Ralph something about political science. And this was almost surely a question asked by one of the behavioralists of the department. David Eastman or something. David Eastman, name, yes, thank you, Irene. And Ralph, I, of course, was not there. Ralph said, political science is a mess. And Strauss, shortly after that, well, well, I should say, I was due the next week. And Strauss came up to me before my thing and told me about what Ron And he said, don't you they say anything like that, Mr. Burns. 
Well, I didn't, of course, but what it, the effect of Strauss's warning had the effect of absolutely tying my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> well, this raises an issue I wanted to ask you about. The epilogue to the book that you worked on with him... That became famous or notorious, it's, yes. Uh, it's, it's a declaration of war. Yeah. <laughs> and did Strauss later suggest that it might have been wiser to take a different rhetorical approach, or... Did he ever have any doubts about that? Well, A, he wrote the epilogue by himself. Right. And he did not consult us as to the content of the epilogue. I mean, my point is, it's not accidental that Ralph Lerner, his PhD defense, said this impolitic thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't recall that Strauss ever regretted having said it. Strauss had made his... Well, he was not at war with the profession, really. So that when Herman Pritchett, I don't know whether you know this. Uh, I don't know, no. Well, Pritchett was chairman of the department, a very decent man. And he became president of the American Political Science Association. Okay. And at the annual meeting of the APSA, when he, Pritchett, was president, he, as president, delivers the president's speech to the convention, and he invited Strauss to sit on the platform with him, which pleased Strauss, pleased him immensely. In a way, Pritchett was saying, this is a man is an important person in the, the profession of political science. It's interesting that Harry Jaffa took real exception to that just as he took exception to the establishment of the Leo Strauss dissertation prize by the association. According to Jaffa, this is, how, how in the world he put it, I don't know, I forget now. I also should say, I have had a war with Harry Jaffa in print, and we don't talk to each other. And I thought it foolish to argue that it was beneath Strauss, it was, it was contemptible for Strauss to acknowledge the existence of the APSA. <laughs> <laughs> that was Jaffa's position? Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's foolish, of course. Well, there's one other episode. No, I haven't thought about this for years. I forget who started it, but I got involved in it. It made me unhappy to be involved in it. But there was to be a public debate between Strauss and Ed Schills. Maybe. Yeah, I think it was, on the question of the new political science, behavioralism. Mm -hmm. And the meeting took place in what's the big lounge in the social science research building? Well, the classroom Strauss often taught in was Social Science 122, which is on the ground floor. No, that's a big auditorium. No, that's and then the auditorium. There's, a, there's a 302, has the giant oval table. And well, there's also a room where you met for tea. The tea room. I was yeah. on the second floor. Anyway. It, so I was I, in the tea room. I think it was there, and it was jam-packed because Strauss had his students and his supporters, and Ed Schills mm -hmm. was not a nobody. I started by asking a question. I forgot what the question was, and neither one wanted to answer it. And there was absolute silence for a while. Well, eventually it was a discussion began. I don't know what ever happened to that. I don't think anyone was happy with it. That was an attempt on the part of the students to have this debate public. I'd like to come back to so many of Strauss's students choosing to work not in or not exclusively in political philosophy, but in American politics, American political thought. Why do you think that happened? Two reasons. In my case, for example, I was simply not competent to do the kind of work that Alan Bloom did, and I knew it. And secondly, Strauss emphasized the importance of teaching American politics properly. Storing was probably the best of us non-theorists, and Strauss must have known that, if only because Strauss must have had something to do with storing his appointment to the department. But something occurred once when Storing wrote a paper for a, a Strauss seminar, and it was clear that Strauss thought very well of what Storing had written mm -hmm. on a subject that, you know, let's say it was Thucydides or something like that, mm -hmm. and Storing had never dealt with Thucydides. But mm -hmm. Storing was a very smart person, and Strauss knew that. But Storing never pretended to teach political philosophy. 
And I think that they never pretended to do it, yeah. But Strauss convinced us of the importance of what we were in our fields. And that's the answer to your question, really. So did he say to you, well, Mr. Burns, you should really concentrate on the Constitution? Or did he say to Herb Storing, you should really follow up this work you're doing on race relations in the United States? Did he give specific... I don't, I don't think so, no. Yeah. It was simply that he conveyed to you that working on American the, things... The importance of it. Yeah. And yeah. It's not to be disgraced and not to be ashamed of teaching this. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else do this. You mentioned that Strauss was on your dissertation committee, and your dissertation was on the First Amendment. Yeah. What role did he play on the committee? He read your dissertation? As I recall, not very much. My chairman was a fellow named Bob Horn, mm -hmm. who didn't get tenure at Chicago. He went to Stanford. And Horn was a, a very good teacher. And Strauss wanted Horn, and I, I, this is faculty matters, and I can't be sure of this, but I have reason to believe that Strauss argued for Horn's retention and his getting tenure at Chicago, uh -huh. which he didn't get. He didn't write, for one thing. He didn't write, yes. But he was a very good teacher, and he was my, my principal advisor. So, did he give you any feedback on your dissertation? Yeah, he said I should have talked more about John Stuart Mill. And once you turned the dissertation into a book, did he comment on the book? Not to my knowledge, no. He uh, liked the title, you know, Freedom, Virtue, and the First Amendment. How would you describe Strauss as a teacher? You've asked that question of everybody, and you know the answer to it. Well, I've gotten several different answers. What do you mean by your question? Well, I... Did he lecture? No. Okay. He did, the classes were done, the records of the classes we have, have him working through a text. Yeah. A reader, very often Mr. Rankin, would read a passage, Strauss would stop him, comment on what was read, and then go to the next section. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the case of the courses you took with him. Yeah, you know, each of us wrote a paper on that section for the day. And I remember struggling with my section, and my wife mentioned it yesterday. Yeah. When I first knew Walter, that was he was struggling with his first paper for Strauss. He didn't know at all what he was up against. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I had some vague idea because this was, mine was not the first, and I knew what had happened previously. I thought it was the first paper of the semester. No, it was mine, but anyway, by that time I knew what I was up against. And it was a question of reading something and not understanding the importance of, of something in the text and I was anxious to come up with the right answer or the right reading of a particular section. And of course, I didn't. And one of the things you learn from Strauss is to see something of importance in a particular text. You know, what Strauss taught me was how to read. I remember going to him very foolishly as a kind of confession saying, I had encountered some speed reading uh, program or text or book or something, and I was interested in it because I wanted to increase the speed with which I read. <laughs> he smiled, something like that. You know, the problem was not how fast you could read a text, but how well you read it. And that had nothing to do with speed. So you asked what was behind my question. And there's nothing in particular behind it, but I'll ask a different question, which is, did Strauss have a project in his teaching? Was, it, was there something he was trying to accomplish through his teaching, political philosophy? A great political project? No. I'll try to answer that question by saying something remote from your question, in a sense. I once, after I had read Harry Chaffer's Crisis of the House to have I said to Strauss something to the effect that he was one of your best students. And Strauss responded in, certain, in some way that indicated to me that he didn't think so. After a couple of years when I was smarter and more experienced with this, I said something about Alvin Bloom. And he said something about Bloom and Bernadetti being his first understanding was Seth was by far the best, but then something happened and he wondered whether Bloom was not better but they were the best. Now, why were they the best? I suppose because they were the best who understood philosophy, understood the great problems of philosophy, 
understood about the importance of the theological political question and the importance of understanding that. So the, your question about Strauss's project or whatever, however you put it, I suppose he was interested in the perpetuation of philosophy, the importance of it, especially at a time when the world of classics was beyond contempt as he looked at it, and political science was not even addressing the questions, or beyond that, at a time when we were so bloody confident that the end of the world had come in this happy condition of liberal democracy in America and nothing to worry about. And he was worried about that. But he was worried about, the, I think, the future of philosophy. So his project was by training students in the study of political philosophy to try and create the conditions for the serious study of philosophy yeah, to continue. Yeah, I think so, yeah. That was, and then with the, the rest of us, the perpetuation of liberal democracy in the United States. Have you had anything to do with Seth Benedetti? Did you before he died? No, there was no chance. He died before we started. Oh, I see. Yeah. Wasn't he really one of Strauss's best students too? Oh, except, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And Strauss said so. I spent one night with him. He actually just wore me out. You know, I ended up not knowing what the hell he was talking about. He was much more abstruse than Alan. Uh, yeah. Alan had something else. Uh, Alan Bloom was a better teacher than Strauss. You think so? You know, student, regular students. I'll tell you a story about that. This was at Toronto. Bloom and I were in Toronto together. One year he had Cliff Orman as his student's faculty assistant. That was after the heart attack. And Cliff came and was helping Alan. And on this occasion, I was going down a staircase to go to a big lecture hall and Cliff Ord was coming up the staircase, having just come from the big lecture hall. I was to teach whatever I was to teach there, and Bloom had just finished teaching. And Cliff met me on the staircase, and he met me with this question. How much of what Alan knows about Rousseau does he tell the students? I was just nonplussed with that. I didn't know how to answer it. So I asked him, what are you talking about? He said, well, Alan has just finished something about Rousseau and passed it off, and that was that. And I said, yeah, that's all right. He said, why do you mention it, I asked. Well, he had just come from Harvey. He had been Harvey's assistant at Mansfield mm -hmm. at Harvard in a Gov 101 or something mm -hmm. like that. And he said, Harvey tells the students everything he knows about a particular subject. And I said, yeah, that's the trouble with Harvey Mansfield. Said, I mean that incidentally. He was a, a bad teacher of undergraduates. And Alan Bloom, another thing about Alan, Toronto student grades were departmental grades in a way. And everyone's grades list, every professor's grades list went to the chairman of the department. And in this case, in Alan's, he had given a few students A's. No, 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 no. He didn't give enough A's, that was the point. <laughs> and the department chairman just took B pluses or something like that and made him A's. And that infuriated Alan because he gave the A's in order to know which students should be in the upper seminar. So in the big 101 courses, if you got an A, he was likely to allow you to enroll for the, the summer. My point in saying this in connection with Strauss is Alan knew better than Strauss the condition of the typical undergraduate student, or in our case, the typical graduate student. Strauss, I suppose, had to learn how stupid we were, really. Alan knew. Stupid, of course, is not the word, but how unprepared we were. And Alan was better than that. He was a better teacher of undergraduates. As to the other business, uh, I won't say anything. Harry Jaffa said of Strauss as a teacher that he thought too highly of his students, that he tended to idealize them, or think that they, uh, well, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said they thought too highly of them. Strauss What was the fault of that? What was the problem with that? I mean, he gave good grades to bad students? No, that he simply overestimated them, in Harry Joffa's view. He overestimated his students, but they were capable of it. And then was therefore disappointed? No, I don't think Strauss was disappointed. I think Harry Joffa is standing on the outside saying this is how he was. Well, Harry could be saying what I just said, really. Mm -hmm. Alan understood better mm -hmm. how little American students knew. Whether that's what Harry was talking about, 
I'm not so sure. Well, what you said suggested it to me, but it's yeah. it's what he said and not what Strauss said. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can I think of someone that Strauss misjudged by thinking too much of? I don't think so. <laughs> of course, that gets me back then. Strauss did not misjudge Harry Jaffe in that respect. I don't know, what are you about 50 years later, aren't you doing this now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Strauss certainly did not make a mistake about Helen Bloom, although they had that terrible, I don't know what started it really, but there was a time when there was a real rift between them, and it had a terrible effect on Helen. But, you know, when the question came of teaching Jenny Greek, Strauss asked Alan to do it. Have you talked to Jenny, as a matter of fact? No, I haven't talked with her in this way. I don't know any case of where Strauss thought too well, too well, and too well being with unhappy consequences. I don't think that. that I think Strauss, and if you get back to what I said about storing, Strauss thought very well of Herb storing, but he did not encourage Herb to go into philosophy. In my experience, he thought very well of Alan Bloom, and he should have. He thought very well of Seth Bernadetti, and he should have. I think he thought very well of Ralph Lerner, and he should have. I think he thought well of Harvey Mansfield, although I never talked to, you know, Harvey was never a student at Chicago, but I think Strauss realized that Harvey's virtues, which are considerable, Another thing that struck me is about how fair Strauss was to religious people. There were frequently priests, or never rabbis in my experience, but priests surely, and Strauss always took them very seriously. In a way, well, the best case, of course, would be Ernest Fortin here. It's a pity you couldn't. Yeah, he's, he's gone. Because it would have been an interesting to talk to him about Strauss. But the priests, at least the serious priests, were concerned with how we should live. And Strauss respected that. And he could criticize a paper written by a, you know, a seminar paper and so forth. He would point out certain difficulties, but he would never dismiss a religious person. I once asked him, as a kind of test of his Jewishness, I said to him, Mr. Strauss, you argue that, we're talking about Plato, that there's an element of truth in every honestly held opinion. I said, there's an honestly held opinion that Jews are something or other. I wanted an answer for that. And he said, well, they're different, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> that told me volumes, you know. <laughs> what else? Do you think Strauss learned anything from his experience of America, or his experience of American students? Oh, sure. What? To some extent, he knew he learned something about political science from us who wrote this book, mm -hmm. whatever it's called. There was, you know, things, certain things going on in the profession that we knew that he didn't know, although he must have had a pretty good view of it because some of his colleagues in the department, David Eastman, for example, yeah, I suppose he learned something from us. You know, he ended up you knowing a great deal about America. Yeah, he sure did. How long was he at the new school then, when he first came? Not so very long. I think he was at the new school from 43 to 49. So, during the war then? I yeah. think so. Yeah. That's a question I should know the answer to. Yeah. But I, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I would think during those years, if yeah. they were the war years, he would have learned quite a bit. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the new school, though, it was full of people who were refugees, too. Yeah. Well, this was, I mean, the reason for my question, obviously he was, he grew up in the German university system. I guess he moved to the United Kingdom in something like 35. And so the United States is something completely different than what he had grown up with and where he had studied. And maybe there isn't any, you know, I don't know how one would know if he did learn something in particular about American political science, certainly, about whether the country introduced anything new to him that he didn't understand already before he came here? I would think he would learn a lot, <laughs> appreciate. That, that's a good question, you know. I'm, I'm thinking of him. Well, for example, had he read Tocqueville before he came to America? I, mm -hmm. Probably not. But he knew Tocqueville when I knew him. You began by describing him as a great defender of liberal democracy and 
practice that meant of being a great defender of the United States. Yeah, oh yeah. That was apparent in uh, his Walgreen lectures. Something else, there's two stories about this. Eric Thurgolin gave a Walgreen lecture, and I went to the first and then didn't go to any others. And then at my first teaching assignment was LSU, and Thurgolin was a professor at LSU. So I went to Strauss and asked for some sort of guidance with respect to Eric Thurgolin, what I should do. And he said, well, he's read everything. <laughs> <laughs> and the other story about this is, uh, you ever hear of Wilmore Kendall? Yeah, sure. Uh, he corresponded with Strauss when yeah. Kendall was at the National Review. Yeah. I was a colleague of Kendall's at Yale, and Kendall came to me with the question, would Strauss be willing to talk with him? He was going to somewhere and he was going to stop. He would stop in Chicago if mm -hmm. he thought Strauss would talk with him. I said, of course you don't, just write him. So he did, and they talked, and then afterwards I got essentially the same account of that conversation from each of them. And Kendall had been reading Eric Fergalin and was mighty impressed with mm -hmm. Fergalin mm -hmm. and insists that Eric Fergalin was essentially a religious man. And apparently there was then a discussion as to the evidence wherein Fergalin's writings, did you come to the conclusion, or were you entitled to come to the conclusion that he was basically a religious man? And finally Strauss, and this came from both of them, Strauss said, Mr. Kendall, can you imagine Eric Fergalin on his knees praying? And Kendall, who was an honest man, <laughs> no. <laughs> and that was the end of that. I don't suppose you've had any occasion ever to see or listen to Eric Fergalin. No, I had no chance to see him. There may be tapes available of him, I don't know. There's a program that he and Alan are on together. I didn't know that. Yeah. I forget who. Mark Blitz, remember, was yeah. a student of Fogland's, a yeah. first year student, graduate student. <laughs> he said he came out to him <laughs> whirling. He had no idea what in the world was being said. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you had ever met I'll tell you a story about Fergalin. I was at, what's that place in Vienna, in, London, in Austria? Salzburg, I guess. Salzburg, yeah. It was at the Salzburg Seminar, yeah. yeah. I was teaching the Salzburg Seminar one summer, and I went back through Germany for some reason. I stopped in Munich to see the Fergalins and had dinner with him. I always got along okay. And he had recently been appointed to the, what's his name? Weber, I believe. Yeah, yeah, Max Weber chair at Munich. And I said, that's very nice. I said, who, who occupied the chair before you? And he said, nobody. And I said, what? I said, Weber died in, what, 1922 <laughs> or something like that? They couldn't find any, anyone to <laughs> fill the chair. That's what Fergalin said. I said, okay. And Fergalin thought well of himself. He was also, much to be said about him, for example, having such disparaging things, I don't I feel obliged to speak about his virtues. He and his wife left Germany at a certain time, and they had to leave in a hurry. He certainly wasn't Jewish, but for political reasons, they had to leave, and they had to leave a house. And they sold the house to someone with the understanding that the payment for it would come in Switzerland or wherever the Fairlands they realized that this probably wouldn't be the case. They would get rid of their house, but they wouldn't get anything for it. But in fact, they did. The guy who bought the house actually transferred the money to Switzerland and so forth. Anyway, Fogler was anti-Nazi. And that's my point in this mm -hmm. story. And he deserves some credit for that because he was certainly not Jewish. Right. At Cornell, you were in the thick of the unpleasantness yeah. there. Sure was, yeah. Um, did Strauss ever discuss those days with you? I think so. In the first place, Strauss came and lectured at Cornell, you know. That would have been before the takeover. That was before the takeover, about a year before the takeover, actually. Yeah, these were black separatists or black nationalists who took over the, the administration buildings. Yeah, right? yeah. with uh, some ver <clears throat> very nasty white S, what were they, S E S? Uh, hmm? SDS. SDS students. Oh, SDS, yeah. 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 All I can remember is Strauss was very sympathetic to me. 
and Alan, of course, yeah. understood why we were leaving. Yeah. Do you have any idea what it was to leave? Our family was there, you know, three children in school. We had a house to sell. And I think it never occurred to me that I wouldn't get a job. And as I think back, and I, how foolish that was. How could I be so sure that I would get a job? But luckily, I did. George Will was the guy who got me the job in Toronto. Did you know that story? I think when I first, early early on after I met Bloom, he told me something about George Will, but I, whatever it was, I forgot. Well, I had resigned from my professorship. Yeah. Yeah. That was reported in the New York Times. George Will read that. George Will was an assistant professor of political science at uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. George Will had come to Cornell when I was chairman, looking, making a decision as to where he was going to go to graduate school. He went to Princeton. When he saw my name, he then went to the chairman of the department and said, try to hire me. So I went there, and I then said, after I got there and so forth, I said, there's another one of us. And that's how Alan got the job, so mm -hmm. the two of us went up there. And George Will was responsible for that. That's wonderful. And then a couple of years later, George Will had an offer to come to Washington, and he came to me and asked my advice and pretended to be uncertain as to what he should do. He's had an opportunity to be a journalist in Washington and continue to be a political scientist. And I pretended to take that question seriously and finally concluded, well, George, I think maybe you should be a journalist in Washington. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> He's still going strong. Yeah. He sure is. Yeah. TV is made for him. I mean, oh, yeah. the way that he writes, the readers don't exist for him anymore. Too Maybe abstruse. you and I and a few others, perhaps, but the average newspaper reader doesn't have the patience to read someone like George no, Well. No. But on TV, he can be very powerful. Yeah, and he speaks in full sentences. Yeah. And he's yeah. succinct, yeah. which is right. appreciated. Too. Right, right. I was interested in Strauss's reaction to the events at Cornell for a couple of reasons. One was, it was one of several things around that time, 1968, that marked a change in what America is. I mean, the events at Cornell and around the country, different university takeovers, but also a new left rising up, the SDS, hippies appearing, <laughs> the sexual revolution. All of this happened around the same time. Yeah. And it was just a few years before Strauss died, but he saw this, he must have seen the ground was shifting under his feet. I was yeah. just wondering if he had any reflection on I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't with him right, then, right, right. so I don't know. You know, you can ask Harry about that, of course. You know, he, he went out to Claremont, and I presume Harry was responsible for making that possible. I think so, yeah. But it was, a, I gather, a very unhappy time there. Yeah, I asked Harry about Strauss's time at Claremont, and he insisted steadfastly that the Strausses were happy there, but that they had to move to St. John's because of Mrs. Strauss, and he brought up various things. I don't know that. I mentioned his name in this connection because, of course, he knew Strauss in St. John's. When Strauss left Claremont and went to St. John's, and it's possible that he was being in a position to say something. Well, he and Bob Goldwyn. Bob Goldwyn was yeah. instrumental yeah. in bringing him to St. John's, was he not? Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. it's something amusing. But I was there at St. John's when Strauss was in the hospital. I forget why it was I went there, maybe because Strauss was in the hospital. He had this splendid suite in this hospital. I think Leon had something to do with getting it. And I said to him in the hospital room suite, I said, boy, this is terrific. I wonder what it costs or something like that. And Strauss, and Lynn found, later found out, of course, that Strauss' notion of a high price for the suite was $10 a night. It was probably 200 or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody else was picking up the tab. Yeah. I forget that, then. Oh, was at, at Strauss's funeral when I was in St. John's and stayed in the Learner's House. In the Cass's No, the Cass's house. Cass's, you were all there. I mean, you and Alan and Howard, maybe? Yeah. And... I believe it was also Yon Kipper Bohr. I mean... It was, yes. Yeah. And it was Strauss's funeral, and we went to Annapolis at the... Anyway, Leon Cass 
had a house there, but he was Montreal. in Montreal or someplace like that. Yes. And so he arranged with Ralph, whom he knew. Ralph and you weren't there, were you? I wasn't there, no. No, Ralph and I stayed in the Cass House in Annapolis on the occasion of Strauss's funeral. And we were having dinner someplace on the waterfront in one of those places. And someone came in and had just talked with Mrs. Strauss and conveyed the message that she wanted me to deliver one of the eulogies. And I spent the night in the Cass's house trying to... I suppose she wanted a non-Jew. I think that's the, mm -hmm. the, the only reason... You know, Alan delivered a eulogy and Joe Cropsey delivered a eulogy, so to speak. Yeah, Joe had trouble, didn't he? Oh, boy. Yeah. And I. And, you know, who in the hell was I? And as I suggest, it was only because I was not Jewish. So that was that. And then we had... <laughs> I remember the rabbi delivering some eulogy of his own. He didn't know Strauss from his elbow. This great defender of the equality of man. <laughs> <laughs> you said something about, I remember, most of the students paid attention only to Strauss. And Walter, being more grown up, said something to Mrs. Strauss, which the others paid no attention to doing. She was sort of a... Oh, in the eulogy, I just said on behalf of the students, I want to thank her for... But that's the kind of thing that uh, students don't think about, in a way. <laughs> yeah, you know, who else is involved? Yeah. Young students. Well, let me ask just a few more questions. In your experience with Strauss and in the courses you took from him, how did his practical intelligence come across, his practical wisdom? I mean, there are... Uh, Lawrence Burns' stories are very funny, but they're all along the lines of this professor doesn't know how to operate a car, this professor doesn't know how to turn an electric fan on, this professor doesn't, you know, th these kinds of things. They are very funny. You know, this man who's living so much in the world of ideas that he just doesn't know the most basic things going on around him. But it's also the case that people like Wilmore Kendall, who were very much involved in practical politics or political affairs, respected his opinion very highly. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts along these lines about Strauss in terms of his, his practical wisdom. By practical wisdom, you mean? His, uh, his, his understanding... How to change of, a light bulb? No. I mean, his understanding of, of practical affairs, of international relations, of events in the United oh, States. Boy. Of, oh, boy. He, he knew about international affairs. And he told stories about who was that friend of his who was plagued by the thought that he was responsible for the Russian Revolution by advising that the Germans allowed Lenin to go back to Moscow. Who was that? Kurt, Kurt Rietzler? Yeah, mm -hmm. Rietzler. Yeah. You know, he had these friendships with very important people. Walter Benjamin, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, Strauss knew all these people, and some of them he argued with. The trouble is, I haven't thought about these things for years, so these, their okay. names... But he advised us to read Kurt Rietzler and other people of that sort. He advised us to read Churchill's histories. One of Churchill's biographies he described as a masterpiece. And of course, you've seen the statement he delivered in a seminar on the occasion of Churchill's death. You've seen that. Yeah. Well, he understood that Churchill, of course, was the defender of Western civilization. Oh, he knew these things. What you're talking about is practical politics, really, not... Not how to turn on a light bulb, no, but... but practical politics, yeah. certainly. Right. He came right. from that. He mm -hmm. learned from that, I should think, mm -hmm. what he'd come from. Uh, this dangers. next story has to do with, well, your knowledge of the configuration of office space in the Social Science Research Building. There's a sort of offices on a kind of open space, mm -hmm. right? Right. You come in from the corridor, you get in this space, and then there are offices off this space. Right, right. right. Yeah. He had an office next to... Morgenthau. Hans Morgenthau. And Hans Morgenthau collected the New York Times to give him information daily. And he had great stacks of New York Times, and, and he was filling part of this corridor outside the office space. And <laughs> Strauss said to me when uh, these papers were sort of getting in the way, and he said something about what was Morgenthau's famous 
something, something versus, I was starting a story, I can't remember, that Morgenthau had a book oh, about international it. politics. And more than one book, but this one had a title, Scientific Man Against Power Politics or something it's like something. that. <laughs> Strauss this is implicitly identifying himself as scientific man in power politics, pushing these papers all over there and, and making it difficult for Strauss to get into his office or something <laughs> like that. And then having said that to me, he immediately apologized. He shouldn't have said that. That's the crazy thing about Morgenthau. He collected all these papers, but it turns out he, he was getting the early edition of the Times. Remember, what was that? I'm not sure. Well, he had collected all these papers, but they were the, he was getting, I think he was getting the Times by mail, and what he was getting was the was early edition. Late. You mean it was... Some... And the index, the New York Times index, didn't index the crop proper page to the early edition or something like that. <laughs> no, to get back to your question, of course, what was marvelous about Strauss was that he understood what was going on in Europe, and he appreciated Winston Churchill. It was Churchill's biography of the first Duke of Marlborough. Marlborough. His life of Marlborough, yeah. yeah. Okay. Strauss said that was a masterpiece. He said something, the best history ever written or something like that. Does the word Straussian mean anything? Is there such a thing as a Straussian? <laughs> well, when it's used, it refers to students of Leo Strauss. When it was used in the press here in the last couple of years, it's used with reference to people like Paul Wolfowitz, who had been students and not necessarily the closest students. I, I think that Paul, in fact, would say that Herb Storing had more effect on him yeah. right. than uh, Strauss. Right, right. The term Straussian, it seems to me, it doesn't, there are too many distinctions between people. Well, so, you you know, the, the neoconservatives were all Straussians in some ridiculous like way. That damn woman in Canada, whatever her name is, what is her name? There's another name I forget. A real anti Straussian. Right. It's people who don't like Strauss who use the term Straussians mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. generally. It's a pejorative. Your controversy with Harry Jaffa, on the outside, it looks like a quarrel over what Strauss's legacy is. Well, it's an Eastern and Western Straussians or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think my quarrel with Harry Jaffa is is related to Strauss. The trouble with Harry Jaffa, I once wrote a letter to him that was published in which I said he could have been the poet of American politics or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he wasted his time in arguments with his old friends, mm -hmm. having alienated, and he, you know, he alienated even Joe Cropsey with whom they, you know, they were mm -hmm. classmates together at grammar school or something. Right. You know, the, the absurdity of that it came to a head when Jaffa wanted a chapter in the strauss Cropsey volume. Now, yeah. he wanted a chapter on Churchill, I guess, or something. Oh, Wasn't it yeah, that? Yeah. And Joe said that was not appropriate because whatever Churchill's virtues, he was not a political philosopher. And Jaffa got to the point, Jaffa said, unless you do this, I'll take my chapter out. He had written the one on Aristotle, I think. And Joe said, sure, go ahead. And somebody else wrote the chapter on Aristotle. Holt, Holton? Hmm? Who's that student of mine? Jim Holton? Jim Holton. Did he write the chapter? Well, it doesn't make any so. difference. But that was the absurdity of, you know, Jeff had a terrible argument with Harvey Mansfield. Unnecessarily. The last episode with me was a couple of years ago, and I published a big op-ed on Lincoln in the Wall Street Journal. And Jaffa wrote me a letter in which he said, that was all right so far as it went. And then he attached something he had just written. So I wrote back and said, it's all right so far as it goes. And that was the end of that. It all comes back. Strauss is responsible for all those things. You're interested more in Strauss than I Jaffa ended, fights. <laughs> I ended one of my statements, something to the effect, I hope he goes into a monastery especially one of the monasteries where they don't speak at all. I forget the name for that. He then said publicly in all kinds of places, apparently, I put out a contract on his life. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. No, the principle that was looking at Harry Chalfin, The Crisis of the House of the Divided, was published in 1959. And in it, he promises the second volume, which appears in 2000 or something like that. All those years 
what was he doing? Writing silly essays, or necessarily silly essays, but trivial essays, and getting in fights with his friends. Well, the second volume, did you read it, Walter, or not? I never read it, yeah, but uh, people were very disappointed. A Abe read it yeah. and said, "Forget it." It was it was too bad because I really liked the crisis of the house divided. What else? Well, one last, one or two last questions. Did you consider Strauss your friend? Oh sure, oh sure. But if you want a very exact definition of friendship, a la Alan Bloom's <laughs> love and friendship, that was impossible between Strauss and me. We could not be friends of that sort, but I never called him Leo, certainly. It never would occur to me to do that. I think all of his students addressed him as Mr. Strauss. It's always Mr. Strauss, yes. Yeah. There was a famous story that had to do with Alan, with Abe. Abe Schulzke, do you know him? You know I know him? Abe, yeah. You know Abe. Well, Abe was a student of Alan's. And I guess when Abe got a teaching, he became a, a teacher at, at Cornell. For a couple of years at Cornell. And Alan said something about, you don't have to call me Mr. Bloom anymore, you can talk to me, Ellen. And Abe said, something, well, all right, I'll call you Ellen in department meetings, but outside it's always Mr. Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had Strauss for dinner when he came to Cornell. I had a lunch with Strauss more than once, I think, at Chicago in the tropical hut. The Tiki. Um, <laughs> Was it the Is Tiki? Is it still there? No, it, it, it closed 20 years ago, I think. <laughs> I grew up in that, in the 40s, I guess. And uh, he knew my wife, and one talked to him when one had a child, and he was interested in that, and he always said if people gave him pictures of his children, he didn't know what to do with them, but he accepted them. Sure, and I knew Mrs. Strauss, and if we were expected to know Mrs. Strauss, sure, his friends. But friends, friends, that wasn't the kind of thing that one was with... A person like Strauss. I, you know, I think I was closer to him, in some sense at least, than I was in any other teacher. I never had lunch with Herman Pritchett, whom I admired. Can, can I think of someone? What other teacher did I have? Bob Horn. Yeah, you know, I had lunch with him at, here in Washington years afterwards. Yeah. He had, Bob Horn had come from Stanford because one of his students was Tony Kennedy in the Supreme Court. Kennedy was being something, and Kennedy had asked Bob Horn to come. So I had lunch with Bob Horn, but that was 30 years after, 40 years after I had had Horn as a teacher. No, I think I was, in some important ways, closer to Strauss than any other teacher I ever had. Why? Well, I admired him more than any other teacher I ever had. Looking back on Strauss now, well, uh, looking back on him, how do you think of him? Well, I hesitate to use the word, but the word I hesitate to use a big reverence, I suppose. We were always, people like me were always very careful to resent someone's statement that Strauss had his disciples. We were not disciples. He was our teacher, that's all, but we were, we were not disciples. Yeah, could you say something more about that? Because it is something that's... One of the objections to Straussians is that the impression that people in the universities have that the students of Strauss are somehow all reading off the same page, or, as you say, disciples. Well, I can imagine disagreeing with Leo Strauss on certain matters, but certainly not if we're talking about Plato's laws, for example. What does it mean to say reading off the same page? Well, just that they're all saying the same thing, that Strauss's students are simply repeating the same doctrine or something like that. I don't know of any doctrine, you know. That criticism suggests that we are like uh, Peter and James and so forth following Jesus or something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. What Jesus says, well, there's no equivalent to Strauss says. Now, that's a good point. Strauss didn't say anything in the way that Jesus said some things. Don't people who talk that way mean everybody thinks the same way in terms of taking texts? Seriously, I mean, you can say something like that. Yeah, we all think that one should take certain texts seriously and certain other texts not. Yeah, but you're uh, not a bunch of parrots. I mean, I think that's what, really what the. And it's talking. absurd to think when the term Straussian is associated with the neoconservatives. And who are the neoconservatives? Well, Paul Wolfowitz and Bill Crystal. He's a neoconservative, but he's certainly not a Straussian. No. That's silly talk. But it is used. I mean, yeah. you're quite right. 
it's mm -hmm. used that way, but by mm -hmm. enemies in a way. Right, right. Yeah. right. Well, to repeat something I said, but it's absolutely true. At the time when Strauss was alive, we resented the notion that we were disciples. It was simply an inappropriate term. We were students, he was our teacher, in a very honorable sense. The presence at Chicago caused some trouble with his colleagues there because they found out that some of their best students were turned out to be Strauss students. And I recall once what was it, David Eastman? Eastman. I remember once him saying something to the effect, I don't give a damn what Strauss said. And they found some of their best students drifting away from them. Yeah. Or questioning them. Well, not writing PhD dissertations under them. Most students in Chicago ended up writing a dissertation under Herb Storing. He literally had, he was chairman of at least 50% of the students. Is that right? He was a terrific teacher. He had a house on Hatch Lake, which is five miles from Colgate, where he grew up. His father was a professor at Colgate, in mm -hmm. fact, had been temporary president of Colgate. And they had this summer home on this Hatch Lake. He had a sort of boat house close to the dock in their property, and he used it as a study in the summer. And he had a, I can recall this, just a heap of PhD theses there, <laughs> which he summer read. Summer work, right. During the summer. He didn't have disciples either. <laughs> no, he didn't. Oh. But boy, did he have devoted students. I don't know what else. Okay. Have. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground. You cover 10 hours? No. <laughs> no. I wasn't going to subject us to that. <laughs> well, I, feel, I feel inadequate because, well, I can't compare myself to Alan Bloom, but I know that Alan Bloom would speak much more sensibly about the important things that Leo Strauss taught than I can. Oh, I think you said some very interesting I things. Have, I have anecdotes. Alan did at Toronto, did a wonderful piece, which I don't know where it's published. It's on political Strauss's, theory. It's political theory, on, yeah. which you probably know, mm -hmm. on Strauss's development as a It was a, a kind of eulogy thinker, of Strauss. Really. Yeah. Well, it was to make up for the eulogy in a way, yeah. but it was the development of Strauss's thinking, and you no doubt know that, because mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful piece of understanding how he came to be what he was. But you must know everything <laughs> you're doing this project. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hardly know everything. Okay, this is Gail McKean here with Jeff Burnham. And let's get started by your telling me when you came to Chicago and how it was you came to Chicago and how you came to study with Leo Strauss. Well, it's one of the more interesting stories. I had been a student at Cornell and took a course from Walter Burns in constitutional law. And then he also taught a course on Plato's Republic, which was basically using the Bloom understanding of the Republic and the Strauss understanding of the Republic, although Bloom wasn't there at the time. Bloom came in the second term of my senior year, and I was already on my way to Chicago. Then he went back to Yale, or he went to Yale for a while. So unlike some of the Yale Chicago students, I was not part of that crowd, although of course we knew each other. I was a math major at first, and Paul Wolfowitz, his father, was the chairman of the department. So Paul and I knew each other, but the other people like Tom Pangle, I didn't really meet till I got to Chicago. So to get to the point, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Charles Umbenauer, who unfortunately has just passed away, and I decided, based on the courses we had taken from Walter Burns, that we would study in Chicago, go to Chicago to study with Strauss. Neither one of us, as it turned out, were political theorists. We wound up teaching con law and American government and public administration and so forth. So we were different from the other Strauss students who were primarily political theorists. So Charles and I decided that if we were going to study Chicago and put up all this money and make this choice, we ought to meet Strauss. So we got in our car, we drove 750 miles from Ithaca to Chicago. We we're supposed to meet Strauss in his office in the afternoon. When we got there, we were told that he wasn't feeling very well and we'd have to go over and meet him as an apartment. So we met him as an apartment. That was my first introduction to him. 
And of course, it was a huge surprise. I mean, having read Natural Right in History and some of his writings, I was expecting this fairly large, kind of imposing figure. <laughs> and when I met him and realized how soft his voice was and how, so shall I say, impish he was, it was a huge surprise. So he was there, and he was very courteous and thought he should offer us a refreshment. So he went to his refrigerator, which Jenny had kept stocked, and the only thing in it was completely empty were like two boiled eggs. <laughs> so he offered us each a boiled egg, which of course we refused. <laughs> so that was how I met Leo Strauss. And what was your conversation like with him? Did you ask him about his classes? What did you talk about him? What sense did you get of him in that experience? Well, I don't know exactly. I mean, there's nothing remarkable about the conversation. He asked us why we were interested in studying in Chicago, and we told him, I don't think the conversation itself was as remarkable as the boiled eggs. That's what I recall. <laughs> So that was that conversation. But it didn't dissuade you from coming to Chicago. It... Well, we'd already pretty much made up our mind, and I can't remember exactly when, but we discovered Herb Storing. I guess we knew about Herb Storing, but when I got to Chicago, I started taking con law and even got interested in public administration. Storing became my mentor. He was the chair of my PhD dissertation and a really good friend. Like Strauss, he was uh, unassuming. Neither one of them would make you or your wife or anybody else nervous. They were very approachable. Her passed away at the age of 49, the same age as his father had passed away by the same, well, they both had heart attacks. But he was this professor I saw the most of, and then there were others of no particular note that taught con law. There's a fellow named John Roach who had been Milton Johnson's academic advisor was visiting there and on his final exam I criticized the question and I got a C and Story said, oh don't worry, we're not going to hire him. <laughs> but, but he was sort of combative, but anyway, that'll have to be edited out. What was it like being in one of Strauss's classes? Oh well, they were quite remarkable. I was in seminars, I was in a couple of lecture courses that he gave. What I remember most of all about the seminars was that he was always learning himself. He had some notes which were fresh. He always was reading the text and had in a very small handwriting you'd have on a sheet of paper his notes for the class of that day. And one thing I remember was he once said the secret of good teaching was to assume that there was someone in the classroom who was smarter than you were. So that was the child he didn't want to leave behind. And it conforms with my own teaching experience, which is you set high expectations for students, they will meet them. And so he sort of took us into our confidence, almost as if we were fellow scholars. That's an exaggeration, but still, we were reading the text together. A student would deliver a paper at the beginning of the class, and he would critique it, and then we'd go discuss the class together. And there was a fellow named Donald Rankin that would read the text. Have you, is anybody in touch with Donald Rankin? I think he gave permission for his voice to be heard in the transcripts that were put online. Not in terms of interviewing him, no. But his voice is on so many of the transcripts. He read in multiple of Strauss's classes. Well, the reason I was asking is that some of us have been wanting to track him down and we have no idea what happened to him. I might that. have some information at the office. I can, that would be I can interesting. Really touch and let you know, yes. There's another fellow who was close to Strauss at the time named Marvin Kendrick, and I'm not sure what happened to him either. I don't know. But there were some people you know, just sort of dropped off the scene. That's what I remember about him the way he drew us into his confidence. He, even there was a student named Alan Seltzer. He challenged to a debate. On what? What was the debate? Uh, about? It was on the question of whether there could be an independent social science, independent of natural science, which Strauss said there could be, and Alan Seltzer challenged him. And so he said, well, let's have a debate. Seltzer was terrified. <laughs> But they debated it, and uh, he did a pretty good job. And, Just you know, right on the spot? No, no, they set up a special debate in the uh -huh. little lecture hall, and uh -huh. they debated it. No, he didn't. 
challenge them right right off. No. But that was not recorded, apparently. I've never heard of a recording of that. No, it probably wasn't. That's a pity. Well, so that was very remarkable. I had an interesting relationship with him. I didn't know it at the time, but looking back on it, he sort of treated me as if I was somebody that might be going into government or politics. I, at the time, I thought he sort of treated me as if I were a gentleman, which for a Platonist is a put-down, but for an Aristotelian is not. So when I gave my paper on Book Six of the Ethics, I used an illustration about the practical syllogism, and I said the major premise might be don't do business with incompetent firms, but the more important premise is which firms are incompetent. And he loved that. It was a very homely example, but he thought that was great. Well, yeah, you're right. That is the most important thing in a practical syllogism. That fits my career in many ways because I worked for Dick Luger for 20 years. And Dick Luger is a very principled man. He is a Rhodes Scholar, very, very smart. He was first in his class in college. And although he's very principled, he's always interested in how the principles are going to work out in practice. So that was the difference for him and between him and many senators who weren't philosophical. Well, he's not philosophical, but many senators who are not principled, let's say. I don't mean in necessarily a bad way, but who are just merely pragmatic, and the others who are ideological. When Senator Luger ran for president in 1996, I arranged a breakfast for him with Harvey Mansfield, because Harvey Mansfield was supported him for president, and I thought it'd be interesting if they met. Well, it was remarkable. I had to really keep the conversation going, and Luger at one point said, I'm doing too much of the talking. What are you interested in? And Harvey said, I'm interested in the whole. And I said, that's a conversation stopper if I ever heard one. So I had to kind of intervene and steer it back to subjects that were more practical, like affirmative action and stuff like that. So that's what I remember about Strauss from his seminars. And I took a number of seminars with him. I took Xenophon. Remember Marvin Kendrick was in that seminar. He later did his dissertation on Xenophon. There was a lecture course I took on Plato's Gorgias, which was quite interesting and amusing as well. We were talking about the true arts and the sham arts. And there was these two German students in the class. And Strauss was talking about the true art of gymnastics and the false art of cosmetics. And the German student raised his hand very forcefully. He said, but Mr. Strauss, he said, wouldn't a man who was ugly have a right to use cosmetics? <laughs> and Strauss said, indeed, it would be his duty. <laughs> so I got a really good understanding of Plato and Xenophon and Aristotle from Strauss. I also... I failed to mention this. I think the first course I had from Strauss was Natural Right and History. It was a lecture course, and it was just terrific. I just loved it. I think I may have already read the book. It wasn't really a rehash of the book, presumably. I followed the book very closely, as I, I recall. Oh, I and yeah. actually, I might have read the book at that time rather than before I came, but I think I read it before I came. But anyway, it was a fairly large course. I don't know who did the grading of their... He must have had an assistant for a course with 50 people, maybe not. But the question, which was three hours long, was summarize the argument of this course. Oh. <laughs> and I got an A. I don't know who <laughs> graded it, but... That's quite a complex task. Yeah, <laughs> so that was interesting. Yeah. How much did Strauss's pedagogy influence your own pedagogical style? I know you taught very different material. But... Well, that's a good point. Quite a bit. Every chance I get... I teach a seminar or even a tutorial, and I try to engage with the students, not on a footing of equality, but I go into the class trying to learn something myself and not just teach them what I think they want to know. Another person who was there at the same time was Bob Goldwyn, who was a terrific teacher. And that was his style. Of course, he had the St. John's connection, I think, before then. I don't know if he'd been to St. John's. Anyway, he taught in that same method, although I think he was trying to lead you to a certain conclusion, which is different from that. And Strauss wasn't trying to lead you to a... 
I don't specific. think so, no. Interesting. It's a sort of stereotype that you hear from Strauss denouncers, of course, is that Strauss had a very clear teaching in terms of method and so on, but apparently you did not find that in your experience of his classes. Why do you say that? I thought I did. Oh, you did. Sorry. Okay. Well, I thought I was saying you that... You said he didn't lead you to a specific conclusion. Well, this is getting complicated. Well, you have to remember that I've been teaching for a long time, <laughs> and my teaching was interrupted by a long time in government. Mm -hmm. So when I taught for a few years, I went to Washington in 1979, and other than teaching a few courses on the side, I didn't really teach full-time until the last 10 years. There's a lot of differences, I suppose, in my teaching style over the years. So I don't know, I'm not quite sure what I want to say now. I'm not sure I'm getting the point across. You asked me, did it influence my teaching style? And yes, it did, but there were a lot of influences on my teaching mm -hmm. style. It wasn't mm -hmm. just his. But what I got from what you said before was that this sense of engagement, that you are there as a learner in addition to being a teacher. And that's that right. Yeah. Very much that that was part of Strauss's. The, yeah, the, that's what that's the part I learned from Strauss. So one thing that a number of Strauss's former students have talked about is this notion of the Straussian, and whether or not they identify themselves as a Straussian. You don't have to say anything about that if you don't want. But but what was your sense of what it meant to be a Straussian, and did you identify yourself as one in any way? Well. I was usually identified as a Straussian, and, but I never thought of myself as a Straussian because I never thought of Strauss or myself as being particularly dogmatic. And to me, I was horrified by some of the students that went out and preached with the view to Straussian doctrine. The background to that is that I was sort of a minor in philosophy, and I studied with Norman Malcolm, who'd been a student of Wittgenstein's. Uh, I studied with Elizabeth Anscombe, who was also a student of Wittgenstein's. Mm -hmm. There were actually interesting parallels between Wittgenstein and Heidegger and so on and so forth. Wittgenstein and Strauss and the people Strauss studied with had in common rejection of modernity. I mean, everything from Descartes on was a mistake as far as they were concerned at least the Wittgensteinians, and Strauss also, although of course he had a lot of sympathy with Nietzsche and Husserl and Heidegger as well, but going back to the pre-moderns was something they had in common. And uh, I took this course from Elizabeth Anscombe, and it was called Pleasure. It's on my transcript. And she wound up defending the scholastic definition of happiness. I thought, but Malcolm was the person I had studied with at Cornell, and I sort of treated him as a philosopher. I mean, he was analyzing philosophical questions on his own. He wasn't relying on somebody else. So my simplistic understanding at the time was, well, I think Leo Strauss is just a very profound historian of philosophy, and he's not a philosopher. That was over simple, but that's the way I perceived it at the time. And looking back, do you still see it? Well, no, not of, co of course not, because he, like Elizabeth Anscombe actually, was kind of working through the history of philosophy to reach philosophical conclusions of his own. But still, the point remains that when people went out and sort of preached a Straussian doctrine, to me it was a dialogue, not a dogma, and I didn't really see him that way. Although some of the people that have done that are really good, and I don't disagree with them, but it's not my perception. When it came time for you to formulate your dissertation topic, did Strauss have anything to do with that? No, no, that was under storing. It was on federal regulation of broadcasting. <laughs> Strauss was not part of that. The one thing, though, when I left academia to take a job in the Congress, and I was working for the House Republican Conference, among other things, I had a split job, but half my job was writing papers for the House Republican Conference, and one of them was on cost-benefit analysis, which was all the rage at the time. And... I was trying to point out the limits of cost-benefit analysis. In my draft, I said, even Aristotle said, there was no mean with respect to adultery. Oh. <laughs> and then I said, how many members of Congress that might read this <laughs> would not agree with that? 
And so I struck that. But that was an amusing example of the difference between working for the House of Representatives and a more academic setting. Right. And did you keep in touch with Strauss at all after you left Chicago? No, I guess not. When did he leave Chicago? 1967, end of 1967. Oh, he'd already left. Yes. I, I left Chicago in 1968. He went right. out to Claremont, right. I guess. That's right, yes. Yeah, and then he passed away in 1973, was it? Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't in touch with him. I was in touch with Storing a lot. And then I moved to Boston for a while. I taught as instructor at Boston College, and that's where Harvey and I became friends, although we were already friends, and Bob Faulkner. Then I was back at Northern Illinois University after that, and Storing taught a course there. And then I was at Augustana College. I invited Bloom to come as a guest speaker, which was interesting. And did you meet Bloom at Chicago, or did you know him before? He taught a seminar on Aristotle my senior year at Cornell, which Walter Burns took. We were all astounded. Here's our professor taking a student in Bloom's seminar. This was before Bloom became wealthy and well-dressed and stuff, but he came into class looking a bit disheveled, and he had a cold, a bad cold, and he asked if anybody in the class had a handkerchief. And Walter, of course, had two perfectly ironed and folded <laughs> handkerchiefs, one in his breast pocket. He takes it out of his breast pocket, he hands it to Alan and says, you know, Alan, what you need is a wife. <laughs> and Alan said, oh, you've done perfectly well, thank you. <laughs> well, that was my exposure to Bloom, I guess. I remember once going out in a nice spring day. I guess I was taking another class from me, went political theory class of some sort. We went out on the lawn and had a jug of wine and stuff like that, I remember that. He and I were friendly, but we were never close. It was just a wonderful Bloom story. I guess that's not part of your project. I'm sure people would be interested to hear them. Well, the one I remember, this is a second hand, you'd ask, ask A. Cholsky about it, but he was a resident in Telluride House where Paul and Abe were also residents. And there was this one reception where Peter Geach, who uh, was Elizabeth Hanscom's husband, was visiting. And this professor of medieval literature, who had no idea they were connected, referred to the bitter tongue Miss Hanscom. And Geach just nodded his head. <laughs> but I guess this isn't really a Bloom story. But the, the other story that was interesting was there was a seminar on the New Deal. Again, I wish I'd taken it, but I think it was just for Telluride students, and I wasn't one of them, although they offered me to teach in their summer program once, which I had to turn down. But Francis Perkins would travel up from New York, and Jim Farley would also come to the seminar, and they'd talk about the New Deal. Farley would talk about how they got a bill passed, and then he turned to Francis and said, what was that bill all about, Francis? <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, there are a whole load of Bloom stories, but you're going to hear them more from his students than from me, I think. So it sounds like Strauss was supportive of your going into American politics. Oh, I think he would have been. Yeah, a number I think... of his students, well, Walter Burns, for example, a number of them went into studying the American founding in particular, Ralph Lerner. Oh yeah, when I was there, Storing had a grant from the Ford Foundation and four or five of us had fellowships and we went through all of the founding documents for a year and that later became the basis for his own writings and editing of the anti-federalist papers. I got the impression that Strauss admired Storing. He even contributed to the essays on the scientific study of politics that Storing edited. Storing had a horrible time or difficult time with the publisher who said that Strauss's paragraphs were too long. Oh. <laughs> and Storing had to explain it. Some people just thought that way. Uh -huh. <laughs> you didn't have to keep the paragraphs the way they were. So I don't think he knew that I was going into politics. I didn't know myself at the time. But I think he would have supported it. I remember he was very interested in the foreign policy. And I think the neocons did him a great disservice by treating him as if he were one of their own. Irving Crystal was responsible for that. And I never felt he was that kind of conservative. I think the person he respected most on foreign policy was Raymond Aron. And I remember that his views of the Cuban Missile Crisis were sort of similar to Raymond Aron's. But I don't believe that Strauss was an interventionist. I think he was more realistic. And many of his students were. I remember there's a fellow named Tom Schrock who would be interested 
Mm-hmm. Is he in the? Yes, I've interviewed him. Yeah. Did just, you ask him about the Vietnam ago. War? No, I didn't. Perhaps I'll have to revisit that. Well, a number of us were. Butterworth is part of this, I think, and Kirk Emmer. Kirk Emmer, do you know? I know the name, but I've never. Oh, you've him. talked to him. He's a Kenyan. Just retired. He, he was the mayor of Kenyon and Gambier is a small town, so you'd have no trouble finding him. But we were talking to Tom on the lawn, and he was kind of leading the conversation, and we concluded that we were against the Vietnam War because we wouldn't win. And this was pretty early. This was in 1964, 65, like that. So we had this perception that it was a bad war. And I, I don't know what the position of the neocons was in Vietnam, but you can imagine they might have supported it. I, I don't know. But they certainly supported a somewhat parallel case in Iraq. I don't know what Strauss would have thought about that. It would be quite interesting if you could find out. I bet that he said something to somebody about it. I, I just don't think he was a neocon. Have you read the Zuckert's book? Have you interviewed the Zuckert's? Not yet. Oh, yet. you must. Yet, yet, yes. Yeah, yeah, they wrote a book on the truth about mm-hmm. Leo Strauss. Right, exactly. Yes. Yeah, which okay. I, I tend to agree with. They critique the East Coast Straussians uh-huh. and West Coast Straussians. Kathy Zuckert is absolutely brilliant. Her first year at Chicago, she did her master's thesis in a year on some Greek dialogue, but she learned Greek at the same time, all in a year. And she has these incredible books like Postmodern Plato's, which you Strauss. And Butterworth knows a lot about this. At the time I studied with him, he wasn't hiding it, but he didn't really emphasize his connection to Heidegger, which was complicated. And one can perhaps understand why. I mean, not only Heidegger's reputation at the time, but also the fact that perhaps his students would have had to know more about German philosophy. No, I I won't give him that excuse. He didn't really talk much about Heidegger. So when I read Heidegger later on and then took Strauss's course on Nietzsche, which I took it by reading the transcripts. I studied Kant and Nietzsche by reading the transcripts and doing the assignment and then listening to the discussion. It was later on then that I realized this evolution from Nietzsche and what he learned for Husserl and then his thinking through Heidegger. And Hannah Eric was there at Chicago at the same time. I wish I'd taken a course from her because I don't know what Strauss's relationship with her was, but it would be interesting because they had, of course, in many ways parallel experiences. When you mentioned in connection with the neocons that Strauss wasn't that kind of conservative, how might you characterize what kind of conservative he was? I'm not sure I could in American terms. I was wanting to think maybe he was a National Review conservative, but that's wrong. I don't know. I mean, he certainly was conservative, and he was critical of John F. Kennedy, but I don't know if he would have been sympathetic to Goldwater or any of the other, certainly not to Lyndon Johnson. I don't know if there was any politician at the time that he would line up with. Maybe it's a broader sort of conservatism. Well, conservatism so has all sorts of right. all sorts of, a sort of iterations. Skepticism about the possibility of ultimate transformation of the human condition, that sort of thing. Oh, I see. And the, the kind of anti Baconian element in his thought, you might say. The ultimate transformation of the human condition. Well, that I'm thinking of the whole project of modern natural science that there could be the relief of man's estate, or that you could see. Oh, <clears throat> well, I think he supported. Okay, that's a good point. I guess he was sort of a defender of natural rights conservatism because he thought it was the best practical alternative, but he didn't really agree with John Locke or Jefferson or. He was defender of liberal democracy. Maybe the word conservative doesn't really help uh-huh. in describing it. It confuses it a little, doesn't it? Well, maybe I was going to say natural review conservative, but they're all sorts, because I tend to think they're more sensible than the weekly standard. Uh-huh. Uh, but that's now, and that's me. There were a whole host of people there, like William Buckley and Wilmer Kendall and some of the others that the National Review would drew together the conservative movement at the time. I can't see him in terms of any identification with a contemporary figure unless you were to look at what Raymond Aron wrote, which I don't remember, but I, I never read it. I just know that he respected. He would say, you ought to... Here's what Raymond Aron said about the Cuban Missile Crisis or something like that. So, and of course, he, 
There's no reason why he should identify with any kind of American conservative. He's not an American. He came to America fairly late in his career. Mm -hmm. Why would you think he would be, you could explain him by relating him to some contemporary figure. All I know, I was really shocked when I had lunch with Irving Kristol and somebody else and got his take on Strauss. I was oh my gosh, this is not the man I know. If you interview the Zuckerts, you ought to cut out this whole conversation where you talk to the Zuckerts about it. They know this issue much better than I do. I know Mike and I were both against the intervention in Iraq for the same reason I had been against the intervention in Vietnam. We didn't think it was realistic. And Luger was skeptical of it too. This notion that you go in and overthrow a dictator and people would rise up and say we're free and thank you America. I mean, we just thought that was nuts. But I couldn't put words in Strauss's mouth. Now that's helpful to see the diversity of points of view that are connected with Strauss's students. There really appears to be no coherent school of thought, you might say, apart from the point that you made earlier about Strauss's deep engagement with the text and not having a specific conclusion that he wanted to arrive at. Well, also, too, the notion of persecution in the art of writing. That was a big one. Of course, no one else other than students of Strauss was teaching that to people at the time. And that was huge. And his interpretation of the Republic in the City of Man was a huge eye-opener to me that actually the Republic is about the impossibility of a philosopher king. And the reason is there's a tension between eros and justice. That's had a deep influence on my thinking. I actually learned that from Walter Burns, who learned it from Strauss. But that's really very important than reading the text for a secret meaning. In modern times, it might just be to protect the author from persecution. But in ancient times, there was a notion that some teachings weren't meant for everybody. <laughs> and I remember Butterworth and I and Kirk Emmerich took a course from Lucid Mahdi on the Arabian Nights. It was in the downtown school. And so we went through that whole Al-Farabi as well, and then the whole Muslim notion, the whole Muslim teaching, which was similar to Plato's, I guess you could say, in that respect. And my students at Georgetown, many of them, although they're taking American government and public policy courses from me, many of them have philosophical interests, and they're trying to reconcile Plato and Aquinas because they're serious Catholics and... So I get in a lot of discussions with them related to what I learned from Strauss, but with a couple of exceptions, I've never really taught political theory. But it sounds like it's very much informed your thinking, your study of it. Well, I think so, because I think there's kind of a hidden philosophical question behind every practical subject. For example, climate change, which I'm teaching now. What's just? What do we owe to future generations? What do we owe to people in Africa? What can they demand from us? So when you look, when I went into the Senate to work there, I became quickly aware of the, we would call them moral questions, but more accurately, I would say philosophical questions that are behind many of the debates you have in the Senate, like health care, climate change, even the budget. I remember asking Alice Rifflin once, is it running up the debt a form of fiscal child abuse? And she said, oh, you people from Indiana, you're always trying to make something into a moral question. <laughs> Which was ironic because she was from South Bend. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, that was... So I would always you know, I'd be perceiving, uh, we would call it the moral question behind many of the issues that the Senate was debating. And that was a difference that I'm sure related to my studies with Strauss and Walter Burns. Walter Burns, before he passed away, we had a wonderful kind of friendship because he was here in Washington. I don't know if you've talked to Irene. I have only on the phone. So I saw Walter not too long before he passed away. His mind was very sharp. I suppose he was interviewed earlier on? Yes, he was. That's good. Bloom probably never was. No, no, a number of people were not. Joe Cropsey was not interviewed. George Anastopolo. I went to George Anastopolo's thesis defense, and Strauss was a member of the committee, and he was trying to persuade the committee to agree with his view of the First Amendment, and he was making a real heavy pitch to Strauss. 
in sort of an odd dissertation, you're supposed to respond to their questions, and he was actually trying to, yes. just to persuade them that he was, was right. A real lawyer in him, you just yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and Strauss said, uh, "Only for this afternoon, Mister." Oh. <laughs> but I was walking back with George uh, for some reason, walking back to his apartment. We just happened to head in the same direction, and he opened his mailbox, and there was this letter from the Committee on Social Thought that said, Mr. Anastopolo, your dissertation has been accepted, your defense is scheduled for May XX, and will you please submit the manuscript? Oh. <laughs> so that's the only way they got him to stop, because he kept working on the thing. I mean, his book is, the dissertation was like 1,600 pages long or some ridiculous amount, yeah, half of it in single-spaced footnotes. Yeah, that's a shame. But Kirk Emmerd would be good to talk to, yeah. and, and the Zuckerts especially. Okay. It would be interesting to see the, about the Zuckerts, though, because they not only were with Strauss, but they also have studied him forever after he passed away. So you kind of might have to separate out what you learned about him after they studied with him. And Tom Pangle is another one. He's mm -hmm. probably in the original group. This has been very helpful. Is there anything you want to say looking back on Strauss's influence on you or his legacy, more broadly speaking? Well, yes. He taught me how to read a book. That's what so many people have said. I think he taught me that politics was an honorable profession. But I think the most important thing he taught me is to be a perpetual learner. Never stop at where you're at. Just move forward. I think that would probably be... The most yeah. important uh, things he taught. Yeah, that sounds terrific. You asked me what I most remember about Leo Strauss. I think perhaps the one thing I haven't said yet about him is that he always taught you to understand other thinkers the way they understood themselves, as if you were an anthropologist studying a tribe. You have to really understand that person, that tribe, and so when a student would sort of jump to conclusions about a the thinker they disagreed with, he would slow them down and say, wait a minute, why do you think that person said what he said or thought what he thought? The saying he would say, you have to fatten the goose before you kill it. The other thing I think I didn't mention enough was the Straussian quest for nature. I think that was what was really behind his thinking. He did believe that there was something essential about a human being, that you could recapture the essential human being. And the way you would do that would be to go back and start at the beginning, which is maybe what he learned from Heidegger, but start from the beginning and try to find an essential human nature. I think that influenced his own thinking about liberal democracy, because I don't think he was optimistic or pessimistic about liberal democracy. I think he was realistic about liberal democracy, and I think he thought that history was cyclical, at least in the sense that while there was always a threat of barbarism, we would eventually sort of recover. So he wasn't optimistic about the fate of liberal democracy, but he wasn't pessimistic either. And I think he thought that liberal democracy was the best regime for modern man. I think he would think that it was, at least in contemporary times, something that was good for all peoples. Although I think he would have been aware of the difficulty of imposing a liberal democratic regime on others. That's why I'm skeptical of the claim that he was a neoconservative. But he did want to go back to nature and particularly go back to our understanding of virtue and good character and good habits. And I think one of the important things I learned from him personally was the necessity of getting your soul in order, <laughs> about thinking the same way that your emotions led you to, which is a difficult thing to do and perhaps a lifetime quest. But it's what I try to teach my students who are very interested in moral questions. I also try, as I mentioned before, to bring moral issues to bear in my teaching and my research because behind every practical question like climate change or health care or even the deficit, as I mentioned, there are a lot of questions of justice and fairness that need to be addressed. So while I appreciate the teaching of the Republic that arrows and justice are two different things, 
I'm sort of more on the Aristotelian side of the fence that you need to somehow bring those things together as a practical matter. That's okay. what I wanted to say. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is Gail McKean here with Charles Butterworth. And we were just talking about the number of courses that he took with Strauss, which was significant. So tell like, me a little bit about how you came to be in his classes, what, what drew you to Strauss? I'll do that, but let me just, um, in case there is a record to be, to be had. So I went to Chicago in the fall of 1961, and in those days, or perhaps for all the time that uh, Professor Strauss was at Chicago, the load was four courses a year. And the way he did it was in one semester, usually fall semester, he taught two courses, a seminar and a lecture course, and then winter, I'm, I'm sorry, not semester, quarters, quarters. Uh, in, in winter and in spring, he taught a seminar. To the best of my knowledge, when I was at Chicago, I was there from 1961 through the spring of 64, and then I went off and did what one might call field research in Egypt, uh, since I do philosophy that has a kind of uh, between question mark, uh, between quotation marks tone. And then when I came back in um, 65, I uh, guess then I probably audited rather than taking classes, because I, I would have had all of my coursework done, would have passed my comps, and there would have been no reason to have courses on my, my transcript. The way that I came to Chicago and to uh, Leo Strauss was uh, because at Michigan State, where I went as an undergraduate, I had uh, come into contact with Robert Horwitz, who was a remarkable teacher and was persuaded beyond all doubt that the only person one should study with for graduate study was Leo Strauss. Uh, I think I met Horowitz in my second year at Michigan State, and I, I didn't spend that much time at Michigan State. I, I spent two, two years complete, and then in the, at the end of the winter quarter of my third year, I went to Brussels as a guide for the World's Fair. So I was gone spring quarter, and then fall quarter of what would have been my last year. And I came back to Michigan State in the winter quarter of my senior year. That would have been 1959, and and finished up. I took a lot of courses with Horowitz. Uh, there was a, a number of other people at Michigan State, not students of Strauss, but aware of Strauss. And above all, a man by the name of Stanley Idzerda, who Idzerda, I D Z E R D A, Idzerda, yeah who was remarkable as a teacher. He also founded the Honors College. That I was uh, among the first people to be in this Honors College when I went there. And he was just always a, a kind of gadfly to get students to do more and to do better. After I graduated from Michigan State, I went to France on a Fulbright Fellowship. and. Uh, because I already had a, a, a good command of French, teachers there uh, encouraged me to actually do something with my studies rather than just spend the year being a, a scholarly tourist. So I followed a, a PhD program at the University of Bordeaux. Even though I was in philosophy, the person who was most helpful and, and uh, directed me most during that time was uh, a man by the name of François Bourricaud, B-O-U-R-R-I-C-A-U-D. Bourricaud, who was a very close friend of Alan Bloom and more or less an age contemporary, had studied with Strauss, I think in 50-51, when he came to the United States on a Rockefeller Fellowship. So Bourricot was a sociologist, but even more than a sociologist, or as an, in addition to being a sociologist, an ethnologist. And, and his uh, ethnological 
area of, of concentration was Peru, Latin America, but especially Peru. He's, uh, he's now dead. His claim to fame as a scholar, uh, uh, I suppose, would fall into the two following categories. A, uh, he was a student of Raymond Daron, and B, uh, what he did was to put into French, to translate into French, uh, Talcott Parsons' uh, book on sociology. I forget now the, the title of it. But Talcott Parsons, who was a remarkable sociologist, famous in the United States, but infamous for his English prose, was then made understandable by Bouricot's translation. So, so. But at any rate, uh, once Bouricot saw what I was interested in and we got to know each other and we talked about these things, uh, he, he too was of the opinion that there was no place to go but Chicago and nobody to study with but Leo Strauss. In the meantime, uh, I, I was interested in Jean-Jacques Rousseau and also in Montesquieu, but mainly in Rousseau. So he was of the opinion, A, I should stay another year in France, and Fulbright was very uh, gracious about that. So that came through, that happened. And B, that I, I shouldn't spend my time in Bordeaux, but rather should go to Nancy and study with a man who had written uh, at that time, published the most on Rousseau and Rousseau's political teaching, man by man, the name of Robert Dirate, uh, D-E-R-A-T-H-E, -E, with an accent de U at the end. <clears throat> Those were two excellent years. I learned a great deal, probably was exposed to much more than I learned, but I, I enjoyed the contacts that I had with all of these people, and managed to stay in touch with Boico uh, even after I left Bordeaux. And, and then because uh, I decided that uh, attractive as Nancy uh, might be as a university town, uh, Paris was a much better place to live. And so like Dirate, I took the train once a week from Paris to, to Nancy. We would, we would meet on the train, but of course I was in second class and he was in first class so we didn't sit together but we would meet and chat in the corridors and then of course have his uh, courses one day and each of us in one fashion or another would come back to Paris I mean, this is fascinating because this is in the very late well, from 1959 to 1961 and even then the idea of what they call turbo prof the professors was uh, very much yeah, in vogue. Uh, you, you lived in Paris and you commuted by a fast train to every conceivable part of France. Bourrico didn't. Bourrico lived in, in Bordeaux and stayed in Bordeaux until he actually received a uh, job possibility at, at Paris, at, uh, what they now call Paris 4, uh, Descartes. So at any rate, I continued to see Bouricot, and he, uh, sensing that I might be in need of talking to somebody from Chicago, uh, arranged for me to meet Alan Blue. So, so we, we met at a little cafe at uh, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, and uh, anybody who knows Bloom and, and his uh, temperament will understand that I had, had no chance to put in a word edgewise, but was certainly put on the right path. So that's how I came to Chicago. Um, and, and perhaps to, to put things as clearly as possible, when I came to Chicago, because I, I had this background in France and, and had a, a fairly good grasp of written and spoken uh, French, uh, there was another professor at the university who did uh, contemporary political philosophy. And let's, let's leave his name out, but I'll just say he's famous for the black box theory. And uh, this professor was looking for research assistance. Even though I was on fellowship at the time, uh, he, he 
that made me a, 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 an overture of sorts that would have been very interesting. But I made the mistake of sitting in on a class of his before I accepted. The difference between his teaching and that of Leo Strauss was night and day. So uh, I never pursued that, that opportunity. There, there were. Did you regard it as a mistake? Not at all. No. It, it, this man was very nice, but he was, how can I put it, much more full of himself than than he was of students or worrying about students. And I did meet other people at, at Chicago who were remarkable and, and, and you know, who, who were very helpful in helping a student make his way, but, but uh, this was not one of them. And, and I, I think the simp uh, that simple experience of taking a seminar with this man and then taking seminars the very same simple quarter with Leo Strauss was what, what showed me the difference. Uh, a, Strauss was always prepared. Uh, it was clear from the moment that he came in the class that we were there to do important things. And uh, we tried to. We, he was clearly better, better prepared than any of us, but things, things went wrong in a remarkable way. And I, I think it was his, his grasp of the material that we were reading that allowed him to raise the most important questions either for the author or for himself, which meant also for us, and to address those questions. And, and what was remarkable, uh, especially from my perspective, having, having so to speak, uh, bathed in a European approach to these things, was reading the text on its own and not reading it through the light of its historical antecedents. So, I wish I could say that um, Strauss won and that there is no such thing today, but that's certainly not the case. Uh, there's a, a great German term for what represents, I think, most academic scholarship, Quellen uh, Forschung, uh, looking for the sources, and that it, when you read almost any journal article, that's that's what you see. So, uh, it, and of course, the the counter to that is uh, those who are called Straussians being accused of always looking for the uh, the teaching, and, and, that, and one would say the secret teaching or reading between the lines. But in essence, what it really go, it goes to is trying to figure out what the author said, and. And Strauss made that very, very clear uh, presentations before the class, uh, answers to questions from students, and things like that. Now, how did you get into the Arabic political uh, It's It's Strauss's uh, instigation, in a way. I think it was at the end, towards the end of the first year that I was at Chicago, he, he made a remark. Um, in one of the questions at the end, after class, it, it sort of formally ended, there were a lot of questions from students, and he, he happened to say in passing, well, you know, one really can't understand the history of philosophy, and this one understands the medieval Jewish and Arabic aspects of philosophy. So I went up to ask him about this, and it, in a way that's, those familiar with the University of Chicago will understand his response immediately. Um, I, I wouldn't want to answer that, Mr. Butterworth, but why don't you go across the street to the Oriental Institute and look up so-and-so. Well, so-and-so happened to be Mohsen Mahdi. Yeah. And, uh, and so I dutifully did that. And, and was Nabia Abbott still there at that time? And Nabia yeah, Abbott was still there, Abbott. yes. And, and so I went over and I looked up uh, Mahdi and he, he said, well, it's a long uh, path and you really can't make any sense out of it unless you learn Arabic. <clears throat> By chance, there was an intensive Arabic uh, program at Harvard that summer and I could just squeak in the door. So I, uh, 
that's how I started. <laughs> and and I, I really thought that this was going to be a, a couple of years learning Arabic and then going on to do the continental philosophy that, that I had originally set out for myself. Instead, a whole world opened up. I still find today in my research how deeply involved in that world uh, Strauss was at one time, mainly through his attempts to understand Maimonides and Jewish philosophy, but also uh, because he had to, he, he, he became fascinated with Al-Farabi, and because of Al-Farabi, with Averroes. Uh, and, and so he read diligently in all of these things. And of course, I, I did have the chance to study with Mahdi, and also uh, with Nabia Abbott, who's a remarkable historian. Unfortunately, not that greatly heralded. Uh, everybody who, who works in medieval Arabic slash Islamic history knows of her name, but very few people know much else about her, and yet she did remarkable work. Above all, she, she, taught, she taught Mahdi for sure, and tried to teach me how to be a good historian, and she was excellent at, at the sources. Uh, what I'm finding today is to what an extent uh, Mahdi, who was supposed to be studying business administration in Chicago, but had been uh, somehow caught on to what was going on at, uh, with Leo Strauss, how when he began to look at this material, first for Ibn Khaldun and then later for Al-Farabi, opened up a whole new world of culture. And, and, and by going back to the sources, and clearly to the sources, uh, was able to show to those people who, who read him what a wealth of, of learning that was going on in the uh, 10th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. Well, and then all the way up to the beginning of the 15th with Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So how involved was Strauss in shaping your dissertation topic? How involved? Yes. Uh, he, he was the uh, co-director of, of the dissertation but with, with Mahdi. And I also had the uh, notion that I should put a uh, contemporary person on the uh, committee, somebody interested in the Arab world, uh, in order to enhance my, my possibilities for job. So also Leonard Binder was on. I, I think it would be accurate to say that that was a very bad decision. But uh, I, I learned from Binder the, the things that one shouldn't do as a young person. and. Uh, but to reply to the other issue, uh, Strauss directed me to the best that I can tell the way he directed others. He read, he was willing to, to talk to you, but it wasn't a matter of going through the dissertation and, and marking it, uh, uh, chapters of the dissertation and marking it up and sending you back. Um, and and Matthew didn't do too much of that either. He, he read everything that I wrote, made comments, showed me where I was off base. But um, for one reason or another, and it would be nice to explore this, I think, those teachers did not hold us by the hand. Uh, we had to either, well, this is mixing metaphors, but sink or swim on our own. They gave us a goal to aim at, and if we got too far off base, indicated that we were off base. But otherwise, we kept talking about the, the major point. If I understand myself and my contemporaries correctly, we tend to take our students by the head, for better or for worse. But uh, yeah, so so uh, Strauss was as, in, as involved as as uh, he could be, but mainly through my initiative. And you were the one who. Came up with the topic. I, I came up with the topic through. Uh, I became interested in Averroes 
uh, through a class I'd taken with Matt D. And this seemed to be a topic on Verily's rhetoric that uh, was not that well known. Mahdi and I decided that I really needed to go uh, to the Arab world and learn to speak Arabic and, and to learn what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And fortunately, uh, there was fellowship uh, possibilities there. Uh, I received two fellowships, one from the American Research Center in Egypt and the other one from Fulbright. And for one reason or another, I decided that I should take the American Research Center uh, fellowship and allow the Fulbright money, since I'd already profited from Fulbright in France, allow it to be used for somebody else. Uh, that, that was a good enough decision. There was nothing wrong with it. And, and my contacts with ARCE, American Research Center in Egypt, uh, continued for many years. It was a, a very good place to be. And as a matter of fact, became this, the, the kind of uh, academic center even for Fulbright students who, who came there. And were there people there working on Averroes? There was nobody there working on Averroes, but there were there people there working on any number of different uh, things in the Arab world. And remarkably, we, we stayed in touch over the years. Well, it's a small group to begin with, and there are uh, learned societies that brought us together. And the fact of having spent time uh, in a... Um, I don't want to say difficult, in, in a strange land that, that doesn't lend itself easily to uh, immediate assimilation, it creates a bond. Um, I mean, it's not like living in Europe, it's, it's a lot different. Um, so what, what Mahdi did, just by chance, that happened to be a sabbatical year for him, and he came and spent um, essentially the first semester in Egypt, in Cairo, he introduced me to uh, different scholars, and we decided that it would be a good idea for me to take classes at Ain Shams University, which is a kind of suburb of Cairo, or it was in those days a suburb, uh, with two very remarkable uh, learned uh, Egyptian scholars, Abdurrahman Badawi, who has done a lot of work on philosophy, well, he's now dead, had done a lot of work, and Abu Rida, um, and whose last name just simply escapes him, but hopefully he'll come back. But Abu Rida was interested in, in Kalam, in dialectical theology. So that way I got um, a uh, uh, Abdel Hadi, was his first name, Abdel Hadi Abu Rida. Uh, I got a remarkable exposure to what was going on in those days in the Arab world, and also by being in the bath, so to speak, uh, learned how to speak Arabic. Uh, all the classes were handled in Arabic. I was a kind of uh, exotic foreigner. They couldn't quite figure out, fellow students couldn't quite figure out how, what I was doing there. I couldn't probably figure out what I was doing there. But All right, so after an interruption, we're picking back up. I asked uh, Professor Butterworth about a paper that he gave at a conference of Arab American University graduates in which he justified why he was on the panel as a conservative by claiming Strauss's, um, Str he was a sort of grandchild of yeah. Leo Strauss and so I asked him to elaborate on uh, what that meant. I, I think there, there are two things that need to be said. The, the justification was the whole panel was a panel made up of people who would call themselves conservatives. Parenthetically, probably few people uh, who know me today would use that description for me, but we can let that one go. I, I was happy to uh, use the description back in the 90s by all means. And, and the goal was, my, my, my attempt was to explain um, what we were doing to what would have been normally a hostile audience, not, an audience not wanting to hear from conservatives, and, and why a conservative argument was worthwhile. So it was in that context. And then and I, as a uh, 
academic as somebody coming at it from the perspective of academia rather than from uh, public policy wanted to explain what my contribution would be on that level and I tried to and the argument that I made was was gauged in those terms what is fascinating is that uh, because of this new uh, I don't know what the correct word is uh, uh, internet thing there's got to be a better substantive called academia.edu uh, which has contacted people and tried to get them to upload papers I was prompted or I was asked by somebody asking about that paper to upload it and and did so and um, and there have been a number of hits since then so yes, I received it as an email a link to it. You received it as an email yes, yes, from it's them? A, yes, it says Charles Butterworth has uploaded a paper. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they, they alert uh, uh, subscribers. All right. That explains maybe some of it. And so I've, I've, had, I've not had any uh, contact, anybody asking me about it. And quite honestly, there wasn't that much interchange then. Um, that appeared in a journal called Middle East Policy, if, if I'm not mistaken. The editor, who is still the editor, uh, Anne Joyce, was very sympathetic to what uh, we were trying to do and encouraged the panel and therefore, um, and then published it. And, and there are a few conservative voices or people with conservative leanings wanting to hear these things. And, and so that's, that's really what was going on. And so were you, am I correct in understanding you say that you, you consider yourself a paleo-conservative? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think uh, if I understand things correctly, um, it's hard to be that today. Uh, I, my, the more I understand where I stand politically, I see that I've more or less left the conservative fellow. I would, I would like to think I'm still asking important questions, but my goals are probably not those of my conservative friends, fellows. So you would consider Strauss a paleo-conservative as well? Yes. yes. It, well, a traditionalist. In what? How is that manifested? Well, I, I mean, that really, what is that whole term? That was brought up uh, as part of an argument, and... Uh, Paleo is supposedly the opposite of neo, yeah, so that's what that's what's going on. Uh, I, 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 the man who um, organized that panel and who's been very very influential in helping Strauss students uh, forge their way in academia, uh, Tony Sullivan, who, who was director of program at Earhart Foundation. Uh, is part of that. Now, Tony was also a longtime supporter of Patrick Buchanan, a direction I cannot follow him in. But, uh, but then he left that, and when uh, Barack Obama came upon the scene, uh, Sullivan volunteered for Obama. And I don't know where he stands today. Uh, we, we haven't spoken recently about these things. So, yeah, the, the politics has, for some people, politics changes. <laughs> I, I have no more to say on that. I, I really have nothing more to add except to, to, to uh, maybe bring this to a conclusion by saying that uh, it, it was an encounter that was uh, life-changing. And, and, uh, as I, as I mentioned to you just a couple of turns ago in the conversation, uh, here we are in 2016 revisiting Leo Strauss's essay on Farabi, how Farabi read Plato's Laws. Now, uh, you may or may not be aware, in July of last year, my translation of Al-Farabi's summary of Plato's Laws, along with the political regime by Al-Farabi, was published by uh, Cornell. So uh, there continues to be at least uh, among a few people an abiding interest in Al-Farabi 
without any doubt, uh, in the 40s, Leo Strauss did much to, to bring Al-Farabi to the fore. And then it was later, uh, through the excellent work of Mahsan Mahdi, that Strauss's impetus carried on. And, and, um, and again, if you look around at what's being published in France, in Germany, um, even in Italy, and, 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 and in Spain, uh, there's a constant return to Al-Farabi. Not always a return to the important questions. Uh, that's another story. But, uh, but it's certainly a, 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 a dim uh, glimmer of thought that maybe this person, Al-Farabi, has something to offer. And then a reluctant willingness to say, yeah, and that fellow Leo Strauss did make sense. So, more it changes, what is it, uh, the more it changes, the more it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Let me just ask you one more question, since you took so many classes with him. And, of course, one of the authors he taught most was Plato, of course, Aristotle. Um, what did you think was so important about Plato for Strauss? I, I, I think that it's the same thing that's important for those of us who continue to read Plato. Uh, Plato has a uh, unbridled desire to, to learn, or uh, let's, let's be fair to, to the author. Plato, Socrates, has an unbridled desire to learn. And it, it, as much as that attracts a young person, it also attracts an older person. Uh, you know, it's, it's dangerous to say, but it should be said because it's true. Uh, Leo Strauss also had a great fascination for Nietzsche. And, and one can't help but be uh, grabbed almost by the throat when one reads Nietzsche and, and forced to look at important questions. I mean, there's, there's a way of, of engaging people when it's there. Al-Farabi is a lot more subtle, but the same thing is there. That same radical challenge of yeah. status quo and accepted opinion. Radical challenge of, of, of status quo, uh, and, and of course the, the important question always is, as Strauss pointed out, um, reason and revelation. And uh, how uh, both of them are kept alive by at least by Plato and by, by well, for Plato, of course, there's no revelation, but the issue of, of the gods, and, and uh, by Al-Farabi, there is revelation. It, it's kept alive, but what lies behind it is probed very, very thoroughly. And perhaps it's not kept alive by Nietzsche, so then the challenge is, well, wh what has he seen that we haven't yet seen? But maybe that's uh, for somebody else to speak about. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope. I, I hope, hope we got. Yes, me <laughs> too. We'll just have to. We'll just have to hope for the best. We'll just have to hope for the best. We'll just have to. Is that he was far from the completely quote serious figure that he emerges to be in some of the controversialist literature of recent times. That, in other words, he appears. To Miss Drury as a kind of demonic fellow who is harboring evil thoughts about democracy and so on. And among other things, what she completely fails to understand is the human character of Mr. Strauss. His remarkable, truly remarkable learning, many languages, writing in all kinds of places about all kinds of things, religion, politics, philosophy, metaphysics, or morality, for all of that, he had a side of him which came to light only when I became a student at Chicago, namely a man who was quite prepared to laugh, and to laugh uproariously, in fact. How he came about, given the travails he went through, is still a mystery to me, quite honestly. Fleeing Germany ahead of the Nazis, making his way to England, where he began to learn some things, I think, about America, to which he was destined to come. 
but where he also must have felt hunkered down, no place really to go, no job to speak of. In any case, he came to the States, and by the time I first met him, about 62 years ago this fall, yes, I think that's right, he was well established finally in his position as professor of political philosophy at the University of Chicago Department. I think that was the first time in his life that he had a secure income, a place where he could really do his work unimpeded, much to the credit of the University of Chicago. I know nothing of the negotiations whereby he was brought to Chicago, but it was just a huge blessing for that university and for the bunch of students that he turned out over the years, till the time he retired, as a matter of fact, and on beyond. And two examples, one on Woodhouse, one on somebody else. Woodhouse, P.G. Woodhouse, wrote about 100 novels, comic novels about England and America, a very particular point of view. I'll read a little bit of a blurb on this book called Praise for P.G. Woodhouse. Quote, Woodhouse's idyllic world can never stale. He will continue to release future generations from captivity that may be more irksome than our own. He has made a world for us to live in and delight in." Unquote. That's Evelyn Waugh. Another one. P.G. Woodhouse is the gold standard of English wit, Christopher Hitchens, and so on. So what I did was to follow that up on my own over time, collected a number of novels of Woodhouse. This one contains I think four different pieces by Woodhouse. And it's a way of enjoyment and learning something. I came to be a great fan of Woodhouse simply because Strauss liked him. It was that kind of thing where this very dignified, very learned man, talking about very serious things, he likes Woodhouse. He above all loved the relationship depicted in these novels by Jeeves and Bertie Wooster. You say you've not read Woodhouse. No, I have not read Woodhouse. It's a treat you're coming to. When the war broke out, Woodhouse was in France. He was quarantined, in effect, by the Nazis. He made the bad mistake of being taken to Berlin and doing some lectures, talks on the radio. He was a political naive, real naive. In any case, he set to work in his usual fashion, even though he was captive of the Nazis, to write probably his masterpiece called Joy in the Morning. It's a book which he wrote in La Touquet in France as the war ground on before he could get back. And I want to read a little bit of the opening of the novel because it so illustrates what Strauss, I think, would have found wonderful. Bertie Wooster is talking. He's telling what happened. It's like the Republic of Plato. Socrates says, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday, mm -hmm. and so on. This is narrated in that fashion by Bertie Wooster. I discovered, by the way, some years ago in one of the novels that Wooster, in fact, claimed to be a graduate of one of the colleges at Oxford. So I sent an email to the master saying they should do a plaque in honor of Bertie Wooster. <laughs> <laughs> he clearly didn't have funds for such a frivolous purpose. But Bertie Wooster is a young man about town, clearly very wealthy, able to do as he damn pleases, and he has a manservant named Jeeves. Jeeves is an intellect. One of the things I think that greatly pleased Strauss was seeing the English class system, so to speak, lampooned by having the young master be an idiot and the gentleman's gentleman named Jeeves be a master of intellect. He's a lot of fish and so on. The opening of the book, Joy in the Morning, is remarkable, so I'll read a little bit of it. After the thing was over, when peril had ceased to loom and happy endings had been distributed in heaping handfuls, and we were driving home with our hats on the side of our heads, having shaken the dust of steeple bumply from our tires, I confessed to Jeeves that there had been moments during the recent proceedings when Bertram Wooster though no weakling had come very near to despair. Now Bertie speaks. Within a touch of Jeeves, Jeeves speaks. Unquestionably, affairs had developed a certain menacing trend, sir, Bertie. I saw no ray of hope. It looked to me as if the blue bird had thrown in the towel and fondly ceased to function. 
And yet here we are, all bumps a daisy. Makes one think a bit that. Yes, sir. There's an expression on the tip of my tongue which seems to me to sum the whole thing up. Or rather, when I say an expression, I mean a saying, a wheeze, a gag, what I believe is called a saw, something about joy doing something. <clears throat> joy cometh in the morning, sir. That's about the baby. Not one of your things, is it? No, no sir. Well, it's dash it good, I said. And I still think that there can be no better way of putting it and so on. I took the trouble this morning, just on the spur of the moment, to analyze the beginning of this book. Strauss was fond of saying the beginning is important. He said that not because he was Strauss, but because he had learned that from other people like Aristotle and Plato. The beginning is important. The way the beginning of this book is organized, what I read is a collection of two narratives sandwiched in between our dialogue. Woodhouse is a master of dialogue. He made a great success in developing dialogue for stage plays, musicals, in New York and London. And what I did was to outline it the way I was taught by Strauss to do, namely two narrative speeches, enclosing a series of little dialogue exchanges, and then he moves on with narration and more and more dialogue. One of the fascinating things that I only hit upon this morning, quite frankly, though I've read the book a couple of times before, is the following. Embedded in the dialogue, which I just read, is a surprising illusion, namely, Joy in the Morning is the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Woodhouse was a master of quickly introducing little bits of this kind which go completely over your head unless you're thinking about what he's doing. In the first chapter, which is the beginning of the book, there are three such allusions. First one is the Psalms, the Old Testament. Here's the second one. It's part of the dialogue that is reported, which took place before they went to the country. Bertie Wilson gets up. His man Jeeves typically brings him tea in the morning and maybe a kipper or something. And so he says to Jeeves, Odds Bodikins, Jeeves. I'm in rare fettle this a.m. Talk about exulting in my youth. I feel up and doing with a heart for any fate, as Tennyson says. Longfellow, sir. Uh, or if you prefer it, Longfellow, I'm in the to split hairs. Well, what's the news? And so on. Here is what must have terribly amused Strauss if he read this novel. He's being persuaded to go to the country, and Jeeves doesn't want to go because he wants to take his holiday at the seashore. And so because he respects Jeeves and values his work as a manservant, he realizes he may owe him something. And so he says, would you like something as a replacement for not going to that place in the country? Well, sir, any little gift you would like, I mean, says Gertie. It is extremely kind of you, sir. Not at all, Jeeves. The sky is the limit. State your desire. Well, sir, there has recently been published a new and authoritative and annotated edition of the works of the philosopher Spinoza. Since you are so generous, I would appreciate that very much. He goes to the bookshop. He says to the clerk, Good morning, good morning. I want a book. <laughs> <laughs> a book, sir, he said, with the ill-conceived astonishment. Spinoza, I replied. <laughs> he said him rocking back on his heels. Did you say Spinoza, sir? Spinoza is what I said. He seemed to be feeling that if we talked the thing out long enough, as man to man, we might eventually hit upon a formula. You do not mean the spinning wheel, no. It would not be the poison pin. Or with gun and camera in little known Borneo, he queried, trying the long shot. Spinoza, I repeated firmly. That was my story, and I intended to stick to it. He sighed a bit like one who feels that the situation has gotten out of hand. I will go and see if it's in stock, sir, but possibly this may be what you're requiring said to be very clever, and it's a book called Spindrift, a novel by a woman, which is anathema to the characters in the story. It turns out that I've done it very ramblingly and quickly, that the opening chapter of the book is organized as well as a platonic dialogue. I really believe that. The opening narrative, the closing narrative, encompassing a set of dialogic exchanges, which could be something like Plato's Republic, without any of the seriousness of purpose. And with, if you think about it, the Old Testament, Book of Psalms, Longfellow's poetry, 
and finally Spinoza's collected works. The Spinoza is particularly telling because of the following. As you know, Strauss himself wrote about Spinoza. It placed him very high on the list of books to be read. My first teaching job was at Harvard from 1955 to 57. Among my students was a very able student named Michael Bamberger from New York City. As I got to know Michael Bamberger, I came to realize that he was a child of emigres. His father was Dr. Fritz Bamberger, who had been able in Nazi Germany beginning in 1934 to organize some sort of schooling for people forced out of the schools by the Nazis in Germany. In 1939, the danger was so great that he abruptly left for New York with his wife and two children, Michael being one of them. Dr. Fritz Bamberger was known to Strauss in Germany, it turns out. He was a part of the group of young German Jews who were very well educated, but who were very great targets of destruction. Bamberger, Strauss, Jacob Klein, the three of them. What Bamberger did in New York is to do some teaching, a little bit of writing, but he was editor, strange way, of Coronet and Esquire magazines, sort of production executive. But his serious work was to amass the largest collection of books by and about Spinoza, a rare collection of books, which he late in his life gave to Hebrew University, and it was devolved into, I think, a library holding in Jerusalem, where Strauss once went. So life is filled with strange crossings of paths. Here was a student of mine at Harvard whose father knew Strauss in Germany and fled Germany, as Strauss had, to go to New York. And as a matter of fact, the father's interest in Spinoza is a serious one compared to that of Jeeves in the book called Joy in the Morning. But the comic quality of it, I think, would have appealed to Strauss. Whether he actually read Joy in the Morning, I have no idea. His references to Bertie Wooster and Juice and Jeeves were more general than that. And I presume today, talking with you, to do a quick look at the opening chapter on the principle that Jeeves as a character is of interest to Strauss, not least because of its overlapping meanings within British society, but also one other part of that little prelude is a very different one, but also literary. Strauss came, I think, when he was in England to learn something of the works of a man named H.C. Bailey. I've forgotten all the titles of the guy, but he was a British crime writer who had another name too. But one of the books that he wrote was called Dead Man's Shoes. The lead character in some of those novels by H.C. Bailey was one Joshua Clunk. Joshua Clunk, J.C. Joshua Clunk was a learned barrister in England, made a great deal of money, which he invested in a fine dwelling, and he had flocks of birds, and he had, a, I think, a harmonium or something, and he played and sang hymns. His mansion shall be mine, shall be mine. His mansion shall be mine. <laughs> An overlap of a kind of rudimentary Protestantism with the reality of making money, which again would appeal to Mr. Strauss, I believe. So that's by way of a kind of discounting of people like Drury, who make Strauss out to be some kind of serious monster, when in fact he was a man of enormous talents, including the talent to make people laugh. One final one to close that part. When I did a seminar on Machiavelli's Discourse, the last part of my work at Chicago, as was characteristic of his procedure, he assigned chunks of the book for paper, to people to give papers. Well, very early in the quarter, a young man who was older than a number of the students, he probably was in his 30s at the time, I'm not sure where he was from, maybe Italy, maybe Central Europe, he was assigned early on to say something about Machiavelli discourse. What he did was to read some of the letters of Machiavelli. And the first thing he did was to say, here was a letter of Machiavelli's wife to him. Dear Niccolo, I'm so happy when you're away. <laughs> when the student read that, we almost had to take Strauss out of the room. He was so convulsed with laughter. The, the sense, in other words, of the wit of Machiavelli being transferred now to the province of his wife and the notion of get out, get out, get out. So those are little tidbits that I've reconstructed from now over 60 years ago and have been sources of delight on and off for a very long time. 
One of her wonderful books recently, Feeling Our Feelings. It's a book on the passions. Very learned, very interesting. We were talking about P.J. Woodhouse and how much you think Strauss enjoyed him. And how That's Strauss right. was a man of laughter. That's right, including the fact that he did a wonderful book on that Aristophanic fellow called Aristophanes, which is a wonderful, wonderful book of the many books. I had great difficulty reading the books on Aristophanes. Because They're very difficult. The, the plays are very compact. I mean, what Woodhouse does in this little example is reasonably easy for a man of great intellect to do, but Aristophanic comedy is mm -hmm. another story entirely. I never learned Greek well enough to read him fluently, but even reading him in good translation, he's a man of wonder, absolute wonder. Mm -hmm. Strauss would sometimes talk about him. As a matter of fact, I, a couple of times when I taught the Republic, had students read the Ecclesia Zuzide, which is an incredibly funny play, and serious about what the limits of law are. You can't command young men to have intercourse with old hags, even though the law says so. How did you first come to know Strauss? I grew up in a very poverty-stricken family in northern Indiana near Chicago. I was born in Hammond, which is right around the bend from Chicago. My father had married twice. I was in this number two family of five boys. He and my mother both had very little education, formal education. They got caught in the terribleness of the Great Depression. My father had no work for years on end, subsisted somehow by a janitor job at the church, handouts. My mother baked coffee cakes and we sold them on the street. We at one time lived in East Chicago, Indiana, which is one of the chain of industrial cities along the lakeshore. And we lived in the downstairs flat of a two-story flat building in between our building and another building was a vacant lot filled with debris. And upstairs was a family where a teenage boy was shot to death from a kid playing with a gun. Downstairs was a moonshine parlor, Italian-run moonshine parlor. On weekend nights, the drunks would come reeling out of that place and vomit all over our doorstep. I'm not trying to portray anything very sentimental about it except to say my way to study with Strauss was started from a pretty poor position, to say the least. How did I get where I did? It's only 25 miles from Hammond where I was born to the University of Chicago. You could drive it in an hour. I made a different route. I was inducted in the Army in 1943. I served until 1946. I then went to Northwestern for my first bachelor's, for my first degree, and I met Ken Thompson. Was that on the GI plan? Yes, indeed it was. I was one of the beneficiaries. I only deserved it in the sense I put in my time. I did no fighting, no combat, nothing destructive of anything except good food and, <laughs> and clothing. Yes, I was in three years. Ended my career, as a matter of fact, by the way, playing the trumpet, which I'd learned to do in high school. <laughs> I played in the post band at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and finally was discharged. When I went to Northwestern, one of the people I soon learned to admire and respect was Kenneth Thompson. Kenneth Thompson is a mentor like you rarely see. He himself was a Midwesterner who served in the infantry in World War II, in intelligence, I think. He became a student of Hans Morgenthau, one of the two great German exile scholars in the department, yeah. Chicago in that era. And I became a student of Thompson's and, in effect, also a student of Morgenthau's. So, while finishing the MA, I, at the suggestion of Ken Thompson and of Roy McCreetus, who was a Harvard graduate, they said, both of them, you need to go elsewhere for a PhD. Where will I go? I tried out for a junior fellowship at Harvard, turned down. I then applied simultaneously to Yale, to Princeton, and Chicago. When the spring returns came in, I got nothing from Chicago. I had the two best fellowships at Harvard, at Yale and at Princeton. What was I to do? Ken Thompson talked with me. He said, among other things, Morgenthau will give you some work in a center he's got money for, and secondly, we will get you something. So the most important decision I ever made in my life, apart from getting married to a beautiful woman, I said to Yale and Princeton, thank you very much. I went to Chicago. So that's, in a way, how it happened. From sheer poverty in a family which was beset by the terribleness of the Great Depression, parents who had very little education, all those kinds of conditions, here I arrived in Chicago. It was a new world. I must say that thinking recently about the transition, Northwestern struck me then and strikes me still today 
to what I know about it, of a sort of bourgeois university. High quality in certain ways, but not very much of the atmosphere that I found immediately at Chicago. The quadrangles, the Committee on Social Thought, where you were, and the Department of Political Science, which had not just Strauss, but Morgenthau, David Easton, Charles Harden, several other people. But what I knew of Strauss was almost nothing. I was so busy trying to get my MA done and to keep my bread on the table that I didn't even bother to look up anything about Strauss. And your MA was on Thucydides, Thucydides yes. I'm ashamed to admit that I did that because what I learned in Chicago from Strauss was an entirely different landscape, but that's the way it is. I think that's emblematic, though, of what happened to so many of us. We were, as undergraduates and maybe masters, we were given sort of the routine of political theory, something like Sabine's history of political theory, which is dry as dust, never touches the text, except at very light little excursions. So when I wandered into the first course with Mr. Strauss, I believe it was, I haven't looked up the record, but I think it was a course on the idea of history by Collingwood, the English uh-huh. one. It happened that that was particularly, when I think back on it, important for me personally. I was reared in a poverty-stricken family, but with strong bonds formed by the dedication of my parents, and secondly, by the fact that my mother was a descendant of a large German immigrant family, one of nine children. She worked as a servant until she was married, about age 29, and my father and she had then the five children. So the way that I came to the University of Chicago really was through a kind of ordering process. First, I learned to be very disciplined in the Army which carried over into my studies, I think. Secondly, when I got out of Northwestern, I was prepared to do the PhD in Chicago, above all because I trusted Morgenthau and Thompson. I can't say enough about Thompson to the good. He was not only generous to me in support of various kinds, but to other people who studied with Strauss. The last year I was in Chicago, I was not in Chicago, I was at Oxford. Ken Thompson had gone from the political science department to the Rockefeller Foundation, where he spent several years, and he provided me with access to money to go to England to work on the lock papers, both at Oxford and at the British Museum, which I did. And I incorporated a fair amount of the stuff they found in Oxford and in London in the book on Lock on War and Peace. The staunch moral backing coming from my parents maybe most particularly for my mother, because of the stern Lutheranism, German Lutheranism. I was reared in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, which is very stringent, very stringent, very stringent. And the pastor at the church was a H. A. Neuhofer, a man of German descent. And I think I never saw him laugh once. He preached the doctrine of sin and salvation. But also what he did was to teach me something that proved to be, as I now think back on it, of value, and that is to learn to be disciplined in your thought. How did that happen? Because as part of a coming to maturity in the Lutheran Church, you had to do Martin Luther's small catechism. And that meant you start with the first commandment, what does this mean? And you give the answer. No diversity permitted. You had to give the answer, which of course has its very great limitations eventually. But it served me well in the sense of a kind of training of the mind. But more important is the fact that it came into conflict with what I was learning in university life, namely relativism, historicism, as Strauss came to call them. The book, The Idea of History, struck a real nerve in me, I think, a moral nerve, because I was confounded by the fact that I was increasingly taught that there are no standards other than those which the society itself develops. And that meant even that Nazi Germany was, in principle, exempt from any condemnation by the principle of letting sleeping dogs lie. And I felt personally distressed, I think, at times about that. Where was I to turn? So one of the first things that happened, really, was that in the course on Collingwood, I learned for the first time that there was a serious road to go if you wanted to take it. What road was that? Reopen the old books. Simply put, reopen the oldest books, the Bible, Plato, Aristotle, Thucydides. And so the next seminar I took in my quest to find a better way to judge political life was a course on Plato's laws. 
You, I'm sure, know Strauss's book on the argument and the action of the drama and the action of the platonic dialogue. I still remember the opening line, something like, tell me, stranger, is a man or a god your founder, and so on. And on we went. It's a big book. I must say that given Strauss's own great learning, including classical Greek, he was able, of course, to read the Greek in a way which none of us in the course that I remember could do. But he was not in the least high-handed or pretentious about it. He simply took for granted that he had to teach what he could, namely with the English text of it, Jawad translation in a two-volume work. But I learned for the first time, I think in a rigorous way, the possibility of really confronting a text, confronting it, taking it in, taking nothing for granted about it except what the author says or does or suggests. And I use those three terms because they are all related to the whole problem of dialogic speech in which the dialogues are presented to us, some dialogues acting, some dialogues narrated, the Republic is narrated, you know, so on, kind of classification. But it was that kind of opening out that happened I think it's interesting that many of the general themes that eventually are talked about in Strauss's writing and work mm -hmm. were not very much ever, in my experience at that time, were not very much the theme of the courses themselves. That was external and above, I think you could say. For example, the book Natural Right and History, which is probably his most important single book, I think probably. He never taught, that I know of, courses on all of those figures yeah, I know he certainly did on Rousseau, Machiavelli, and so on. But what he was doing, I think in retrospect, is to find his way through these great books and establish a bridgehead against modern relativism and historicism, which was a very great contribution. It remains so. The third seminar, which I recall most completely, is the one on Machiavelli's discourse. In the usual way, Strauss handed out assignments arbitrarily. I happened to light with one of a group of chapters in Book 3 of the Discoursey. Like all graduate students getting nervous about what they're going to do when the old man is sitting there waiting for you to speak, I toiled away. By that time, I knew French very well, and so I could do some of the Italian without too much difficulty. But I worked and worked and worked, and finally I said, I've got to write this thing, but I'm exhausted. So I went to sleep got up first thing in the morning. I think the seminar was early afternoon. I typed furiously, and I realized that all of the work I had been doing for some weeks on and off finally coalesced. I finally saw what Strauss meant about a kind of rhetorical dialectic, where Machiavelli, as the author, cleverly insinuates himself into the argument by changing the argument as it proceeds. One point, the next point, the next point, the next point, until the whole group of chapters assumes a very different property compared to what one does in reading it on the surface. All of that was by way of a prelude to my work in Oxford, where, among other things, I had to contend with the realization that Locke, an important figure of the founding of America, had to be understood in its entirety. I wasn't capable of studying all of him. For example, The Reasonableness of Christianity is a work unto itself of very great importance. The essay on human understanding, I've made some headway with over time, but I never pretend to really come to a whole grips with it. I confine my work mostly to the letters on toleration and especially to the two to grips with it. I confine my work mostly to the letters on toleration and especially to the two treatises of government. What I found at Oxford was interesting, namely that quite contrary to what the general opinion was about men like Locke, he was assiduous in partial concealment, and with very good reason. He was threatened in England by the royal authorities and took refuge in Holland. And what I found in the wealth of the documents at Oxford and in London was, for example, evidence that he denied having read at all certain authors. I found positive evidence of him owning those books long before any notice of them in the public print, and also in various other ways, a very great awareness of the fact of political persecution. For example, there's an old collection called Howell's State Trials, I think that's the name of it, and in that set of volumes, 
Locke came upon the record of a trial held in Edinburgh, Scotland. There's a kind of wry irony in the name of the man being tried, as you'll see. Thomas Aikenhead, Thomas Aikenhead, a young man of about 18 or 20. He was prosecuted for blasphemy. Blasphemy meaning what? He had read Hobbes and was applying Hobbesian doctrine, and they convicted him and hung him by the neck until dead. This was part of Locke's resource in determining what kind of way to write. I'm absolutely sure of that. That fits, of course, with the whole rigmarole, I guess you could call it now, of the arguments about esoteric, exoteric, double meanings. People like Drury have, in effect, convicted him out of hand for teaching a subtle, underhanded doctrine of the elite who will rule and do so by noble lies perpetrated on the citizenry. What these people utterly fail to do is to realize the absurdity of imputing to Strauss a notion of writing which had never before been broached in public print, something idiotic about that. I first just forget it, refreshing my memory about it the other day. I went on the line using my French, and I remember some years ago seeing this, so I went and got it, printed it out. This is from the great encyclopedia of Diderot and Company, Exoterique, the double doctrine it's yeah. called. I'll just translate a little bit of it. The ancient philosophers had a double doctrine. One external, public or exoteric, the other internal, secret or esoteric, and so on. The whole idea of a double doctrine, in other words, just to use one piece of evidence, pre-exists Strauss by two centuries something absurd about people who claim that he invents such a way of proceeding. And even in doing the book on Locke, I came across a lot of materials, of course, some of which I could use. One of them was about a century after Locke published the two treatises of government, an Englishman named Josiah Tucker wrote a book about these matters, about Locke and so on, and he came to the conclusion after some soul-searching that Locke was not to be trusted as to the validity of his seeming to follow the argument of Richard Hooker's laws of ecclesiastical polity. Mm -hmm. Here is, once again, a completely separate piece of evidence of the awareness early on of the difficulty of simply taking Locke for granted when he claims, for example, to be following Richard Hooker. And that's incorporated in the book, Locke on War and Peace, which is still, I think, used a fair amount just in bibliographical records about mm -hmm the writing on Locke. But it was a thrilling thing to work in Oxford, courtesy of Ken Thompson. And one further remark about Ken Thompson, because of his position at Rockefeller, he had access to funds to help young people. One of the things he did for me was to let me have some money to run a small summer seminar of young people and somewhat older people on the theme of ideology which I'd done some work on in France when I was on the Fulbright. And, uh, for example, when my wife and I landed back in New York in the summer of 1955, Ken Thompson, then in New York, living in Scarsdale, took me and my wife and Ken and his wife. We went to visit Joe Cropsey and Lillian. Joe was still in New York teaching as an economist. So what Thompson did was to find funds at Rockefeller to permit me to have a little group of the people that Thompson was interested in. And we would gather at Harvard and have talks together. We'd invite in some outside people. One of them was Hannah Arendt, as a matter of fact. And we talked about ideology, and people worked on separate documents of their own, which they thought were relevant. Among those who were in that group are the following. David Lowenthal, Joseph Cropsey, Morton Frisch, myself, somebody else maybe, of all people who had at one point or another, been involved with the teaching of Strauss. And uh, Joe, as you know, left to become a political scientist, a political philosopher in Chicago. What year was this that you had the group on ideology? Summer of 56. I was only really at Harvard one summer. I went to Harvard having been offered jobs elsewhere. I knew when I went to Harvard that I would not be staying on there because it's a very, very select clientele that mm -hmm. make it up to the tenured rank. But I did have that one summer... And once again, it was Ken Thompson who furthered it. But even further up in time, after I was working on the doctorate, he, Thompson, would have access to money to help various scholars, some of them Strauss students, some of them not. So how did I come to read Strauss that way? 
It took a long time to get from Hammond, Indiana to the Midway to the Social Science Building to see this dumpy little man with the big spectacles, wisp of hair, tiny little voice, cigarette in the mouth. And I remember, fascinated, little pieces of paper about like this and a little yellow pencil, about this long stub pencil. He would make a note. Nobody could read it except him. But that's the way he taught. We're talking about Plato's laws now. We open the book. All we do is read, then we talk, then we read. And even so big a book as Plato's Laws, he would have, of course, to make strategic decisions about where we're going to look most carefully. But it was often sufficient, so you came away from it with the idea, this is a wonderful way of exploring what is law about. And you can return to it time and again to think through what it means. One of the students one time asked him, Mr. Strauss, what do you do when you study some new writer of importance? He said, smiling, I clear off my desk, which was wonderful. The, the metaphor of getting rid of my ideas about this book, which I may have inherited from someplace, and putting it to the test of reading. This was, I must say, and is now so evident as in, in compelling, as I this morning read, and for the first time ever, did a quick analysis of the opening chapter of Joy in the Morning. That's peanuts compared to the great works Maimonides, Guide for the Perplexed, El Farabi on Plato, Aristotle's Metaphysics, and so on. I think the remarkable thing was that the Strauss courses, whether lecture courses or seminars, were simply a wonderful compound of serious and intelligent thinking and talking, along with wonderful gales of laughter, comical things that happen, which is particularly true in Machiavelli. Harvey Mansfield once said years ago, if you read a chapter of Machiavelli and don't laugh, you've missed something, which I think is not a bad rule, a kind of hermeneutic rule. Just take up the subject matter and treat it the way it needs to be treated. So that's a long way around to the answer, how did I get to know Strauss? Did someone recommend to you taking one of his courses, was it Ken Thompson or someone else? Ken Thompson did. He was disappointed, of course, that I didn't get any grant from Chicago the first mm -hmm. time round, but I think he reasoned even though he didn't know Strauss a great deal at the time, he reasoned that I could and would profit from studying with that man as well as with Morgenthau, which happened, as it turns out. He himself, whether he ever read very much of Strauss, I don't know, quite frankly. We parted ways, not as friends, but geographically and career-wise, and he went, as you, I guess you know, to take up the post that Herb Storing had vacated in Virginia when okay. Storing died of a sudden heart attack. Uh -huh. Storing being one of Strauss's other students. Teach was to do this kind of work, scholarly work, which was not anything original in the strict sense, but was original in the sense of the organizing of the material to focus upon key issues, as you've seen in the table of contents of this book, and using the very finest materials one could find from different points of view. Different points of view is what's critical, because the understanding of the state and international relations proves to be itself a very complicated topic, as we're seeing today, for example, as to whether Sharia law is going to be incorporated into the laws of the United States, with some very untold consequences, I suspect. Right. So that and the book on ideology, which is similar to this one in scope and method, reflects the same principle. Provide scholarly materials, or choose scholars' books to give them to students, graduate and undergraduate, who can be expected then to deal with the problems that result from the way in which these things occur in political life. This morning, for fun, I googled Leo Strauss. Have you done that? See what the recent numbers are? Well, I haven't looked recently. The number of hits. 1,820,000. Stupefying. Most of them fragmentary, I'm sure. Passing references, because they're algorithm, I guess they call it, tracks them down. But a lot of it more serious, including the very great controversy that erupted early in this past period when the war in Iraq took place. The class on Collingwood, how did Strauss's course compare to your previous academic experience? It was new. It was new above all in the sense that though it was clear Strauss found Collingwood's understanding defective, he could not simply contend that and tell it to the students. What he had to show is We'll work our way through, and we'll give him every chance to reply. Couldn't do that literally, of course, 
but give him every chance to reply in the sense of taking seriously that if he makes this point and elaborates his, with this sub-argument, you have to look to that. And that was for me and for many of the other graduate students, I think, a revelation, quite literally. It was a way of reading that had come into great conflict with the traditional lecturing, teaching, textbook sort of thing, where in a textbook on political thought, you get summaries of what are said to be the main doctrines. What you don't see is the arguments. The arguments are what's key. And Strauss was, by that time, so immersed in, in that way of proceeding that it felt very natural to have him lead the way. But he was very responsive to questions. I think it was in that one where I smartly said to him one time, Mr. Strauss, you keep suggesting we need to go back and read some of these early books. Why can't we just do it on our own? And he liked that because it allowed him then to talk at some length about what, like an archaeological dig. We're looking down to find the roots, and the roots are not easily found. The roots, that is to say, of modern thought. The roots, indeed, of classical thought. How did that come to be of this kind? And so always the question was, where do we begin? We begin with the beginning, and we go to the end. And, and we will use the best text we can, the best editions, for example. And that was true throughout. I sat in on a couple of the courses, took three or four for credit. But I, you said earlier there were about 47 transcripts. Over the years he taught... And there are more courses than there are transcripts, of course. And there are more courses than transcripts. So I got a, I guess you'd say, a kind of appetizer. That's really what it was, an appetizer which proved to be beneficial all the way down the road because, as I said earlier, my discovery of the book called Battle Pieces and Aspects of the War came about only because I learned enough by that to make inquiries. As a matter of fact, I remember the other day, Strauss was very, very responsive to students in so many ways. He loved their questions and he would dig back at them. And often after the seminar would meeting, we would go to the social science tea room and students would sit around and he would have tea and cookies and carry on the discussion from the course or from other kind of matter. But he was wonderfully accessible in my experience of him. Now, admittedly, I was among the first Chicago wave, so to speak. Behind him, behind me were, or ahead of me, I guess you'd say, were the new school wave, David Lowenthal, Joe Cropsey, Harry Jaffa, maybe Howard White, and so on. But I was the first of the group to go through to the PhD in his Chicago career. He came, I think, at 49, and I encountered him first in... 1951. 51, and then I went to England in the fall of 54, finished the dissertation in the spring of 55. Then I took five years to completely rewrite the material in the form of the book. In the meantime, I was doing my own teaching, and so on. But the thing about his openness he welcomed students to bring in suggestions about things they'd read. He was, by the way, also at times comical. Jeremy Rabkin, a guy I've known for a long time, taught at Cornell. He's now at George Mason in the law school. Rabkin taught at Cornell for a long time. Strauss came to Cornell to give a talk, and one of the faculty members was assigned to go and bring Strauss to the lecture room. And they went to his room in the motel, and he said, I can't come now, I'm watching Gunsmoke. <laughs> this was not just an idle thing. He loved those programs, white hats, black hats. He loved the morale and the morality of the confrontation between good and bad and acted out. And so one time, somewhere along the way, he said, someone, uh, Mr. X, I go over here, I don't know, Mr. X told me of a recent book. It's called Melville's Quarrel with God. That's an interesting title. What is that book? It kind of stuck in my memory. After I started work on the battle pieces, a little bit before that, I had a graduate student who wanted to do work on Benito Serino, the Melville novelette. And keeping in mind what I'd learned from Strauss and what I was now going to learn from reading, I hoped, Melville's Quarrel with God, I realized that I might be on to something interesting. This book was published coincidental with the publication celebrating the 100th anniversary of Moby Dick, 1851-1951. 
And uh, Lawrence Thompson was a professor at Yale in English. What he does is to look carefully at Melville's works, especially at Moby Dick. And here's a statement. One of Milton's most brilliant opponents in spirit of that letter was one of Melville's favorite authors, a 17th century Frenchman backslidden from Calvinism named Pierre Bayle. After having sought refuge in Rotterdam from Catholic persecution, Bale soon discovered that his fondness for ridiculing all theological pretentiousness was likely to put him into equally serious trouble with the Dutch Calvinists. A great admirer of Montaigne, Bale developed his own varieties of self-protective stylistic equivocations and employed them with devastating effectiveness to his anti-theological Dictionnaire historique et critique, published in Rotterdam, 1697. Because Melville owned a set of veils of voodoo volunteers, made extreme use, and so on. It's very clear that even if Strauss hadn't read the book, he would approve of the stance, so to speak, taken there. If Melville's acquisition of a very considerable library, but certain books like the Pierre Bale and the Montaigne were clearly exciting to him, the double doctrine, in other words, came to light in a, still a different form. And when the graduate student, at my suggestion, took on Benito Sereno, I felt, of course, the need to give it a little myself. I'd read it quickly through before. What happened was startling, but in a way shouldn't have been given what I'd already learned about rhetorical techniques. Benito Sereno, if you read it, it's a story of a slave rebellion on a Spanish ship in the Western Pacific. The story is so organized that it begins with a mood piece of greenness and ship. Turns out that a Spanish slave ship has been encountered by a ship from the States. Is that the rights of man, the U.S. ship? I've forgotten the title of his ship, Sorry. but in any case, the main thing is a confrontation between an American ship and a Spanish ship, where on board the Spanish ship there's been a slave revolt. And so when the skipper from the American ship confronts the ship, he is greeted with a strange spectacle. Everything looks to be in order, but the slave revolt is unobtrusive, to say the least. Everything seems to be in order. What I realized after quite some time is, I don't know what to make of some features of the story. What, what am I supposed to look for? I finally hit on the idea, the dates. I looked, I made a diagram. I made a diagram with listed all of the references to her actual presentations of dates and times. How do you suppose it centers? You have no idea. The 4th of July, the Declaration of Independence. I was the first to discover that. I know that from the print, from the documentaries. But it was a thrilling thing to see because it was done so innocently, so to speak. The dates appear to be part of the drift of the statement of the story. It's only when you take the time to dissect, for that purpose at least, what the dates are. Now that book was published in 1856 in America, four years before the Civil War broke out. My reasoning about the book is that Melville sought to reach some people, people who thought more carefully about the problem of slavery and what to do about it. And he needed to do it in a way that was able to take account of the what? The moral pretentiousness of the American skipper is naivete and so on. But when you look at the book carefully and then see how he's so carefully organized it, to cause a kind of sudden awareness, this coincides with the day of independence when that document comes to be enacted. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Melville was a profound student of America. That I'm convinced of. I'm quite convinced of it. And Paul Dowling and I have done some work on Moby Dick, given that premise. We have written some on Moby Dick in the introduction material, I think, to the book on the Civil War. But I still haven't made much headway with the front material of Moby Dick, which is completely ignored in the literature completely ignored. It's amazing that all of that front material, which consists of an etymology and extracts, fairly long, quite a few pages, has completely escaped the detection of literary scholars. So Strauss was not responsible for my finding my way to that, directly, of course, but because of the taking in of his teaching as to what to do with important books. How do you know it's an important book? Well, there's some surface indications. It's a very learned book. 
Maybe it's superficially learned, but we'll see. His effect on Shakespeare studies is another. This is something I wanted to ask you about. Yes, I've trod upon forbidden soil by publishing one essay on Shakespeare. Well, Strauss taught a wide range of works, including Aristophanes' plays. He did teach literature. He taught that one time. But on the whole, certainly he didn't focus on teaching literature. No, that's right. And yet his students, I mean, you have this lively interest in Melville and Woodhouse, Shakespeare. Other students of his have published on Shakespeare and on other literary figures. And the question is, what is the connection between Strauss's teaching political philosophy and his students becoming students of literature in many cases. I mean, they're not teaching in literature departments, but they're writing very interesting, sometimes provocative, and even That's profound right. essays on literature. How does that happen? I think it happened by what suddenly occurs to me is a metaphor of osmosis. That is, a movement through the filaments, so to speak, mm -hmm. and where the underlying premise truly accepted or worked at to be accepted is that men of great mind do not write simply. They write, in effect, to teach. Teach maybe moral lessons, or lessons about the depravity of man, to take a more ugly side of it. They teach by investing their characters with moral qualities, bad and good, pride, humility, anger, hatred, gentler forms of that, more savage forms. One of my graduate students did a dissertation on Richard III. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer of the son of York. It's a poem. It's a poem about the corruption of soul which takes place. Lincoln, as you probably know, thought that Macbeth is the greatest of Shakespeare's plays, and with good reason. He gives reasons why. It's a great, great treatment of tyranny. So the empathy between looking at philosophic texts and looking at great literary texts, I don't mean the kind of paperbacks you buy in the airport, which are disgustingly trivial, but they may keep you from falling completely asleep when you travel. <laughs> uh, but the greatness of the books is proved in the process of the eating, so to speak, to use another metaphor. You, you take them in and work on them. Now, my friend Paul Dowling, trained as a professor of literature, English, did a wonderful little book called, what's the name of it? It's on... Milton's Areopagitica. It's clearly influenced by Straussian techniques, if you want to use that word, of looking carefully at arguments as they develop and as they redevelop and so on. I got into that mood some years ago. I can't tell exactly why now, but I got into it because, once again, it's this question of the overlap between politics and human life, more generally. I began to be wonderfully, wonderfully questioning about what a Shakespearean comedy is. So I took up the question of Midsummer Night's Dream, a frivolous little thing. Samuel Pepys in his diary says he went to a performance of Midsummer Night's Dream. He never saw such trash in his life. Well, that's a serious man, you know. Is that true? Is it a trivial piece? So I spent some time particularly writing an essay on it up in my house in Maine one summer, and I got it published. I found the play to be a marvel of wonderful things. It's political philosophy in the, the garb of literature. Not all the political philosophy books, in other words, are so identified by any means. And another variety of that interest, not just the Shakespeare. Oh, by the way, Jaffa was one of the leaders of that whole thing. And in the case of Lear, the tragedy of King Lear, and others followed in the way. Tom West has done that. John Alvis has done that. A lot of people have done it. It simply occurred to me that one has to make allowances for the form so that the thought is embedded in different ways in the different works. One of the books that many students of Strauss have come to regard very highly is Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's supreme novel. I've read that book at least five times over the years. Every time I read it, I see something more. In the way of moral seriousness, in comic character. Her remarkable ability to portray Mr. Collins, the obsequious, fawning preacher of the Church of England, done, I think, without malice, but with serious moral purpose, to show how, in the jargon of these times, 
how the class system, as in its particular form, as it's encountered in the novel, is corrupting. The obsequious Collingwood fawns over the good lady nearby, who is part of the decaying aristocracy of England. And those things had to interest Strauss. Whether he ever read Pride and Prejudice, I have no idea. But the students of his, including this one, have read it with great care. In fact, one of the finest essays... Well, he, the, he does, in a famous remark, compare Austin to Dostoevsky, which suggests he must have read Austin. Yes. And if he read Austin, you assume he read Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. One of the finest essays on Pride and Prejudice is done by one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He's named Adam Schulman. Adam Schulman teaches at St. John's. He's a theoretical physicist, history of science. He's one of the smartest men I've ever met. This range of his is so extraordinary. The essay on Pride and Prejudice, I have a copy of somewhere, it's wonderful because it sees the ways that the delicate techniques of Austin's ability to provide character studies, so to speak, is, well, it's a revelation. What happens in the book is that the prideful man and the somewhat prideful woman find their way to each other by reforming themselves morally. It's not a trait in political philosophy, but it's a wonderful evocation of the ways in which erotic desire, family pride, religious appearances all become entangled, and the people are finding their way in that maze. So I only speak for myself, then. I have a long essay on The Tempest, which I've never been satisfied with. I probably will never publish it, but uh, I did publish the one on the Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, among other things, I start the way I think Strauss would want one to start, namely, is there any other play in the Shakespeare corpus about the founding of a political society? And the answer is no. This is the play. It's about Athens. Is that accidental? That seems improbable, and so on. So that's how I came to do it. And David Lowenthal, some time back, said it's the finest thing he's seen and most beautifully written. But he's done a lot of work on Shakespeare himself, published a lot of stuff on Shakespeare, mm -hmm. as well as on Lincoln. You began in thinking about and responding to my question by using the metaphor of osmosis, that there was, and I assume that the osmosis refers to habits of mind developed in studying political philosophy than being applied to the reading of literature. I think that's right, absolutely. It's, it takes some time for that to happen, of course, because in my experience, you first have to feel you're on solid ground in making these transfers, so to speak, but they work. For example, one of the features of certain kinds of writing, according to Mr. Strauss and others who've worked with texts taught by him, who've been taught by him, is that certain works are organized such that there is a central part, which is in this act, perhaps the key to the whole. The beginning and the center, in other words, and then the end, alpha, alpha and omega, to use the biblical terms, are what's so critical. What I discovered in organizing the essay on Midsummer Night's Dream was that, not surprisingly, the very center of the play takes place outside the city walls, which is to say, in Rousseauian terms, in the state of nature. In a way, it's very simple when you look at the structure of the play. Where is the center? And why is it there in the way in which it is? Did Strauss in any way encourage his students to study literature or read literature seriously or even write on literature? I can only speak for the time that I either was a student of his in Chicago or later in a secondary kind of way. I might have heard from him or said something to him by a note. But I don't recall he explicitly sought that. But I was following, I guess by that time, I was following the example of Jaffa. Jaffa has been important to me for two reasons. One is the book on four constitutionalism, four, four pillars of constitutionalism. He was the one who suggested I do that. But also, his early essay in the Political Science Review on King Lear was a kind of beacon of what one could do and should do. Harry is a very learned man, and in this case, he put his way of proceeding, which he'd learned from Strauss in part, but also just from his own native intelligence, I think, working on literary works. And he did it with a fairly well. It was highly criticized, I think, by people in, quote, literary studies. But one of the things to reply to that is, a lot of people in literary studies don't know what the hell they're doing. They get all kinds of doctrines today, incredible theorizing, 
critical theory. A friend of mine from the SUNY Buffalo English Department said to me a while back, shaking his head sadly, the department is searching for a queer theorist. I said, what, what is that about? Oh, we've got to have all these theories modeled in our department. So we have to have a Marxist, we have to have a queer theorist. And that means the dredging, the degeneration of literary studies, namely old-fashioned pick up the book and read. He was appalled. He, by the way, is a very liberal political person, but he could see the degeneration before his eyes so that people like my colleague Dowling, trained in literature at Indiana, he came to me just to take my seminars when he first came to teach at Canisius, and then we developed a great friendship. He is truly one of my most profound friends, a Roman Catholic, student of literature, good co-writer. He's made his way in literature in large part by reflecting on the learning that he got from reading Strauss's works. I don't think he ever met Strauss, but partly through me telling him things he might do, he became quite, what, skilled at it. He's still working, for example, on a long essay on King Henry VIII, a play which has been mostly ignored by literary people, and which he thinks is greatly undervalued. I don't know that he's doing a convincing argument, but I've seen some of it. So, yes, great books fall into categories by modern classification systems, I guess, but they defy those boundaries. There's a man named Leon Craig. He's in some circles known as the Prairie Straussian, way out west in Canada. He's written a huge book published in the past few years it's on Platonism, namely... It's a book mostly on Hobbes, Leviathan, but it has some interesting chapters on Melville's Moby Dick. And those chapters coincide with some of the things I've discovered independently, namely that the shameful inadequacy of literary scholars in the Melville field shows up in their utter silence about a big chunk of the book. These introductory things look sort of strange and difficult and puzzling, and so we just pass over that. Everybody knows that the book begins, Call me Ishmael. That's the way the book begins. Well, not quite. It begins with the title. The book has two titles, Moby Dick, semicolon, comma, or, comma, the whale. Was that strange? A book with two titles, seemingly very different titles, and yet the same book. How is that possible? Or to take another aspect of it, the extracts are voluminous in nature. Many, many pages of them. Many pages, many pages. By the time you finish reading them, you're bored and exhausted. What the hell? This is a letter from somewhere in 1622, side by side with an extract from Montaigne, side by side with a whaleman's song. A mishmash, mishmash. But it turns out, and I discovered this only by teaching a little bit of Moby Dick at a seminar in Dallas some years ago, where the focus was on teaching teachers who teach, that is, grade school and high school. And all the students were expected to read Moby Dick, which is a big, big, big book. But some of them tackled it. And I had a little seminar group of my own, which met periodically. This is against the background of some very interesting learned lectures by the faculty on that program about Moby Dick. I could see that some of the students were impatient with that. And so I did the what now comes natural to the thing. I said, let's open the book. We see the double title. We wonder about it. We look and see the dedication to Hawthorne. Ah, oh, that's interesting. The genius of Hawthorne, not just anything. Then we have etymology about the whale. And then we have those damned extracts, which are so boring, so boring, so boring. I said to the students, let's read them, the extracts. It turns out there are five biblical extracts, Old Testament extracts, and they focus on Jonah, which is to say, as a harbinger of the wonderful chapter 9, the sermon on Jonah, and so on. I haven't made as much headway as I would like, because the book is bafflingly difficult. Craig rightly says it's a philosophical work in the disguise of literature, and I think that's true. But the way in which I came at it was simply to sort of get into the same habit the way I did this morning in reading the opening of Joy in the Morning, which is, turns out is a passage from Psalms. Who would have thought? It's just comic stuff. Bertie Wooster is a nitwit, but he has the money to hire this incredible Jeeves who wants for a present 
the research <laughs> annotated set of all of Spinoza's works. <laughs> yes, we laugh. Was there something literary about Strauss's teaching in political philosophy? Was his approach literary in some ways? Mostly the Machiavelli. I think he was intrigued and tantalized initially by the, well, the sheer comedy of it and the overt brutality, which seems unfitting to a man of philosophic ability. Don't ask for a man to borrow his pistol, but ask him to borrow it and then shoot him. Lessons like that. And when he opens his book on Machiavelli, he speaks about he's a teacher of evil, morality, and so on. That book, by the way, is enough to digest for a lifetime. Mansfield, one hell of a Machiavelli scholar himself, said one time, I make a kind of trek with hard work into some part of, say, the discoursey, and then I discovered that Strauss was there first. That's the way it is. Yes, the literary quality of Machiavelli is wonderful. I taught, as a matter of fact, with some care, the little comedy, which is about it, fornication, adultery, and so on. All of us evil things. But Strauss reveled in those works for the solidest of reasons. That is, they were explorations of the human problem, so to speak. All of the passions that are embedded in us. This big book of even Brands, somewhere letting our, feeling our feelings. So, yes, I think in response to your question, the case which was most appealing to me was his treatment of the Machiavellian comedy, so to speak. And he laughed a lot. We laughed a great deal in that seminar in Machiavelli. Laughed and laughed. Once again, I come back to the point of early on. Some of the really harsh critics of Mr. Strauss haven't a clue what he was like as a teacher. Not a clue. They can't have a clue because they couldn't say the things they do. You mentioned the first three courses you took from him, Collingwood and Machiavelli and... Plato's I, Laws. And Plato's Laws. Were there other courses you took from him? I started in a course on Rousseau, as I recall, and maybe one other, which would bring to about a total of five. That wouldn't be surprising that it was that few because I had to do all the other courses in my field. Sure. Constitutional law, public administration, the international politics. Yes, yeah, so that sounds about right. I would have taken more, but I was already eager to get my degree and get a job, keeping bread on the table. Yeah. You spoke of the GI Bill, by the way, earlier, and I'm greatly indebted to that law because it helped people like myself, frankly, get out, get out from desperate situations and make our way. And his generosity of temperament towards people like me and others like me, of which there were a few, was a remarkable thing that I treasure. He just wanted to know what you could do, not where you came from. Just one more question about students of Strauss being inspired to somehow by his teaching to then venture into studying literature. What would you say to the literature professors who say, well, what you're doing is illegitimate. You're reading works of poetry and literature like their political philosophy. We can't expect Strauss to respond to that objection, but what would you say to that? I guess the way I would approach it is to choose an example of a book, talk about how we're going to read it and why. I made an error, by the way, a minute ago when I said there isn't any published material on the front material of Moby Dick. There's one, an essay by a guy at East Texas or someplace. And what it does is to do what most literary scholars do these days. It grasps some abstract doctrine some abstract theory, and plugs the pieces into it. That's the absolute antithesis to what Strauss taught. Absolute antithesis. That's what was embedded in his metaphor about clearing a desk. If you come to a reading of Midsummer Night's Dream with a Marxist doctrine in your mind, you'll fail miserably because you're presupposing that you know better than Shakespeare what he was doing. In a way, Strauss always talked in commonsensical terms. It wasn't great theorizing. He would say, how do you know? What's the evidence? What do you know about the author? You ever heard of him? And indeed, other writers do all kinds of things. There's a novelist who, in one of his novels, plays with the opening sentence of Moby Dick. Instead of saying, call me Ishmael, the character says, call me Ishmael. Give me a call on the telephone. Playing with that. Strauss was playful, amazingly playful. 
And his playfulness carried into the exploration that I and some others have made into literary works. Not as much as I would have liked to do over the years. I had a family to raise, money to earn. My wife never worked until after we had children. I was the sole breadwinner, contrary to what happens much today. I would have done more work in literature, and I'm still, at times, digging away at the Moby Dick because I... I think it's, well, it's the most remarkable book written by an American that I know of. Totally remarkable. And it's not political philosophy in the usual sense, but somewhere I have a copy of the journal Interpretation, which was founded by Strauss students. And there's a wonderful essay in there by John Alvis from the University of Dallas on Moby Dick. It's one of the best things I've seen. But it simply does what Strauss always did. It takes one's bearings by what is said, what is done, what is alluded to and so on. I can't say much about what other literary people are doing, except that much of what I see is boring or even appalling. And Paul Darling feels the same way. As I said, a guy I know in the English department at SUNY Buffalo had the same sense. Even though he's for diversity, this is going too far. This is going too far. Just doctrinaire people who plug pieces of a work into this framework, and they claim, voila, great, great discovery. Unfortunately for people who do that with Moby Dick, they're in for real trouble because the book is so complicated, including the fact that if you read through the book at the beginning and are bored by the number and variety of the extracts, you won't slow down enough even to read carefully through the extracts, trying to mobilize your courage against boredom. But really, you have to, because it turns out that a key passage is one by Hobbes' Leviathan embedded in a way you can hardly see it. And it's the only one of the many, many, many extracts, in fact, which points exactly to where to be found the passage. And it's in Hobbes, Leviathan. Dowling and I discovered that, independently of Leon Craig discovering it. So there are people doing these things, a few of us. We don't pretend to be, what, endowed with all of the rigmarole of people in literary theory, but literary theory has become corrupt, I think. I read stuff every now and then about books that I know and I find it either laughable or appalling. Appalling, not least when there's such a pretension to have outsmarted, say, Melville, to know what he's up to. Right. Well, we've got this theory and we, we apply it in liberal doses. Right, right. Strauss saw that in, more particularly in the field of political philosophy because he, by the time I came to know him, he was in his 50s. And he'd done an enormous lot of reading in all kinds of books, Judaism, Christianity, philosophy, history. And he came equipped, in other words, with a cornucopia, which in my experience with him, he never was arrogant about it. He was, if anything, remarkably humble that he couldn't do anything else than laugh at some of the strange doctrines that are perpetrated about great works. One arbitrary consideration about Strauss and literature, which he took seriously, he mentions several times in his courses that he's a member of a political science department. Yes. And so he has to justify teaching something that belongs in a political science department. So he did teach the Aristophanes, of course. You say warmth made Strauss an effective teacher. Yeah, warmth in the sense of a liveliness, intelligence, working. Warmth at ease, complete sense of mastery of what he's doing. A kind of fusion that plays itself out in the form of seeking for the profound parts of the reading, but with a certain playfulness, examining it, turning it over, thinking about it in relation to what's come before, maybe coming after, all of those things. It was completely new to me, completely new. Everything I'd done before had more the sense of just looking at services and, and taking them in, but not tarrying. Some exception might be a couple of the teachers I had taught literature, novels, but nothing like what Strauss did, above all given the terrific difficulty of the text. Not only wasn't he intimidated by it, but he exuded a kind of gladliness, like the clerk in Oxford in Chaucer. Gladly would he learn, gladly would he teach. It's a beautiful way of saying it, gladly, gladly. Open to suggestions, questions, Patient, but also stubborn. You had to really push him hard if you thought you had a point. And he was clever. Long years of doing it and enjoyment of what he was doing. The day we walked in the quadrangle, 
when he spoke about it being a golden age. I think he had just come from doing a seminar or something. It was a beautiful spring day. There was lively discussion, and it was a golden age. We were a group of veterans in his classes, Storing and myself and Sigliano and Walter Burns, Bob Goldwyn. All of us were veterans of World War II who managed to escape being killed and were back to get an education. People like myself, utterly dependent on the GI Bill of Rights to get there. And he clearly enjoyed the presence of such a stalwart body of students, obviously. Anybody who's ever taught, if you get a group of good people in the class, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. I remember when I taught at SUNY Buffalo here years and years ago, I was teaching a course on political philosophy. We read Plato's Republic. And I had in the class a young woman who was a double major in political science and English. She also was a musician, played the flute. She was very intelligent, very sweet-natured, smart. And I had them do an essay on something in Plato's Republic, some question just about how to look at what happens over the course of maybe a section of the book or some theme where they had to face up to writing it for themselves. This was before the time of internet sources. <laughs> And, and so I gave one on Plato's Republic, I gave it a B minus. She came raging in. How can you give me that? I'm an A student in English and political science, not in my course. She was mad as hell. She went away. Next work, Machiavelli's Mandragula, a wicked play. She wrote an A plus paper. 10 or 15 years later, I got a letter. She was finishing a doctorate somewhere. And she said, I must write to you and say, I finally discovered what you were doing. She knew all along what I was doing, but the truth is it wasn't until then that she could formulate exactly for herself how to do that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So Strauss had that sense, students reporting back to him what they were doing, writing, and so on, and he exuded confidence and enjoyment the minute he entered the room. Put the books down, took out his little pencil with the perhaps with paper, God knows what he was writing, probably German shorthand, and he would proceed that way for, what, two hours or whatever the seminar was. Then people would straggle down the corridor, maybe, go up to his office, go to the tea room. It was always the same sense of lively inquiry guided by pressing need to understand what was being argued, what directions it was taking, what examples were used. When I did that little thing this morning, just spontaneously, I realized for the first time that I think this is maybe the only title of a Uthaus book which comes from the Psalms, perhaps the only title in the corpus from the Bible. Things like that which you notice after a time and quickly see what's happening. In this case, it gives a sense of the book which when you know the historical background is the reality of him writing it, mind you, imprisoned by the Nazis mm -hmm. in, in Western France. So I think the sense of joy in the morning was a sense of his being finally released with his wife. So this is as much as I can say. It was a joy to be in the classes. It was a sterling occasion. And a lot of people who weren't taking the course for credit would show up, They'd listen to the discussion, go away. And there was a particular group of people, by the way, who made it all the more even poignant for me. A man named Ernest Volgamut, who did a PhD at Chicago in some other field than mine and a woman named Avi Ellis. Wulgemut was a boy growing up in Berlin and was sent by his family to England to get him out of Germany. He grew up in England, went to the LSE, came to America, taught for a while, then he came to get a PhD. He was a refugee from Nazism. Avi Ellis, whom he eventually married, was a refugee with her family from Austria. They got out through some hook or crook and some bribery, I think, and came to Chicago where her parents worked in one of the hospitals. A.B. and Ernest married. I last saw them in England. They're both deceased now. They were part of a group which included Gerald Stutz from Vienna. Morgenthau hired him initially, and then he went back to Germany in around the mid-60s. I visited him in Berlin, him and his wife, in 64 in the fall. Then he went back to Vienna, where he still is. This was a cluster of people I was very much a part of doing our work in Chicago. And that added to the enjoyment of it. We know we would joke about what the old man is getting up to here and that sort of thing, you know, just the way graduate students do. They're smart Alex, having a good time, above all, enjoying themselves. By the way, a while back, I saw Bob Faulkner's statement about Strauss as a teacher, which he put down, and he echoed my own sentiments. 
namely up until Strauss took you in hand, so to speak, to read some important book, it was always sort of droning on the surface. This is this, this is this. There was very little in excitement, just a kind of routine telling of this and that. But there was no power to it, mm -hmm. no dynamism, no sense of digging down, going for the sense of radical, going to the root. And he never varied from that. Whatever the text was, it was always digging for the root, the explication of details which were often there on the printed page but weren't perceived as being what they truly are. He would have liked, maybe he did know it. You know the book by Norman McLean, The River Runs Through It? Mm -hmm. Paul Dowling tells me that Seth Benedetti used as an epigraph to one of his own books a sentence from the McLean Thinking is seeing something which reminds you of something else you saw, which ends in you seeing something which isn't there. That sort of dynamism, in which the, the one thing provokes your interest and suddenly it, it blossoms out into something else, which in turn moves to another level. And that's what Strauss would do fairly regularly. The one paper I did on the discourse, he was like that. For the first time, felt reasonably comfortable using that kind of technique of analysis to interpret a series of chapters. And Strauss was pleased with it. He was a tough master in that sense. He was, I think, a fair grader, but he didn't put up nonsense. How did he grade? You would give a class presentation, then he would record a grade for you on the presentation? Presentation, but also class participation when others were reading. I yeah, see. The whole thing put together. About Strauss's teaching, I mean, the gladness that he brought to the classroom, I think that's a very interesting yes, uh, way of putting it. Gladness, gladness. In part having to do, I think, with the simple human reality that he is now secure and a first-rate institution had money coming in, he could do what he damn pleased. Within some sensible limits. He was incompetent to teach physics. He wouldn't have tried to do that anyhow. But within the perimeter of what's called political philosophy, he could do what he wanted. And he had time, energy, and money to live while he worked on things that were not at all part of the political science curriculum, namely Jewish studies of various kinds, things that he wrote, things that he was editing. It was a whirlwind of activity when you look at the record. I've heard that in these classes in the early 50s that he often went long over time. Yes. So the class would be listed for an hour and a half, and then he continued taking questions for some time afterwards. That's right. How long did those classes last? Sometimes it would be another hour or something going on, sometimes in the classroom, then in the corridor, then up in the tea room. <laughs> it was a kind of Pied Piper sort of thing. Because he had serious, mature students. In other words, the core of it was a group of veterans from World War II who were way behind in their careers. I was two years behind storing it, although others were exactly the same. Walter Burns was in the Navy. And when we got there, it was indeed like the promised land. We got into the first-rate place that we wanted to go to, and mm -hmm. we dug in, and when we discovered the riches that Strauss was opening up, it was sheer clover. All my life, it was the happiest period of my life in the sense of the most exciting and enjoyable working, working. Not just in Strauss's courses. Herman Pritchard did a very good constitutional law class. Leonard White did well with a dry subject called public administration, but a first-rate scholar. We, in other words, had one hell of a group of people there. Not all of them did I get to know. For example, I didn't know Morton Grodson as much, but he was available. Strauss was exceedingly available in the way in which we've just been talking about it. But earlier you raised the question about him feeling perhaps that he could not venture into some maybe literary works in the curriculum. I don't know about that, whether he tried, failed, or didn't want to try, I don't know. I never talked to him about it. He certainly well, would have been prepared to do it, I suspect. At the beginning of several of the courses on the transcripts, you can see that he feels the need to justify why in a political science department they're reading such and such text. Like Aristophanes. Well, it was common for many of his courses. If he was teaching the Plato's Republic, he would begin by explaining why. One of the questions he would take up at the beginning of the course would be, why in a political science department would we read this dialogue? And so uh, I was just suggesting he took seriously the need to present materials that were appropriate for his position as a teacher of political philosophy in the political science department. In another kind of department, he might have taught different kinds of courses. It's possible. We it's don't just know. possible. But he had a rich catalog, so to speak, of untaught things, things he'd worked on, obviously, and he had written them, but they had not yet taken them into a course. 
I don't know what the politics, so to speak, of was in the background. My sense is, because Herman Pritchett was chairman of that department at the time, he was a very fair-minded man. He was very fond of Strauss personally, thought him a wonderful scholar and teacher. So I think he would have been quite cooperative. But the underlying issue was and remains, in some respects, the narrowing of the focus of what's called political science in the age beginning about a century ago. The founding of the Political Science Association was a part of a movement imported in part from Germany, for example. American scholars went to Germany to study, and they got this sense of some sort of scientific inquiry, which was then translated into different terms in America. And once computers became available, mm -hmm. no, nothing could have stopped the flood of so-called empirical studies. Meanwhile, the questions about the regime, which was central to Strauss's way of thinking, the questions about the regime sort of fell off the table, so to speak. You weren't going to get into those questions because, well, I mean, if you take the structure of natural right and history, he takes up the question of the fact-value distinction. He takes up the question of claims of historical hegemony following in phases and so on, which made the study of political science look to be a different kind of thing, particularly on the empirical side. When I taught here at Buffalo, we got a heavy dose of people coming in. The university dean wanted that, as a matter of fact, to teach courses on the kind of materials which could readily be subjected to tabulation, all kinds of rigmaroles, the way of polling data, voting data, oh God, that's green pasture for the appearances. Some of it important and interesting, but a lot of it fairly repetitious and not very much to do with political life the way citizens are compelled to live it and choose to live it. Strauss was a very great encourager of the citizen perspective on what's going to be studied. And he held up two men, this is no news to you, he held up two men as beacons, Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill. He regularly recommended that people get Lord Charnwood's biography of Lincoln as a first great way to read about statesmanship. And he had high praise for Churchill, not least because he had saved Western civilization by refusing to give in to Nazi Germany until he could get help from the states, so on. And so I was in uniform, by the way, in Belgium the day the war was declared ended. And they had public speakers all through the city set up by the Signal Corps. And we heard Churchill's voice live declaring the end of hostilities. It was a chilling moment. It was a gorgeous May day, streets filled with people. And that evening, for the first time, little children saw streetlights on. A child six years old had never seen streetlights, living in darkness. So there was a sense of sheer euphoria. And Strauss was not there, of course, but he knew of that kind of sentiment and what it meant. And his toughness in defending liberal democracy is one of his great contributions to American civilization, I think. He, for example, was clearly very much in the background providing sort of moral support to Herb Storing for the work he did on the founding the Anti-Federalists. That work was not work he himself would do, but he knew that it was important to do just on general principles and it wasn't being done otherwise. The same with the volumes that Ralph Lerner collaborated on, the founding, the three volumes on the Constitution. Those are rich treasure houses, which were in good part derived from moving over from political philosophy, per se, into founding mm -hmm. as a particular political phenomenon. So, yeah, I mean, his sense of the Declaration is immediately broached in the opening of natural right and history. And the leading question is whether this country still adheres to that. Well, the truth is, since I studied with him, there's a hell of a lot of people in political science who seriously doubt it. The most appalling misuse of the Declaration of Independence is by Obama. He every now and then dips his finger into the well of language of the Declaration. Utterly fallacious. Utterly. People don't say a word. He claims to be a follower of Lincoln. My God. You know, about Storing and Diamond and Bob Coldwin and Bob Horowitz and Ralph Lerner and Harry Jaffa, he had a large number of his students who, Walter Burns, who ended up doing significant work on American political thought. That's right. Do you have some sense about how that happened? I think I go back to my metaphor about osmosis. It's the sense of the radical going to the roots as being radical, seeing how things begin, for example. Founding is a peculiar institutional thing that happens. One reason why I got so interested in 
I mean, the little essay on Midsummer Night's Dream is that it, it has about it the aura of a founding, a founding of Athens, which is not least important because the obvious fact is that eventually Socrates appeared. He doesn't appear in the play, but he's there in the shadows, I think, as a possible entrance, so to speak. And so, because most of the people you've named, and myself included, were veterans of World War II, they felt a kind of moral stake in making sure that the foundations of their own regime were being protected. There was a certain protectiveness about it, which continues, I think. And it was seen for that by people like Jeremy Radkin, who came later, Harvard PhD with Harvey, now at George Mason. And yes, so what Burns and the others did was to make a very solid case for the remarkableness of the founding of the American regime, the remarkableness. And it is. Every time I go back and read some of those documents, I'm astonished. It was a perilous time, you know. The Revolutionary War was not a done deal, I'll tell you. The tenacity, the courage of Washington and some of the others in Lafayette were absolutely indispensable to bring it off at Yorktown. So, yes, I think a real element of the most dignified sense of patriotism was involved, and it proved to be helped by... How did Strauss's teaching help inspire that dignified patriotism, if it did? I think it did. Not always directly, but always at the level of what? Openly declared principles which can be tested with experience. Openly declared principles. We stand for the principle that all men are created equal. Lincoln, when he did the great speeches about the crisis of the house divided, drew on the one hand from biblical materials, but also, most importantly, from the founding materials, the Declaration of Independence. When I did the essay, the introductory essay to my little book called Four Pillars, it was a revelation to see how the kind of Lincolnian language was omnipresent in the debates in the post-Civil War era in the Congress about rights, about natural law, and all of that sort of thing. So there was a kind of welling up of pride in that affiliation. And I think that's in part what inspired people like Walter to do the kind of work they did. And through him, students he's had to have students, now we're into the fourth generation, in effect. That has certainly not pleased many people in academia, <laughs> to say the least. It's seen as a threat, threat to the autonomy of the kind of political science which is still the dominant form. When I taught at Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo, we had at one time three full-time political philosophy people, myself, Friedman, and Douglas Watley, and then Glenn Thoreau. Four, we had four at one time, now zero. That's happened very much across the country. Modernization, all of these things. Some important work, but political philosophy could have squeezed at the margins. We don't have the resources. Well, that's just a fairy tale. They could have the resources but it's not supported. On the other hand, it's been encouraging to see a couple of the meetings I've gone to, the APSA meetings, one in Toronto, one in Boston, to see that that form of what you're talking about, namely the work of Harvey Mansfield and people like that, has been well attended at the mm -hmm. political science meetings. I can't say that I'm really in touch with what's happening with the profession. I'm not involved. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but my sense is that there is an eager enthusiastic audience for serious work in political philosophy in the American that's Academy. Right. That's quite right. Even if it has been squeezed out of some institutions, when people encounter it, they're interested. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's a kind of native curiosity, you might say, mm -hmm. coming to bear. And I think also a kind of reaction in part against the sense of scientism taking over, the false claim of science. In other words, the very categories we use in the universities and colleges are boundary categories. You're going to teach political philosophy. Don't you dare do anything with Shakespeare. Well, that's nonsense. Philosophically speaking, it's, it's puerile to suppose that you can cut those sharp boundaries. Take, for example, again, the Ecclesia Zuzai of Aristophanes. Here are the women running the city, which, of course, is hilarious. Why is that? Well, because they aren't fit to run the city. Or what? Yes, they are. They're in charge. And so one time when I taught the Republic, a couple of times I had students read the Ecclesia Zuzai. And it was interesting that two of the best women students I had were in the class one time. And we read the play and I had some of the kids acted out and I sort of hammed it up a little bit. Well, the two women in question 
who both went on, one of them went on to get a PhD and law degree, the other one's a law degree, they were affronted by the fact that when we hammed it up in class, that the crucial scene where the young man would like to have it with his young woman is told by one hag and then another and then a third. Now, me first, Sonny. Well, the two women in question were affronted. I could tell that. I invited them to my office, either that day or another time, and we talked for a while. And they began grudgingly to say they saw the point. Well, the point is, of course, in vulgar terms, that men don't get erections to screw old hags. And anybody who thinks that the law can require that ought to get the Colney Hatch, which is the favorite nuthouse that Woodhouse speaks about. <laughs> There's a limit to what law can command, and that limit is set by human nature, which can't be overcome by any persuasion techniques, let alone by any threat of force. You're going to screw this old hag. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Oh, what an absurd conversation. But things like that, which are so fundamental to understanding what political life is about, seems to me every justification being taught in political science departments. I was fortunate in SUNY Buffalo Partly because I came here as the leading political philosophy person, I taught just what I pleased after I finally got here, and I taught courses like Rhetoric and Politics, where we read and thoroughly examined Julius Caesar. Another course is on Literature and Politics, where I took up Gulliver's Travels, among other things, and the students loved it. Loved it. I made no pretense of doing anything that what I was doing was justified because it was works that treated fundamental problems. And if anybody didn't like that, that's too bad. One of the privileges of having tenure, as you damn well know, is you can at least have greater freedom to work as you want. And it was a wonderful life. I, coming as I did from a working family, to be able to live as I did then, teaching two semesters and then going to my house in Maine for the summer, it was a utopia, utopia. You had your own golden age. That's right. Yes, the, the courses I taught were well, look, just an example. American political thought was a staple of the curriculum for a long time. When I took it at Northwestern as an undergraduate, it was a dry-as-dust course. We would now read a little bit of one of the old pilgrims, and then we'd do a little bit of this, and then we'd read a little Calhoun, and so on. It was dull, deadly dull. When I took over the course after the guy teaching it retired, I said, we're going to do something very different. We want to talk about American political thought about fundamental problems. So we read the four organic laws, doctrines. We read Jordan Anastopoulos' book, A Commentary on the Constitution. Then we read Benito Serino of Melville on the problem of blacks. In other words, he was thematic courses which used any works that were relevant, and it worked wonderfully. And as far as amongst Strauss students or people who comment on these things, there's the saying of Strauss is about something like, when you teach, you should remember that in your class there may be someone superior to you to heart and mind, a famous saying of his. Well, I learned that lesson time and again. One time when I was doing the course on where we read Gulliver's Travels, I was very happy with myself because I finally perceived that there's something wrong with the structure of the book. And I brought it up in class in an indirect way, and a young woman down front put up her hand and said, I can see why. I thought I was a smart guy. She got there way ahead of me. It's a salutary thing to happen. You ain't so great. Yes, teaching activity is slow, hard work, but it's a eminently humane one. The students like this guy, Pelson. He's a man of great intellect. He'd be success no matter what he did anywhere. He came to me having done a degree in Ireland and then some work in Germany. And when we first studied Plato's Republic, he thought I was nuts by concentrating on the drama of the dialogue. What is this about? We're talking about philosophy, right? Well, he eventually came round, and when he did, he could see the sesame, the doors opening, to an entirely different way of thinking about that great book called The Republic. And so when he worked on Machiavelli, it was wonderful to see what he would do. He would come to my office, and the door would be opened, and I think people in the department thought we were drinking because we were laughing all of the time. <laughs> Every time he would come, I see something new, and he would talk about it, and then we would laugh. And the next time he would come, same thing. It was simple joy to have a student that good, who was that interested, and so independent, so eager to do his own work. And now he is a really successful man in the world of diplomacy, ambassador for his country to all kinds of places in the world, including India, which was a eye-opener for him. 
Do you think that there was anything in particular in Strauss's teaching that facilitated this osmosis for our Americanists? Is there anything that they would learn in studying Plato or Machiavelli that would then open up for them the field of American political thought in a way that those coming from inside the disciplines would not readily see, give them some new purchase, some yeah. vantage point? I think one facet of that, I speak more about my own case immediately, the realization of what had happened in Germany, the destruction of the Weimar regime, the formation of the Nazi regime, and the incredible, terrible things that happened thereby, was there to some extent all along. We escaped, Walter and I and the others. We made it home safely, but we damn well hadn't forgot. I was shipped to Europe in the spring of 1945, just as Roosevelt died. The war clearly was nearly over in Europe. The troop train that led from Le Havre over to Verviers, Belgium, moved at night, and along the way it was an eerie sight. We would come into small, poorly lit railroad stations on the French railway line, on the line going from Le Havre over into Belgium. And what did we see? Cars full of people who had finally made it out of concentration camps, by the hundreds. Their striped uniforms, many of them looking emaciated, grabbing up and gobbling on the spot cheese and bread and wine brought to them in the station by local people as these trains brought back the, the surviving prisoners, the surviving ones. I never saw the camps. I didn't want to, but we, people knew about them, and I saw with my own eyes what the residue was. The camps gobbled up millions. These were the lucky ones who got home. And so when I went into graduate work, attracted by Ken Thompson into the field of international politics, then the layer added by Strauss was pretty much where I then stabilized, doing work in both parts of the discipline. But to my mind, they overlapped. There wasn't a particular distinction between them. And I won't speak for Burns and Storing and so on, but they all had that sense of digging for roots. And digging for roots meant, to your surprise, things coming to light which you hadn't expected. I mean, for example, Herbert Storing's very fine work in bringing to light the anti-federalist papers that go along with the federalist papers, restoring a sense of dialogue, dialectical treatment, which otherwise had been absent. The good guys won, right? We won't talk about, well, they're not bad guys anyhow, it turns out. They're other guys. They had some reservations, to say the least, about the size of the confederation, about the ways in which it would trample on local rights and so on. Look at the problem exactly today. You had mentioned when we were out for lunch how Strauss treated you and the other veterans with a real humanity. Yes. Do you want to say something about that? I think he was childless, but he had a beautiful adopted daughter, Jenny, who considered him her father, had a son. He had no children of his own, but he couldn't help but be aware of the terribleness that had happened to so many German families, for one thing. Secondly, he knew he was at one of the great universities now, and that he was getting a crop of students who were really gung-ho to go forward. And because the problem of the regime was all about what happened in Germany, the question is, what was in store in the United States, possibly down the road sometime? The need somehow to build barriers against that. How much of that was explicit and conscious at the time, I don't pretend to know. But I greatly admired it as it came out, the learner volumes, the story materials, because it was such a rich feast, a feast. If you want to see something about the objection to the federal power of taxation, not only read the Federalist Papers in the Constitution, and the early laws, but read the Anti-Federalists. Why did they so object to some provisions of the Constitution? And to bring that back to the surface was to do a job of civic responsibility carried out. So one of the things that Strauss imparted to his students was the need to, to understand the best grounds on which the American regime could be defended. That's right. And to lay bare what the original arguments for that regime were. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Regime... The word regime, which is a French word, means regimen, meaning organization, meaning the dialogue called the Republic is called a polité in the Greek, and that means something like the political ordering. We have a regime which is called a constitutional republican democracy. It's republican because 
It has all of the classic features of a republic, namely not direct democracy, but voting for and being ruled by those who are representatives. I had lunch a while back with some friends, and they asked me if I was a Republican. I said, in effect, I'm a small-r Republican. I'm officially registered as a neutral, but I have voted for Republican candidates in recent times. But the Republicanism, as a representative system, was at the root of the groundswell of madness in the 60s. Direct democracy was the cry. I escaped from Berkeley just about the time it was breaking forth as a cancer there, only to have it transported to my campus here, rampaging on the campus, destroying property, tearing up libraries, all of it on the grounds that the war in Vietnam is unconstitutional or something, that it was a bad war, I grant you, it was a terrible war. But the insurrection that was taking place, I was proud to, to accept an invitation to become a member of a reviewing committee, which was specially appointed by the acting president, to give hearings to those students who were picked up on campus for violating laws. And I felt a responsibility as a faculty member and a citizen to try to engage in even-handed justice for those who were incurring the threat of being prosecuted. I was not liked for it by some of the faculty. There was a group of faculty called the 30. <laughs> the 30. Yes, and they were in violation of the law in the sense that they were being paid by citizens who work in garages downtown to teach students at the university, and they were on strike with the students on the grounds that they were all for the students. I never missed a class. Chatting went on outside my classrooms. It happened by God, the most providential thing, come to think of it, when the worst of that madness was going on on campus, we were reading Burke on the French Revolution. These students could peer out the window and see what was happening. It was a remarkable coincidence. I hadn't planned it that way, but they saw the destructiveness of this kind of rampage. And the claim that we want direct democracy was, uh, what, almost childish. In a country of 200 million people, what are we going to do, take a poll by telegraph sites or something? Just a practical notion. But above all, the failure of American college and university education to to teach these students about the American regime, which is a republic, not a direct democracy. And it doesn't want to be, it shouldn't be. So I think Sigliano and Burns and others who worked in that area of political science were profoundly aware of that and the need to challenge the way of the attempts to overturn it. Did you have Sigliano on your list no. ever? No. He's a very good man. He's now retired from Boston College, lives up in Maine. I see. Do you think Strauss, I mean, he came to City College as an emigre, spent most of his life in continental Europe, he'd spent a few years in England. Do you think he learned anything from his experience of the United States that he didn't already know from his study of philosophy, history, literature? Was That's hard to say. That's hard to say because I don't know his inner working of his mm -hmm. mind. But I think what he learned, direct first-hand experience, was the... What? The liveliness of America, the quickness, the adaptability in wartime, for example, the eagerness to get ahead, the pride in home and family, which he saw firsthand for the first time. And he became, I think I mentioned earlier the episode where he told the guy who come to take him to the lecture at Cornell, when I'm watching Gunsmoke, I'll be there by and by. He had that sense of the American, what we call general culture, I guess, he had a sense of being very aware of it and very curious about it. He liked Bob Hope, for example. He liked that kind of joke. And frankly, his remarkable ability to learn American slang and so on was, I thought, remarkable. English is not an easy language. And to have piled English of that kind on top of more formal English, let alone all of the other languages he read, was something. But he would read the Sun-Times in Chicago Students would talk to him about this or that political issue. Faulkner reports that one time he, Faulkner, made some denigrating remark about FDR, and Strauss sort of cautioned him and said, don't do that because Roosevelt helped protect Western civilization by eventually bringing America into the war. So he had that kind of sense of nuts and bolts political things, which he viewed with a sort of curious and investigating eye. But because of his 
what I've called is, gladly do I teach, gladly do I learn. He learned about America in direct ways, including some of its foolishness, which he was never taken in by. But on the other hand, he was sheltered, too. He had students who took him places if they need go go to them and so on. And so he didn't lead the rugged life that some immigrants had to do. I don't know about his background in New York, how he lived there. But finally, once he was settled in Chicago in a house, apartment not far from the Midway, he was quite content. He watched the television, he read the newspapers. He was no ivory tower guy. You've spent a lot of time thinking about international relations. Your first book, on Lock, Lock on War, and War peace. and Peace. <laughs> did, in the courses you took with Strauss, did any teaching about international relations come through? He never ta- Obviously, he never taught international relations as a subject. And so it would only be something that would come through along the way oh, to sure. talking about Machia- the office Machia- he was interested Machia- in. Machiavelli on war, absolutely. This would be prime territory for him. It just happens to be in the third book that I did my best essay that I wrote for him, namely on that third book, which is about foreign relations. So he didn't see these boundaries the way people do, partly from his own experience, but partly from reflection. Namely, the protection of the regime is the first law. When the chips are down, in other words, to protect the regime, you have to do some things you otherwise wouldn't do. Take the Civil War. Suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. It's still argued about. But Lincoln thought it absolutely indispensable because without it, he was going to be overcome by amounted to insurrectional activity, which couldn't otherwise be checked. Warfare took primacy at that point. Not to say that he didn't realize he was acting, quote, unconstitutionally in a very limited sense, but that he dared risk it because he saw what the danger was. And so Strauss saw that sort of thing with very great admiration. The very fact that Lincoln put his very existence virtually on the line and had a reasoned argument for doing so and the incredible tenacity with which he did it. How he came to have such an appreciation so early for Lincoln, I just don't know. I never talked to him in detail about it. But it was clear that the two men he held out to all of us, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill. Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. And he was clearly the inspiration for Harry for his great book called The Crisis of the House Divided, which is still one of the best books ever written about the coming of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. A wonderful book. If you were to try to summarize, and this is perhaps not a fair question, (laughs) but if you were to try to summarize If Strauss had a teaching on international relations or understanding of international relations based on your experience with him, what would that be? The inevitable or nearly inevitable formulation of a policy which centers upon the need for sovereignty. That is, the protection of the political society is the first law of nature taken from the the most necessitous level. Without that protection, the internal regime will collapse or be destroyed. So in that sense, my book took up the following question. Hobbes writes with very great clarity about the supremacy of war in forming the regime. Locke seems to be much more, what, reticent or different. At the beginning of my book, I quote some learned experts about these matters. And without a question, they all say, Locke is very different. Locke is very different. I wanted to find out. One of the great things that happened was, as I had hoped would happen, I found materials, particularly at the Bodleian Library, where the greatest amount of material is, but also in the London British Museum, I found material which, to any sensible person, showed very clearly Locke's own rhetorical strategy. One of the short notes I have somewhere in my book is a note. He did commonplace books. Commonplace meaning he would write passages from books he was studying. And one of the entries I found, which I nearly cheered out loud when I saw was, he said something like, therefore, in these circumstances where you have to protect yourself and protect the regime, you have to be oblique. You have to be reticent, reserved. Uh It fit perfectly with the underlying argument that I was making. But what it didn't do was to convince some people who felt that I was somehow defaming Locke, defaming him. Why, he's an honest man. He couldn't possibly keep things in reserve. What I finally did, for example, was to work out an analysis of the chapter on property. It's the most valuable part of my book. It's never been refuted. Sniped at, but never been refuted. 
What I did was to see the structure of that chapter and to see the way in which the Christian teaching, the biblical teaching according to God's providence, caring for us and so on, starts to be undermined because within the structure of the chapter on property, he gradually removes the support for that biblical principle and replaces it with one which is a Hobbesian one, state of nature, state of nature. The natural materials of the world are almost worthless, almost worthless for the sustaining of life. And one dramatic pairing of the kind that I eventually formulated is about seeing. One of the things that Parkinson's has involved me in is double vision. Mm -hmm. I can no longer drive and do other things because of double vision. In Aristotle, in the Metaphysics, he opens by saying, all men by nature desire to know. And one of the indications of that is our desire to see things, look, see things. We're curious about them. We want to know what they're like. In a footnote that I put in the book, maybe it's in the text, Locke writes, the eyes are the great watchman of our safety. The complete turning upside down of the Aristotelian position. Aristotle is no fool. He knows perfectly well that the eyes in combat are vital to you but it cuts it off from the ascent to the level of wanting to know for the sake of knowing. So when Strauss began to make arguments, as he did, about the low but common denominator, he knew what he was doing, namely resorting to that first passion, which is the absolute terrified fear of self-destruction, or of being destroyed, rather. So to the extent that Strauss would be considered a supporter of the view that sovereign states are indispensable, I think that that's uh, quite right. He at times made remarks, come to think of it, about the poor quality of that thinking which seeks to organize the whole world under one political regime. The fear of tyranny was always present in him. He saw it. He saw it. Mm -hmm. He fled it. He had no illusions about what could happen. And related to that is a theme which he found in Churchill, by the way, namely great caution to the point of fearfulness about the advent of increasing technology, atom bombs, now drones, and so on. So Jeremy Radkin said about my book one time, because he teaches international law, he said it's a great book because it does exactly what is needed, namely to clarify the way in which the Lockean formulation about political society is hard-headed. So Jeremy has written various things about the attempts to, for example, invade the province of legal activity in the United States by the International Court of Justice and so on. He seeks to protect against that. He has in mind, in part, works like mine. I know that from having talked to him. Strauss never wrote anything extended that I'm aware of about these matters, but you can piece it together readily enough from some of the things he'll say about the Republic and so on, where the image of the noble dogs, guardians, the fulakes. That book, by the way, is the most... I sometimes think if I were to have to go into exile someplace, I could take only three or four books. I would take the Republic, the Bible, and Shakespeare's works, and that would be enough. Maybe Thucydides, too. But the Bible, or the Republic, and Shakespeare's works would be quite sufficient. And you'll search in vain for any deference to the notion of world community in Shakespeare. It's a, to put it crudely, it's a soft-headed view, soft-headed. E.B. White of The New Yorker was all for it. E.B. White wrote gracefully, but he didn't know what he was thinking about, to be so inclined to subordinate the relative freedom of the American regime to a regime God knows of what kind. Some of that is, some would say about that, that's Machiavellian. Well, I'm afraid that Machiavelli knew some things quite well. If you read Strauss's book on Machiavelli, you'll find them. It's a book of unbelievable thoughtfulness, unbelievable attention to the text. When I was about to do a dissertation, we conferred a little bit, and he thought, maybe you should do it on Machiavelli, but then it's a jungle. He didn't think I was yet up to it, and I agreed with him. So I took on the job of doing the lock, which was more accessible to me, not least because it was in English, and it wasn't as complicated and difficult. So in that sense, he always, to my mind, gave sound practical advice. Your Italian is not very good. You do French well, but that's not enough. You've got to be able to cope with the intricacies of these structures. And this was just before he was bringing the book on Machiavelli into shape. Did you consult with him? This was about what the subject of your dissertation would be. 
Did you consult with him when you were writing? Not very much. He was on your dissertation committee? He was on the dissertation committee, but he was also in Jerusalem part of that time. Mm -hmm. Did he comment on your dissertation when you were done? I don't recall that he did, because the committee which sat for the final exam included a man from the history department named, strangely enough, Locke, sitting in, I think, for Strauss. Just a convenient thing to have somebody from outside the department, I guess. Mm -hmm. But no, he did not participate in that because he was in Israel, or mm -hmm. I think in Israel. Michael Zucker did tell me some time back, I think, he was working on the transcript of the Locke seminar that Strauss once did. That's right. That's and right. he said something about my dissertation, I guess, or about the book that came out of it, saying something complimentary about it, I think. I've not seen it. He was a tough teacher in the sense that he had rigorous high standards, but he was very generous with his time in helping you. Because I was working far away in England at the time, I had to do what I could, and I did. But then I realized when the manuscript was accepted by Oxford, I quailed, and I had to completely rewrite it, which is the form it now takes. Great experience to do that kind of research on a great figure. I think so. Does Strauss, Tarkov, by the way, has written very good stuff on Locke. Does Strauss's teaching, did he have a project in teaching? Was he trying to accomplish something in particular? Yeah, to bring back to a limited number of people the activity of thoughtfully reading the best books. As simple as that, in a way. What are the best books? God knows Plato's Republic, by all accounts, is one of them. Now we can take off another list. Herodotus's history, Thucydides' history. Hegel, yes. Kant, yes. Locke, Hobbes, yes. But you don't go very far in their hands and feet before you begin to run out of candidates. And that was the sense he conveyed. One of the most puzzling aspects of what he did do was what he didn't do. He didn't forthrightly treat Heidegger. Right. And that's the man in the background. The title of his book called Natural Right and History seems to be an echo of the title of Heidegger's most well-known book, Being and Time. I'm sure that's deliberate. A repost in the form of a dialectical treatment of problems of natural right. But I never conferred with him directly about that. Some of the other students, I think, over time did, and they have written about Heidegger. I don't know German, so I couldn't attempt that. I was spoiled by the facility I had in French. I studied French in college. I knew it very well. When I went to France, I learned to speak it. So at that time, Chicago had only one foreign language for the PhD. So one day I tripped over to the room and took this French exam, and that was it. I didn't have to exert myself to learn German, which I should have been required to do, but I didn't. But he has students like Gillespie who have written about them. Is he on that list, Michael Gillespie? He never studied with Strauss. Oh, that's right, he didn't. Did you consider Strauss a friend? Not really. He was more reserved and aloof than that. I was very young, a kid really. He was a middle-aged man who'd suffered terribly from the political ravages of the war and having to decamp. And I think that the people who became more truly friendly with him were some of the students like Lawrence Burns. When I last saw Burns before he died in Annapolis, he told me that when Strauss was hospitalized, I think, for the heart attack, Strauss became more, not, not chummy exactly, but more, more just open about addressing him as Larry, which he rarely did with students. I was always Mr. Cox, he was Mr. Strauss, he was Mr. Sigliano, Mr. Storing, that's the way it was. I think he despised being called doctor or professor because that was too elitist. He was in a modern Republican democracy, and we don't have that stuff. <laughs> but no, he was not friendly the way Ken Thompson was, for example. But that's a very different relationship. He wasn't friendly, certainly in the way in which Herman Pritchard became friendly, chairman of the department. But that was, it was not in my mind a defect, it was simply what he preferred and what he felt justified in doing. He wasn't palsy with students at all, not that I have ever observed. He was dignified throughout and, and liked joking with them and so on, but it wasn't on the basis of the kind of familiarity which some academics have fostered in later times, namely, we're kids together or something. He found that distasteful, I would think. He was a man of the old school in that regard. You don't easily call people by their first names. Summing up, how do you think of Strauss today, looking back? Beacon of light, leading the way out of darkness 
The darkness was in part personal, partly shaped by the rigor and intensity of the Lutheran form of Christianity, also darkness in the sense of what in the world are we doing in this world? Why do we do what we do in the way of treating human beings in certain ways? What is the good of making war? My oldest brother was a Marine in World War II, served in the South Pacific in terrible combat conditions. He was not a ground combat man, but he did aircraft electronics. My brother Fred was a year and a half in the South Pacific, came back, served out his time, and so on. But how much Strauss knew about our families, I don't really know. I never talked to him directly about mine, maybe a very little bit. But he was warm toward me. He once said at a certain time in the years I was there, he said, you and Sturing are among my best students, which I took as a very considerable compliment and tried to live up to it as best I could. Under no illusion that I would ever be anything like him, the reach of his mind, the extraordinary learning he possessed, it was a sobering thing to be confronted with a man of that stature and learn from him without presuming for one moment to be like him. And he was aware of that on his side. He knew perfectly well that most of his students were of reasonable intelligence, but not with the great learning that ever would come to them. He was of the German mold of the best kind, which was sabotaged and destroyed by the Nazis. And I guess this guy Heinrich Meyer is now seeking somehow to resuscitate some of it, some of the dignity of academic research in matters of politics, philosophy, law, and so on. Well, I think he simply wants to help promote the serious study of Strauss and serious thought generally. He's written very interestingly about Rousseau, for instance, Heinrich Meyer has. Yes. So looking back, you see Strauss, Leo Strauss, as a beacon of light. That's right. Gladly would he learn and gladly would he teach. His classes were just wonderful to go to. They were tough. You had to really concentrate and work. Mm -hmm. Read ahead of time. Be careful. But because they, so to speak, the doors were always kept opening. New compartments concealed initially from view. What is he doing here now? I mean, for example, I learned from him about Machiavelli, about the need to look at the ways in which Machiavelli knew perfectly well not only the Christian but the classical understandings of certain principles. In an essay I did on Aristotle and Machiavelli on liberality, I put that to good use, where I addressed the chapter which lists the good things and the bad things, and saw how intricately it was connected to, among other things, the Aristotelian treatment of the virtues in the Nicomachean ethics. This is the kind of thing he quote, taught me, but he taught me only in the remote sense that he taught me how to go. Then it was my job to do it, and I did it as well as I could. It's still one of the best things I think I've written, that along with the essay on Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. By the way, I learned recently by Googling something that some publishing company has swiped that essay of mine without paying me. There are a couple of websites now that get around copyright laws. I'm sure they do. Those are all my questions for today. I don't want to wear you out, and I think we've covered a lot of ground. I have, I think. It's been a pleasure to do it because my regard for Strauss remains very strong. He helped me get out. My life as a child and adolescence and so on was a nightmare. Father barely getting to work, finally, in a machine shop, dangerous, dirty work. Kids having scarlet fever, being quarantined. Neighbors who were drunk vomiting on the house. Barely any food to keep going. Strauss helped ensure that I stayed out by helping me to get enough education to get a teaching job, which I loved doing. I had a very, very good life still have. If you can get up and go to the art gallery and have lunch, you're in good shape. <laughs> and you saw how attractive it is, apart from the paintings inside, I mean. <laughs> but that's another story. We hope this will be valuable. I think that for those people who are seriously interested in... Well, I think that for those people who are coming to Strauss from just from nowhere, just have no yeah. knowledge of him, I think that hearing about the personal contact with them and what role he played in right. people's understanding, I think that would be very helpful to, to, to a more serious consideration of him. For those who are seriously interested in him, they're going to study his books. They're not going to spend a long time listening to things like our conversation. Of course. But there are better things to do, like read 
Aristophanes. Yeah, but there is matter here for thinking about what the philosophical life is, that if you have a dozen conversations of people who were profoundly influenced by him, each one gives you a little fragment That's of, right. from their perspective, what they experienced, how they understood him, and each of those you could see as a way to begin thinking about what it means to be a philosopher in 20th century America. That's right. It's like the old story about people studying the elephant. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Parts this one, I've got the trunk. That's not a bad metaphor, in fact, because some of the nasty criticism of Strauss is really rooted in almost, what, criminal neglect to read carefully. Just stupid sort of stuff. And all the more reason to protect his image of a philosophically minded man who, drawing in part on the great tradition of these great books, but drawing on the terrible experience of what World War II meant, has served up a, what, a menu of wonderful things to read and think about, including books like The Republic, mm -hmm. books yeah. like Locke's Second Treatise of Government. Not a huge number of such books, mm -hmm. which would be a very fine foundation. Aristotle's Politics. If you did The Republic, Locke's Two Treatises, and maybe Machiavelli and so on, half a dozen books you'd have all you could do to take a good big dip into the pool of understanding. I was lucky in that I landed there just as he was taking off in the Chicago part of his career. This is Stephen Gregory. I'm sitting with Werner Danhauser, visiting him just outside Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Hello, Werner. Thanks for having me. Hello, Steve. Nice to see you. You studied with Leo Strauss soon after he came to the University of Chicago. Is that right? I don't know when he came to Chicago. <laughs> 1949. 1949. No, I didn't arrive in Chicago till 55 or 56. Oh, a long time. <laughs> yeah. So did you come to Chicago to study with Strauss? Did you know about him before you came? Well, first of all, I knew where I was raised in Cleveland, especially young Jewish intellectuals. We all look to Chicago rather than Harvard or Columbia or Yale. And I'd applied there three times already and... I was admitted each time, but no fellowships. So I went to other worthy schools. But in the meantime, I heard of Strauss. Well, first I heard of Hutchins, and then I heard of Strauss. And then I was in Europe on a Fulbright, and I decided to give Chicago one more chance. <laughs> and I got a very lavish fellowship to the Committee on Social Thought, which was where I wanted to go, because you could study with Strauss and evade a lot of requirements that way. <laughs> so you came to the committee in 1955? I think it's 56, 56. now. 56, okay. And what was your first experience with Strauss? I came from the New School indirectly. There was a Wednesday night, I believe it was called the Graduate Seminar, and he came there already from Chicago, and he lectured on Thucydides, whom I had not read on at that time. I didn't think he was an unusually excellent lecturer, but then he was questioned by the graduate faculty, and I was amazed both at his friendliness and the fact that I thought he was the most alert mind and that he knew more about Thucydides than anyone in the world, <laughs> though I had never read him. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard Strauss lecture on Thucydides, and then soon after you came to the committee. 
after I came to the committee recommended by Howard White of the New School. Right. And I went to his office, and Howard had written him about me, and he said, hoped I liked it, and if I only took one course, I should come to his Hobbes seminar, whom I also had not read. <laughs> but that's the one I signed up for. So you had a letter of introduction from Howard White, and you went to Strauss's office and met with him. Yeah. And how was he in your first meeting? He was perfectly cordial and sweet. And he was very busy because it was registration week. But he gave a, an unhurried air and the atmosphere of someone who enjoyed being a teacher. And how was the Hobbes course? I hate to be, uh, you know, platitudinous. <laughs> it was an eye-opener. I had I know nothing about Hobbes, except that he was, you know, the wicked lock. <laughs> and he just sort of started by, you know, it's a good question why we're reading uh, Hobbes. And then he led into it. And I'll first describe what the requirements were. You had to write a seven-page paper because long experience had taught him that that's what 20 minutes took. <laughs> and I was amazed at how light the requirements were. That was, if I remember correctly, didn't even have to hand in the things. And uh, the paper, they just criticized you afterwards. You, you didn't turn the paper in, you gave it in class. You gave it in class. And then he, he commented on the paper and commented on... Each paper was on a certain section of the text. And in a few of his courses, but I don't think in this one there was a final, but it was always a very routine question. Like, what are the main themes of the Leviathan? <laughs> <laughs> and then that was it. And you could say what you wanted to. What kind of feedback did he give when you gave your paper in class or others did? He had not had a chance to read the paper beforehand. No. I just said uh, certain things, like I was wrong in my discussion of sin, which played a role, but otherwise it was, I believe, to use the word alert. And afterwards, as he saw me leave, he smiled and said, Howard White was right about you. I was in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Did he often compliment students? No, they would have lost a value. <laughs> no, he was uh, never mean. The meanest thing in my many years that I have ever heard him say was, we will now turn to a coherent discussion of the text. <laughs> but otherwise, sometimes he would just say something like, thank you very much. I must boast once more, then hit me. I really came to my own the second quarter, which was Thucydides, and I gave the paper, and he didn't say anything for a while, but made one of his elaborate and unintelligible charts on the wall, and he suddenly turned around and said, by the way, that was excellent, so I was in heaven again. How many courses did you end up taking or sitting in on with him? How long did you have a chance to uh, attend his courses? A long time. I belonged to the generation when it was considered bad manners to do your PhD quickly, so I took 20 years. <laughs> but the courses by him were something you just dropped in on long after nobody bothered about the credits or anything. You just wanted to learn something or to hear what the course was about. And how was Strauss as a teacher? What stood out to you about him as a teacher? One of the things that came to mind immediately is, mm -hmm. like uh, many of uh, my friends who also studied with him, have also noticed this, uh, how different he was as a teacher than we ourselves became. Like others and me, we were certainly not averse to using histrionic effects, raising our voices and getting angry and... Uh, sort of sparring a bit maliciously with our students. But he was much more quiet and gentle, and he just managed to convey the worth and the love of what we were doing. 
and he was, uh, again to repeat, he was kind, by which I mean I, I wouldn't call him loving, and he was rather formal with students. And he never called any of us by our first names, that would have been unthinkable, except in the case of Larry Burns. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the story behind that. And, but he also seemed uh, genuinely interested. And he was very popular. And also, you came to him for something, and he was unhurried, like usually with an academic question. And he'd say, you know, smiling, you have your nerve asking me about that. I last read it 40 years ago. So you'll be um, at the mercy of my bad memory in something. And then he would sort of effortlessly say the most astonishing things about it. And that's it. I've heard that through the 50s, at least, that he really poured himself into his teaching. That His classes would often go long over time, and he would take questions until people no longer had questions to ask. That's right, yes, I have that. And I have even seen him as, I'm sure others have, when the only reason he left is Mrs. Strauss came to fetch him. I mean, he would give you a fair warning, and he said, well, class is now over, but if anyone has any questions, shoot. And that was it. Why do you think he was pouring so much energy into his teaching? You know, these, these uh, sessions apparently last three or four hours sometimes. Yes, they do. Well, I... <laughs> This is in no way, this is a terribly reductionist, <laughs> but uh, the atmosphere in Convergence, he was having a good time, and that he really, it made him happy, and that made us happy. There was a lot of joking and a lot of laughter in his class, and he was quite respectful of students. Mm -hmm. I remember to go back to the Hobbes course, where it took me a long time to I used to be retiring and quiet, you know, to ask a question, because, you know, you're never sure it's not a stupid question. But to my amazement, he said, that's a very difficult point you raise. And then he had a habit that was like super involvement. He would suddenly be in front of your desk having walked up and address you personally. And as usual, I froze, and after 15, I don't know, five minutes, I no longer knew quite what he was talking about. But I was hugely impressed. And this is for the first time, you know, sort of things opened up. But then at the end, he said, that's not quite a correct answer, but it'll have to do. And it wasn't fake modesty, it was him judging himself. Did you have the sense when you attended his class that he was paying attention to the individual students and understood what their own dispositions were towards what he was teaching? That if a student asked a question, that he was responding not in a kind of formulaic way, but to what that particular student was really getting at? Yes, I mean, I call it rapport. He was never at all, you know, Many teachers, including me probably, you get a feeling this is pretentious or this is a showpiece stick or something. You know, it was always addressed to you and your questions. How do you think he saw his role as a teacher? I think he had the students of so many persuasions or shades of the finger or something. Mm -hmm. He just wanted you to... Well, I think, I guess, deep down, he really wanted you to learn how to read. And that meant to be, I think, I hope, deeply involved with a book. And sort of try to sit inside of it. You know, as Joe Cropsey used to say, you don't learn about these books, you learn from them. Mm -hmm. And that impressed me. I think, but he certainly, I mean, I think he was open to a wide variety of choices by his students. It was observed at the Strauss Center's conference last weekend that he thought it was good to start students with Aristotle's politics or Aristotle's ethics, but he, he taught the politics most frequently. 
this is an unfair question, but why do you think he preferred to start with and keep returning to the politics? I give it a very simplistic. I think he really liked that, though. Mm -hmm. That was an odd choice. And you'll notice I started with Hobbes' Leviathan. But he really liked the book, but what made it odd and puzzling, in a way of forbidding text, mm -hmm. not a page of it reads like a novel, and then there's all the problems of uh, are the pieces really in the right order, and so forth, and some of it is very dry. But he rammed it on to us. <laughs> Though now that you ask me this question, if I had been him, or if he had asked me what to mm -hmm. start with, I would counsel him <laughs> to say the ethics, because by them no way unique with me. I think the ethics you took to very quickly, especially with his gentle guidance. Lots of book we really learned to love much more quickly than the politics. In a letter to Klein in 1949, I'm not sure if this is after his appointment or after he knew of his appointment to Chicago, he complained to Klein that, that he needed to give students a political teaching. and uh, He needed what? He needed to give students a political teaching, that students wanted a political teaching, so he had to come up with one. Did you have the sense that there was a teaching in his courses? No. I think if I uh, got time for an anecdote about another Strauss in. We have lots of time. <laughs> they have two days ago, I talked to Arthur Melzer, who is uh, now, after many years, close to finishing a book on esotericism in mm -hmm. Strauss. And he said he was dealing with the issue of whether Strauss had a political teaching. And Arthur has taught everything under the sun at Michigan State. He was impressed that he, Strauss, was far less political than he, Arthur. That he never, or very rarely, addressed himself to a today's political, you know, current political thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's correct. Or as we used to say, you know, and Landers is quoted ten times as often as Plato. <laughs> <laughs> that is a striking thing about his courses when you look at the transcripts, the number of times that he refers to not big political figures, but simply figures who were in the news. Grace Kelly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, other, I don't. I doubt she appears more than once, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that seemed to be an important part of his teaching, just the way he taught, I mean, hmm. to bring up the things that were happening on a daily basis. Yeah. Do you think he had any particular hopes for his teaching students? I think he did develop them. He didn't say something hugely self-serving. I think he was very lucky in his students, and he kept liking us. And it gave him satisfaction. You know, not everyone, certainly. I could mention some scoundrels that will <laughs> seal my lips. But uh, that they turned out well. Or at least, you know, that what they learned somehow made them fuller and happier. So if he had an end in view, it was simply having students who became, who were able to study political philosophy and a in a serious way and, and became, as you say, fuller and happier for doing so. Yeah. And a completely non-doctrinaire. I mean, I used to say as a doctoral student, I had several crises, but the early ones were all... I thought Nietzsche was right <laughs> at the beginning, and he seemed slightly bored, by the way, you know, what this has, you know, like... Well, what else would you think at your stage? No? <laughs> and, you know, the question, was Nietzsche right, was certainly a necessary question to deal with. And with Nietzsche, that can be very painful, unless you like fascists. <laughs> <laughs> he taught Nietzsche at Chicago perhaps three or four times. There were two courses on Nietzsche, and then he included Nietzsche in reading lists one or two other times. Uh, of course, as a young man, Strauss was, like you, very interested in Nietzsche. 
in his teaching, did Nietzsche come up as a particular alternative that he felt students had to meet and address? I'd like to think so. <laughs> I don't really. I mean, I think they're just, for thinking of the way I think he thinks, they're, you know, to plagiarize from Montaigne. There are a lot of different roads to the same end. I think, I certainly think that, you know, some of the functions would be fulfilled by Marx if you were deep in the 19th century and had some feelings or had read some of the novels of Balzac or Stendhal or practically everything else. That there's something, or oh, Flaubert, seedy about the bourgeoisie. And that's a prejudice that Strauss never himself seemed to entertain. Yeah, though I think, in, uh, you know, ultimately I think his uh, hero was Goethe, as far as the modern's concerned. You know. Goethe certainly knew everything that was wrong with the bourgeoisie. That's why so many wild women in the text and so on. But he gave things due. And the road, that's an interesting question. It works both ways historically. I think Goethe is, in a way, puts Nietzsche to shame. But in the, in the same, in the other direction, I think Nietzsche is a very powerful critic of Goethe. He never understood the Greeks. He never understood, well, as in Greek tragedies, too. There were several students of Strauss who were registered with the Committee on Social Thought. Did you see any difference between the social thought students who were studying with Strauss and the political science students? No. I consider that to our credit as students. That simply didn't matter. I mean, now that I think back of it, there were majors in Chinese or in Jewish studies or all sorts of things. I don't think we pay too much attention to them. Now that I'm very old, sometimes a question comes up and I simply don't remember whether so-and-so studied political science or on the committee. Though I, I suspect that there was more snootiness on the committee. Were there any institutional obstacles to your studying with Strauss since you were not in the political science department? No. Yeah. It would have been uh, the other way because the man who um, subsidized me, who controlled the fellowships, I guess, mm. was Hayek. Hayek certainly knew that there was nothing, so to speak, in common between him and Strauss. As far as I know, they didn't really know each other very well. But Hayek was very, uh, you know, old-fashioned Austrian courtly, and it didn't matter to him at all that I was plainly on the committee known as a Strauss student, and none of the others. I mean, the people today have been asked again and again, sir, how could you be both Green student and Strauss's student? But it just wasn't a problem even though we all knew that Green had called Strauss a lunatic in the Tribune. Right. Well, didn't Green look upon Strauss as a close friend for some time? Was they that... were friendly. I think yeah. uh, they liked each other, though. Yeah. You know, Straussianism can have excesses. That's so why I took a course with Green that he taught at the downtown center. It was on some Shakespeare plays. And Green was excellent at teaching Shakespeare. But then I got, uh, you know, I had survived his dislike of me for some, and uh, I'd gotten enough nerve. So there was, so I raised my hand at something and found myself, I can't even remember the play, giving a very elaborate and practically wrong, I think, a definitely Straussian reading of a certain section. And he looked bemused. And then he said, Werner, 
do you really believe all that nonsense? <laughs> that was a very, that was a great name. Well, I had wits enough to say, not when you put it like that. <laughs> was Strauss on your dissertation committee? Yes, he was. Did he give you feedback on the dissertation? Well, he did something better than that. He <laughs> read it very, very promptly. Yes. And wrote me back a very nice letter saying it was good. He had the following, I don't know, maybe half a dozen suggestions. And then came the saving in. These are all trivial. <laughs> Dispose of them as you wish. So that's what I call an ideal dissertation reader. Prompt with detailed feedback that he gives you permission to ignore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And is that how you supervise dissertations? Uh -huh. No, I, I didn't live up to it. Uh, Strauss was an emigre. How did he view his American students as Americans? What did he think of his American students compared to the European students he might have had if he'd been able to, to remain in Germany? Well, I think he liked American students. I think he really liked America, though it's a moot point. He may have liked England slightly better because my memory of the letters is that when he first came to England, he sort of fell in love with the English. Now, that may have something to do with this was uh, early Hitler times, and Britain was like the last remaining hope. I don't think he ever fell in love with America, but he appreciated it. What did he appreciate in the American qualities of his students, if anything? I think their their good naturedness. I would just simply, I think that American students are less sour than most students of most countries, or sweet, if you want to use an, an imprecise word. Is there such a thing as a Straussian? Yes. What is it? Well, you're looking at one. Okay. <laughs> what is a Straussian? As someone who is moving in the direction of thinking that. Leo Strauss was right that his way of looking at things is better than any other teacher that's around. During his lifetime, he had the chance to observe that there were people who called themselves Straussians and who were called Straussians by others. There were famous controversies about Straussians while he was still alive. Do you think he was pleased to see that there were people called Straussians or indifferent or... No, I think he was pleased. I'm filled with a warm memory that he really liked us. And with us, there is a kind of inner circle. We're the ones who, when we're called Straussians, we like it, or it's like a badge of honor. And others don't. But I remember, you know, when we used to gossip, a very important virtue, I don't think anyone felt embarrassed in front of him to call himself a Straussian. Mm -hmm. It was just a term with a with pretty fair identification record. In addition to his teaching at the University of Chicago, Strauss gave a remarkable series of lectures at Hillel House on Jewish topics. Did his being a Jew feature into his teaching, the way that he taught, the outlook that he had? Oh, yes, indeed. but. I mean, <laughs> there may be a tribal sense when, like, a deeply committed to, I tend to think everyone I like is Jewish. <laughs> Secretly, somehow, in some mysterious way. But this is a complicated question, which is not always easy to explain. Mm -hmm. But here was a man who only very rarely went to synagogue. And he certainly, after a while, never uh, met Jewish ritual obligation or the Jewish dietary laws. But he was very, very deeply Jewish. And the Hillel House is there he conveyed it. I mean, he was a sort of not giving away any inner secret. Strauss was a, a stingy man. He had his faults, and uh, he was certainly not in love with giving lectures without a compensation. <laughs> he would rather have been paid, but of course he would do 
almost anything for Hillel, it seemed. One lecture, I think, by no means is best, you know, captured in the title, Why We Remain Jews. I just took that for granted. There, if I can just divert for a minute, I mean, since I'm Jewish myself, you wouldn't have guessed. There's a number of us he turned into better Jews by the simple route that he was in no way condescending to the Jewish tradition. I certainly came to the University of Chicago. I think those old books, they're antiquarian. But all you have to do, if ever were lucky enough, is listen to him on Maimonides. And there was simply not a bit of condescension or anything. And he took that very seriously. And he taught us to take it very seriously. Maybe we, that is, we Jews. Yeah. Maybe we never took St. Thomas seriously enough, it's mm -hmm. possible, or uh, Augustine. But we did learn the Jewish thing. And there was a, in addition, he was without condescension within Jews. I also happened to be a German Jew. German Jews for hundreds of years were very nasty toward Polish Jews and others, and were very contemptuous of Yiddish as a language. I mean, Hebrew was a language of the streets and everything. There was never any condescension by Strauss or by Sholem toward the Yiddish language, or Strauss was an admirer of Sholem Aleichem. Well, that's another one. German Jews would they'd rather deal with Kafka. It's remarkable that a few of his students went on to write about Jewish subjects, but uh, Strauss never taught Jewish subjects, apart from those several lectures he gave at Hillel House. Yeah. When you had a chance to speak to well, him, part I of that is you consider Spinoza's a Jew. So okay. <laughs> or not. Fair enough. Well, we saw that as a bad Jew. <laughs> <laughs> when you had a chance to speak to him out of class, was Jewish thought one of the things that would come up in your conversations with him? Oh, yes. But, uh, you know, some of it indirectly because we were both German refugees. So the German question and a Jewish question were always rubbing shoulders together. But in addition, one of the reasons Mrs. Strauss liked me, I think, not only because I'm so likable, <laughs> it's because like many German uh, Jews, she wanted to talk German to people, which is why in Israel, the German Jews, to a huge extent, kept talking German. There were whole cafes where you couldn't hear anything but German. And Mrs. Strauss would always break into uh, German when she got the least bit excited. And lo and behold, I've even had instances where Strauss, when he was talking fast, and knew somewhere that I was a kraut, would break into German for a while. He was also in Jewishness. He liked Israel. And for us, it gives me a warm feeling. One of the most impressive things I know is, was reading the riot act to the National Review in the letter defending Israel. You know, as we said, he practically threatened to cancel his free subscription. <laughs> in addition to not teaching Jewish authors, Strauss never taught Goethe, as far as I know, at least at the University of Chicago. That's as far as I know he didn't, yeah. yeah. Was Goethe something else that you learned from him about, but not in class? Yeah, not so much. I learned Mrs. Strauss had an amazing knowledge of German literature, especially poetry. She seemed to have read everything. So I learned a lot from her. Paid no tuition. <laughs> uh, but I don't know um, how reliable is the course count. For example, old Nathan only taught me later after somewhere I raised a Tocqueville question, mm -hmm. that Strauss never gave a course on Tocqueville. And of course, among his students, Tocqueville is a favorite subject. So I don't know what silence means exactly. Being a Straussian, of course, I think it means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> after you left Chicago, you kept in touch with Strauss? Yes. What kind of relations did he have with his former students? I mean, was he someone that you would correspond with, or...? Oh, yes, after I left. 
we corresponded irregularly. But then uh, whenever I was in Chicago or he was in New York, I mean, by no means just me, but we would touch base. So that, uh, you know, he came to lecture for commentary. And then there was an evening with him, that full of rambunctious argument. And when at long last I got back to my thesis, I was married with one child. I just needed to touch base with him. So we visited him to uh, in uh, St. John's in Annapolis. And he was uh, received very warmly, even though I don't think he really loved children a lot. And he got a little nervous when rambunctious Fania kept bumping into him. Did you think of Strauss as a friend in those days? No. I mean, because friendship always, uh, you know, and I know what Aristotle said to the contrary, <laughs> but friendship uh, implies equality, and I never thought of myself as his equal, or whatever. I always thought of him as my superior. What made Strauss different in that way from everyone else? I mean, that it may be that none of his students felt that they were his equal, and it may be that... I don't think that's true, by the way. All right. <laughs> Well, I'm not, you know, uh, gossip is so far beyond me. Um, but, but I know students well, who did think they were as evil. Well, I say it is not even malicious. Or, mm -hmm. Stanley Rosen came to mind immediately. What do you think made the difference between Strauss and others? They stood head and shoulders above most of the crowd. Now, yes. What do you think made the difference? What made Strauss different from everyone else? The first answer may sound moronic. I think he's just smarter. <laughs> I mean, it's just the most powerful mind I ever came close to. That's it. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything you'd like to bring up that we should discuss that we haven't touched on? No, you have emptied my cup. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever the right thing is. <laughs> okay. I think I've said everything that's <laughs> worth saying. How did you first come to know Leo Strauss? I heard of him from a great fellow named Herbert Garfinkel, who taught for a while at Dartmouth College. He said, if I wanted to study political theory, the place to go was Chicago. I then went off to Oxford for a couple of years on a Marshall Scholarship, but having read the Natural Right and History chapter on Hobbes, my original inclination was confirmed. And off I went to Chicago. The first semester, I had a seminar on Hegel, uh, with Strauss, I think it was on lectures on the philosophy of history. It wasn't until the second semester that I suddenly realized my ignorance under the influence of his teaching. And this would have been what year? It would have been the year 58, 59 mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. Chicago. Okay. And you studied at Chicago for? I left, if I recall properly, in 62, mm -hmm. the uh, spring of 62, and began teaching at Princeton that fall. What were your first impressions? Well, your first impression of Leo Strauss was the Hobbes chapter in Natural Right and History, but your first presentation of the man himself was in this Hegel class in the autumn of 1958? Yes. I'm sure I didn't impress him uh, on Hegel. In fact, I remember I read a paper that was probably 50% too long, and it was cut off at the proper time after 20 minutes. And I didn't, it wasn't until second semester that I had a really strong impression. And that's no doubt due to uh, me. But also Hegel is hard for a nice boy from upstate New York to enter into well, and uh, was a struggle for me. First impression. In the spring class, I remember him walking down the aisle uh, in a large, bowl-shaped room. And I remember the mixture of impishness and seriousness, mostly seriousness, as far as I saw. A small man, soft, without any pretension, but going about what appeared to be very serious work. That's the best I can do to start with. And you were in the political science department? Yes. And began work on a master's in 1959? 
Yes, I guess so. I don't remember exactly when, but sure. I must yeah. have been. Yes, I did a, a master's thesis. He gave me extremely good advice, which I ignored. The good advice was work on the classical Republicans, and that is the 17th century sect called classical Republicans. Zero Fink has written on them, and I looked into them later. And it would have been a very good topic for me, really a good topic for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. It was in English. My language skills are not terrific. And uh, would have taken me into this Machiavellian turn of Republican doctrine, which would have been very interesting. Instead, I, having worked on Locke and being very interested in a comparison with Richard Hooker, ended up writing a MA thesis on Hooker. But I did do that under him. And why do you think he made this particular recommendation to you? I think he thought it was an important topic, perhaps just coming into fashion in the English-speaking world. And I think he thought it probably was suitable for my abilities. I was not a scholar of Greek. I was very interested in his teaching, but I'll leave it at that. I think he thought it suitable for me, and I think it probably would have been. (laughs) Strauss typically taught his classes at Chicago by having a short passage of text read. He would comment on it. He would invite questions. This is what you experienced? Yes. Had you ever seen a class conducted that way before? No. (laughs) (laughs) It was a terrific relief. The one thing you leave out of your description is these wonderful summaries and putting the the book or the passage or the doctrine in context at the Mm -hmm. beginning of his classes. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes in the middle of the classes, suddenly there would be a wonderful sort of riff. But it wasn't an extraneous riff. It was a remark, a digested account. But still what you say is correct. No. uh, The teachers I had had at Oxford... Isaiah Berlin and others, uh, Plaminats, respectable people, but they lectured and wanted to give a kind of comprehensive account of their own. And they didn't exactly comment on the text. Strauss led one to see how penetrating the text was and how it went past the students' original impressions. That was maybe the greatest lesson. That he showed you the context the surface, and then took you beyond the surface. Correct. And you could say brought out often the radicalness of what to the inexperienced student might have appeared just another argument. But Mm -hmm. Strauss could bring out its significance. And that came from his deep experience of other teachings. And thus he could bring out the distinctiveness of this and the bite. That's what I had not had before, either as an undergraduate studying with historically oriented scholars or at Oxford. The scholars I've mentioned are historically oriented. Sort of, they thought they could give a complete account of the place of this thinker in in history. After doing your master's on Locke and Hooker, then you very quickly moved on to the stage of of writing a PhD. Quickly. I'm I'm delighted to hear that. (laughs) Judgment. Yes, I did, and, and directly did. And I had doubts about whether I was good enough to write in philosophy, frankly. And I was very impressed, as I think almost all of Strauss's students were, with the wonderful teacher Herbert Story. So while taking all of Strauss's classes, I nevertheless wrote in the field of, I guess you'd call it American jurisprudence, a uh, dissertation and eventually a book on Chief Justice Marshall. But I was not long into that when I saw that I needed something more searching than the constitutional lawyers. Or maybe I just couldn't remember all the cases well. But I think it's perhaps in this case even truer to say I was dissatisfied. Uh, Bluntly put, I would have to bring a lot to Marshall if I were studying a serious thinker or philosopher. They would give me a lot. I would have to rise to their level. Strauss was on your committee. Yes. And did he give you feedback on your dissertation? Not much, but that was my fault. There was very little hand-holding by anybody on my committee. And basically, I went away and, I'd like to say, wrote my dissertation. I think it would be truer to say, with my wife's help, uh, (laughs) uh, wrote my dissertation. And it was pretty much in finished form when I I handed it into Herbert Storr, to his surprise. Before you went away, you served for a time as an assistant. I did. And what was that like? A joy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what were your duties as an assistant to Leo Strauss? Uh, Well, let me just indicate their importance. 
So I walk into Strauss's study on a very hot day, and he is sweating and wiping his brow. And he says, Mr. Faulkner, Mr. Faulkner, can't you do something about this awful heat? So I walked to the window and threw it up, and a great breath of fresh air came in. And Strauss's reaction was, Mr. Faulkner, you are a genius. <laughs> By the way, he never said that otherwise. <laughs> I do not remember heavy duties, you know, getting books and that sort of thing. I would do some typing for him. My typing was execrable. It was awful, but I did that. I would turn a manuscript or a dictation into text. Not an awful lot, frankly. That was one task. Generally, I was not running many books. It was accompanying him, uh, taking him to the train for lectures, uh, taking him downtown once a year in order to get a suit, a suit, maybe two suits, a shirt, a tie, at a nice a gentleman's haberdashery down on the North End. Such test as that, and then the pleasure of walking him back to his apartment after class. That mm -hmm. was, of course, a wonderful privilege. And on these occasions, walking him back from class or going to the haberdashers, what did he like to talk about? I mean, he would talk a bit about what he had been teaching. That was a very great pleasure. I'm sure I could have taken greater advantage of such occasions. But he was very easy to talk with. I never saw him truculent or, or really moody or something. Unless he had an appointment with a dentist. <laughs> he hated the pain of the dentist. He's very sensitive, delicate body, and not one, to put it mildly, given to exercise. So his walks home were very slow, and I'm sure his relatively early death you know, must have reflected that to some extent. I've not further answered your question. I mean, he would have remarks about people, about others. Frankly, I do not. I'm ashamed to say, remember closely detailed conversations with him in that context. Sure, of course. The classes you attended by 1958, those were held in Social Science 122, Social Science 302? I don't remember the numbers. Now, the seminar room was, of course, different from a large bowl room. There would be a lot of students, except in a class, say, a seminar on Cicero, when probably there were not more than 15 of us at most, 10 mm -hmm. of us maybe. Mm -hmm. And there was a sense among the 10 of you for a seminar on Cicero or perhaps more for a course on, on Hegel, there was a sense that this was something unusual happening, his teaching? It wasn't your judgment alone. Oh, God, no. Oh, no, everyone. I mean, after all, his classes were being recorded. No other class that, that I attended was recorded. And we were... I knew, we knew, we were in the presence of, of something extraordinary. It's not extraordinary in the sense of something spectacular with fireworks and amusement and all sorts of things. I'll bet Bloom was that kind of teacher. It was a sort of spectacle mm -hmm. as well as rich with inquiry. Mm -hmm. Strauss's was more quiet, mm -hmm. but he had a trait, I've, I've mentioned this in other contexts, but he had a trait that none but the best have, which is a kind of ruthless following of the argument of the text. Mm -hmm. And therefore, one was gaining illuminating remarks about the movement of the text. At the same time, one was gaining particular insight into parts of the argument. So something very important was going on, and we, at least I, had mm -hmm. never had it before I woke up to this my second semester in Chicago. One thing I'd like to ask about is what Strauss understood his role as teacher to be. What did he think he was doing? The most important thing he was doing was showing his students the depth and originality of a serious thinker. So overcoming historicism, mm -hmm. I would say, was the tacit, was a very great concern of his. So as I've said in another context, there was much less of raising objections to a thinker. There was absolutely no dismissal of a serious thinker. Hegel had to be understood on his own terms. And mm -hmm. when a naive student like myself raised questions as to whether Hegel accurately portrayed an age, Strauss discouraged that very much. It's not that he discouraged his students' originality. 
But their originality was on the whole so light and secondary that he really wanted them to be sure they saw the argument of the text. That was the most obviously important part, but it had a very deep, deep resonance. It meant that one read to learn, or at least one was encouraged to read to learn, mm -hmm. and to take mm -hmm. these arguments seriously. Strauss knew that few of us would be what would be called philosophic in some grand way, but many of us boys uh, could make progress in thinking by considering the different alternatives of the great men. And that was, I think, the very healthy thing he encouraged. Mm -hmm. And that could apply to students at many levels of ability. And it encouraged at once a kind of humility and at the same time an ambition to make what progress one could. What was his basic attitude towards his students? It seems natural in the case of Strauss to say that he had students, mm -hmm. that these were not people who took his classes, but people who wanted in particular to learn something from him, I guess. Yeah. I think the most important thing is he took them seriously, and he took their aspirations seriously, and therefore he took their objections and questions and doubts also seriously. Having said that, I would say he was really concerned himself to learn, and he was really admiring of those who were serious about learning and had the gear to really do it well. Some people, I think, might have thought he had favorites. For example, there was a, a man whose name I've now forgotten who took care of the recording and such. I did not think he played favorites. I thought in the classroom, he was open to questions from wherever it came, from any point of view. He never made fun of a questioner. So my first impulse in reacting to your question was, well, he was friendly. That's such a shallow remark, but he... He was friendly, but because he meant the best for them and was happy to help them out. But there was a tacit reserve because he was about very important business, including investigating in his teaching, and that was the most important thing. It's not that he was preoccupied with his students. I would not say that. Did he show insight into the character of his students, uh, what they needed to understand or what they did understand? Well, I think so. I mentioned the example of me. He thought a certain study uh, would be appropriate for me. He said at one time, he was sort of pleased. He thought that he had helped me understand things that my character felt, but which I didn't understand and couldn't explain or justify. I thought that was a very impressive remark. His remark approximately was that he helped you understand things that you felt but couldn't express. That's right. That your character and was defend, you could also or say. defend. Yeah, that your character was disposed towards seeing certain types of things, but couldn't articulate or defend those things that you could see. That's a very clear statement. <laughs> <laughs> and so he applied some practical discrimination towards his judgments and his dealings with students. Oh, sure. I mean, he would. The he, point here is to use a word that I've heard Ralph Lerner use many times. He wasn't a Luftmensch. His head wasn't in the clouds. No, 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 no. <laughs> his head was not in the clouds. Not on politics, not on idealism, despite his very great admiration for, for decent people. He knew the limitation of that in politics. He was, in a way, very tough. But his toughness was never callousness. I'll quote one wonderful remark that he made after he had sent a letter to the National Review protesting their treatment of Israel in a certain matter. I like oil, he said, but I like Jews more. <laughs> <laughs> so Strauss's teaching, his hopes for his teaching, were that he would encourage a kind of activity that he himself was engaging in to the best of his ability, to the highest degree. That's what his, if he had a project, that was his project. I'd go a long way with that formulation. He cared for us because he cared for thinking things out and the benefits of that for us. One can push that a bit farther than you did, and that is the caring for us and for his students was in the light of an awareness of the obstacles to clear thinking and to decent conduct, or at least to understanding decent conduct in the present time. And therefore, he no doubt wanted cared to have his teaching 
have some influence. That's not strange. But mm-hmm. that was not his principle, a motive, mm-hmm. it seemed to me. Mm-hmm. He was a thinker and was concerned to think things out. I'm not sure what to think of Heinrich Meyer's uh, interesting argument that Strauss wanted to found a school. Strauss seemed to think that a serious thinker would inevitably have followers, and that was to some extent problematic, that there, there would be a sect and there would be a division of sects then, as different people understood him differently, and he regarded that as inevitable, in a way problematic, Uh, But as he put it in one of his writings, better a sect than the Republic of Letters in which all kinds of differences are tolerated but muddled and muffled so that we all get along. He really meant to think things out and thought it was inevitable that people who did try to think things out would be followed. Uh, The extent to which he intentionally wanted to found a school in somewhat different sense than I've just expressed in the last few remarks I'm not sure of that. I'm just not, I'm not sure what that means. During his lifetime, in debates in his own department and in other departments and in the literature and among his own students, he would have heard the word Straussian. Probably, sure. And he would have been aware that there were conversation among his students about what it meant to be a quote-unquote Straussian and who was the legitimate heir to Leo Strauss. Insofar as he would, I'm asking you to, to read his mind, but insofar as he was aware that this was brewing, what do you think his stance towards it was? He was too busy to get too much involved on the gossip front. I'm putting it that crudely. I think he knew that he had a variety of serious students. He had some confidence in them, that there would be less serious students and mistaken ones, and the student and the serious students might differ in some ways. I think he would have just understood that as part of the inevitabilities of a great teacher and his followers. I never saw any grave concern about what his students, about fears or apprehensions or zeal about what his students were doing. Mm -hmm. I never saw Mm -hmm. that. That some of his students might do really foolish things. Yeah, he could understand that. There were students who didn't understand a lot or who, who took his teaching in one way or the other. Sure. But his mode of teaching, which was taking the variety of points of view seriously in his teaching, and therefore ventilating a variety of opinions as students took different courses, that discouraged, it seemed to me, foolish zealotry. On the other hand, he was not shy, upon occasion at least, in clarifying the differences between the different modern thinkers and not least the moderns and the ancients. He was not always pushing the ancients, that's not the case. But his opinion that modern thought might have grave difficulties in its foundation, that certainly came through and not just in his writing. So Mm -hmm. that's a different element. That has to be said as well as what I've said. I believe you've remarked that he sometimes referred to his students as his puppies. Yeah. What's packed into such a description? Oh, not much. It was playful. Strauss was as unneurotic. I've never even thought of using the word in conjunction with him. As unneurotic as about anyone I've ever known. There must have been problematic relations with this or that student. Of course there were, and I heard rumors about this break. But it was pretty rare, very rare. And on the whole, relations with him, people were not fraught. Nothing like it. People may have felt that it was fraught, but as far as I could see, Strauss was not to use this colloquialism, fraught about his relation with students. Not at all. He had bigger fish to fry. So if there was any turmoil surrounding him, it was something that students brought with them to what Strauss had to offer, not something that Strauss was introducing. I am convinced of that. Right. Uh, He was impish, he was warm, he was friendly, but fundamentally he was austere and about what he thought was the most serious business a man could be about. And therefore, from that point of view, then other things fell into place. I mean, he might make a mistake here and there. I -hmm. never saw him make a mistake in dealing with people, but I didn't see all his intimate relations Mm -hmm. with Bloom, Rosen, other people who were before my time, like Benedetti, or for that matter, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Sure. Strauss had this remarkable influence on you as a student and, and on your career, yet 
your publications have been mostly about things that he never taught and that I doubt that you ever had a chance to study with him. Marshall in the first instance, and then Hooker, I believe you've written on the First Amendment. I mean, Strauss did have something to say about liberalism in his courses, but I don't think he taught a course on liberalism itself. How do you understand that? I mean, was there some influence that appeared in the things you worked on, even if you didn't study them with Strauss? Oh, yes. Oh, sure. How does that, this is an interesting question in general because among Strauss's students, there are, including you, of course, there are a number who turn to studying American founding, American political thought and political theory, yeah. and made remarkable contributions to the field yeah. and understanding America. Yeah, it's important to appreciate that. And Strauss never taught this, but, yeah. but nevertheless, this is one of the great legacies of if there is a Straussian school, one of the great legacies of Strauss's teachings was somehow to inspire people to do work that he himself wasn't doing or teaching. Yeah. One can give a different account for each of the big things that I've done. The stuff on American, which people like Marty Diamond and the wonderful Walter Burns and Jaffa's marvelous work on Lincoln and such things, those were all inspired by Strauss because he encouraged one to take politics seriously, and that means thoughtful political men seriously, and he also taught about the formative character of a regime. And therefore, the founders, the turn to the founders is not just an accident. It mm -hmm. could be overdone, in fact, but there's a kind of impulse to understand the form of our country, which to some extent was expressed in that original constitution, which uh, our fundamental law. Mm -hmm. Also, he taught one to take law seriously, and that included custom. So mm -hmm. again, that pointed people like Walter Burns and others, and myself. Uh, one cannot neglect the importance of Herbert Storing, who had two immense assets. First, he took the country very seriously, and second, he insisted on interpreting it in a non-tendentious or non-Straussian way, so to speak. We weren't reading it with a view to the ancients or something. One had to see how the country was founded as it was founded and mm -hmm. examine that, but taking it seriously. That, too, was Strauss's fundamental impulse. So that influenced me via Storing, especially, who was my dissertation advisor. The Hooker book was, for me, very interesting because having left American things and hungry for some broader, I had done some work on Hooker. It also allowed me to comment. Hooker was a Christian Aristotelianism, and I could investigate Aristotle without being exactly responsible for being a first-rate uh, classic <laughs> scholar. <laughs> that actually was very useful at the time. And that's a good book, despite the fact it's far out of the fashionable topics. And one thing you didn't mention, what, what was very important for me, was a book on Francis Bacon. And that was inspired by Strauss's remark about the importance of the turn in philosophy toward an activist or useful philosophy that could help human beings. Useful knowledge, in Benjamin Franklin's phrase. Mm -hmm. And I was stimulated by that, and then just fascinated by Bacon. And Strauss, <laughs> Strauss says somewhere that it's not worth working on Bacon because he's so complicated and difficult. It would take so long. Well, he was right, but it was suitable for me. And he also said that it's important to understand natural science. Well, Bacon is really interesting on that. But still, the fundamental, I suppose the most obvious sign of the influence was the last book on uh, the case for greatness, which is an investigation of magnanimity or greatness of soul or ambition, looking at Plato and Xenophon and beginning with grand old Aristotle. And that was sort of a boy growing up with a confidence to confront big topics and at the same time take up also the arguments against that, by whomever they're by, whether by Rawls or by Kant or, or whomever. So... I don't see myself as by any means freed from the influence of stress. Ambition, great sold ambition or, or otherwise, this is something Strauss inspired in his students. Yes, that's quite true. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, you can see that. There's a book on the role of the neocons in the invasion of Iraq and such by a guy named Mann. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it because it was said at the time, by, especially by enemies of Strauss, that somehow the Straussians were decisive. Mm -hmm. Uh, James Mann in that book, I think it's called The Vulcans, investigates that and uh, I think shows that the influence was only this, that 
there was a certain confidence in statesmanship or leadership that to some extent infused some of the Straussians. The teaching or the outlook of people like Wolfowitz and others mm -hmm. seemed to me to be not Strauss. There's a certain kind of excessive, you could almost say patriotism, that's present there or mm -hmm. ambition for mm -hmm. our liberal democracy that I think Strauss would have thought impolitic mm -hmm. and impractical. But at the same time, he encouraged people, especially decent, well-meaning people, to be ambitious in the best sense, to do important things, and to take on then important thinkers in another way. Did Strauss discuss American politics with you at all during the time you knew him? Very little, and little or no time in class. What is your suspicion or your intuition about what his politics might have been, or if he, or if he had any? Oh, he did have a politics. But I would say, generally, he feared the softness of the people we call modern liberals. And he feared it. So he would be called a conservative, I think. But his thought on politics was so much deeper than the various schools of conservatism. He thought that it was very important to have decent, honorable, judicious people in power. That, I would say, would be the most general thing. But a certain toughness in foreign policy, not necessarily imperial, but strong. He feared the power of the Soviet Union and worried that America might be too soft to take them on. After all, there was a grave problem for a long time, and the turn to Reagan in 1980 with a, a new and tougher foreign policy was many years after Strauss had died. Right. Strauss's suspicion of the softness of liberals, this is soft-headedness with regard towards expectations for foreign policy, or does it extend to suspicions about you know, the wisdom of the welfare state? I mean, what's, what's comprised of that softness? Yeah. He rarely ventilated such matters and did mm -hmm. not did not with me. I do recall once evincing some naively tendentious remark about uh, FDR, and Strauss corrected me. FDR uh, had been remarkable in foreseeing the rise of Hitler and in moving this country to confront that. And as far as I knew, he was a... No, I don't want to say he was an admirer of true, but I don't know that. <laughs> I don't want to say that. I am, but I don't know that he was. But, for example, he thought that Nixon was very impressive in a number of ways and didn't go along with a terrific denigration of Nixon, which was fashionable in the mm -hmm. Academy at that time, which is not to say he celebrated Watergate or celebrated the man's character fully or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. He did not. Strauss came to the United States, a German immigre, and with, I understand, relatively little experience as a teacher. Yeah. Do you think his experience of the United States changed him in any significant way? I would guess so. And not in his fundamental being. Mm -hmm. This is a man who, from uh, the time that he said he, his ambition was to read Plato and, and raise rabbits, was remarkably devoted to thinking things out. But in this sense, he said he loved American slang. He had an eye and an ear for America's funny ways. He loved the informality of the slang. He once pointed out in class the genius of FDR in changing a Latinate long word for a very pungent Anglo-Saxon short word. Not a swear word, just a pungent remark. And just saw the terrific discrimination of FDR in rhetoric, in popular rhetoric. Very mm -hmm. impressive. He was impressed with that. He loved Perry Mason. And so some of the, the informality of American life, I mean, he, he liked. He was very proper, however. So the later, the informality of the 60s plus, uh, he thought was, what did he call it at one time? America's burning while the social scientists fiddle. He saw it burning. He saw, he did predict it, but he also saw it with his mm -hmm. own eyes that this strange mixture of Heidegger and liberalism into something called liberation in many, many respects could tear down, could deeply damage the structure of 
the constitutional and liberal structure of the country. I understand. Was there any model for the way that Strauss taught classes? I can't imagine if somehow there had been the possibility of him staying in Germany in a German university. Does anyone in the German university conduct classes in a way similar to what Strauss did? I don't really know. I thought he was influenced by German professors who would take up a text and really look at it closely. Mm -hmm. the, the big difference, though, the decisive difference is that he had broken from the historical school. And that was bound to have a big effect on the way he read these books. But, you know, he would talk with Vogel and he'd talk with other German friends of his. Mm -hmm. And I think they were more accustomed to looking at texts really well mm -hmm. and closely, that German intellectual tradition and German academic tradition. And I'm just yeah. wondering if somehow being in the United States was liberating for him in a way, in the way in which he approached his teaching. Was this something that was, you know, sui generis? Let's put it this way. Yeah. I never heard any nostalgia for somewhere else. Yeah. It was remarkable. I never heard him comparing American universities to German universities, which he might very well have done, talking of somehow the shallowness of American universities. Nothing of that. That isn't exactly the question you asked, but now that you mention it, it's in a way strange. I mean, his, his writing in English is just extraordinary. The clarity and grace and the possibility of summoning up extraordinarily pungent remarks and somehow uh, what one can only call his genius just absorbed that. And he was living not just in the moment, as we say today, but he was living for the life that he could live. You know, he remarked once, you know, you don't have to have a big house or something. Look at Spinoza. He lived in one tiny little apartment grinding lenses to make a living. And I think that caught Strauss's own attitude. There are all kinds of disadvantages and terrible dangers out there. One does one's work as one can. My own opinion is that his, his remarkable aversion to getting involved in the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and thinking about it and thinking about victims and such, has something to do with this, this mm -hmm. extraordinarily, you could say, love of life, so long as that's understood well. It's easy to see the deficiencies of the American students he would have encountered if compared to those who received a, a pre-World War II education in the German university yeah. that didn't have the classical learning, they didn't have the understanding of the tradition, didn't have any knowledge of the tradition. Yeah. Nonetheless, do you think Strauss saw certain virtues or strengths in his American students that perhaps would not have been available if he had had a classroom full of European students? Well, my dear Steve, I wish I could quote <laughs> any kind of chapter and verse. Right. I can't. Right. Sure, sure, I understand. And this was another instance of the lack of comparisons of this kind. And one thing is clear. He admired, liked, in some cases, and really liked his American students for what they were. I mean, Walter Burns and Allen and the others. But I never recall a kind of regret I mean, the American students had a certain freshness. They, they were ignorant, but fresh and independent. Mm -hmm. Guys like Marty and her, uh, well, her Garfinkel doesn't count. He, he studied mostly with David Easton. But they'd been in the Merchant Marine. They'd been around. They brought something, uh, something fresh and interesting. And he was very attracted to these interesting guys. I'm wandering. I had never heard this kind sure, of comparison. Sure, sure, sure. I understand. <laughs> I remember once telling him that I was going to write something on the shallowness of the modern great curriculum at Oxford, which I had taken, which didn't go uh, beyond Descartes uh, or Hobbes, and there was nothing on the ancients. He looked at me strangely. I don't bother myself with writing about academia. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say academia, but about curricula and that sort of thing. Right, I understand. He had bigger fish to fry. That's it. Was his... Jewishness significant to his role as a teacher in any way? Well, that's just a complicated question. Fundamentally, no, I'm not a Jew. And I found him a wonderful teacher and never felt anything like that. On the other hand, he was a Jew, he cared for the Jews, and his entry into very great issues often was through, of course, Jewish texts, Maimonides being the greatest example. On the other hand, he also knew Christian texts. He didn't talk about that much, but mm -hmm. he did. 
Mm -hmm. but not as many or as extensively, but he did, to my embarrassment, uh, far better than I did. But this was a matter of just his very great learning and investigation. I'll leave it at that because I have nothing, I think, of real subtlety to add to a complicated question. After all, he, he was a great Jewish scholar. I mean, I benefited enormously from his introduction to the Guide to the Perplexed and other such writings. Mm -hmm. Did you consider Leo Strauss your friend? Yes. That's why the, my answer to the first question you asked would have been he was friendly. I mean, I spoke with him. I could speak with him quite candidly, he to me. He liked my wife a lot because she's a kind of independent soul who would tease him and speak to him straight, probably more than I. I once entertained the thought of getting him a little summer place for a few weeks next to where we went. I think he would have liked that. Good. Looking back now. Let me add, yeah. a very unequal friend. Did I cons <laughs> consider him my friend? <laughs> in a very, uh, knowing that it was in a very subordinate way. The parallel question is, which I can't expect you to be able to answer, but do you think he considered you his friend? To some extent, going a little beyond the puppyish phrase. Looking back on Leo Strauss now, how do you think of him? Not, not how you thought of him back in 1958, but looking back over your career and looking back over what's transpired since he taught, how does he appear to you? Every time I read his works, any work of his, my judgment, my estimate of him only increases. I see things that I did not see before. He's superior, far superior to any, to virtually any thinker I know, maybe except the greats, in beginning from what's obvious or what would one would find plausible and then entering deeply into a topic in showing you the necessity of the argument that he's making from the beginning. If in some ways I'm disappointed in what I've done, I regard that as completely my fault and not living up, in fact, to the kind of remarkable investigations which he encouraged. So I regard myself as my life having been decisively shaped by Strauss. Many people think that. But there's a richness there which I have not fully drawn. The world is much warmer, more interesting, more sober by virtue of that education. And he set one to do one's own work. And if one failed to do all one might, that's oneself, not him. Somehow your remarks are suggesting to me the thought that Strauss, in addition to inspiring ambition, seemed to inspire a gift for friendship among his students, that there was the rivalry that you spoke of, undeniably among some students, but there was also a great gift for friendship among various of his students. Now, would that have been there if they hadn't had Strauss as a teacher, or did he draw it out? Did he make them self-conscious of it? Uh, he fosters generosity of soul. That is, he, he encourages, above all, uh, to use Locke's word, understanding, or pursuit of understanding, and that's something that's shared, that there will be differences over politics or over ambition or different points of view or political conflicts, or academic conflicts of one sort or another. That's bound to happen. But there's an encouragement of largeness of soul because one is about important things and one appreciates others who are about important things then because one can learn from them. I'm sure I'm missing something, all right? I'm not the most ambitious sort. And so pride and such maybe mean less to me, for better and for worse. So I don't say I understand all of this, but that's surely what was encouraged. He used to say that one of the few things that can be unequivocally shared is, in fact, thoughts. And I regard one of the happy things of my life has been these wonderful colleagues I've especially had at Boston College, but I can run into Cliff Orwin or Chris Nadon or people all over the country, and they're interested. If they think you're going to have something interesting to say, or they're sympathetic to at least your endeavors, and I think that comes in part from this. It's very different. For a couple of my books, I've had reviews by English historians, and they are so concerned that no one 
enter their turf without their permission and their point of view. And to some extent, Strauss' students at their best are not sectarian. If there's a good argument, they say so, or mm -hmm. they know they ought to say so, mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. ought to rise above their dispositions or their friendships. Otherwise, they're living by prejudice, which is a mistake. To put words into your mouth, you're saying that Straussianism is a sect devoted non to non-sectarianism. Yes, <laughs> it has the human frailties of a sect. There's not a single Straussian who is uh, comparable to Strauss in the breadth of his views and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and therefore, to some extent, we're followers. The best of the followers of Straussian are looking at the premises, of including the premises that Strauss unearthed or, or thought were sound. I understand. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. This is Stephen Gregory. I'm sitting in the home of Professor Halal Gildan. Thank you for having me. Uh, pleasure. <laughs> and I look forward to this interview. Okay. You studied with Professor Strauss at the University of Chicago? Yes. And around 1950? 1952. Actually, I couldn't have begun until the winter semester, the winter quarter of mm -hmm. 1953. But I heard him deliver the progress or return lectures at Hillel House, and that is what got me interested in studying with him. So you heard him at Hillel House, and then you looked him up as someone you might take courses with? I registered for his courses. What was the first course you took with him? You know, I th thought I remembered it, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I just remember that the first three courses were on Machiavelli, Hobbes, and Plato's Statesman. And then later there were courses on Rousseau and Montesquieu, and then he went off. I think to Israel. So that's the sequence I recall. And how did you find Leo Strauss as a teacher? Illuminating, prepared, uh, needless to say. I mean, uh, by that standard, more prepared than any teacher I've ever had before. Accessible, and the things he was saying, and the examples he used to illustrate the points he was making. Excellent at dealing with questions that students asked. Mm -hmm. And I found that the students were capable of asking better questions in the atmosphere created by one of his classes than they were outside the atmosphere. Uh, he established a framework that made that happen. I'm sure it'll get reflected in the tapes that you're publishing and mm -hmm. the transcripts mm -hmm. that you're bringing out. That's an interesting remark, that the students would ask better questions in the context of the classes than they might ask outside the class. Yeah, a framework was established for the subject under discussion. And when he gave his classes, I'm told he would typically assign a short paper. Yes. Did he read your papers, your class papers? We read them out loud yeah. to the class, and then he would comment on them. And that would be the basis of your grade? Uh, that plus the final exam. So there was this, this is the way the class opened. Now I learned from the transcripts that when the classes grew larger, it became necessary to assign several papers for a given session. And as a result, they could not all be read. I don't know how the decision was made, whose paper would be read and commented on, but I mean, I'm sure they were all commented on. And how was he? I've never attended a class this format. How was he in common on papers in class? It led to an interesting discussion mm -hmm. with the person who'd written it. And that's the material you have on the tapes. Right. They would turn it off when the student read the paper, and then the tape would begin when Strauss would begin commenting, but you often didn't know who he was commenting on. You had no context for the comments because you hadn't heard the paper. I remember now that not all of the courses had that structure. Mm -hmm. I don't think the symposium course had that structure. Mm -hmm. That is, I don't remember any papers being read at the beginning of the symposium course. And there were times when students were asked to comment on a passage that had not yet been discussed in class. Mm -hmm. uh, there were other times when the paper took the form of a summary of what had been said in the previous class. I do recall that. Though I could no longer tell you exactly in what classes uh, this was done, and exactly in what classes that was done. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So his comments would lead to an interesting discussion with the paper giver. There are some transcripts, the mm -hmm. old transcripts, that have those comments. I understand. 
you say Strauss was very accessible. You would go to see him after class? Well, depending on the state of his health. And uh, this changed, I think, as he grew older. But the classes would last longer than they were scheduled for. And I don't know whether you had that experience. I have office hours. The time the students want to talk to me is right after class, and usually there's a professor coming right in, yeah. and once you go into the hall and, or, say, come upstairs and so on, it's not the same thing for some reason. I mean, I, I remember occasions during which I saw him in his office. I no longer remember how they occurred, but there were lengthy discussions after class. There were periods that lasted much longer than the length of time assigned to them. I've heard that he would, in the 1950s at least, that he would answer questions after class was over for one or two hours. There you go. Yeah, and that was the time when one was most motivated to ask them yeah. because the material was fresh. And Why do you think he expended so much energy on teaching in those years? That's a tremendous commitment. It means he would have been spending four or five hours on his feet answering questions and lecturing. I think I heard Jenny say once, he enjoyed it. Yes, I, I think that is true. And as age took its toll, he might have had to cut back on it somewhat, but he enjoyed it. That's why he had these reading groups. He had reading groups separate from the courses, the official courses he taught. Yes, I mean, during the year, even during the year in Palo Alto, when one might have thought he was away from everyone, there were others who were around, and there was a reading group. I mean, Martin Diamond was there. And was he different in the reading groups than he was in the courses? In the reading groups, there were, those who took part in them were usually people who had been through his courses, and they did not need to have a framework established, like, why are we studying this in the Department of Political Science? I mean, from what I've seen of some of the transcripts from St. John's College, he felt, well, now that I'm here, I don't have to do that. He actually said that <laughs> on one of the transcripts. Right, right. Uh, but then he went ahead and did it. I mean, he didn't provide a justification for political science, but he provided a justification for why to read this book. Yes, yes, yes. The importance of the book, yes. So in the reading groups, he didn't feel the need to establish a framework. Was his manner with the students different at all? Well, I guess the form was different. I mean, the ones that I experienced, short platonic dialogue, which we just went through, passage by passage, discussing it as we went, him leading the discussion. It wasn't like a course on Kant where every session was, as it were, planned in advance and people were chosen to read papers. The next time one had to go on to this, the next time one had to go on to that. To that extent, it was a loser structure. And mm -hmm. When we finished one work, we moved on to another. Right. You took classes with Strauss for about half a dozen years? Yeah. And how do you think Strauss understood his own activity? How do you think he understood his role as a teacher? Well, it was clear that he thought that political science, at least, was on the wrong track and wanted to encourage truer understanding of political life than was available in those inspired by the ideal of turning it into a natural science deserving a place alongside the established, respectable natural sciences. That he was clearly undertaking uh, through his reacquainting us with what one has to call common sense. In the debate with Shar and Bolin, one of them uh, challenges him with the question, what is common sense? That's one of the hardest questions in the world to answer. But he said he will content himself with a common sense understanding of common sense. <laughs> but without denying, that it is, uh, there's a place where he calls it the fundamental riddle. That's in the epilogue. That's pretty strong language from Strauss. And it's not what one usually thinks of as the fundamental riddle when one thinks of Strauss. So one way in which he saw himself as a teacher is someone who is trying to encourage or to recover a better understanding of political life than was available through scientific political science. Uh, scientific in quotes. Scientific and... Scientific in quotes. Scientific in quotes, yes. Okay. But not science, because I mean, I remember references in the writings of the founders to recent advances that have been made mm -hmm. in political science, and mm -hmm. there it was not in quotes. Hume speaks of political science, 
without embarrassment. And he doesn't mean anything that's the least bit reminiscent of mathematical physics. But did he ever discuss with his students what the, uh, perhaps even in the context of some of the books that you read with him, what the role of a teacher is? Certainly in the context of Platonic dialogues he discussed. Well, I mean, Socrates was always there. And, but I don't remember any, I remember hearing from others or even reading, I think it's in Liberal Education and Responsibility, his comments on the rule of thumb he gave to students who were going to go out and become teachers. Always assumed that there were some silent students in the class who was your superior in mind and heart. Take what you're doing seriously. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. That's how I remember it. But anyway, one can check that. Right. Uh, it's been written. Was that principle of, I would call it, modesty, did you see that at work in his teaching? Did he follow his own advice, <laughs> do you think? Well, he always gave the thinker he was teaching the benefit of the doubt. I, don't know, I mean, I must say, there are places where he permits himself to be critical, even while teaching to someone. I remember finding them in the Grotius transcript where he felt he was parading his uh, scholarly learning a little excessively. Mm -hmm. and the Vico transcript where he was hammering a point in repeatedly and remarked to that effect. But you know, the courses I took with him have to include the things that I read in the transcripts after <laughs> I, there were courses I didn't hear, the subject interested me, so mm -hmm. I consulted the transcripts. And they have to be part of the experience, although I wasn't physically there. He didn't feel that his course on the statesman had been understood by enough people. That I do recall. So I don't think that's one he went back to. Others he would return to. He taught the politics most frequently of any one text, and as far as I know, and I suspect that after the politics, probably the Republic was second mm -hmm. in terms of number of courses that he offered, although I don't think we have records of several of those, but I would have to go back and look at the course records. And I don't know what he taught at the New School. I don't know if anybody has the course records for the New School. Well, you haven't interviewed David Lowenthal no, no, I, we have not interviewed David Lawrence. I mean, he is, he may outlast me, but he is more mortal than I am, <laughs> uh, as these things are ordinarily understood. So he probably has valuable uh, recollections. Others have passed on Henry Maggot long ago. In a letter to Klein in 1949, Strauss complains to Jacob Klein that students need a political teaching, and that he has to come up with a political teaching for his in order to teach. Have you seen that letter? It's in public. I have not read through that wonderful trove that yeah. Heinrich Meyer has made available yeah. to yeah. us. I mean, I've been teaching full-time at Queens and trying to figure out what to include in a, as good an introduction to philosophy course as mm -hmm. I can teach, and still haven't been able to do so, but it keeps me. Anyway, no, please acquaint me with what you're thinking. Well, about. just simply that that's a provocative remark for him to have made, and that he felt that he needed to come up with a political teaching for the sake of his students. This would have been in 1949 when he was starting at the University of Chicago. I don't understand political to mean in that instance, in that context, to mean I'll have uh, to look Republican at or Democrat. I mean, I think that the word has much broader meaning in that context. If he came up with one, I confess I don't know what it is, <laughs> except that I remember from quoting Max Weber's remark that accomplishing something in the political arena was like drilling a hole by hand in extremely hard wood. But clearly, extravagant hopes were identified for what they were. Though even when they were present, when he taught Nietzsche, it was not an anti-Nietzsche polemic. If there was something to be learned from Adventa, he wanted to communicate, but that was. That went for Hobbes and Machiavelli as well. As far as that politics course, I think it might have been, was it 1960? I think that was, a, I don't know whose idea it was to have him teach undergraduates, but I think it was a younger group, not the usual older graduate students, but it was a younger group that poured into the classroom when he went through the politics with him. That's an interesting question. Is in the courses that you attended, how many people were attending? How many people were attending his, his classes, do you know? 
I get the impression that afterwards it got much bigger. And someone said something that reminded me that the class on the statesman, a lot of people poured in. It had the title, subtitle, Metaphysical Foundations of the Political Philosophy of Plato. I may not be getting that perfectly right, but Metaphysical Foundations was in there. I wanted to hear what he'd have to say on that. And that was an unusual, that had to be, someone reminded me, and I did not realize it at the time, it had to be moved to a larger room than the one in which he usually taught. But while I was studying with him, the classes were not unusually large. I understand that they became unusually large in subsequent years mm -hmm. as his students started sending their students to study with him. Yeah. But what did Strauss want to accomplish by teaching political philosophy? Well, I mean, an interesting thought experiment might be if someone had come along and said that they would give him a stipend to live the rest of his life out reading and studying and writing, he never had to teach another class again, would have he accepted that? Or was there something in teaching that he felt he needed to accomplish, just as he needed to write his books? It's an interesting question. But those who studied with him and were impressed by what they experienced in his classroom went ahead and read his books. If they'd just been lying there on the shelves, not too many people would have become aware of what they contained. And given the amount of noise, I have the impression that if you ask the average political scientist who the more prominent thinker is, John Rawls or Leo Strauss, you'd probably get Rawls. Now, how do you combat that? It's not as though he didn't enjoy teaching. I mean, he did. I do remember one thing that I heard of, heard about. One of the first students, one of the ablest that he had, published little, uh, became specialized in constitutional law taught what he had to say by teaching courses in constitutional law. Leo Weinstein. And I just learned from talking to someone at the reception that he was involved in the project to tape record Strauss. But he started out very opposed to Strauss. I think Strauss told me something about that. And he was very able and very bright and kept raising objections. And by the end of the semester, Strauss had brought him around. The quarter. And <laughs> Pardon? The quarter. The, the quarter. <laughs> and, but it was something of a struggle, and that indicated to me that it may have taken work very early on for him to establish himself and his way of looking at political life against the prevailing view, Atchikov. Right. Yes. I'm told his first few classes were very poorly attended. I mean, there was very few people there. Is that right? Or he had already been teaching three or four years by the time he'd studied it. Well, I remember a seminar on Rousseau, not even a class. I mean, a small room. If I remember correctly, we sat around a table. Mm -hmm. I don't recall the exact physical layout. Yeah. But at the same time, the other classes were full classes. So it depends. I mean, people knew he had written a book on Hobbes and acquired a reputation, so when he gave the Hobbes course, it was very well attended. A seminar on Rousseau, which I don't think got recorded, but which... I learned a tremendous amount from. And then I remember a seminar on Montesquieu, for which I wrote a paper that was too long, not intending to be arrogant, just not realizing that it was too long. <laughs> so Leo Weinstein had something to do with getting the project to tape Strauss's courses started. What do you know about that, getting well, that started? I, someone told me, now, who is this man at Roosevelt College again? Stuart Warner? Stuart Warner. He said, that Carol Lerner, he, he was the one who told me that Carol Lerner told Leo Weinstein, and this is how far back it goes, and Bob Horowitz, uh, that they not only have to get Strauss's permission, uh, but that they have to get a letter saying that they have his permission, and that they have to get that letter notarized. So it's the first time I learned that. The first time I learned that Leo Weinstein had anything to do with that, but I could see it's happening because he saw the difference between the old way of studying political life and the way of studying political life that Strauss encouraged. So it was Weinstein and Horowitz who were the students who had pushed for the taping? This is what I learned from Stuart <laughs> Warner. Okay. I did not know it. I, I knew that Horowitz had played a role and I conveyed the version of it I got from him 
you know, uh, Strauss said, okay, if I don't have to have anything to do with it, by which he, I think, I think he meant if I don't have to read the transcripts and make mm-hmm. corrections and the like. But that Leo Weinstein and Tara Lerner were in on it from way back. That I did not know. That's very interesting. Uh, yeah. Is this news to you? Well, I had been told that students of Strauss had been the impetus behind this project, but all that I knew about the organization of the project was that Storing and, I'm told, Cropsey, kind of uh, after Cropsey arrived in Chicago, kind of took charge of the organization of this. And I there were grants that were gotten from the Realm Foundation, and I guess, I, I suppose, I don't know, that they probably applied for those grants. So I didn't know the names of the students who were behind the transcript project. Carol Lerner is someone who can be asked for her recollections, and it'll be interesting to have a conversation with Carol. I mean, Stuart Warner said, I have, apparently he was a little annoyed at the impression created by my saying, so I said, go ahead, as long as I have nothing to do with it. Yeah. So he said, I have a copy of the letter in my briefcase. You know, I was astonished to learn that this letter existed, that Carol Lerner had anything to do with it, that Leo Weinstein had anything to do with it, and he actually had a copy of it. Warner had a copy of the letter. That's what he said. I did not ask to see it. I see. But I'll also have to give Stuart a call and find out what he knows. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. So Weinstein had come with a point of view that was hostile towards what Strauss was teaching, but he was interested. He came to the class, and by the end of the quarter, he had turned around and became one of those with Horowitz who wanted to see this teaching preserved. Yes. Yeah. Do you think their interest was in seeing it preserved or simply to make it available to those who were attending the course to use just as lecture notes for them to have personally to study? I mean, what do you think their motives were in arranging for the recording? They felt something was happening that was immensely important and they wanted to contribute to its success. There's a common sense understanding of political life. There's common sense again with getting trampled underfoot. That would be, I mean, surmising this. This is not, as a matter of fact, there is a, something a part of this once said to me uh, that indicated he felt as though he was taking part in a kind of reformation, the political science profession. But of course, what Strauss got across uh, without explicitly saying it uh, was that he was trying to restore an older notion of philosophy, and one that included Plato and Machiavelli and Aristotle and Hobbes, but still. So Strauss was engaged in a project of restoration. Yes, and, but of course at the same time, he acknowledged that things had been learned since the days of the ancients, mm. which made the confidence of the moderns felt, at least for a while, in having surpassed them, which helps understand the existence of that confidence. And it also implied that some of the solutions offered by the ancient most perspective need to be reconsidered, by which... Uh... During Strauss's lifetime, a new term entered in the lexicon of political science, that is, Straussian. What did Strauss think of that, that there were now people running around who were called by others Straussians? I don't recall this ever discussing it. I don't recall this ever saying anything explicit about it. I mean, as regards to contemporary affairs, he was remarkably open to disagree. It was different from disagreeing uh, with him about uh, whether there should be a flat tax instead of this arcane income tax structure. It was very different from uh, disagreeing uh, with him about whether something he said about Maimonides was true. And people did, and you know, they, they simply felt they could. So your experience of actually conversing with Strauss was of an open-minded dialogue. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you're bringing that up now suggests that the word Straussian suggests to your mind the opposite. <laughs> well, I, 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 falsely, yeah. Yeah, falsely. But I mean, but since we don't think highly of John Rawls, and since we don't accept scientism or ordinary language philosophy, mm-hmm. which also doesn't accept scientism. Who are these strange people? So the things that... Do you think Straussian is a useful term? Kantian? Hegelian? I guess they're all misleading. I'm told the neo-Hegelians are not really neo-Hegelians. Uh, so I guess 
they're more in need of being intelligently understood than other terms might be. But when I have accepted the label, it was I'm not going to disown something that what I does, found enlightening. What does that term mean to you? If you were to, if someone were to come to you and say, I guess as I am now, what is a Straussian? How would you gloss that? Well, I would walk the well-trodden path of historicism, neo-positivism, paleo-positivism, what the alternative to them is. But beyond that, the importance of an understanding of human affairs for an understanding of the possible answers to the great questions of philosophy. So it comes back to, well, how should one understand human affairs? Well, so I would have to say, well, not that way, and not that way, and not that way. <laughs> And then what are the issues that would have to be faced? And we're back to that. One student suggested that a lifelong effort, the historicist he took most seriously was Heidegger, mm -hmm. and he did not think that the common argument against historicism sufficed to refute Heidegger, namely that they make an exception for themselves and claim to be timelessly valid, because Heidegger represents that, and what fate has allocated that insight was what fate has allocated to our age, but to show that it fails to face up to questions about good and bad, right and wrong, admirable, contemptible, their sources. Incidentally, there is a passage in the end of the first part of what is political philosophy where he says that thoughtful historicists recognize these things but fail to accord them the full importance that is due them, and uh, that is the source. So it's not as though they don't think there's such a thing as courage or uh, arrogance. Or, it, gets, it gets very subtle. But yeah, I mean, connected with the restoration of a sound understanding of political life, that just walks us into the confrontation between the great ancients and the great moderns, and so on, is a restoration of a sound understanding of philosophy. And that is always at the back of his mind. So, if I were to unfairly summarize your answer in one sentence, that if one wants to refer to Straussians, Straussians are those who are looking to recover a healthy understanding of philosophy while engaging in the various philosophical challenges facing us today. Something like that. I think I lost the thread of your answer. I'm sorry. Well, um, the focus on the political, the moral, and the religious, and the right way to face the issues they raise, and then the larger implications thereof. When I first mentioned the term Straussian, you immediately responded with, well, they're Kantians, they're Hegelians, or there were, I don't know if there are any today. Do you think Strauss wanted there to be a Straussian school in the same way that there was a Kantian or Neo-Kantian school or Hegelian school or the academy? back in ancient days. Well, he certainly didn't teach us any articles of faith that he did. That's not what we experienced. You were enrolled in the Committee on Social Thought? Yeah. But you were able to take classes with Strauss? Yeah. Was Strauss on your dissertation committee? Yep. And what your dissertation was on? Spinoza's Theological Political Treatise. Okay. Uh, how did you arrive at your topic? Well, originally he suggested Shaftesbury, and I thought I wanted to work on a greater philosopher than that. <laughs> so I suggested Leibniz. He knew that that was impossible. Waited until I found out. And then we settled on the theological political treatise. Which, which I had taken his Which, course. of course, he had written on. Which he had written on, and I read what he'd written, and I'd taken his course on it. Was he the chair of your committee? Yeah. And how did he perform as chair? What did he do? Well, he was thorough. Did he read drafts? Did he uh, wait until he had a completed draft and he read that? Did he, he approved the, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, he approved the completed draft. And there was something in it that was, I thought, good and worthy of publication. Mm -hmm. When Marjorie Green asked him to submit a piece for a book on Spinoza, a collection of essays that she was editing for Dover, he explained that he couldn't but he recommended me. I had made a favorable impression on David Green, somewhere along the lines, and whatever was valuable 
in that dissertation uh, I put into that paper. I can't bear to look at it. <laughs> uh, I know others who've had similar experiences. Uh, Marty Diamond said he wrote his holding his nose, as he expressed it. Uh, but then he looked at it many years later and mm -hmm. said, you know, it's not so bad. Well, I taught a course in the Theological Political Treatise, and when I taught that course, I realized that I missed a very crucial point, uh, which gets mentioned in passing. Like, why were there all these rebellions against the true God and ceremonies to all these bad gods, mm -hmm. uh, idols and so on, and... Uh, kings wanting to legislate and prevent it from doing so mm -hmm. by the way the thing was structured. Is that Spinoza's analysis? I totally missed that. Did Strauss give comments on your completed draft? Yes. I don't remember the process at this point. I really don't remember the details of the process. I remember the criticisms. I don't recall whether I submitted a draft to him, how to make corrections. I know I didn't have to resubmit it. I had more of a problem and getting it typed up in accord with the university. The university is very standard. strict about the correct quarter inch wide margin. And <laughs> yeah. You had to employ one of their typists yeah, yeah. Uh, in order to get it right. And even then, uh, that's where I got things bounced back at me. There were certain pages I uh, quoted, not only the page, but the line numbers. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the rule came down, either do it always or not at all. I don't know how to do it always. Spinoza was not only a great early modern thinker, he, he was also a Jew. Do you think that entered into Strauss's, uh, in your conversations with him about what to settle on for a, a dissertation, do you think that Spinoza's Jewishness played into Strauss's recommendation? No, I don't think it did. I have the impression. I raise the question because your introduction to Strauss was progress and return. And so, in a way, you encountered him, first of all, by what he had to say about Judaism. Well, you're right to bring that up because at first it looks like a clear case is going to be made for return. Mm -hmm. And then it turns into the debate between return and Spinoza. Mm -hmm. And that crops up again in his later preface to the new translation of Spinoza's critique of religion. But no, I don't think that played a role. I mean, my suspicion is that he was saying, get it over with. I mean, you know, taking a course, he read what I've written. These words did not get uttered. So go and, you know. As you got to know Strauss over the years, was his Jewishness significant in any way to the Strauss you encountered in the classroom at the University of Chicago? I mean, at, at Hillel House, he gave not only Progress Return, but several other remarkable lectures on Jewish topics. Let's see, not that I can think of, but that may not mean that it wasn't there. I mean, I don't know how to improve on that answer. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, fair. You have had a full career as a professor of political science, political philosophy, but you have also had a career as an editor, the founder of Interpretation. <laughs> Leo Strauss often published an Interpretation after yes. you founded it. Yeah. So these would have been the last years of his life. Did you consult with Strauss about founding interpretation? Did you do that independently? And then he, what was the relationship then? We came up with the idea. Seth Benedetti, Howard White and I. We told, I remember writing in a taxi with Strauss. I don't quite recall the occasion. There were a few occasions when he came to New York. I said we hadn't decided on a name. And he suggested interpretation. Yes. And I thought that was wonderful. Interpretation, the Journal of Political Philosophy. Leo Strauss suggested that. He suggested interpretation. I don't remember whether he suggested interpretation. Mm -hmm. I don't remember whether he suggested interpretation in the Journal of Political Philosophy. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And it was originally published by NIHA uh, because the exchange rate was good. <laughs> and then when the exchange rate became bad, they cut back on their copy editing. And Klein was very displeased with the results. What was the original idea when you and Howard White and Seth Benedetti discussed the journal? What was the original idea for the journal? There are some good ideas we didn't implement. Seth Benedetti suggested uh, that we start reviewing old books. He didn't mean Plato and Aristotle, but he meant some important work of 19th century scholarship that people have forgotten about, mm -hmm. but that's something that will 
draw people's attention to it. And we've never really done that. We've just been, once you have a journal, it keeps you going. You have to deal with emergencies that show up, and they keep showing up. And the time to do long-range planning begins to pretty much vanish. Just keeping your head, keeping your head above water and over the best you can do. That's something I had to learn and have been living with once the thing was launched. When Strauss published an interpretation, he would contact you and say, I have an article and... Yeah, and it went. Right, okay. Many of Strauss's students have published an interpretation. They did. I mean, they began there, and their students now are writing reviews for us. Uh, it succumbed to the recession, and when I suddenly realized we weren't getting uh, sufficient subscriptions from college libraries uh, for the thing to keep going. Uh, college libraries were cutting back their budgets, their journal budgets, mm -hmm. and when times got tight, so we went electronic, and I am currently dealing with an ongoing crisis, finding a copy editor to replace the wonderful copy editor we had, uh, who had been looking for a long time, for a teaching position, and finally found one, and had to devote himself full time to the teaching uh, he was required to do. So this is the current emergency that's okay. keeping me from any long-range planning, which would have to include, why haven't we reviewed Straussophobia yet? <laughs> uh, do you see interpretation having a, I mean, uh, not entirely by accident, it's always had a special relationship to Strauss and his students. Do you see it having a particular role to play in terms of Strauss's thought or the thought of Strauss's students? Well, I think they represent a healthy current. I think they're misunderstood to the extent uh, that people falsely believe them to be marching to the same tune. Mm -hmm. Anyone who knows the least thing about them mm -hmm. knows better than that. Ralph Lerner recommended to me a review by Father Fortin of Shadia Drury's book on Strauss, in which Father Fortin takes up the question of what a Straussian is and then provides apparently 14 different classifications. And the result of his taxonomy is by the time that you finished, the term has no meaning anymore. I mean, there's so many different varieties. It can be, but I mean, I can predict that there are no people who regard roles as the leading light in political theory mm -hmm. of the last 40 years. In other words, there are negative characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as for positive ones, uh, no. Mm -hmm. no. Was Leo Strauss a philosopher? I think so. What does that mean? It's a well, he, d he did think about important philosophical questions. And there are pages about them. At the beginning of The City and Man, a natural right in history, he did lean to a certain view of the whole, but he did not write works like The Critique of Pure Reason or Hale's Logic. There are pages in which he spells out the Platonic Socratic view. I mean, one would have to here go into the relation between his thought and Klein's thought, what the important areas of agreement were and mm -hmm. what the disagreements meant, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not sure I'm competent to do that. But yes, and in fact, the word keeps coming up, philosophy, in his broader sense. He himself is reported to have said that he was not a philosopher, he was a teacher or a scholar of political philosophy. In those lectures on Heidegger, I know I'm only a scholar. Well, if he restrict philosophy to thinkers of the stature of Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Hegel, no, he didn't consider himself a thinker of that rank. If you include... Rousseau, Montesquieu, Hume, Barclay, it becomes a different matter. After you left Chicago, obviously you stayed in touch with Professor Strauss. Yeah. Did you consider him your friend? Uh, no, I mean, it was, it always remained teacher student. Let's say older friend. And this was an earlier time, but I assume that you always addressed him as Professor Strauss. I never called him Leo. <laughs> Or Mr. Strauss. Mr. Strauss. Mr. Strauss. Yeah. University of Chicago, you would say Mr. Strauss. Mr. Professor. Strauss, yeah. I don't think any of his students were on a first name basis with him. We've covered a lot of ground in the past hour. Is there anything that comes to mind you'd like to discuss about Strauss and how you knew him? And... I think we've covered the important subjects. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. 
Well, you're very welcome. This is Stephen Gregory sitting with Victor Gurevich, the William Griffin Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Wesleyan University. We're here at the Leo Strauss Center at the University of Chicago. Victor, welcome. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. You must have been one of Leo Strauss's first students here at the University of Chicago. I think I was. Yeah. Yes. He came here in 1949. That's right, and so did I. Yes. And what was your first experience with Professor Strauss? As I think I mentioned during the conference, I went to see him more or less within my first week on campus to ask him for a tutorial on Spinoza. So that would have been in autumn of 1949? Yes, that's what I remember. It's it just barely possible that it might have been in winter, but I think it was in the autumn of 49. Right. And he would barely have unpacked his bags at that that's, time. <laughs> that's exactly right. And what was his response? Yes, I'll do it. He was perfectly willing and enthusiastic. And it was material he, of course, knew and had thought about very carefully. We did the ethics together, not the political writing. And I had done the ethics in a course in the history of philosophy as an undergraduate in Wisconsin. I can't remember with whom. So I felt that it was not totally virgin territory, but Strauss pressed almost right away on what it really meant to equate God and nature and what the one essence would be. And I felt, how should I say, uncomfortable. But that's not entirely true. The thing is that I guess the teachers I had 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 gone at great figures in the history of philosophy from the outside, as it were, and said, here is this way of thinking about things. Whereas Strauss really invited you almost immediately to think about it from the inside. And for me, that was very new and in a way unfamiliar. It was difficult. Yes. Think along with Spinoza, keeping in mind all the alternatives, you know. <laughs> and also, I think Strauss thought of me as, in a way, more sophisticated and more comfortable also in languages, especially he expected me, I think, to read German fluently. I had stopped German at the age of 10, and I was, as it were, making myself relearn it. So I remember his giving me sources to consult, not in order to understand the text so much as sources he thought were really first-rate information, a biography of Spinoza by Dubon Barkovsky, and two volumes. And I just simply didn't feel that I could devote the energy and the time uh, to doing them justice. It was hard enough to do the Spinoza. We moved along. I guess there are two things that stand out in my memory of that Spinoza. One of them was the insistence on the primacy of individual things that Spinoza was not interested so much in the generic as in the individual. And the other is that his Spinoza was really a materialist. That was quite striking to me and eye-opening. But all this is truly very long ago, as you know. Right, right. When he conducted these meetings with you, how did he do that? I guess we met once a week, probably. Yeah. And I don't remember for how long, but probably for an, between an hour and two. And he assigned sections to me so that we moved through the text. And I don't really recall being asked to write papers. At least I have no record of papers either. So I would come in and report on my reading, and he would sort of poke and probe, and then would expound parts of it, revealing to me things unsuspected. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you have the sense as he poked and probed that he was responding to your understanding, Victor Gurevich's understanding? Oh, yes. I mean, I do think that he overestimated my understanding, but mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes. It, he was always sensitive, I think, to the other person. Ralph Lerner, in his 1973 uh, memorial remarks, yes. suggests that when 
Strauss arrived here in 1949, he was not yet the master teacher that people think of him as. Yes. Is that what you observed? No. I'm sure that that's true. But the stories that were told during the conference, let's say, mm -hmm. of his giving a test lecture and being told, or people judging, that he was not suited for teaching, but for research. Uh, right. I think some, I, some unnamed history professor commenting, this man is a researcher, not a teacher. It's something like that. <laughs> no. There was always, this was a tutorial, but there was always something, if I may put it that way, personal. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean that it was, in fact, personal, sort of this person, that person, but rather we made contact with regard to the texts or the issues. And he adjusted, I must say gratefully, to the fact that I was at the level I was, since I couldn't adjust to the level at which he was. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that he, you say he overestimated your background? Do you think this had something to do with him being a European immigre and his experience with American students? No, I don't think think that I, mean, I was a little older than my classmates and I had German and French and some Latin and so he thought well probably he can handle this material and he wasn't fully aware of how wobbly it was. Let me tell you an anecdote at that time. I had been told when I came that Chicago was very generous especially the committee with tutorials and I saw listed in this extraordinary catalogue a course in the Oriental Institute on Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that, that sounds fabulous. I must do that. But the prerequisites were Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Coptic. And so I went to see the professor. I think his name was Marcus. And he was uh, sort, of, sort of perched high on a, a stool in his study. And I said, may I audit? Because, you know, I mean, Greek and Latin, all right, but Aramaic and Coptic, Hebrew, no. He said, it's all right. Do you know French and German? I said, yes. He said, most of the relevant texts are translated. All right, thank you very much. Now, when does the class meet? You tell me. No one else had had the nerve. <laughs> But you had the nerve to approach Strauss when he first came. Yes. How, how did you know of him? I had been told about him by Taubus. The name Taubus Ta doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything to you. Probably just as well. He was a very gifted, young, recently minted doctor in philosophy. He was of a family that came from Vienna, but he had gotten his degree under someone called König, in Switzerland, in Zurich, I think. He was touring America, looking for a job. He had written a book called Western Eschatology, Abendländische Eschatologie, and it was a very bold history of, in a way, moral philosophy and theology, at least from Augustine through Marx. I think that he knew Strauss's Spinoza book, he had gone to look up Strauss and had attended Strauss's lectures on Maimonides at the Jewish Theological Seminary very soon after his arrival. Progress and Return, I think? No, no, that came much later. No, it was on Maimonides. At the time, the other students, they were Hyman and Fackenheim. It's almost never mentioned in the biographies that he did this. And it wasn't for very long. He went on from there to uh, some visiting appointments and then to the new school. And Taubes was really very affected by this. He immediately recognized the brilliance and, in a way, the originality, uh, the depth, the originality of the teaching. I think he probably first alerted me also to the existence of philosophy and law, that first one. It was he who invited me, Taubes, then at that time. I was whatever I was, 21 or so, 22 to a group, a study group he was leading, where Nat Glaser and Irv and B. Crystal were, a private study group. So that was the introduction, their introduction to Strauss as well. And that would have been in 19... That would have been in 19... Uh, probably 47. I see. And so you had known Strauss before he came to the University of Chicago? No, I didn't know him personally. I knew of him. You knew of him? I mean, okay. 
this is a very interesting chronology. <laughs> it's it's rarely mentioned. Okay. I think Bill uh, Crystal didn't quite know it. <laughs> <laughs> you would have taken, in addition to the tutorial you had with Strauss on Spinoza, you would have taken regular classes. Yes, I did. I took the. Uh, I seem to remember that the first class I took was a course on the Republic. And that's the course with which he made his mark first. We had really never witnessed this kind of detail and deriving so much out of small detail. You know, I mean, yesterday I went down and so on and so on. What is Piraeus? The sort of harbor, pits, and so on. And then the definition of benefiting friends and harming enemies. Later, we learned to read poems that way. You know, with the new criticism, this kind of serious respect for the total integrity and unity of the text. So that was that. And, and I took another tutorial within the second term, or spring term, I guess, yeah. on Hegel's phenomenology. And I didn't know at the time that he had just reread the phenomenology because he had gotten the uh, Kozhev lectures and was uh, replying to that. So that was really very rich. Did you find, well, your experience of him as a teacher in the classroom must have been in some ways very different from him as someone conducting a tutorial. Yes, but it seemed a totally natural setting to me. By the way, it's not totally different. Let's just plunge into the text. The Republic became the richest text for at least that generation of his students. And this way of approaching the issue of justice was a really totally novel for us. I hadn't gone to the college, and so I had not, how shall I say, I had not been educated on the great books. So I would have approached or would have heard about these things as a systematic discussion of justice or so, rather than this context. And when you say lectures would have been different from tutorials, yes, but since for him the texts that mattered were dialogues, he was continuing a dialogue also in a lecture. Right. I mean, that I think affected his teaching. It's hard to say. Did it affect his teaching, or did his teaching, so to speak, get influenced by his attitude towards class? But I suspect it affected his teaching. When you read the phenomenology with him, was he discussing Kojev at the same time? Not with me. But did we? We may have. I had read Kojev before, so... But I don't, no, I don't think it came up directly. And the criticism of Kozhev that is contained in one of the letters to Kozhev, I don't believe it came through. I see. Okay. L let me add one thing. Quite early, I don't know, whether it was it that first year or a little later, but quite early, his insistence on nature, human nature essentially, that was really quite striking and distinctive. If you ask me now what he thought nature was, I wouldn't be able to answer. But at the time, it sounded convincing. <laughs> so, in several ways you've mentioned, Strauss appears as someone for whom, in your experience, there was no precedent. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, you're perfectly right. But I'd had good teachers before, right. and lively teachers. I don't know whether these names mean anything to you, but, I mean, let's say somebody like Vivas uh, at Wisconsin and others. I was thinking of Strauss's use of the word nature, his teaching about nature, the detail you mentioned, of the way in which he unfolded the drama of the Republic. That Sure. I mean, as so many people have said, he did, in a unique way, approach these texts as if they were teaching the truth. And that if we interrogate them thoughtfully, they will yield something like the truth. From the inside, as you said, that he yes. introduced oh, yes. you yes. Spinoza. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's very different, let's say, from McKeon saying, this is how Aristotle divides knowledge, and you can do that in a tidy outline. I guess the best form in which the uh, traditional academic approach went would be what you find in something like I don't want to sound as if I were putting it down, but in Thomism, a very thorough and thoughtful outline. 
that comes as a structure almost from outside the... Absolutely. Right, right. That's exactly right. What did Strauss think of his students here at Chicago? Later, I uh, heard he thought very highly of them, mm-hmm. very highly. He certainly thought very highly of his young students from the first, and the ones that come to mind are Seth from the very first, I think. Seth Benedetti. Benedetti. Mm-hmm. And Alan Bloom, I think, from the very first. I'm trying to remember who some of the others were at the very first. For instance, people like Kennington came later, but he had known Kennington at the new school or vice versa. And it was a generation he was, after all, in political science. I think it was not a fluke. But they were veterans. They had a maturity he was unprepared for and a seriousness he was unprepared for. And he thought... He was immensely lucky to have such a group of diverse, mature, humanly mature students who had done some studying, then had been on the battlefield or in one way or another involved in the war, and came back now on the GI Bill or something like that at a level at which one commonly does not get students and threw themselves into it with an enthusiasm that... He found that admirable. He often said that he couldn't have imagined better students than those he had at Chicago. And that would be different from the students who spoke knowing him in Claremont. How's that? Well, they were younger. Just that simple. I see, I see. Do you think Strauss learned something from the American students he had that he would not have... This is a very complicated counterfactual question, but do you think he learned something from his experience with the American students he had here that he he might not have learned if he had had the opportunity to remain in Europe and had European students exclusively? Was there something significant about his being a European coming to teach in America and being exposed to the United States? I would imagine, I do not presume to know, but I would imagine that the possibility of easy relations with students, he found very congenial. And he took to that quite easily. I mean, he would invite students. I think I'd said before that I believe he was closer to his students and took more time with them than with his colleagues, with whom he was not very close. I came from the committee... After my first year in the committee, I got the fellowship to Paris for a year. Someone had uh, interrupted his fellowship. And I was taking courses with Jean Val, who had taught here, as a matter of fact, during the war. And so, and Val would lecture, and then he would ask for questions from the students. And they would sit silent. And he would say, I mean, you must have some responses to what uh, has been going on. And they would be reverentially silent. And he would say, my God, I miss American students. <laughs> uh, and this is surely something which Strauss would have missed and which he encountered not just in Chicago, but probably at the New School also, that I think he found genuinely congenial and stimulating. Did he learn anything? Yeah, they're nice guys. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> yeah. But this other stuff, I don't want to get into these political discussions, but I mean, virtue and capitalism don't go hand in hand. Okay. What do you think Strauss was, uh, how do you think he understood his role as a teacher? What was he attempting to do? You're pushing me to the inclined plane about forming a school. I don't think he was trying to form a school. There are other answers. Am am I, am I, you'll edit this if you want to. I think he found it comfortable before long to be taken over by what I would call viziers. And it became a sultanate with greater and lesser access and greater and fewer favors and so on, and jealousies and infights and... I thought it was terrible that he allowed that to happen. And I believe he allowed it to happen, not that he fostered it, but it was convenient. 
to be driven across the midway and to have somebody take dictation and, uh, and so on. You know the trappings better than I. I had nothing to do with that, but it was a way of currying favor with him to be his assistant. I mean, people would, would bear that as a badge of honor, more or less. I don't want to draw comparisons. That, that's clear. But I don't believe that that was a school. The other question, did he direct, in some sense at least, students' interests in one way or the other if for dissertations or so? Probably to some extent, the way that it was described, let's say, by Ralph Lerner yesterday or the day before. You know Hebrew, you're interested in constitutional law, you're a patriot, do something like the founding. It became engrossing to a great many people. Did he come with a view to teaching or, or encouraging the study of the founding? I'd be surprised, maybe the least little bit, only in the sense of showing that the progressive liberalism of the 30s and 40s, let's say, of which these students had been brought up in, is not how it all arose, mm -hmm. and that it's good to look to the roots. That's how I see it, but I may be wrong, and others may see it differently. It, it is striking that with the American founding and the study of a Jewish and Arabic texts, you had students of his who have done really remarkable work yes. on texts and subjects he never taught. Yeah, that's right. He never taught the founding, never taught Maimonides, never taught Al-Farabi. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. But he encouraged such things to some extent, yes. Mm -hmm. I will say this, I've said this before, and I'll take this occasion to repeat it. He was an exemplar in many ways to many students, but preeminently to Jewish students, mm -hmm. in the sense that he was the only person who bore being Jewish and Jewish learning with great dignity and absolutely no apology. I didn't say this in my prepared notes, but I mean, since we're doing this and since you can edit it, um, <laughs> I remember the rabbi at the Hillel house, Pekarsky, who was a most remarkable man, mm -hmm. once saying, let's get the Jewish faculty together and involved in the activities of the Hillel house and gathering some people together. By this time, I had gotten a job in the college, and so I was included as faculty. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have known about this. Mm -hmm. And there was, I guess, Singer in sociology and somebody from philosophy and so And we were in one of the back rooms of the Hillel House, and Strauss was there. And they were acutely uncomfortable. They were acutely uncomfortable, a little bit as if they had been seen entering a whorehouse. I mean, I don't want to be seen even coming into the Hillel House. I mean, what is there to be done here? You will hold satyrs or something like that, but I mean, that's it, isn't it? And I mean, Jewish for them meant small business and Lower East Side and mean, mean lives. And Strauss said, hallelujah, it's also Jewish. And then they just snuck out. But the fact that he did that and that it was natural to him to do that mm -hmm. was very powerful. As you know, he gave a remarkable series of lectures at Hillel House. Well, sure, yes. That's an, an important part of his teaching here at the university, although it was Turned out to be. Yeah. That's right. Of course and that is uh, both he and Pekarsky. It's to the credit of both of them together, yes. Yeah. Regarding Strauss, how Strauss thought of his role as a teacher, leaving aside the question of school, are there other ways to... Yes, to yes, you mean a, of a Straussian school? Yeah, leaving yeah. aside the yes, question yes, of... Yes, of yes, 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 all right, yeah. yes, yes. You know, Strauss took with great seriousness the idea of a philosopher, who a philosopher is, what yes. a philosopher yes. is. Did he imagine that he might... Well, this is becoming a complicated question. Was he teaching possible philosophers? Did he understand himself to be providing service for philosophy, keeping it alive, but perhaps not by necessarily finding that very rare individual he would consider to be a philosopher? How did he understand himself with regard to philosophy and his teaching? What was he trying to do? Yes, surely keeping it alive. Surely. I've often wondered about 
just the question you are asking, mm -hmm. and and I'm not sure that I can speak to it really very well. He, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, at one point in a letter that Maya published, mm -hmm. latest letter I think, said, "I think of myself. I like to think of myself as a as a philosopher." But I see that Jonas calls himself a philosopher, and so I'm not so sure. <laughs> that was the private Strauss. And Pines speaks of him as a philosopher. I do think that, was he teaching philosophers? He was teaching the respect for and the utter importance of philosophers mm -hmm. or philosophy, and that one ought not to give in to the temptation of believing that, so to speak, a homogenized culture or social science or, or so eliminates that. I think in the beginning of Persecution and the Art of Writing, he says something like, he's very critical of, I can't even remember his name, uh, Sociology of Knowledge, and he says, they never even consider the possibility of philosophy. And that, I think, is true. And that, I think, to him was a terrible danger. And did he think that it was particularly that America or, or Chicago was a, a good soil to cultivate a philosophy? It's the soil he had. And it was okay. It was okay. Would elsewhere have been better? I'm not at all sure he ever considered that seriously, yeah. except in the sense that, for instance, it was more important. When he was invited to take the chair in Jerusalem, he didn't because he didn't want to move, not because he loved Chicago, but because it would disturb the continuity of his work. Mm -hmm. That mattered more than anything at a certain stage. What's the best way to do it? To do his work. I think that, you know, in an odd sense, at a certain age, that totally naturally takes over. I understand. I think, if, I hope that speaks to your question. Very much so. I heard one of Strauss's later students claim that in his first decade at Chicago, that he really threw himself into his teaching, that the classes would often go four hours long. He Absolutely. Answer every question. Absolutely. That's true. And then at some point he pulled back. Now, it might have been because of the heart attacks that he had, yes. or it might have been a change in his understanding about what he was trying to do, or a sense that he had to save his energies and devote himself to his own work more than his teaching. I think it's the latter and perhaps the health. But it's true. There was simply... Yes, he was notorious. His classes would go over an hour or two. His Hillel lectures, he would invite a group of us over to his apartment. We would sit on the floor and he would continue talking. There's no question about that. Yes, and that he probably cut back. Uh, probably, yes, health, time, Mrs. Strauss. I won't ask about the last. <laughs> no, I, solicitously. I mean, to, to, totally, you know. What would a solicitor's wife under the circumstances sure. urge? Sure. Why do you think he conducted his classes this way. The accounts I've heard is that after, once he opened the discussion to questions, he would literally take every question until there were no questions left to answer, discuss, as you say, you know, for an hour over time. Why do you think he conducted his class this way? That's his respect of students and of interest. I do believe that's certainly what it conveyed. He very seldom, almost never, put anyone down. He was sometimes very severe. He was a tough grader. But he didn't say that silly or stupid. A respect. I mean, in that sense, almost Kantian respect of the other person. And so... And the students felt it. Yes. So the students who came to his class, that Professor Strauss felt a deep respect for their choosing to come and study this thing that he was teaching. You always put it in terms of his taking, how shall I say, pleasure in their taking pleasure in his teaching. That's not how it came across. He was not at stake. Yeah, I was thinking that they were respect for their choosing not to hear him teach, but for their choosing to their study Their interest in the subject, yes. Yeah, that's what I their mean. In, okay, their yeah. interest in the subject. The difference, 
once again with McKeon could not be greater. Just to take McKeon as an example, I think, by the way, that the question that came up this past weekend several times about why does he do political philosophy and not philosophy proper, which I remember feeling very acutely, and I know others also. I mean, this man who knows the whole history of philosophy, and there he is teaching, occasionally teaching maybe something like Hegel's philosophy of history, but what about the encyclopedia? What about the logic? What about the critique of pure reason? I mean, why not? I think there was the genuine feeling that he was not entitled to trespass on the territory of the philosophy department. And his relations with McKeon were tense. Let me say a word about that. You probably, I mean, most people know this, but anyway, it's worth going on record with it. McKeon also was a medievalist and a well-trained medievalist. Right. He was encyclopedic and learning in, in a certain way, but he was a Latinist, Greek and Latin. He didn't have Hebrew or Arabic or anything like that. That was outside his ken, that somebody would be able to do both and is sitting over there across the quadrangle was acutely uncomfortable. McKeon had headed the Committee on the History of Ideas. Right. I don't think he ever involved Strauss. Strauss minded that. McKeon, at a certain level, Strauss probably expected that he would be welcomed in a, quote, neo-Aristotelian setting. He soon recognized that university politics takes precedence. But I'm sure that that was part of his reason for finding an offer from Chicago tempting. McKeon's highest aim, as it were, was a philosophical ordering of the systems, which would in some sense be neutral, but a system of alternative systems. That's just like Strauss at a certain very general level. The enterprise is not that alien, and so that intellectual, let us say, suspicions, if not clashes, and wearinesses would be much more manifest than if it were about, I don't know, the reading of a particular passage in uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas or so. Because so much is at stake, you have an entire system. And so. Your whole view of philosophy and right. how you put it together. Right. And there they were hardly in agreement. I mean, McKeon's system was, for instance, such that he put Dewey and Aristotle into the same bag. But you know, on Strauss's side, one recognizes that he sought out the highest, what he considered to be the highest interlocutors. You, you mentioned his study of the phenomenology in response to Kojev. He and Kojev had very different views of philosophy, and Strauss did not avoid him. He sought him out. Well, there are two things to be said that I will say. There are many more than two things to be said. <laughs> I think Strauss and Kojev found each other just congenial. And one of the things that they found congenial is that both of them were superlatively intelligent and both of them were ruthlessly radical. And that aroused sympathy. <laughs> you, I mean, just, just simply, yeah, I mean, okay, why piddle around? The second thing is, I think, which Pippin once said, that he thinks that Strauss chose a public debate with Kojev because it's a somewhat easier surrogate for Heidegger. And I believe that is also true. I think that it's very shrewd of Pippin. It's as if that were a trial run, you know? Right. It was not important that you agree. It was important that you are matched equal, that you are equals, or that it's really tough in that sense it's clear that he held Heidegger in higher, philosophically, in higher regard than anyone else of his contemporaries. I'm going to take a step back from those heights to the University of Chicago, and you had mentioned his relations with McKeon and how there was this unfortunate university politics that perhaps bad feelings or... I'm not sure, but it was short, turf wars. Yeah. When one thinks of Strauss's friends, one thinks of mainly Germans and old friends of his. Yes, absolutely right. Yeah. Who here at Chicago would you have considered to be his friends or his close colleagues? You know, I daren't 
say I was, after all, a we young man. We can edit this question young, out. You know, there were limits to how much mm -hmm. I participated in his life. I was not as close to him as any number of others. His, I believe that his closest friends were indeed Blankenhagen, David Green, and Ed Banfield. There must have been others. I wouldn't have known. I remember dinner once with him and Morgenthau, but it's just we happened to have been invited to the same dinner. I don't think that he was particularly close to Morgenthau. And what he had in common with both Blankenhagen and David Green is both Europe and this very profound classical culture. Finally, I think that that war thin. Blankenhagen found difficult, if not impossible, to swallow Strauss's sympathy for, let us say, conservatism, and especially things like censorship. And he was not a moralistic or so, but, I mean, Strauss wasn't, but he certainly found censorship something worth considering, and Blankenhagen found it totally unacceptable. And then Blankenhagen moved to New York, and they really hardly saw each other. But I think that created tensions. And David Green, did you know him? Yes. You probably didn't know Blankenhagen. I didn't know Blankenhagen. I studied with David Green for several years. Oh, well, there you are. So David felt what counts is the free spirit and allowing humanity to express itself lyrically, poetically. And he called Strauss a ruthless rationalist. And he was perfectly right, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> from his point of view. And that was eventually just incompatible. Inside the political science department, by the time that Strauss left Chicago, it seems the department was eager to show him the door. That may be, that was much after my time. This is what's been reported to me. Obviously, I wasn't here then. Yes, I wasn't here either. There was a certain rivalry, probably within the department, even in my time. You must remember, I'm talking really about a period, let us say, that goes at most, let's say, through 55. I mean, a little longer, but right. essentially 55. At that time, the committee had only come into existence quite recently. It was a very strange combination of people. Schaus was, after all, not on the committee and made himself available, in part probably, to go back to the earlier question, to do philosophy in a context in which it was not at issue. The relationships between the committee and the philosophy department were awful because of David and other reasons. But you know the story of how David was fired from the philosophy department. And Hutchins had made a note in his file saying, if anything happens, let me know. And so Hutchins placed him in the committee. But classics, right. Maybe the classics department, maybe classics. My impression was he also had an appointment in philosophy, but maybe I'm wrong. In the end, his only appointment was the committee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why do I mention this? Alan, well, you, there was uh, a very powerful secretary in the political science department. I don't know about the faculty. I mean, I know about some of them. And God, you make me think about things that I hadn't thought about <laughs> for such a long time. And it was a Mrs. Herlihy. You know the name. I've heard the name. Uh, yeah. She was a sergeant major. And Alan saw, quite rightly, that the prospects of going on, getting a job, or a professorial affiliation with a degree from the committee were very slim. And so he cultivated the political science people and eventually went to one of the political science conventions and one of his friends managed to get him signed up there. And suddenly he came back from the political science convention as a political scientist. And Mrs. Hurley he was furious <laughs> that this interloper was trespassing on this sacred ground. Mm -hmm. And this is not a direct answer to your question about whether uh, the department as such was glad to see him go, but they saw that it was an Im empire within an empire, whether he wanted to create it or not, it mm -hmm. grew that way. And they probably thought enough already. Yeah, that I can see. But Strauss had several students from the committee, you, Sassan yes. Ardetti, Alan Bloom. Right. 
do you see any differences between his committee students and his political science students? Well, the committee students, the ones I can think of, did go essentially into philosophy in one way or another, which is something we had no hope of achieving, really, at the time. Rosen was the first. Rosen got a job for Kennington. He got me a job. And the only other one was Mahdi. Mahdi is now sort of praised and stroked as a very great scholar and so on. And it is said to his credit that he dedicated his major book on Farhabi to Strauss. As I pointed out the other evening, he dedicated it to L.S. He didn't mention the name. And the book, so far as I can tell, is Strauss in English. Many students simply lived off Strauss's teaching and his the transcripts. You might once put somebody on that track just to see how much of this is what in other circles would be called plagiarism. It's really quite astonishing. It's simply paraphrases of the lecture notes. And that's one of the reasons why I have very mixed feelings about putting these lectures in public circulation. I mean, it's worse than term papers on the internet. It's, so to speak, faculty getting their term papers on the internet. Anyway, that's a different story. Was there any difference with the other students on the committee? Kennington came to the committee. He had been a student of Strauss's at the New School, and he was fanatical Straussian, if I may put it that way. He had a difficult life. He was a tortured soul and a very fine man. Who else was on the committee as a student of Strauss? Was Masters on the committee? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think he was on the committee. I didn't think so either, but I didn't know. Yes. It was a comparatively small group. And one of the differences is that for the most part, we did not take courses in political science. Not on principle. We would take Strauss's courses or so, but we regarded those as not courses in political science. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really... But courses on constitutional law or, uh, I don't know, the governmental structure and so on, we did not do that kind of thing. And we thought it was worth the price we had to pay for that. As you mentioned, Strauss arrived at Chicago right around the time the committee was starting. That's right. And it's an interesting question. Why didn't John Neff ask Leo Strauss to join? John he didn't Neff. like Jews. I mean, just for starters. I understand that he wanted d'entrave. The one person who was in philosophy and the committee mm-hmm. uh, was Yves Simon, who was a disciple of Maritain. I mean, a real disciple. If there's an expression Straussian, there's an expression Maritainiste. <laughs> he was a Maritainiste, much more than a Thomist even. And a very nice man. Very nice man and a thoughtful man, a deadly teacher as far as I was concerned. Some others thought he was really very, even an interesting teacher and he was certainly genial. And that's what Neff wanted. Strauss was not well known at the time. Why would Neff have invited him? Neff invited celebrities. Strauss became a celebrity here. He had been known by a group of students and young professionals in Germany and so on. And he was in, known as a medievalist in France, but that really didn't cut much eyes. I don't think, for instance, that Massignon, who thought well of him, would have intervened with Neff. That would have made a difference to Neff. Or Gilson, with whom Strauss, I think, was on fairly good terms. But these things didn't quite make it. I don't know how. Otto Simpson got appointed to the committee, but he was von Simpson. And his very good friend and classmate, Blankenhagen, was von Blankenhagen. Was Strauss on your dissertation committee? No. he. I guess he read my dissertation and he recommended a reader. Mm-hmm. But officially I did my dissertation with Simpson. And Wach, in a way, was involved at the time. Uh, did Strauss give you comments on your dissertation? No. Not that I know of. You know, my dissertation it came about in the following way. I had studied with Redfield, who was a really great gentleman. Robert Redfield. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes, yes. The Redfield. And then summer came, and I was short of funds. And Redfield said, 
I'll give you a research project. Write me during the summer an essay about Diltai, uh, who was mentioned in Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture, and so on. I'd be curious about it. And I settled down and started reading and studying Diltai. And I found it absorbing. And a couple of years later, I handed in my report to Redfield, and it was a dissertation. (laughs) He must have been pleased. I think he was relieved for me. (laughs) 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 Yes, and that I hadn't simply forgotten it. In 1968, you published your essay in the Review of Metaphysics, uh, Philosophy and Politics. Yes. That is, I believe, the first treatment of Strauss as a thinker. Yes. And the first treatment of Strauss as a thinker by one of his former students. Yes. Why did you write that? Why? Why, yeah. Dick Bernstein, who was editor of the Review of Metaphysics, said, yeah. do a review of on tyranny. Okay. And? And I did. And I worked on it very hard for a long time. And I think I was the first person to have read Strauss's publications, in contrast to my classmates and friends who had heard Strauss in class, but hadn't really read the books. And so thought of him in terms of what had come through in class and didn't know what had come through in the writing. And to me, that was a dramatic contrast. To put it most simply, infinitely more cautious in the writing, more radical in some ways, but also much more cautious and a much wider horizon. And then when I finished finally the final draft, I just didn't know, is it faithful to Strauss or is it in a way too detached at this point? And I felt really very awkward towards my old teacher. And I sent him a copy, a draft, before it was printed, just Mm -hmm not to approve of it so much as to say, if there are unfairnesses or inaccuracies, please alert me to them. And he very generously said that it was the best thing he'd seen and the best thing there was. He approved of it completely. The only thing he said is that occasionally you attribute to me views that are other people's views, but clearly that was not very serious. And he knew that he was at fault in something like that. <laughs> but that, yes. That essay, I think, had some... My impression is that essay had something of a liberating effect on other students of Strauss in terms of how they began thinking about Strauss. Do you think that's fair? Oh, I think that's fair, yes. I mean, uh, Tarko, for instance, has said very nice things about it, and... The people who were in Claremont, when uh, the article came out, as mm-hmm. it happens, just as Strauss arrived in Claremont, or just, mm-hmm. just about. So the people who were there at that time really were hit by it. And yes, there hadn't been anything like that. And I think it continues to be surprisingly mm-hmm. interesting. Many different readings of Strauss have come in, but I would stand behind it. The main thing, by the way, is yeah. this really... The zeteticism, the stress on zeteticism, that many people before simply never had perceived. (laughs) That's surprising to hear. Now. Now. Yes, Yes, that's right. It's hard to imagine the other way. but He made it seem as though there were nature. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he continued to do that. Nature, and that was unquestionable and teleological and all kinds of other things. And the reservations that he builds, especially into all of his written work, had not come through in class. That was no accident. (laughs) That's an interesting remark. Why do you think that was no accident? What do you think the difference there is between his presentation in class and what he was doing as a teacher and his presentation as... He he was undermining what received pieties. I mean, what nowadays would be called PC-ness. And you say this was in his activity as a teacher or his activity as a writer? I think I would say as a teacher. I mean, you know, as a writer, there was just much greater caution. Right. That's what I mean, yeah. and justification of caution. I don't mean that he was not cautious. For instance, one of the consequences 
of the things that you're going to be doing now. I suspect is that a number of old timers will reread these transcripts or notes mm -hmm. and will say, huh, it was there, but we didn't hear it. You know, right. that I consider perfectly possible. But Strauss presented a teleological nature in order to perhaps disabuse his students of a too easy embrace of the historicism that he was. Uh, oh yes, sure, choose. sure, yeah. sure, sure. It was a, 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 sure. almost a dramatic choice. Oh yes, oh yes. I mean, it's not that easily dismissed. These are sort of sophomoric arguments. They may be right, but they're sophomoric. Looking back now, and perhaps this weekend may have sparked some reflection or reminiscence, but looking back now on Leo Strauss, how do you see him? <laughs> well, a great teacher, surely a great mind, but we don't know each other. I surely learned much, if not most, of what I know about philosophy or the permanent problems from Strauss. I learned a great deal from him about being a teacher. I learned nothing from him about how political choices or wise political choices are made. And when I see the political uses to which his name has been put by presumably distinguished students and the political personalities that they embrace, I suspect I just never understood what he was doing. And that I find disturbing. Which, if I could press you on this, which students, which of his distinguished students do you see as having used Strauss in a political way? Oh, you are really pressing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer. Well, the way that Sholsky spoke yesterday is one way. I think Harvey Mansfield, and you know, fortunately, I don't know about any of the others as well. All right. Well, I hope sometime in the next year or two I'll have a chance to interview Harvey Mansfield about his memory of Strauss as a teacher, although Harvey did not study with him. That, much, exactly. But Harvey learned a great deal from him. <laughs> yes, yes. Professor Mansfield, I should say. Oh, heavens. Yeah. But anyhow, if I get the chance to do so, I'll ask him about the appropriate and inappropriate uses of Strauss. All right, all right. We've covered a lot of ground. Are there questions or topics you'd like to touch on that you think you'd like to speak to? No, I think you've really covered a great deal of ground. You know, maybe I should say this, I didn't read this in my comments, but the prologue to Goethe's Faust talks about reminiscences from long ago washing to the surface of the mind yet again. And do you try this time to hang on to them? And that kept coming back to my mind. All of this made me think about things over half a century ago, you know, it made me think differently. I think, I mean, that's just, just silly. I get annoyed at times and distressed with things said by people who claim they are students and or disciples of Strauss. And I made some of that clear the other day, for instance, at dinner. But Strauss did his thing. That's fine. He's not responsible for that. I mean, right. he's responsible to some extent. But OK, he did his thing in his time. I was astounded that nobody said, for instance, that this is a man who started all over again as a fully formed adult, became, in a way, master of a new idiom. His English is not perfect. but. In fact, he's quite a remarkable writer in English. He's an extraordinary writer in English. I mean, and he's the man who wrote to, to Klein or so. I can't imagine ever thinking or writing in a different language than German. German remained in his blood, and that whole life naturally remained in his blood. And in a way, people who now say, well, he changed his mind in the middle of his life or later, in, let's say, in his... 50s and 60s, he saw the merits of America. Yeah, he saw them. But in his perspective, 
And as a place that was perhaps not inhospitable to philosophy. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Right. America is a land of uh, second chances and reinvention. And I think it would be a mistake to say that Strauss reinvented himself. But it is remarkable, as you point out, that he acquired a whole new idiom and acquired a new home. Absolutely. Absolutely. Though I don't remember, and I may be wrong about that, I don't remember his ever saying that he was grateful Mm -hmm. that he was forced to learn it. He said it was probably a fortunate destiny that washed him here, but that's somewhat different. Whereas I remember, I think it was Carnap and some of the others who Mm -hmm. said they are genuinely grateful to have been forced to learn and think Mm -hmm. English, that that cleaned up their thinking. (laughs) <laughs> so, so you know, you can see how it might. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope that I spoke to the issues that you would have wished me to. I think I and many others will be grateful for your conversation. You're very kind. You're very kind. You're very kind. You're very kind. The Strauss Center is devoted to publishing the surviving audio tapes and the original transcripts or the transcripts from the digitally remastered audio tapes of Strauss's courses. And on our website, we have published the digitally remastered audio tapes. Anyone can listen. If a tape survived to Strauss, anyone can listen to it now on our Mm -hmm. website. And we're in the process. Over a period of seven years, I attended every single one of Strauss's classes, 19 courses. Right. Do you know Nathan Tarkov? Yes, I've known Nathan since I came to the University of Chicago, and he's the director of the Leo Strauss Center. So our main project is publishing the tapes, and we are editing the transcripts of Strauss's courses and publishing those either in print or online. And a secondary project is we are interviewing those who studied with Strauss about their memories of him as a teacher. We have so far interviewed Victor Gurevich, Hillel Gildon, Lawrence Burns, Stanley Rosen, and Werner Danhauser. And I expect next month to interview probably Ralph Lerner and George Anastopolo. I expect to interview Bob Faulkner. Who? uh, Bob Faulkner from Boston? Yeah, and that is probably the surviving students from mm-hmm. that, I, that I'm aware of, from his first generation or so of students. So no, not his first generation, of the, well, if you mentioned the second generation, because he, his career is about almost equally divided between the New School and the University of Chicago. Right. And I spent five years with him in New York. How did you first come to know of Leo Strauss? <laughs> I've got the whole story, it's written out in my new book. It's a collection of essays from over about a 35-year period, but I wrote a new chapter to introduce the whole collection, and there I told the whole story about it. I I went to Yale first and uh, had a year of graduate study at Yale, and I left Yale in the spring of 1940 because I was totally dissatisfied with the course of study at Yale in the graduate program. I'd been an English major as an undergraduate, and I didn't know exactly how I would continue my studies. My only ambition in life since I was a freshman in college was to be in an academic career. And I was told in the spring of my freshman year at Yale, that would be 1936, my faculty advisor, I was making out of my program, and I said that the only two courses that I had at Yale as a freshman that were any good at all were government and English. And I told him, I said, whichever one I majored in, and I did the other one in graduate school. So uh, he asked me well, what, uh, why I was going to go to the graduate school. I said, you know, I wanted to have an academic career. And he said, you can't have an academic career. Why did he say that? Because you're a Jew. Before World War II, the liberal arts colleges were 99%. I mean, Einstein could get an appointment. <laughs> but, but there were a few very famous sociologists who had appointments. But uh, So I decided to go ahead anyway and see what would happen. And 15 years after I had that interview with my freshman advisor at Yale, I had for my first tenure-track appointment. And the man who hired me was this man who had been my faculty advisor in 1936. His name is probably familiar to you, through his son rather than himself, Harvey Mansfield. Yes. 
Anyway, in 1940, there were no jobs. It was, the job situation was much worse than it is today here to now. And urgent necessity was to get a job. I thought that was an urgent necessity, and my father thought so even more than I did. Five years at Yale, and he can't even get a job. So I found that the only profitable employment that I knew about was the U.S. Civil Service Commission had a program for, called Junior Professional Assistant for recruiting college graduates into the federal service. And the only option available to me was public administration, the subject which I despised and loathed and hated. <laughs> but it was the only chance. I'm only 94 years old now, so I don't have to apologize. So you were saying that uh, you found a civil service job yes. in public policy. No, uh, what I did was I found a, a way, of, uh, a means of getting a job but through the civil service okay. this program. But I had to take an exam, and I knew graduate students at Yale who majored in public administration who flunked this exam. I was pretty good at taking <laughs> exams, but I knew I had to study for it, so I did. And I found out that there was a place called the New School, and there was somebody giving a two-semester course in public administration there. His name was Arnold Brecht. Mm -hmm. Does that name mean anything to you? He was quite famous in his time. He was a great teacher, and he was a good friend of mine. And so I took his courses, and I took the exam. I think it was in April of 1941. And I passed the, I don't know what grade I got, but I was on the register. And I went down to Washington, and I got myself a job. I didn't have any place to stay in Washington at that time, so I signed up for in a boarding house, which was managed by a cousin of one of my father's bartenders. And it was on, I think it was either Sunday or Monday morning, on July 14th, 1941, that I came down to breakfast and signed in the night before. There was only one other person in the room, and she came over and welcomed me to the boarding house. And I found myself looking into the face of the most beautiful girl in the world. I can show you. And I hadn't expected this. I was looking for a job, not a wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew the wife was more important than the job anyway. So we were married eight months later. And she died on September 27, 2010. Anyhow, uh, all my good fortune up to that point and beyond was due to the fact that I'd taken these damn courses in public administration. So. She worked in the War Department. I, I worked in a variety of agencies, war agencies. I never did any work that was, except with one or two exceptions, that was worth a damn. And I came to have a loathly for uh, government employment. Uh, and all I wanted to do was to get back to school. But I'd, I'd had a good relationship with Breck, who was a very fine teacher, incidentally. He gave another course that I took, which was on the end of the Weimar Republic. He'd been a judge in Weimar, Germany. And he was tall, very good-looking, very, it looked like the Megalopsychos, you know what that means? The gentleman in the, the fourth book of the right. Nico yeah. McKean ethic. And Strauss was the exact opposite in all these respects. Brecht was tall and stately. Strauss was a, a little guy who was a, a, as physically unimpressive as anybody could be. But in the fall of 1944, we went back to New York and I registered at the graduate school. And there was a course by one L. Strauss on Rousseau. And so I, I was meat and drink for me, so I signed up for that. So you simply picked up the catalog and saw there was a course on Rousseau. Well, yes. Yeah, so and that's what brought well, you my, to Strauss. Well, my major interest, my interest have been remarkably consistent over a long lifetime because when I graduated as an English major, the three authors who were the most important in my life and who I wanted to learn most about were Plato, Aristotle, and Shakespeare. I mean, his other, other authors of is Abraham Lincoln. I, I never had a course in American history. And in fact, if I, if I had, I probably would have been ruined as a Lincoln scholar because well, now I discovered Lincoln is another story. Before you attended that class, you had never heard of Leo Strauss? No, nobody had. In fact, if he hadn't gone to Chicago, I don't think I could have had a career either because he was my principal professor at the new school. But nobody knew about him. There was a period of about 10 years when I think the greatest faculty ever assembled under one roof was at the new school. It just lasted about 10 years, and I was there for at least five of those 10 mm -hmm. years. And it was an amazing place. All these top professors from the German universities were refugees. And so and I had to make the Euro famous European tour. If I'd been the son of a rich man, I didn't have such space with them. And I wouldn't have known who they were anyway. So Strauss's recommendation of me wouldn't have done me any good until he went to Chicago, which gave him a platform and more students. 
most of the students at the new school were high school teachers getting extra credit for it. They wanted to. Dave Lowenthal was one. Did mm -hmm. you have him on your list? He's at Boston. He was chairman of the department there for right. many years. Thank you for reminding me. He had slipped my mind. Actually, I didn't know he was still alive. Yeah, well, I keep getting things from him. I'm sure you're right. I'll check on him. When you attended that first class, what impression did Strauss make on you? Well, I, I wrote in this autobiographical introduction to my book that nothing had prepared me for Leo Strauss. It was pure intellectual force, overwhelming. The first impression you have is a funny little man with a weak voice. And uh, in those days, he was a little bit on the rotund side. Later on, he, he had a heart attack, and he, he didn't weigh as much as he did when I... But he was just in his early 40s, so let's say. 1944, he would have been 45 years old. Mm -hmm. He was born in 1899. So anyway, I, I said, every book was a treasure island, and you, there was a map to the treasure, but you had to decipher the trap. The map. The map. <laughs> <laughs> and his whole... The theory of esotericism and I put it sort of a nutshell. Incidentally, I've since heard that the two greatest heroes in Strauss's life, do you know who they were? I couldn't guess. One was Winston Churchill, the other was... I have trouble with names. The great German Chancellor. Bismarck? Bismarck, yeah. I wouldn't have guessed... If I tried, I might have guessed Churchill. I wouldn't have guessed Bismarck. Yeah. There was a good bit of German patriotism deep inside Strauss, too. Although he made it clear that the only salvation in this world was the things he valued was from the United States of America and Israel together. Right. right. And the spirit of Bismarck seems very far from both of those, but <laughs> that's... Uh... I have published one book of essays on Churchill called Statesmanship Essays in Honor of Sir Winston Churchill, which was planned for Churchill's 100th birthday. We missed it by about 10 years, but it's got some excellent essays in there, one by Wayne Thompson, on the German naval treaty before World War I. And uh, I think you can see there the, the Bismarckian wisdom. Uh, and there's a famous cartoon, which I'm sure you've seen it somewhere, called Dropping the Pilot. Shows the Kaiser leaving Bismarck. Anyway, Strauss loved Churchill. And I m might say that the one great book that I introduced Strauss to, he didn't introduce me, but I introduced him, was Churchill's Marlborough, which I began reading in the spring, I forget what year, but the first volume of Churchill's War Memoirs. And we were excerpts every day in the New York Times for a while. And, and then there was a Life magazine had a weekly edition. And during those two, both Strauss and I, would, each morning we would look for the, the uh, excerpts from Churchill's The Gathering Storm. And I remember the excerpts were finished I was still so hungry for Churchill that I discovered his Marlboro, which I think was his greatest work. And uh, I, there was a set of a five-volume set in the library at Queens College, which is where I was teaching at the time. And I remember using that, that edition, which I now own a copy of, uh, and uh, telling Strauss about it. Of course, then he went and gobbled it up. He had an amazing range of reading, which... His published writings, he usually is just so narrowly concentrated on a text, and he almost never refers to the scholarship on that text. Mm -hmm. Most of it was not worth it. The only secondary work that he ever recommended that I can think of, and it's, it's a very important one, is Pustel de Coulange, The Ancient City. He always referred to that. But I remember walking into his office at Chicago one day, and there was a copy of a new translation of Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, big two-volume work in it. And I said something to him about the life is not long enough for us to read all the things that we want to read. He said, oh, yes, I just reread it. So and his main source of American history was Charnwood's Lincoln, which is still the best introduction mm -hmm. to Lincoln. Yeah, anyway, I don't know if that gives you something of the flavor of how I... Yes, it, it certainly does. Do you remember how he conducted his classes at the New School? Well, I was in every one of them. So. Okay. He had his text for the day. He had notes written in it, and these little stubby pencils. Did you know about his pencils? Well, I've been told that he would use a pencil until it was completely worn out. Yes, right. And he seemed to prefer them when they got little, and he made all his notes with these pencils. He once told me that in two weeks' time he couldn't read any of his notes. He had to have them <laughs> transcribed, you see. I took down in machine dictation the first three or four chapters of Natural Writing History. 
I was a terrible typist, but if I didn't have to look up and back, I could be pretty fast. So he had a little, in contrast with his notes, he had these little spiral notebooks where he would write out, where he could still read his own handwriting. There's obviously some subtle psychological connection between his esotericism and his writing, the disappearing handwriting. One time he couldn't find his, any of his pencils and he, he came out to the outer office and he accused me of stealing his pencils. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Strauss, who would steal these your pencils? You're the only one in the world that I had use for them at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> his colleagues there at the New School, how did Strauss fit in with I mean, his, his relations with the other faculty at the New School? Not too well. He got on, he always had a good, polite manner. And the only one that he really had any intimate relationships with uh, von Blankenhagen. He really respected von Van Blankenhagen had convinced him that you could read a statue the same way that Strauss read a platonic dialogue. Somebody should do something with von Blanken. I don't, I don't know whether he has an archive or where it is. Or, I have no idea. He did have an essay. That there was, a, for a time, a magazine called the Chicago Magazine. Do you know about it? It only lasted, I think, a few years. But I know that Blankenhagen had an essay on the, the family Saltam Beek which was quite on a level with Strauss writing on Plato, but it was very, very good. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the family Saltam Beek is? Well, it, for a long time, it was the Picasso painting that you saw when you entered the Chicago Museum. Artists, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. The family of clowns in a very large canvas. Go take a look at it someday and, and, and see if you can look up the... Uh, the von Blockenhagen yes, article. Uh, did you know what von Blockenhagen, what, what he looked like? I've only heard a few stories about him, but I don't know. Well, he was a cripple. I don't think he weighed more than 60 pounds or something like that. Very, just uh, skin and bones, but a very spiritual look on his face, which might have been due to the fact that he was so thin. But I always regretted that I didn't take any courses with him. Well, I was only there two years and I, when Strauss went to Chicago. By the, way, by the way, I had a letter from Strauss in the summer of 19... Let's see, what year was it? 1948, I think it was. Yeah, that's it. I was with my wife and the one child we had uh, on his wife's farm in Missouri, or his wife's mother's farm. I didn't get along with the old lady there, so I didn't spend too much time there. But <laughs> And he told me about the offer from Chicago. And at that time, I didn't have any job. I, my three years at Queens had run out, and for the year 1948-49, I didn't have any regular paid employment at all. And I had a family to support. As a matter of fact, I did get some teaching I got three sections of intro economics, <laughs> which I knew nothing at all, at City College, <laughs> which was where Joe Cropsey was teaching. So Joe really rescued me. And Strauss knew my predicament with, as well as I did, really. And he said he would have made his acceptance of the job at Chicago contingent upon their getting me a job. But he said he knew that if, when he got there, it would be very easy to arrange that. But he actually, I think more than anything else, the, boost my morale, let me know where I stood in his estimation. First thing he did when he went to Chicago in, in January of 1949 was he paid his courtesy visit to Hutchins, and Hutchins said, Any, anything I can do for you? For he said, yes, you get Jeff a job. <laughs> so the next thing I had office for all over the university. I took the one to downtown college because I was still working on my dissertation. And things worked out pretty well. Why did Strauss make the move from the new school to Chicago? Well, actually, it was not but money because the salary he got at Chicago, which I think was 10000 at that time, which, by the way, was the salary that a sterling professor at Yale got in the 1930s. And instructors at Yale, I think, also got started at 2500 which is the salary I got at Queens in 1945. And he also had an annual supplement from the Jewish Theological Seminary. He got one... He didn't have any outlets to publish his stuff. The only place that he was sure of, one article a year, social research, and one article a year at the annals of the Academy of Jewish Research. And he gave an annual lecture there. But I have a story to try. I learned from my friend Marvin Fox at Ohio State about Strauss as one of his lectures at the Jewish Academy. After one of his lectures, the audience was leaving, and a very famous scholar there, I don't know who it was, what was overheard to say. What a shame, what a shame, what a terrible shame. 
what a great Talmudic scholar he would have made instead of wasting his life on philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you some idea of the milieu that he... Well, he felt very much at home in Jewish circles. He had a great loyalty to the Jewish, like Benjamin Netanyahu talks all the time about the Jewish state. I tell my students it can be a state, it can be Jewish, or it can be philosophic, but it can't be both. <laughs> no such... But anyway... Was Strauss's Jewishness important to his students? It was important to me, I know that. In what way? Well, I never had a, a direct conversation on the subject, but I heard him speak often enough about the things that were closest to him. So, well, I would say it was the same thing that was represented by when Socrates said, uh, I was not sprung from a rock or a stone, from a rock or a tree. You have your roots. And there was only one... Do uh, you know his autobiographical preface that he wrote in 1960? Mm -hmm. He spoke about a young Jewish boy in, in Weimar Republic. Mm -hmm. And it, it's in that paragraph that he said that all his work was the dimensions of the, see what I want now, the theological political dilemma. I think he used the word dilemma. How can you be loyal? And by the way, in my an essay I published, uh, I forget, uh, Strauss at 100, which uh, mostly was incorporated in my, my new book. And as far as I know, I'm the only Straussian who's even noticed the, the fact that in the introduction to The City and Man, you know that book, City and Man, mm -hmm. 1959, he speaks about the divine city of righteousness, in which Athens and Jerusalem disappear into one, something he had said was impossible. <laughs> so the same parameters of, that I arrived at Strauss, I think it, and so far as my inferior understanding goes, applied to myself. I, I remember if the classes fell on one of the high holy days, he would cancel the class, but he didn't go to the synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> I remember wondering about that and then never daring to ask, but nosing around to find out that he spent the day reading Plato. <laughs> so he was uh, very loyal to... Have you seen the letter that Strauss wrote about Israel in 1956? That was originally a letter addressed to Wilmore Kendall. Then it was reassigned to the National Review and published as such in National Review. It's a beautiful letter. He never did anything that was beautiful. This ugly little man never did anything that was that beautiful. Did, did you see the letter that Jenny wrote to the Times at the time that an English classical scholar reviewed, I think the City and Man, for the New York Review of Books? And I wrote a letter, one of many, one by Joe Cropsey. It was a nasty review. It was a stupid review, too. And, and I had a private correspondence with this guy, apart from the things that were published. And he had said that, I forget exactly what it was, he was part of a class of British scholars who loved Plato and they hated Aristotle. Plato was a communist. Well, I, I was able to locate the the passage in the politics that he was using, and he had misunderstood, absolutely misunderstood the Greek. My, my Greek is not, not that good at, anymore, but it was pretty good at that time, <laughs> since 30, 40 years ago. And what the hell is his name? I wish I could retrieve all of the correspondence. I don't know whether it's on my hard disk or not. But the issue of the New York Review of Books that had his review had a, on the cover a picture of Strauss with two right hands. <laughs> so I remember this controversy, not with the detail that you do, but I read the published correspondence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going back to Strauss's move from the New School to Chicago, you say it wasn't the money. He didn't move because of the money. Was it because of the press? Well, at the New School, he, to paraphrase Socrates, who said that he dwelt in thousandfold poverty, Strauss dwelt in thousandfold obscurity. He was anxious for recognition as much as anybody, as much as he despised recognition. <laughs> he wanted his share of it. And Chicago was the nearest thing to an Ivy League university, not on the East or West Coast, mm -hmm. or East Coast. And there, there was no, uh, I don't think there was a moment of hesitation there. He was going to be given, and God knows he made a good use of it. Strauss's desire for recognition, do you think that that was 
simply a, a desire for fame, or do you think there might have been an element of wanting to use that for something, wanting to use the recognition? Of course. What, what do you think really mattered when it came to this? Well, he has, in several places, he, most conspicuously in the introduction to The City and Man, he says everything he does is dominated by the crisis of the West. I know I at one point had a part of my ongoing dispute with Walter Burns, who at one time was one of my closest friends, turned against me in a really nasty way. And Burns wrote, Shepard has a delusion that he can save the West, you see. My answer to that, yes, it's my a delusion. All I need is one student in front of me, whose soul I think I turned away from the evil to the good. And that was Stratus. He certainly... Well, let me put it this way. I wrote to somebody recently that uh, I think that my dissertation, which was on Aquinas, right? A study of the commentary by Thomas Aquinas on the Nicomachean Ethics. I said that. Uh, I forgot. I also read your Aquinas book. That was the first one that I read. <laughs> That's the one I would urge you not to read. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Somewhere on my bookshelf at home is a large well, mimeographed it, copy of it because well, it was no longer in print at the time I picked it up. Well, what I think may make it worthwhile is it was a 50th anniversary issue, and I wrote a new introduction. And in that introduction, I said that when I wrote this book, I thought that Thomas was trying to make Aristotle safe for Christianity. I now think he was trying to make Christianity safe for Aristotle. By the way, in Strauss's view of Thomas and mine, I don't know whether one influenced the other or not, but he had the same. What he says about Thomas Aquinas in the natural right in history is not his later view. The things that he criticized Thomas for, he later came to think as devices to preserve Thomas's. So Strauss's desire for fame, you see, at least in part in service of a larger project to save the West. Yes. And the West meant above all Athens and Jerusalem. Yes. Did he seriously consider saving the heritage of the West, or was it more along the lines of your remark just now about reaching one student and turning them around? I mean, was the idea to reach a few people and keep things alive, or to really make a change in the overall culture? Well, for I don't know how many hundred years, Aristotle is known as the philosopher, and it would have seemed almost insane, say, to Thomas Aquinas to write a book on ethics. You want to write a book on ethics, you write a commentary on the Nicomachean ethics. You can't go beyond that. I wrote the initial chapter on Aristotle in the Strauss-Cropsey history, mm -hmm. which was dropped from the third edition. You probably don't know anything about that, do you? Well, I don't know why it was dropped. I know that it's no longer in the Strauss-Cropsey, that's all. Yeah, well, the only time that Joe and I have really ever had a disagreement but at one point, I forget, long before there was a, a third edition even thought of, I wrote a letter to Joe in which I said, if there's a third edition, I think you should consider these alternatives. One a chapter on Lincoln to match the one on Burke, and one on Shakespeare. In the last 400 years, there have been only two people who have assimilated the entire teaching of Machiavelli and still rejected it. The second was Leo Strauss, the first was William Shakespeare. In a way, Shakespeare's, in some respects, the most important single figure in the history of political philosophy. And I have a, a two chapters on Shakespeare in the Alvis West book on Shakespeare as a political thinker. One is a long essay on measure for measure, and the other one is, uh, and, it, and it began as an impromptu talk at the end of the conference in Dallas on Shakespeare, uh, and the title I gave it was On the Unity of Tragedy, Comedy, and History. Socrates, at the end of the symposium, man says that a true poet would write both comedy and tragedy, mm -hmm. and no Greek poet wrote both tragedy and comedy. The poet who wrote on both tragedy and comedy mm -hmm. was William Shakespeare. So I just mentioned that. So the, the chapter on Shakespeare, if it had been included in the Strauss-Cropsey history, was mostly written already. Well, I don't know whether Joe thought this was a power grab on my part or, or what, but he's wrote rap rap to me to say that it would not be a third edition. My suggestions were beside the point. The next thing I know is that some, I don't know, years later, I got a form from the University of Chicago Press asking me to release my Aristotle for the third edition. And I found out that the third edition was over. There were numerous changes which were made. All of them good, as far as I can tell. The problem is that the stress history is verging on the point where it either had to become too valuable or expand the shrink. So I was put off by that, and so I didn't sign the form, and 
I deeply regret it. I think it was a great mistake on my part. Both of us made mistakes, and it didn't change our personal affection for each other at all. But uh, Well, I'm sure this is not news to you, but uh, Joe and I talk frequently over the years. We worked on various things together, and when your name would come up, and it always came up, he always mentioned you with a feeling of endearment. So mm-hmm. for what it's worth, he always regarded you as a close friend. Well, I know that, yes. Yeah. But my Aristotle chapter belongs there. If they were reprinted, I hope. Karen's Lord did a good job, but he only used about half as much space, so he couldn't have done as much as I did anyway. But I heard from many people after the first edition was published that my Aristotle chapter, and that, by the way, getting the assignment to write the chapter on Aristotle is that following Leo Strauss on Plato, <laughs> well, I almost was paralyzed with fear. <laughs> <laughs> How did that assignment come to you? Did Professor Strauss write you a letter and ask you to do it, or did Joe contact you? Well, I, I'm sure contact was made, but as far as I can tell, there was never any difference of opinion among mm-hmm. any Straussians. I, and incidentally, I wanted to say that my text of my dissertation, I think it's the only time in history that I know of where a dissertation was accepted by a press before it was accepted as a, as a degree. But that was, at that time, Strauss's recommendation was uh, nobody else had to be. And also my job opened up at Ohio State, and I decided that was a place for me to go at the time. Strauss's recommendation was, well, neither the University of Chicago Press or Ohio State would have paid the least attention to a letter from Leo Strauss if he was at the new school. Right, I understand. So that was a, one of the great breaks in my life as well. It's still in print by, in my 1975 book, uh, The Conditions of Freedom. Right. That, that book, which also you might take a look at it, is a remarkable beginning because it begins with a eulogy to one of my beloved students who died in Vietnam. And it's followed with my eulogy of Leo Strauss and then the Aristotle. So that's a story by itself, but my tribute to Billy Patterson, with whom I used to go bike riding. And anyway, that's a story. He, he was serving as a captain of a naval helicopter gunship, the kind that went right down into the swamps. To, and he completed his a year's service and was waiting to reassign. And his fiancée was waiting for him in Hawaii. They were going to get married. And, and his replacement didn't arrive in time. And rather than for his teammates to do extra duty, he volunteered to serve again, and then his plane was shot down. So anyhow, that's uh, <laughs> but my student, my teacher, and then Aristotle. Yes, I understand. So Strauss moved from the New School to Chicago. That would be 1949? January 1949. Yeah. And you By the were... way, one of the things, that, the result of his going, the custom at the New School was you had to complete your dissertation, and then you had your general oral examination. Since Strauss was going to Chicago, they decided to give me the oral examination before I completed a dissertation. And there's a story about that in my eulogy of Joe Cropsey. One of the subjects I was examined on was economics, and I was going to be examined by Adolf Lowe, who was one of the bright stars at the New School at the time. So Joe went and read all of Lowe's articles, and then drilled me on, <laughs> drilled me mercilessly until I was just a parrot. He pressed the button and I came out with the answer. <laughs> so I said that when the exam came, it was just deja vu all over again. All I had to do was remember the button. And, uh, <laughs> and I was a great success and I had got, I got summa with my degree. And I said, my last, last line of the, that part of my eulogy was, the hand was the hand of Esau, but the voice was the voice of Jacob. So, and you followed close behind Professor Strauss to Chicago. The only quarter that I, the only time I missed any of his classes in a seven-year period was he went there in January and he began teaching, and I think, in, for the spring semester. And I got there in July, and from then on I went to every one of his classes. And was there a difference in how he conducted class in Chicago from how he conducted no, it in your school? Nothing. Nothing changed his approach to how to teach a text. In the transcripts we have, which 
the record of the transcripts only begins in 1954 and only really begins in 1956. I mean, there was, there's one in 54, and then in 56 there are a couple, and after that it picks up and it, it's pretty regular. But in this the class is here over tape too, and right. I have those tapes. Well, we have tapes of the lectures he gave at Halal House in Chicago. Yeah, those. Yeah. But we're very interested in the tapes of the classes he gave here on the Apology and the Crido for one semester and on Rousseau for the second semester. Now, I don't know exactly what's now on all the... When Strauss was here, I didn't go to his classes. I thought it would be a distraction to have two senior professors. The Rousseau one was, shouldn't be that important because the chapter on Rousseau in Natural Right and History, I should think, represents his mature view of Rousseau. But whereas in, in the case of, of course, of Plato, you can't tell the... Certainly. I mean, we've had a lot of conversation, discussion, about the worth of these transcripts and tapes, and it's clear that in most cases, if one wants to know his mature views, one doesn't need anything other than his published books. I mean, he, he published on Xenophon, he published on Plato, Aristotle. I don't think anybody, no study has made it all of his Xenophon writings. Yeah. And Xenophon was his favorite, number one favorite. But there are things to be learned from the transcripts of the courses, and there's intense interest in them. I mean, we have had inquiries from all over the world once we got started. People want to know about what Strauss was doing. They're very interested to see these transcripts. So you felt Strauss's teaching at Chicago, that he used the same method as at the New School. I mean, yes. what, what we can see in the transcripts, he would... In the first session or two, he would give a kind of introduction to the topic as a whole. Mm -hmm. And then he would begin reading the text, whatever it was, a few sentences at a time, and he would have a reader. And the reader would read the text, and then Strauss would comment on it. It's like Thomas Aquinas. That's what Thomas Aquinas did. Do you think that there was some imitation on Strauss's part, or it was an accident? Did Uh, Aquinas give him the idea? My... the first course I took with Strauss was on Rousseau, and his view of Rousseau mm-hmm. was, was the exact opposite of what it became. Rousseau was a secret disciple of Socrates, and everything else was exoteric. He completely rejected that later. The second course I took was one on Kant and Aristotle, in which actually we read Kant's Metaphysic of Morals first, and then we went on to the Nicomachean Ethic. And it was when we were, we were reading passages in the Nicomachean there's a famous passage, 1134b, where Aristotle says, natural right, uh, all is changeable. See? I now think that that's the way in which we must understand the virtue of phronesis, of prudence. But then Strauss brought in commentaries by Averroes and Thomas Aquinas and read them in class to shed light. And that's when the, the iron really entered my soul. Oh my God, I've got to read these medieval commentaries. and. My Latin wasn't very good, but it was. You don't need good Latin to read Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> it's like basic English. Mm-hmm. So that's when I started in the spring of 1945 to work on my dissertation, even though I'd only had one semester. But uh, what he said about Kant at the time was, uh, as far as I can remember, was definitive. I mean, Kant was the antithesis of Aristotle, and that Aristotle, every old natural right was changeable. But, Kant, the categorical imperative was unchangeable. It provided uh, no room for rational discrimination among ends or means. So, anyway, that's, uh, I remember that question. That's when I became a wholehearted converter. <laughs> but uh, Strauss is re- responsible, you might say, for my suspended agreement with him because he himself changed his mind about Rousseau. But he never changed his mind once he saw what Rousseau had done. He was mm-hmm. the father of Kant and, and Hegel. It's been said that when Strauss first arrived at Chicago, he was not the polished teacher that he became. Was that your observation? No. You think he was a very effective teacher from the beginning? Absolutely. What made him an effective teacher? Well, in my essay, which is, I don't have a copy, but here I, I said that Strauss's secret was that he didn't, make you feel that he was telling you what to think. You thought together. It was a, an enterprise which you shared together. Mm-hmm. He was the captain of the ship, but you sailed together. And I even, I think at one point, compared to 
Oh, this was going past the island of the... Scylla and Charybdis. No, Pardon? no, I'm sorry. The island of the Circe. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, except that you all went strapped to the mast with your ears open. <laughs> so, I said Circe, I meant Sirens. That was Sirens. Sirens. Yeah, that's yeah. right, the Sirens. Sirens. So the queen of the Sirens, her name was C-I-R-C-E, mm-hmm. in English translation. Anyway, I said... Uh, even an episode once went among Strauss' students at Chicago, including myself. We were, we started referring to him always as the old man. And he heard about it, and he was offended. And we explained to him, the old man meant the captain. He might be the youngest man on board the ship, but if he, he was the commander, you, you called him the old man. Mm-hmm. So then he was very satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful formulation that when he taught, he made the students feel that they were thinking with him. That's it. That, very much so. Do you think this came naturally to him? Do you think this is something he learned through his study? This well, way of well, approaching teaching? The roots teaching? of Strauss's the B is uh, are complex. And, uh, I'm trying to think now. Well, his Jewish education, I think, had a lot to do with it. He would have been a great Talmudic scholar. <laughs> and I'm not sure that he may, may not have been because he knew that whole subject very well. And his technique of reading is really to derive, clearly comes from Talmudic training. And there's, there's a long Jewish tradition within that, which is not Straussian by any means. But when that Talmudic scholar said, what a shame that he wasted his life on philosophy, <laughs> there was a very keen interplay. And I remember a little story he told once when he was in Hebrew school, and when the class was reading the story of Joseph and his brothers, and when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers who tried to murder him, they're reunited, that the entire class cried. They all broke down in tears. And how real that, well, that's Bible study. You're not just reading about somebody else, but he, he never left that class. And the letter he wrote to the National Review defending Israel, where else is the Bible taken so seriously as the basis of education? And I think even for the most rabid unbelievers among the Jewish community, when they read the Bible, they're reading the story of themselves. I also mentioned in my own education at Yale as an English major, the one professor I loved dearly, his name was Alec Witherspoon. And I think I had him for sophomore English. And I found out that he had a Bible reading group that met every week in his rooms. Mm-hmm. And he didn't advertise it. Mm-hmm. And he didn't invite people. But if you found out about it, you, you, you were always welcome. Four years, I never missed a single reading. And I said, that's by far the most I think I learned it, yeah. Of course, you know it was I that introduced Joe Strauss. He had told me that, that the two of you were at the New School and that... He was never at the New School. Oh, that City College. Yeah. But that he knew you and that... We were in Hebrew school together before high school. I mentioned he was the brightest student in the school and I was the worst. (laughs) (laughs) So how did it come about that Joe started uh, attending Strauss's courses? Well, he was in the Army for five years. He was in the North African, Sicilian, Italian, and Southern France invasions. And thank God he survived. Apparently we're plenty of... uh, close calls. And I don't know how well you know Joe, but he's a very rigid person, very stiff in, in his moral judgments, or at least mm-hmm. he was for most of his life. Anyway, when he got out of the army, first thing he did was get married. I had something to do with that too. I tell a story in that little thing. And then his only thought really was to make up for that five years that he lost in the army. See, now he's got to do everything. And so he would sit there and study and study and study reading the damned economic journals and everything like that, which were a waste of his time. Well, I saw him all the time once he was out of the army. And of course, the main thing I was telling him about was Strauss. He says, that's a distraction. He's just trying to get me back out of what I really got to do, read all this economic literature that was published over the last five years. And then somehow, it was many months, I don't know how many right now, at the time it seemed like forever, and that he finally broke down one of the city colleges. My apartment was right close by in Washington Heights. And when I was teaching at City, I had a desk in the department, and I could just walk from my apartment over there. Columbia was right in the same neighborhood. So finally I got him to go with me one night. Joe had always been interested in Adam Smith. I remember when we were still in high school, he had a hernia operation. I visited him in the hospital. I could see him sitting up in bed reading The Wealth of Nations. So, 
how he knew the difference between real economics and Mehmet Smith was professor of moral philosophy. Right. So anyway, that, that was that was it, and they took to each other very well. I was writing some of Strauss's letters for him, and Joe took over for me. What do you think Strauss wanted to accomplish with his teaching? I'm told that in the 50s in particular, he really devoted himself to his teaching. He always did. So what do you think he wanted to accomplish with his teaching? There are scholars who devote themselves to their scholarship and they're very poor teachers. And there are teachers who devote themselves to their teaching and hardly write a word. Strauss was very prolific, wrote profound works, and was also a great teacher. He's very unusual in that way. And many scholars would resent the energy required to teach, because it does require, of course, a great deal of energy every day. You know day. when I began full-time teaching? How long do you think I've been teaching? Well, it's been quite a long time. <laughs> 1945, over 60 years. My career has been much longer than his, and I'm a lot slower. <laughs> but Strauss and I had close harmony on many things, but what the right way to live physically, we differ. I had a career as a bicycle racer, did you know that? No, I did not know you had a career as a bicycle racer. And then my first bicycle race at the age of 46, and my wife and I rode a tandem for 20 years and logged, we had to get over 100,000 miles. I remember one day I stopped off on my way back from a ride at Strauss's house on 11th Street, and he thought I was a circus clown, because <laughs> I had a striped, if you ride a bike on the road, yeah. you, were, you would want to be conspicuous. Right. So the cars would see you. <laughs> he, he didn't know what I... <laughs> one time, the Goldwyn Conference is in Chicago, you know about those, don't you? Right. I was with 13 of those, and Bob Goldwyn ended up with my enemy, I'm sorry to say, because we were very close. But during one of the coffee breaks, I, I came to Chicago, had two baseball mitts and a baseball, my bag, and Joe and I went out and threw the baseball back and forth. And Goldwyn took Strauss over to the window, and he said, you see those two boys playing ball there? Yes, yes, yes. Well, that one boy, that's Professor Jaff. The other one is Professor Kropstein. <laughs> ah, the Libra <Lieberkart. laughs> And of course, there had been a chain smoker in New York, and at the seminars, I used to take a chocolate bar into class with me to get the smell of the tobacco out of my mouth. Now, thank God, smoking is banned, you know. But I've often spoken on the subject of teaching versus research and writing, it, and there was no division between those two things, and there never has been in any of my classes. So, did Strauss have an intent that you think informed his teaching? What was he about? What was he trying to do? All I can do is tell you what I'm trying to do. And let's begin by saying that he began his autobiographical preface by speaking about a young Jew in Weimar, Germany, mm -hmm. and the principles of 1789. When he wrote that, it was still 1789. That meant the French Revolution and Rousseau, not the American Revolution and Locke. Strauss's idea of liberalism, and one of his books is named Liberalism, and in that he, he speaks about one of the turning points in his career was when he read what the, the German conservative famous name. I'm terrible with names now. Uh, anyway, it was just his critique of liberalism which turned Strauss against liberalism. Before there was 1789, there was 1760 or whatever, 1670, Spinoza, and his emancipation from Spinoza and also his learning from Spinoza. Spinoza was a, a great corrupter of the young and also a great teacher. The theological political treatise, in my view, is the ultimate foundation of the American Revolution because Spinoza ended his critique of the Bible with Judaism. He wouldn't go on to Christianity. That was too dangerous. Slocks Reasonable to Christianity is the book that Spinoza wouldn't write, but mm -hmm. that's the book that turned into Locke's Letters on Toleration, mm -hmm. and that goes to Jefferson. And an interesting thing, which is in my work, and not anywhere else, not even in Strauss's, when Strauss, one of his really definitive writings where he never changed his mind about what he said there is on classical political philosophy, which he wrote in 1946, which was the year I was studying with him. And the central theme of classical political philosophy is the theme of what is the just regime, what are the best regime. Strauss discusses this question in that essay, and the key discussion is in the center of that essay. It is literally the center of the essay, as nearly as you can measure words or whatever it is. What is Strauss's definitive statement in that essay on the nature of the best regime? Shall we not say that that form of government is best that provides the most effectually for the pure selection of the natural aristoi into the offices of government? 
Do you recognize those words? No, I don't. <laughs> Whose words do you think they were? They couldn't be Jefferson's, could they? They were Jefferson's. Okay. So in this definitive spot, Leos Trails, writing on the classic, the best regime according to Plato and Aristotle, uses the words of Thomas Jefferson. Who was Jefferson's inspiration philosophically? First of all, Jefferson is the, the main, obviously, mm -hmm. author of the Declaration of Independence. And what is the Declaration of Above all, such a Lockean doctrine? Is this Aristotelian or is it Lockean? It's both. Anyway, when Strauss gave his lectures, the Walgreen lectures in fall of 1949, I was there for every minute of them. Do you have any idea how he began the lectures? No. It's not recorded in any of the texts. He began by quoting a medieval aphorism. Solid Aristoteles quieted a pugnum. Aristotle is accustomed to seeking a fight. Aristotle is accustomed to seeking a fight. Yeah, pugnum. Not because he loves fighting, but because he loves truth. I think that Strauss's signature and mine is right underneath it. Because the other Straussians don't go that way. They just talk to each other. But if you seek a fight, you're looking for people who may become your converts. So... Anyway, and I'm also the only one who has noticed that in the beginning of the city and man, where he says what is about dealing with the crisis of the West, how can we address the words from the divine city of righteousness? And he capitalized those words, divine city of righteousness. How can we address them to the pagans? And I don't know anywhere else where he ever used the word pagan. In the Middle Ages, Aristotle was called a pagan, and he was. So Strauss makes himself sound like a Baptist preacher with a gospel in his hand. And, of course, the irony of this is not lost on Leo Strauss, but as far as I can tell, it's been lost on all the Straussians. Was Strauss pleased with his students at Chicago? He was pleased by them, and I think to some extent deceived by them. They weren't as good as he thought they were. And that's been some of the history of my relationship. So, I mean, those Goldwood conferences were just wonderful moments. Here's a little episode of involving Strauss. Strauss didn't go to all of them. He went to two or three of them at least. And we used to have our, our meetings on the Chicago campus. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have, we'd have dinner at uh, Chuck Percy's home. He had this elaborate mansion up on the lakefront. And uh, you probably know something about the Percy relationship. Mm -hmm. He put up the money for these conferences. And those conferences were a great educational experience for me because mm -hmm. the very top people, you know, I met Jerry Ford there. Jerry Ford, who once told me that in the speech I wrote for Richard Nixon, which he never gave, he said, if Nixon had given that speech, he would have been elected. And this is a, literally true. You know what the uh, cause of election was? Because I was the only one in, in that camp who kept telling him, Nixon then got, got to imitate Eisenhower. And he never did. Anyway, Chuck Percy. Skip, what's this? Jackson at that time was one of the rising stars in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And was one of the people that we looked to. And he was there at the day, and he was sitting next to Strauss at one of the round table conferences. And that night when we were riding on a bus up to Percy's house, I was sitting with Jackson. Scoop uh, Jackson. Yes, mm -hmm. Scoop Jackson, not Skip, but Scoop. Democratic Party. Right. He's now, today he would be in the Republican Party, but then that was the Democratic Party. Now. Right. Well, that's why I remained a Democrat throughout the 50s, because the Democrats ended us with, with the Hawks. The party of the Cold War, yeah. Right. So, anyway, uh, Jackson was taught, telling me how much he admired Strauss. He said he used these words. He'd never seen such a combination of, let me get these right. One word I want, kindness is not exactly the word. It was one word which meant... I might say, ease of manner, also put the other people at the end. And toughness, that was from Scoop Jackson, comment on Strauss. It's impressive that Scoop Jackson would think something like that. At one time, Jackson was speaking, and Strauss wanted to speak. So he just put his hand on Jackson's arm and looked at him, and Jackson knew that Strauss wanted to speak. Mm -hmm. But he did it in a very soft and mm -hmm. gentle manner. Mm -hmm. Gentleness, I think, was and toughness. So that Strauss could have had a lot more influence, but he took his ministry as a teacher as a kind of a vocation. I don't think he ever thought of it this way, but a divinely appointed vocation. A divinely appointed vocation. Mm -hmm. To do what? To save the West. To save the West. A world in which, first of all, in which Jews could live peacefully. One little episode when I can tell you, which is very revealing of Strauss, 
Strauss was, in some respects, the most sophisticated human being I ever knew. But in another respect, he was very simple. And he once told me that he had some relatives in this country. I don't know who they were. They used to come to visit him once a year. And they were very stupid people, but they were his relatives. And Mr. Strauss used to make fun of them. And that used to hurt him. Why he would confide this in me, I don't know. But he did. And this was certainly, they're my relatives. What he would have wondered at is why he felt hurt. He knew they were stupid, you see. They only came once a year. But he was hurt by the fact that she would pour scorn on these poor people. Poor Jews. Have you interviewed Jenny yet? No, I, I haven't done that. No. Well, it's very important. Yeah. And there's one thing, she wrote that testimony to her father, as she called him. She never refers to, to her natural parents, as far as I know. Do you know about her career? Well, I know that she's now a professor of classics at the University of Virginia. I don't know the yeah. history of her career. Well, she was chairman of the department for a while, and she's achieved a very solid reputation as a classical scholar. She doesn't function as a Straussian, but still she tries to live up to it. She's apparently very good in Greek and Latin. And unfortunately, she had a broken, her marriage didn't work out. Her husband, Diskin Clay, was, the last I heard, he was chairman of the department at Johns Hopkins, I think. You might talk to him, too. He was one of those who presided over the translation of Locke's Letters on the Natural Law, which was published as a book. But Jenny, in this one, she wrote this one letter to the New York Times, which was a very fine letter, except she referred to him as ugly. And I don't think that's right. He was not an ugly man. He was, you might say, his physical appearance made no impression at all. <laughs> Insignificant, yes, but ugly, no. I see. But the minute he began talking, then he were transported into a different world. In which he was a shining knight. How was he as a dissertation advisor, uh, PhD supervisor? He never told me, never a word ever passed between us on the subject. Did he suggest? He read my dissertation. Yeah. The last time he read it was, I think, the third or fourth time when he was giving a course on the Nicomachean ethics theory. Mm -hmm. And he told me, you know, it was much better than I remembered. The only compliments he ever paid me in class is the same formula. Well, Mr. Jaffer, that was better than last time. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the year, that first year I'd studied with him, 1946, I sent out about 100 letters. To try. Not, I never got a single, not one answer, applying for jobs. But I had to give him as a reference of who else could I give. And so I had to ask his permission to use his name. And I said, gee, but he thinks I'm such an idiot. Well, he said, of course, he said, you're the best student I ever had. I don't know whether he, he ever changed that opinion. I did hear once that, I won't mention the name of a person on the faculty at Chicago, who was not exactly a friend of mine, but not an enemy at all, but, but who I knew quite well. There was a discussion in the department about possible candidates for an opening in the department, which is the opening I'm sure that Joe eventually filled. And Strauss had two lists. Now, don't repeat this story, because I'd be accused of lying, but it's absolutely the truth. I think there were four or five names on each list. One list was theory, the other was practice. And the names on the two lists were completely different, with one exception. The number one name on both lists was mine. But I made sure that Joe got the appointment, so. How did you do that? Pardon? How did you arrange for Joe to get the appointment? I didn't arrange anything. Okay, but how did you make sure that he got the appointment? He knew what I thought. And he was very grateful to me for introducing Joe to him because Joe was very useful to him. Joe is a master, by the way. He's 10 times better as a writer of the English language than I am. But you can't say you see that because he disguises it behind a sign of stiff formalism. But if you know his letters, I had a letter. This is important. After my mother died in 1983, I think it was. And Joe, of course, we, we were families were together all the time. Joe's father and mother were really out of the circuit that included Joe and me and my family. But he wrote me a condolence letter, which there's never been such a letter since Lincoln wrote the letter to Mrs. Bixby, just in which he referred to my mother as Aunt Frances. I never called my mother by her name, but he knew it. He felt at home. I think he felt it more at home with my mother than he did with his own mother, <laughs> who was a wonderful woman, but she was an old world. You might say she represented the Orthodox tradition in its nastiest. And I have wartime letters from Joe on the, what, what, the, what did they call those letters? I can't think of the word. 
It was a letter from, was from military trance. Anyway, his letters are all a direct, and the eulogy that I wrote ends by reciting a short story that Joe wrote for our English class, the seniors in Lawrence High School. And I repeated it. It made such an impression on me, I've never forgotten it. So I ended with imitating Joe's voice, telling this story of a rich the bull boy, the joyless quest for joy. Anyway, I'll let you read this story. So did you and Strauss discuss what topic you would write your dissertation on? I don't think so. And he read the dissertation. Did he make comments? No. So no comments. <laughs> well, I had written the first, I think, four or five chapters, and Jacob Klein was on sabbatical that year at 48, 49. And he was doing a course at the New School on Science and Philosophy in the 17th century. And we never got to the 17th century. We never got past the 60th. And of course, I, Klein, by the way, is the person that Strauss really looked up to, the only one of the contemporaries that he did. And he always praised that Klein's book on... On Greek mathematics. That's right. Yeah. Well, oh, by the way, the German conservative you were referring to earlier was Carl Schmidt. That's right? it. My that's mind it. blanked out. That's from it. That's, that's it. Right. Yeah, Sorry. Right. Yeah. When you worked for Goldwater, did you discuss that with Strauss, your involvement in politics? A little bit, to this extent that I have a difference with my friend, George Anastopo, mm -hmm. who objected to Strauss being referred to as a conservative. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying he certainly was a conservative. But when I was putting together a list of names, scholars for Goldwater, I called Strauss up on the phone and asked him if he would want to be included. On. And he said yes. I'm not sure now exactly why he said yes, <laughs> but he said yes. I put his name down on the list. Later, I took it off the list because I thought it would jeopardize his being able to continue teaching at Chicago. So I, but he didn't hesitate. This is the same Leo Strauss who was willing to be called a scholar for Goldwater, wrote a letter to George Anastopolo after the Supreme Court had rejected his suit in a five to four decision with a ringing famous dissent by Hugo Black. And Strauss wrote that the people in the Illinois bar, they should come to you on bended knee and beg forgiveness. In both cases, it's almost instinctive loyalty to his students. You mentioned earlier that you think that he overestimated his students. Yes. I took a couple of his classes, you know, at Chicago and at question periods and discussions. I could see that they didn't understand as much as Strauss thought they understood. He gave them a little too much credit. But also, one of the, you might say, negative phenomena connected with Strauss's presence at Chicago was the fact that his elite students formed a kind of corps d'élite in which they, they looked down on everybody outside of them. And Strauss didn't really know this, but it got a, him a bad reputation, particularly. In fact, one of them, and I'm not sure which, I think this was Dan Borston, who told me that once, that I was the only one of the Strauss students that he felt he could talk to, because the others were struck with their own superiority. Well, that's, a, that's a, something that happens around every teacher who is regarded as great. His immediate disciples, like the 12 disciples around Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> they looked down on everybody else. Did Strauss's students think of themselves as disciples? Yes. Did Strauss know they thought of themselves as disciples? I'm pretty sure he did. Do you think that that was something he thought was a positive development? I thought he could regard it as a kind of a, a negative byproduct, which he couldn't really avoid. Uh -huh. I mean, he certainly was not, didn't present himself as a disciple of anybody else. And I have to mention one good thing about Wilmore Kendall, and I, I've written about this in one of my books. Wilmore Kendall, who had the worst reputation of any political science professor in the country, but who worshipped Strauss. And I think Strauss would have, if Kendall had lived long enough, he would have become a good routine Straussian. But Kendall was the only American political scientist of his generation who paid any regard to Strauss. Mm -hmm. And you know about the Yale professor, who I don't know who it was, but it was back in the 50s, said that, but this has been repeated endlessly, there are only two kinds of people who should never be considered for tenure. Leninists and Straussians. Uh, I believe that was said in response to the tenure decision on Tom Pangle. In part of that controversy. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wrote a letter, but despite our differences, we've always been good friends, but he, uh, well, that's another whole story. That, that introduction that Pangle wrote to 
under Cropsey's ministry to the studies in platonic political philosophy, posthumous book of Strauss's. And uh, do you know about Drury's book? Have you read them? I know about Shadja Drury. I have looked at her books. I haven't read any of them through. I've got other things to do. I don't think she's worth paying much attention to. You're wrong about that, because she went to Bloom's lectures in Toronto, and the, the, the view that Strauss was really a Nietzschean and Machiavellian, mm -hmm. that originated as a Straussian origin. Pangle, when he gave a lecture here at Pi Sigma Alpha, at a dinner banquet, and he gave it Strauss, Nietzsche, and, and Machiavellian, the, the real people for Strauss, that all went into Drury. Mm -hmm. She didn't invent this idea. This is the secret teaching of Leo Strauss, which is concealed, not very well, but it's easily believed, it's what people want to believe about Strauss, but the origin. So I first got to know Drury when she had an article in the political theory. I read it, it just signed S.B. Drury, and I had no idea that this was a female, by the way. So I just wrote a letter saying that you show a sincere interest in reading Leo Strauss seriously. But you've got that wrong. And so you wrote Shadia Drury and, and told her she'd gotten Strauss wrong. Yeah. Right. And then she wrote back to me praising my reply to Pangle, which was published in the Claremont Review of Books. And it's now chapter number two or three in the book that's just been published. And she praised it to the sky that nobody had ever been as victorious as I had been in my contest with Pangle. And then she invited me to come and give a lecture at, I forget the Canadian university she was at at the time. And she hated Pangle, not because he didn't tell the truth, but because he did tell the truth. <laughs> but she just turned that into her book. And she wrote a book on Kojev, which is just another book on Strauss. So I spent the weekend with her. She was a very good hostess. She couldn't have been treated I had a dinner with her family and everything. But then, then she went on and on with anti Strauss. She found out that there was a big audience out there who right. wanted to applaud her. And so she's made a career out of that. She spent a summer here in Claremont with her family, and I didn't see her at all. She is a, it's of some interest that she comes from a Coptic Christian background. She came from Egypt. She came to the, this country as a refugee from religious persecution. And of course, now she's just an Obama. I'm <laughs> liberal, <laughs> just for repeating all the things that people want to cheer. It's a shame she did have a lot of ability, and she sent some of her students here, and they were well-trained. She did have a considerable accomplishment I in reading text, I except see. everything went down the drain when she found out that she could become famous by attacking Leo Strauss. Her last words on me, which she was at an APSA meeting, that how did she, she never wavered in her admiration for me. But I was a gentleman, not a philosopher. <laughs> she taught them philosophy and me gentlemanship. <laughs> she said that in APSA meeting. And I am a reply by saying, you think that uh, Strauss thought that I was stupid? <laughs> and I said, stupid I ain't. <laughs> so anyway, I, so that is a short course in okay. Drury. I wrote a preface to the preface. That Strauss wrote a preface to the preface? I did. You wrote a preface to the preface. I understand. Okay. Yeah, this is particularly Straussian. So I thought to the essays, what follows is intended to be the preface to a collection of essays entitled Crisis of the Strauss Divided, Essays on Leo Strauss and Straussianism East and West. The essays do not form chapters in the unified treatise or book of books, unified treatise or book. They span almost 40 years and are presented chronologically, each representing an insight or point of view that seemed important at the time. Whatever Leo Strauss for the ages, that's in quotes, the reader may distill from these pages will be his or her responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> then I have an afterword in which I do exactly what I say nobody can do. I say that Leo Strauss was the greatest find in political philosophy in the last century, and maybe in other centuries as well. But Strauss makes it, he always puts a contradiction somewhere at any major thesis he espouses, somewhere else there'll be a contradiction of it. So he, he didn't want to be an authority to anybody that, that couldn't accept responsibility for thinking it out for themselves. I have a little paragraph in here on 
when I did an independent study with Eugene O'Neill, Jr. He was extremely kind to me and very generous, but he didn't teach me anything. But uh, a year, two years later, when I was after I'd been studying with Strauss, there was a review of a new book on the Plato's Republic in the New York Times by Eugene O'Neill, Jr. And he got everything wrong. So I wrote him a long letter giving him the Straussian interpretation of the Republic. It teaches us the difference between the desirable and the possible. And he never answered me. But the following January, Strauss was already in Chicago, and I didn't get it. I was a job in Chicago. So I was signing up to teach another course at the new school. And I met him in the dean's office. And he greeted me very cordially. And I asked him why he didn't answer my letter. And he said, because I didn't have any answer. And I'd hoped to see him again, but a short time after that, I saw in the morning in the newspaper that he'd committed suicide. I, I mentioned that when I was in New Haven, I had gone to the library and I looked up his doctoral dissertation, his PhD in classics from Yale. And it was a metrical analysis of 500 lines in the Odyssey and 500 lines in the Iliad. Just a grammatical technicality. I said if he only had one course with Strauss or one lecture with Strauss, he might have learned why the classics gives us reason to live, not to commit suicide. That was my last word then. Did you read Gary Will's book on the Gettysburg Address? No, I haven't. Well, it's, it's not worth reading, I can assure you. <laughs> only because he, it's the one in which he, quoting Wilmore Candle, he, he said that to consider the, the Gettysburg Address to be a giant fraud, foisted on the American people an idea of equality which they had never entertained before. Everything in it was wrong. It got them surprised and all. The book was. <laughs> Hale was a, he's another one of the really great frauds because he started out on the right. Right, yeah, as a Catholic. He started out as a Catholic, identified as a Catholic intellectual. Well, I didn't remember the Catholicism. He had had, I think, Kendall for a teacher at Yale. And uh, Buckley was one of the people who patted him on the back. But he'd written an essay on Calhoun, which, they, uh, which was absolutely worthless. Here. Nothing had prepared me for Leo Strauss. Unlike his students at Chicago, I encountered him unadorned by any distinction of position or place. Unlike Brecht, who was a tall, stately presence, he might have been modeled for Aristotle's great-souled man. Strauss was a physically insignificant little man with a weak voice. His presence was as unimpressive as the dilapidated classrooms provided by the new school. But he was pure, overwhelming intellectual force. After a few minutes into one of his seminars, the little man became a giant. Every great book was a kind of treasure island, or more particularly, a map of an island holding a treasure. But you had to decipher the map and do the work of discovery, overcoming the obstacles by which great art, imitating nature, trains the mind to be worthy of its gifts. One of Strauss's secrets was he made you feel not a passive receptacle of his insights, but as his partner in a voyage of discovery. He was the captain of the ship, but you were part of the crew, and you sailed together. And I said, Saul on the road to Damascus was not more stunned, nor more transformed, than I, by my encounter with Strauss. Uh, that's very beautifully said. <laughs> okay. What year was that first encounter? What year? 19... I met him uh, yeah. in September of 1944. Sailing together, I thought, was my great metaphor. <laughs> you can take that with you. Oh, you thank you very much. I, I wanted to give you a copy of my book, but I don't have any copies here. Oh, well... This is wonderful. Thank you. Well, one thing I discussed there that, as far as I know, nobody else has paid any attention to whatever, and that is the difference between the opening lecture, the introductory lecture in 49, and the book that was published in 53. I think I told you, he began in 49 with the, quoting a, a Latin a medieval aphorism, Solid Aristoteles quaerere pugnum. Aristotle was accustomed to seeking a fight, and he said, and some have been accused of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs>
I was glad to have a good model of it. And he, but he said Aristotle was interested in the truth. Well, Fasimachus in the Republic accuses Socrates of seeking victory, and Socrates says, "No, you have to seek victory in order to seek truth." So, but well, anyway, uh, when the book came out in 1953, the first words were Declaration of Independence, and uh, he quotes the Declaration, and then he repeats what the theme of the Declaration. But it's in the Gettysburg Address now, but there are no quotation marks. In other words, Strauss gives the, he's paraphrasing it to Lincoln, but as if it's a settled doctrine. But the theme of the whole book is given in that introductory paragraph. He never returns to it. And there's no thematic discussion that I know of in the Declaration. He may, he may quote it someplace else, but that has become my project. Did you and Professor Strauss ever discuss Lincoln? Not, not really, uh, oh, maybe only passing references. But I think that the decision that he made in his own mind was that this was my career. He was certainly standing behind it, but he didn't want his understanding to be interwoven in my identity. It was, we had our own separate identities, and he thought that he could do me more good by shutting up about this. And that, but, uh, I understand. But, the, but this was the, in repeating the words of the, the theme of the Declaration in Lincoln's words at Gettysburg, without quotation marks, mm -hmm. he was giving that as his own opinion. And so the, the opening page of the Natural Right in History is his project is well, why have the American people forgotten the heritage in the Declaration? And he quotes a German author, I don't know who that was, saying that 50 years ago the American people identified their regime with the natural and divine right at and Jerusalem, bound up in its project. So the other Straussians that you'll speak, they don't like this, and none of them ever recognized it. But uh, and I haven't launched any attack on their work. I mean, a lot of it I recommend. Goldman's book on the first of on the Bill of Rights is a superb piece of Straussian scholarship, maybe one of the purest examples of it, really. He uh, makes you feel that he's sitting right next to James Madison, and they talked it over. So <laughs> Janet Stoplow does the same thing with the Emancipation Proclamation, which mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. raise very highly. Do you think Strauss learned anything from his encounter with America? He came here as a European emigre. Was there anything about the American experience that changed him or made him see things differently at all? Yeah, I think very, very much so. How? One particular episode which I've recorded in that book is that it was sometime in the first year that I knew him that uh, we were having a private conversation and he said that, uh, I think it was on his second trip here, that he, he, he discovered, and I don't think that what he discovered was really true, but he believed it. In America, he, he, in polite conversation, he couldn't use the word atheist. He said when he discovered this, he knew he had come home, those were his exact words. And this meant quite a change because, as he said in that 1960 preface, that he, he identified liberalism, which means good modernity, with the principles of 89. He hadn't yet to stay. So this was a commitment to, really, to the founder's view of Locke, which was very different from his own view of Locke. But this is what the founders meant. And so I, I have a comment in, on that in this book. The, the Zuckerts tried to explain why so many of Strauss's students were preoccupied with American politics. Well, they're, they're Americans. And Strauss was a German. Well, he was no longer a German in, in his own mind in that respect. But of course, the America that frowned on using the word atheist really no longer existed, but it was because of the alienation from the principles of the Declaration. And uh, I, I have another, this is the, you probably know this, Heinrich Myers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know Heinrich Meyer? Have you met him at all? Yes, I have. I haven't. My impression is that he brings German scholarship to bear upon that transformed the Leo Strauss. And he doesn't see that transformation. 
transformation that occurred after his encounter with America. Yeah, I've got a long quotation in there from Lincoln when the uh, speech he gave in July 1858, I think it was, on the whole subject of the citizenship and how most of those American citizens now were not descended from the original founders, you see, and so they can't trace their way back by blood to their inheritance. But when they read that Declaration of Independence, it says that then they know that they have blood of the blood and flesh of the flesh of the men who made the revolution. And so they are. That's like, that was Leo Strauss's naturalization process as mm -hmm. described by Lincoln. But, uh, well, uh, there's so many different things we could talk about. But what, what questions do you have? Uh, I, I have a few questions. And I'm very interested in your remarks about his Strauss's encounter with America. Do you think that, in particular, that he was teaching American students made a difference for him in the understanding he developed? If he had stayed in Europe and taught European students, would it have been any different for him? I mean, we think of him as, first of all, a scholar, a, a thinker mm -hmm. rooted in the classics. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see how the Americanness of mm -hmm. what he encountered would be significant, but perhaps having a classroom of American students made a difference for him in some ways. I don't know about American students, but, but America. He had me, <laughs> and he had Lincoln. Lincoln and Churchill were the people that, and Bismarck. And Bismarck, yes. <laughs> well, throughout the 19th century, Lincoln was frequently uh, compared to Bismarck. He presided over the unification of the country, mm -hmm. and he did it with blood and iron, not just with them. With sweet words. Yesterday, you talked about how Strauss had too high an opinion of his students. I think so. In reading texts, one of the first things that comes to mind is how tough-minded Strauss was, what Scoop mm. Jackson commented on, mm. that when, he, when you read his interpretation of texts, he's very tough-minded. He seems to have been less so, you say, with regard to his students. Why do you think that was? Well, I think the, the split that came about between me and the Eastern Strauss here Including Joe Cropsey, because he, he really became the sort of the, the presiding. He, he was the prime minister under Strauss's monarchy, you might say, in the mm -hmm. classroom. And, uh, well, I think the underlying division really was with what they thought that where Strauss was going and what was the, the ultimate secret behind all the secrets of the secrets. For them, uh, they began to interpret Plato as the precursor of Heidegger. It's the role of Heidegger. And none of them have ever said it. That, well, Harvey Mansfield wrote a little piece of paragraph once on Strauss and Heidegger. I've got it somewhere to have it down. Where uh, he, in effect, said, or, or at least hinted, that Strauss was a secret Heideggerian. And that was the ultimate secret. And since Heidegger rules America today, he's the most powerful intellectual force in the world today. And it's a uh, ultimate interpreter now of liberalism. I forget what year it was that Hans Jonas came out here, gave a lecture under the auspices of the Theological Seminary, which I, by the way, have renamed the Claremont School of Theology. I call it the, the, the Marxist School of Demonology. I once was in a debate with a guy who was the dean over there, and in which he accused me of not honoring the neo-Marxism, he said, what the hell's the difference between the new with the, with the neo and without the neo? But uh, Marx was Marxist, metamorphosed among the real sophisticated uh, into Heidegger. Well, why was Hans Jonas invited out here? Because he had been the research assistant of Heidegger. It was at Heidegger, which I think, I don't know to what extent, Jonas remained a Heideggerian. He had a, you know, a record, he fought in the British Legion during World War II, and, and without changing his uniform, joined the Israeli army in the war. So he, he had quite a record as a fighter for, for the, at least the independence of, of Jews. But he, at the end of the, his life, Strauss wouldn't, he, he, he heard that uh, Jonas had visited Heidegger, and after that he wouldn't have anything to do with him. Although they had been pretty close friends, as I recall. What you have referred to as the crisis of the Strauss divided, mm -hmm. that was during Strauss's lifetime. That was 
the disagreements were evident. I mean, I think before Strauss died. Mm -hmm. To your knowledge, did Strauss take notice of this or attempt I, I, to I, I, attempt I, to intervene or to respond to this controversy at all? No, but his health was poor. And uh, he, in his last years, he was more and more preoccupied with Socrates, and most of his books mm -hmm. were about Socrates, the, mm -hmm. the Xenophon books. Right, right. Uh, and, uh, and he also was always went back to Nietzsche. He, he seemed to be going back to his German roots mm -hmm. to some extent mm -hmm. in his mm -hmm. last years. Well, he certainly had a time when he was, uh, he was certainly a, a Nietzsche, and I never did deny that. But, As a young man, he said that he was. Yeah. And sure, hundreds of thousands of others. Yeah. You know, regarding the pugnacity of Strauss that he mentioned in 1949 but did not withdrew from the book in 1953, that was present in the 50s, certainly. And do you think he was well served by that pugnacity? Might, if you want to say Straussianism, might it have secured a firmer foothold in the academy if Strauss had been a little less... Belligerent. Belligerent in his attitude towards social science. I think that would have been a betrayal of everything he would really stood for. He, he found himself like Horatius at the bridge, holding the fort. Strauss is, I think, a unique figure in the last 200 years. I mean, there are other people that certainly go back 300 years or so, who are extraordinary genius, which Strauss did not have that kind of genius. But he was right on the big issues, and so was wrong. And there's nobody else that stands between them. I published it, the last chapter of the book I just published, I, uh, Strauss's essay on relativism. I did that because I printed the correspondence with Isaiah Berlin. And Berlin complained that he had heard that Strauss had written a book about him, and he had been unable to find this book or any essay. So I printed the essay that Strauss had written which was more on Marx and Freud than it was Berlin. Berlin. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to put that on the record. So, uh, no, I, I, I think that it was Strauss's coming to America was a, a way of waking him up as to the paradoxes of modernity. And after all, he came here, Hitler was in full bloom at that time, and it looked as if Hitler was going to win the war, too. For a year or two. Well, when I lecture on international relations, or really a political science, I always begin by maintaining the thesis that in the spring of 1940, if the war had been a chess game, Hitler would have had all... Had all the pieces. Right. And Churchill had, had, actually had none. By the way, also, in my book, I say, for Churchill, I'm the first person who reprinted Strauss's eulogy of Churchill the day after Churchill died. I consider that eulogy to reveal Strauss's position, I think, uh, more than any of his published writings. It was a spontaneous. He hadn't. I'm sure he hadn't written that thing, that out at all. You don't. You don't think he had that written out and brought it to class? It's in the transcript. Mm -hmm. That's where I got it. But what I mean is, you don't think that he had written it out, and came to class and read a prepared text? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure that he was much moved by the fact that Churchill had died. But what he says about our obligation as teachers to teach human greatness. That doesn't mean great books alone. Churchill was an example of greatness apart from they played over Aristotle. And by the way, one of the things that I feature in the introductions that I wrote to subsequent reprinting of Crisis of the House Divided was the fact that the dispute between Lincoln and Douglas was exactly, and this is in my later book, was uh, identical with the difference between Socrates and Thrasymachus. And the connection between the classics is absolutely direct and not mere interpretation. It was in the nature of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. So, the, so the, at the heart of the American political experience was the heart of Plato's Republic. Do you think Strauss would have been comfortable with individuals referring to themselves as Straussian and there being a, a school identified as Straussian that traces back to him. Do you think he would have been comfortable with that or pleased or resigned? Probably not. Something else I've written, which is an unpublished manuscript. In 1996, it was a, Kessler had a conference here on the American regime. I forget what the title. I wrote a 
pieces, about 100 pages, on the, called The Decline and Fall of the American Idea. And among those who I put on the, on the wrong side of the fence were the Straussians who interpreted the founding as a Hobbesian document masqueraded by Locke. And they all took their stand, by the way, from uh, Strauss's chapter on Locke mm-hmm. in National Life mm-hmm. History, a chapter which is hard to explain because it makes Locke the opponent of everything that we identified as good Americanism based on the Declaration of Independence, mm-hmm. based in turn on Locke. My reply to that criticism is that in natural light and history, Strauss offers us an interpretation of Locke, not of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. So Strauss would not have been pleased there was a, a group called well, Strauss. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you is that yeah. near the end of uh, this long piece of mine, I had read a review by Harvey Mansfield, Jr. He still was still calling himself Jr. I don't know why he took Jr. up because of father was a published author that you can't tell which is which. But for some reason or another, if he dedicated one of his books to his father, to whom he was personally attached with, in other words, respect, detached. Anyway, Harvey is a, an interesting case study of Straussianism. He's a very clever guy and a very shrewd writer, and he can be both obscure and clear, depending upon what he wants to be. Anyway, he was reviewing this book, edited by... Uh, well, the famous writer on the American founding at Harvard. Anyway, it's a collection of the documents dealing with the, with the ratification of the Constitution, 1787, 1789. There's about 2,000 pages of documents, and Harvard began by just by praising the book and saying what a wonderful level of discourse it was. And too bad we don't have anything like that today. He didn't give any real account of what was in the substance of the book. But then he went on to, I don't know how he got onto the subject of the Declaration, but he spoke about the self-evident half-truth of the Declaration of Independence, which means no truth. It's not a half-truth, but it's still a truth. And worse than that, in the literature on the Declaration, the other people who rejected the Declaration, like Calhoun, rejected it because of the idea of racial equality. And Harvey certainly did not have any reservations as to the rights of Negroes, but what he said meant that. And anyway, then he went on to give a pure Eastern Straussian interpretation. Locke is just a, only Hobbes with a veil over him. But the, so the real, which means that Walter Burns also has said that the beginning of the Declaration and the end contradict each other, because the beginning is really Hobbes and that means that there's no nobility in, in, in the idea of courage. And Harvey then later went on to wrote a whole book on manliness. Of course, the word manliness is only a translation of the word virtue. So, anyway, I took the strongest possible exception. And then, then later on, when the conference had Harvey Jr. made a terrible, terrible personal attack on me before the audience, you see, and without any explanation as to why, just the chaff attacked everybody, he finally got around to me. Well, since then, I've written three open letters, and I have the manuscript of a book of now over, over 200 pages devoted to this dispute. And I haven't decided yet whether I want to publish it or not. But the most important feature of it is the discussion of by Strauss in the reply to Kojev, the classic idea of friendship, where Strauss describes how philosophers have to have friends because they can't know what they're talking about unless they have something reflecting back to them. And so... Philosophic friends begin to, in effect, form a kind of club or, or class by themselves. But when the association of philosophers turns into it, it becomes dogmatic, and they just attack everybody outside and have internal discipline. This is, the Communist Party is a perfect example of what began as a philosophic friendship turned into a political party. So that whole passage is about a page in which Strauss talks about this is the only place I know that he really describes the meaning of friendship in the highest sense. And he said, the philosopher, when he finds himself now inside of a sect, has got to leave the sect and has got to return to the marketplace. And this is a political action. So a political action, according to Strauss, is the foundation for the integrity of the classical idea of friendship, which I think is a complete indication of everything I've done. And, well, Harvey... 
See, Harvey's father was my teacher at Yale, I think I told you that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, when I went to Columbus in the fall of 1951, Harvey, I think, was still a student at Harvard. But we got to know each other, and he used to come to my office, and we had long discussions. He, he was defending Talcott Parsons, his Harvard professor against Strauss, and it was a very unequal conflict. But, and I often said that Harvey's conversion was, hard conversions make good principles. And later on, Harvey was teaching at Berkeley when Strauss was at Stanford at the Behavioral Sciences Institute. And Strauss always had a, a weekly seminar. I don't think he could live without his seminar. He was like whiskey to an alcoholic. And I remember that Harvey used to go over once a week to Berkeley for the seminar. And he wrote me a letter in which he said, sitting across the table from Strauss, he discovered for the first time what it meant to have admired greatness from a distance which was a beautiful phrase, and Harvey's capable of those things. Well, he's made several visits here since that, that episode. He always came over here and visited with my wife, which I really appreciated. Anyway, Harvey wrote me a beautiful letter after she died, so I don't and I, I believe it's an attempt to mend defenses that were broken down because of that eruption. It was very uncharacteristic of him. To, it was a completely non-intellectual attack on me just because I was wrong because I attacked my friends. But mm -hmm. it just, what is the basis for friendship then? I mean, in the Nicomachean Ethics, it was such as Aristotle, there's one book on justice and two books on friendship. So anyway, I've got a lot of other things to get. I don't know whether, but it's easy to see from that eruption on the floor of the conference which was parallel later on uh, by the eruption of Tom Pagel telling me that for 200 people that he had to pull rank on me. 20 years my junior, he, he pulled rank on me, and Strauss confided in him. And by the way, at that same banquet, Pagel went on, and this was also reveals a great deal about Eastern Straussianism, that Socrates encouraged young men to become homosexuals mm -hmm. as a way of, and this is the phrase he used, softening their souls for philosophy. And, he gave a reference to the memorabilia. Mm -hmm. And uh, the minute I got home, I dug out the memorabilia. There was no such reference there. In that same introduction that, that Joe sponsored, after all, he said that the real philosophers patronized the morality because it protected them. But at the same time, they went on to enjoy, quote, the pleasures that were naturally sweet. So that they all, anyway, I don't know that Strauss ever, well, of course, the, this was in a post-mortem publication, but they, they, they were bandying these at, well, what are the real secrets, you see? And certainly homosexuality was one of them. You say that Strauss's weekly seminar was like a drink for an alcoholic. What did teaching mean for Strauss in that life. way? It was, it was life? It was life, yes. Paris when he was pursuing her, that he was like a madman when he <laughs> in pursuit of the Holy Grail or something like that. And uh, he always, oh, that's something I wanted to tell you very much. You'll understand why. It has a personal reference to where he lived in the Bronx and Riverdale. When you got off the train, it, you had to walk up a very steep hill to get to his house. And Strauss never took any exercise that he could avoid, but, but he couldn't drive a car either. And he couldn't afford a taxi cab. So at least once and sometimes twice or even more, he had to go up and down that hill. But when he got to Chicago, that was the one bad thing about his going to Chicago. Uh, there was no built-in exercise. And so he had a heart attack not long after he got there. The heart attack, I think, it was 1953 or 54. And I always, I don't know, are you a fan of the Marx Brothers at all? Well, they're very funny. Yeah, well, okay. It's one of the early movies when Groucho was supposed to be the great, the great African explorer. Coconuts. Pardon me? Coconuts. I, that's it. I'm never sure what's the name to give it. And it's 10 or 15 minutes after the opening of the play or the production that Groucho makes his appearance. He comes in a, on a sedan chair carried by four Nubian slaves. I said, this is the way Leo Strauss would come to class. <laughs> if he could find the Nubian slaves. But he wouldn't even walk across the midway. 
and of course the, the principal function of any research assistant to Leo Strauss. No research assistant ever did any research, but you had to drive him into all sorts of be a kind of glorified Jeeves. So that was Bill Golf. He's the only Straussian or supposed Straussian who has an allegiance to the Democratic Party. But I think that on the whole he probably tries to exert the same influence that us Western Straussians do in our... Uh, I wrote an essay which is very important for political reasons as well as for philosophic reasons. I'm trying to think of a, sometime in the mid-70s, uh, and it was at some Washington meeting. It's called False Prophets of Conservatism. And I began by saying that I thought that the salvation of Western civilization depended on the United States of America. I thought that the salvation of the United States of America depended on the Republican Party. And I thought the Republican Party depended upon the conservative movement within it. And I showed how that conservative movement was completely false to its historic mission. And I, I began by using, I think, as I have another context, uh, Russell Kirk as the head of the paleocons and uh, Irving Crystal as the head of the neocons. And they didn't like each other, I knew that, I think mainly because Crystal was a Jew. But they agreed completely on the the falsity and irrelevance of the Declaration of Independence. And in this later essay, which I just gave you a copy of, I ended by, in a late publication of Crystal's, he said, the Founding Fathers were not much interested in the subject of religion, and few of them wrote anything worth reading about it, particularly Jefferson, who never wrote anything worth reading about the Declaration of Independence or anything else. The absolute denunciation of the Declaration is having any, he's more Calhoun than Calhoun. So but that's, that is where the fate of the conservative movement has been heading. You can see in that false prophets essay, I wasn't trying to prophesy political history, but mm -hmm. it, it is a prophecy of the political. I have about two more questions and I need, okay. to, I need to dash for the airport. Strauss could have stayed in Chicago in 1967 but he chose to retire and to move to Claremont. Why did he move to Claremont? First of all, you should know that he came to me and asked me if I could arrange an appointment to Claremont. Now, in the actual work of doing it, Martin Diamond was my, he was still my friend and partner. And George Benson was very helpful too. And the Earhart Foundation was helpful. And Henry Salvatore, who ended up paying Strauss' salary. So, Oh, of course, we were delighted. I remember it was Christmas week of 1967. I remember going to the train station. There's a whistle stop here. At that point, the Strausses, neither one of them had ever been on an airplane, I think. I'm not sure how he went to Israel. He must have gone by plane, but he really didn't trust anything. That took him. <laughs> well, he wanted to have his feet on the ground. Like. So why did Strauss want to make the move from Chicago to Claremont? I'm not really, we never really had a discussion of that, and I don't want to claim any more credit for myself than I, but uh, I'd say that was probably the most important single reason. And later we had difficulties because Mrs. Strauss' stay in Claremont was, a, on the whole, not a happy one. Not because of the, his arrangements at college and the students and everything, it was just perfect. And so Strauss arranged to move from here to St. John's. Yes. Well, his friend uh, Jacob Klein. Uh, and do you, do you think that was the reason for the move, to be near Jacob Klein? Well, Strauss was, you might say, a, a teacup in a storm. I think the decision was all made by Mrs. Strauss. I see. But it's also the truth that our, Mrs. Strauss was never fully domesticated to America. <laughs> she wanted to be where she could talk German, and there was a little German community at St. John's, so that added a, some, some. But as far as the old man was concerned, he was just as happy as he could be as with all the arrangements that mostly I had made, and he knew that the house and everything was, he didn't really like to pay attention to those things, but somebody had to do it. Did you consider Leo Strauss your friend? My friend? Yeah. Well, there's a question of what kinds of friendship are available, but, Two people who, for me at least, seeing, I, I, I looked up to him. He, he was <laughs> as nearly as, as a god can be possible to somebody. And I thought he 
I discovered by meeting with him with the, uh, the road on Damascus, mm -hmm. maybe an imperfect analogy because there was no Jesus at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would accuse him of that. Yes, I did. I thought he was. Look at it. When he wrote that letter to me telling me that he would accept it, uh, that he sort of making his acceptance of the appointment conditional on there finding a job for me. That was about as personal as he ever really got. But after all, he, when he told me that he had this discovery that in America you couldn't use the word atheist promiscuously, I don't know how many other people he made it that same confidence. Strauss was a f funny, he talked about secrets all the time, but he never kept a secret. He was always full of his secrets, you see. And they, they had a certain charm to his conversation, and sometimes the secrets were quite remarkable. But the relationship of Jerusalem and Athens, which was the dynamic heart of all causes for secrecy, that was, it was perfectly clear to me at least. He, the decision that he said that everybody had to make was one that he never made. The decision between Jerusalem and Athens yes. is a decision he, he never made. Yes. And that is the basis for interpreting the beginning of the city and man, where he speaks about the crisis of the West. And the only remedy for the crisis of the West is the teaching coming from the divine city of righteousness. He never named it. It certainly sounded a lot, a lot more like Jerusalem than Athens. But he once said, said to me, I mean, uh, whether he actually said this or not, I'm not sure. But his head was in Athens, but his heart was in Jerusalem. I understand. Perhaps we better end with that thought. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. How did you first come to know Leo Strauss? Well, I knew something about him before he even came to Chicago. When I was an undergraduate, or maybe in my MA program, although I was very happy being in the Hutchins College, I used to read catalogs of other schools as though I was looking for other places where I might study or have a better sense of the academic world. In those days, whatever the Office of Career Planning or whatever it was called in those mm -hmm. days, it kept a library of catalogs in uh, the Reynolds Club up on the second floor. So I would borrow catalogs and look at them. And I was thinking of something in the line of political science. I don't know exactly that was limited to that. And one day I picked up a catalog of the New School for Social Research. Someone whom I had known somewhat from high school, several years ahead of me in high school, had gone on and, and studied at the New School. And I guess the feedback I got from his younger sibs was that it was a very exciting place to be. So I looked at the catalog. And I didn't know these European teachers who were listed as giving courses. The names didn't mean too much to me. They were largely German refugees, occasional Italian, all refugees from uh, fascism and Nazism. But one thing struck me. Somebody was giving courses with just the name of a person in political science or government or whatever it was called there. So although one wouldn't be shocked to read, in those days at least, uh, that somebody was offering a course on Wordsworth or what have you, that someone would offer a course on uh, Machiavelli or what mm -hmm. have you like that. I had never seen that before, mm -hmm. had never heard of it. And certainly there was nothing in Chicago that corresponded to that. Rather, there were comprehensive courses, history of this or what have you. So that stuck in my mind, that somebody was giving a course on Burke, pure and simple. And I don't recall any explanation of which works were being read. It was someone's thought as a package. And that person was Strauss. So I, I remembered that. I wasn't about to go to the new school, but I thought, what an unusual way of presenting the subject. So then when Strauss came, it was in January of what year? 1949, I believe. 1949, yeah. I was finishing my MA program at that time. And he came uh, with uh, very little announcement or uh, fuss and bother, no blaring of trumpets, and proceeded to offer a course, I think, on the first and second discourses. So I thought, well, I'll sit in, see what que pasa. Well, there were only three other people in the class, counting myself. 
And I was alarmed. First of all, there was no hiding. <laughs> it was a big room. There were a total of four people around the table. And I wasn't prepared at that stage when I was working on a dissertation, on a thesis, to devote the time to reading these works, mm -hmm. though, of course, neither of them is very long. So after a few meetings, I silently stole away. But I observed something. This is another kettle of fish. I don't know that the other two people in the class were especially stellar or risk averse or, or, or what have you, because uh, I left, knowing that I was neither of those. But then I saw him and the way he asked questions and the way he worked his way around and into and burrowing into a text. I could see that in two meetings. And I had nothing further to do with him until that May or June when I had a defense of my thesis, and he was going to be one of the people who was going to do it. And your MA thesis was on? On state control of science, not a distinguished work, which was raised in the context, for me, of hearings that Congress was having on the establishing the National Science Foundation. I mean, all of this was as a result of the huge investment in scientific research that went on under the name of the Manhattan Project and so on. But there was a theoretical issue there, too. And he asked, what would be the position of Plato on uh, state control of science? So I said, out of my deep understanding of scientific inquiry, he'd be against it. And Mr. Strauss then said, uh, you're mistaken. And then he asked, what would be the position of Plato with respect to the free publication of scientific results? Because that was one of the things involved in NSF research and so on, much debated at the time. And I said, confidently, he'd be against it. And he said, you're right. <laughs> so does that mean I was batting 500? No, I don't think so. So those were my first engagements with Strauss. Subsequent to that June, I left school for a year. I thought I, I wanted to go to work in journalism, my true love. And that year that I was away, an enormous upheaval took place in the political science department. And that was expressed to me through the reactions of my friends, all of whom were considerably older than I. I'd been too young to be drafted in World War II, and all these fellows, and they were all men, had not only served in the military, but had served for a long time, some of them six years. So I was just a kid on the block. And that was the audience that Strauss met that September, that fall quarter of 49. None of them, as best I can recall, was a major in what used to be called political theory. They might have had inclinations in that direction, but they didn't pursue it owing to a peculiar rule in the political science department about what fields you had to take preliminary examinations in and which fields you didn't. You didn't have to take a preliminary examination in the field in which you were going to write your dissertation. But that meant you had to take four other fields, one of which was political parties and behavior, which was taught by Avery Weiserson who was very difficult to fathom what he was up to. He was interested in methodological questions, and his courses consisted usually of talking about of the variety of approaches adopted by the authors of this two-and-a-half-foot stack of books that he would bring into class each time. So it got you into that. And how one would deal with questions that he might pose on the exam the uncertainty of it created anxiety in these men, who many of whom had faced live ammunition. <laughs> and as a result, they chose to write their dissertations on political parties and behavior so as not to have to take the pre <laughs> uh, So these students who were being trained in behavioral science. social science, political yeah. science, out of curiosity or whatever, or because they thought, well, we better scope out this fellow and see what kinds of exam questions he might pose. They were his audience. It was not an audience inclined in his favor. Not at all. The predispositions ran quite to the contrary. And I know this. I don't have to name names of these people who were friends of mine and were students at the time. They were very, most definitely, they weren't the ideal audience, but they were very smart. And in the course of that year that I was away, there had been... He had won them over. He had shown something. 
And when you look at or listen to those old transcripts of his seminars in those early years, you will note they all begin with the state of the question in political science to right. which this particular character, name whom you will, <laughs> might have something to say. So it was a piece of kalam, you might say, of <laughs> defensive theology that he would begin in this way to say, I'm not leading you up a cul-de-sac. I'm leading you up through a particular author or a particular work to something that will deepen and broaden your understanding of questions that you already think are important or will lead you to see that the questions that you think are important are themselves too narrowly conceived, carry too much in the way of predispositions or even prejudices that keep you from seeing what's there. So when I came back, it wasn't any longer a question of, you know, two other students sitting with a teacher at an oversized seminar table, but rather wall to wall. I mean, here's the new dancing bear who can do all sorts of things. Come and watch. And they were hard questioners. It, it wasn't a monologue by any means. So that became a very exciting place. And not least because there were other teachers in the department, I think especially of Hans Morgenthau, but there, there were others, and of course those who were more dedicated social scientists, whose approach Strauss didn't refrain from putting up in contrast to what he thought his particular author that quarter was proposing. I mean, Strauss was the soul of bourgeois respectability. I mean, he would never commit an incivility or, or anything like that. Uh, no snide remarks or anything of the sort. But by bringing up the issues in this way, it then turned out that when I sat in Mr. Morgenthau's political theory course, or modern political theory, I think it was called, questions came from the audience that two or three years before would never have been raised in, in that setting. So intellectually, it was a very exciting time. Civilized confrontation, hard arguments, and I say that was all owing to Strauss, his willingness to take it on and to show another way. I've also heard from those days that if the class were scheduled to run for an hour and a half twice a week, that in fact they would often run four or five hours, that he would simply, he would teach and then begin taking questions and take questions until all questions were done. Is that the case? Well, five hours suggests something uh, heroic. I mean, I think he, and not only he, but some other people in the room might have had to visit the washroom in that period. <laughs> but certainly he started punctually, but never ended according to the canonical hour, as we say around here. I mean, one really had a sense that you were in hot pursuit of something really interesting and important. So it went on. So he might have begun at whatever the hour was, two or something like that in the afternoon, 1.30, I don't know. And at five o'clock, you know, it broke up. And then there were people who walked him home. They had more on their brain that they wanted to relieve themselves of. So, no, it was exhilarating. And as I say, there were hotly debated issues with which the individual students, these mature men, had to grapple. I mean, these are people, almost all of whom that I knew, were married and were having children and all that. I mean, they, they weren't sophomores. And he was saying something really destabilizing of their intellectual universe. That didn't mean that all of them were going into political theory, far from it. I mean, think about some of the best students, like Herbert Starr uh, and some others uh, who went into other things, uh, Walter Burns. But the reach of Strauss's approach to political philosophy and to its history raised all sorts of disquieting, destabilizing, second, third, and fourth thoughts about what they were doing and how they might go about it. So it was intense. In these early years, was his teaching style what we've come to know through the transcripts in which he would give the kind of introduction to the course that you mentioned, explaining the relevance of whatever figure he's teaching to our, our current concerns, whether in political science or society more generally? 
and then begin going through the text, whatever it was, one passage at a time, commenting on it, and then towards the end of the class taking questions. Was that his general approach from the beginning? Yes, but with one little difference. Mm -hmm. At the first meeting, he assigned or accepted volunteers for the different sessions of the class. In other words, it was blocked out in his mind or on mm -hmm. paper. We'll do this many pages or this so many chapters and so on. At this meeting and then at the next and the next and so on mm -hmm. for the whole 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And people would lay claim to making an oral report on that passage or section for that particular class. So it was an oral presentation of, uh, whatever, 10 minutes, and then they would submit a paper with it, essentially what they were saying. It wasn't a question of delivering it extemporaneously, but that was the beginning of each subsequent session before he turned to the passage. And he would have a few remarks, sometimes Delphic or whatever, mm -hmm. when talk about interpreting <laughs> <laughs> language about his response to the thing. And sometimes a student would raise uh, a significant issue and he would address it. I mean, like someone like Seth Benedetti, he's going to say something that mm -hmm. um, Strauss will deal with and will come back to through correspondence or conversation with him privately. So that's how each class began. The about 10 minutes, a student presentation of whatever issues he found there. It could be a summary uh, with questions or an interpretation or an avowed puzzlement about this and that. And then Strauss would respond briefly to it and then would go on with his own explication. When I'm remembering, because I sat pretty close to, to see how he was working, he had a small piece of paper. He, mm -hmm. he, Waste not, want not, yeah, right. okay. Small piece of paper, a small stub of a pencil. And he had some things written on it. And then when he finished with it, he drew a horizontal line through it. So these were not yellowed notes to be retained <laughs> and, uh, for further yellowing. Uh, they were f the product of fresh readings, which is not to say that he didn't. He could have had spiral notebooks at home with uh, many of his observations about text. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's the case. But, yeah, he knew what ground he wanted to cover in the class. And usually, uh, well, you know, it was a firm hand on the tiller. Okay. Did his teaching improve over the years? I can't say that. I think it altered because in later years when I had started teaching and he was still here, I would sometimes visit some classes. And I think he felt less obliged to make the connection to present-day issues in political science and just go into the work itself. You know, in a way, the novelty of his approach didn't have to be belabored. That ground didn't have to be won again and again when students got the hang of what he was doing. And of course, he was writing more, too, and giving these big lecture courses. So it was easier for students to figure out what it was he was doing and what he was aiming for. And certainly the lectures that led to natural right and history made uh, things uh, pretty clear through the solid example which you could follow and see. I don't know that he became better at it. How do you think he understood his role as a teacher? Was there something in particular he was trying to accomplish? I have to say that when I heard Heinrich Meyer on more than one occasion uh, speak of Strauss as being intent on establishing a school, I found it counterintuitive, That's, or at least I wasn't conscious of that as a student. Well, I was a kid, what did I know? That he was trying to win over able students to this line of work. I say to this line of work as distinguished from, to this way of thinking, to be sure. But I didn't see it as a school. He was tr trying to win over really good students. He had found something, or recovered something or belatedly rediscovered something that was valuable, indeed, that was extremely important. And I think it's fair to say, minimally, this is not making too much of a claim, he didn't want it to die out with him. But I don't think it was an issue of a school the way there was the Chicago School of Sociology, Chicago School of Economics, though even they were not monolithic, right? Certainly true of economics. Or for that matter, a Chicago School of Political Science when Merriam and Gosnell and, and those people were here in the 30s. So 
maybe, you know, reading his correspondence to Jacob Coyne and others lends some support to that view. But I didn't think of it as a school. And I still find it hard to believe that Strauss thought he was making a school because it puts him too much in the center. You know, it's a, it's a heliocentric view of the thing. And I don't think he expected that or necessarily wished it. He didn't see himself as the last man left to keep classical learning alive, to keep Western civilization alive, something like that. No, I think there were other claimants to that in the, in the classics department. <laughs> uh, no. His manner was not such as suggested that he was seriously engaged in massaging his own ego. Not at all. The biggest person in the room lay in that book in front of us. And in that sense, we were all there to learn. Now, you could say, well, how artful of him. I mean, our deepest cogitations, and I, when I say our, I mean of the finest and most able students, that was kids' play compared to what he could do right then and there. But that wasn't the way it was presented. Not as a result of some belief about the limits of human understanding, but the notion is that we have to earn our conclusions, and it isn't obvious that one can do it in the short run at all or even in the course of a lifetime. So that suggested a certain kind of modesty that I believe he tried to exemplify for more than prudential reasons. So there was a modesty before the tradition, an unwillingness to call attention to himself. And in your view, no project lay behind his teaching, simply understanding something. I would say that was what I took away from it, that that was our highest calling, as it were. Who can read the hearts and souls of men? I mean, we, we don't know about that. You know, what his own ambitions were. And, uh, and even if you find letters, there's a discount rate that has to be applied to everything. <laughs> I mean, one of the things one learned about reading any of these authors was they're presuming a certain kind of reader. So Strauss wouldn't have been the last guy in the block to have thought about that in relation to what he himself was writing. That he was ambitious, you know, in, in terms of understanding is testified by the rigor and dedication that he brought to his work. I didn't see it, and maybe that's a sufficient statement. I didn't see it. <laughs> that's all. During his lifetime, he would have heard people in political science departments begin referring to his students as Straussians, and his own students begin referring to themselves as Straussians, and even beginning to quarrel among themselves about the meaning of what it means to be a Straussian. Uh, were you aware of him ever commenting in any way on this appearance of this new term, Straussian? I don't know. I myself have never used it, except to say that I don't believe in it and I don't use it. The question of the closed sect, what Michael Zuckert calls the secret handshake uh, <laughs> and, and all that, I think with respect to that, Strauss would have said, could, so he could have said uh, what Marx himself said, that he was not a Marxist, and Strauss could say he was not a Straussian. I mean, that people, when they get to see something like this, you know, might get a little giddy, okay? We're, we're into something that the rest of the world doesn't see. And no, it isn't a delusion, and it isn't an illusion, but the scales have been lifted off our eyes and all that. They can go pretty far, okay? I think Strauss would have referred to that somehow as the behavior of young puppies. <laughs> to, to, to steal a term from an author he admired. But I don't see it. Good, okay. And all these internecine quarrels between, you know, I mean, the, the taxonomy of, quote, Straussians uh, that Ernest Fort in a review of Drury's book. Uh, 114? Yeah, she missed some. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's the right approach. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, demolish it with wit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Strauss was your thesis advisor? Yes. On um, political Zionism? Um, yeah, not, a dis not a distinguished piece of work. Pinsker and Herzl? Yeah, but that got me into, uh, you know, when he broached the subject with me and so on. I mean, at that point, he could have written the book, more than the book. And he had, of course, traversed that ground in part. The advantage of the whole thing for me was that he led me beyond reading those five fat volumes of Herzl's diaries in German, and Pinsker also in German, to Spinoza, and even more significantly for me, Maimonides. That was my introduction to Maimonides. 
And that was one of the reasons he suggested that as a theme, because he knew that I knew a certain amount of Hebrew and was at home with it. Not necessarily medieval Hebrew, but the technical vocabulary for that that had to be learned, leaving aside works on astronomy, was really not that great. So he thought I should. I think he probably thought that with respect to any student he was advising or who was consulting with him about a dissertation. Work from your strengths. If you know something, work with that. That introduced me to Maimonides, and that was the most significant thing about the dissertation, that it introduced me to Maimonides, so, for which I am eternally grateful. So you sat down with him, and he said, Mr. Lerner, you should consider writing on political Zionism. And gave me a few clues about the kinds of issues that might be involved there. The and politicization of the, of, of the understanding of what was the situation of the Jewish people, mm -hmm. and so on. And so he gave you a few clues about what the topic might involve. Did that, those clues involve the names of Spinoza and Maimonides? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could yeah. read a more than adequate executive summary of the subject uh, <laughs> in his introduction to the English translation of Spinoza's critique of religion. Mm -hmm. It's all there and a thousand things more. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he gave you a very specific topic and you took to it. He offered something for me to ponder. He thought it would be within my capacities. That has to be a consideration, too. I obviously thought that I could manage the linguistic burdens such as they were. And maybe he even thought, that's what I would think in giving advice to a graduate student, mm -hmm. maybe he even thought that the student would enjoy the topic, really like it. But as it turned out, I did. <laughs> so I was grateful for that. Did he read any chapters as he wrote your dissertation? No, he said, you know, write it. And mm -hmm. I mean, that didn't mean I was unable to query him about things I was working on. One quarter, I think, at least one quarter, I was his, quote, assistant. I, I was typing a chapter of natural right and history that he was dictating from his notebook, the chapter on Burke, or the subchapter. Wonderful chapter. And, you know, I mean, so we had occasions to talk. Then he and I met a couple of times over a text of Maimonides. And, of course, I attended those seminars that he gave at Hillel on Maimonides and so on. So there were plenty of occasions to check in with him about things that were puzzling. But on the whole, I didn't bother him much, and he didn't pester me, certainly. Okay. And once you turned in the final draft, did he give you any comments? I am sure he did, but I cannot remember them, among other things. I, I mean, doubtless he raised some points that would need, if not restatement, perhaps more amplification, because in my own timidity, I think I work toward minimalist prose rather than waxing. But there's no doubt that he read it with care. And as in all these things, I mean, his criticism goes to the heart of the issue. He wasn't distracted by trivia. In addition to... I forget, in either a lecture series of either two or three lectures at Hillel on Maimonides. Also at Hillel, he gave lectures that have come to be known as, you know, very famous articles, Progress and Return, Jerusalem and Athens. Yeah. Do you know how these events at Hillel House happened? Did he happen to begin lecturing there on Jewish topics or topics related to Judaism? I would say it all stems from a very special relationship that Mr. Strauss had with Rabbi Pekarsky, who was the director of the Hillel Foundation at that time. Rabbi Pekarsky in some ways reminded me physically of uh, Moses Mendelssohn, short, slight, hunched, a very uh, winning, modest, highly intelligent person. And he and Strauss obviously got along famously. So there must have been some occasion when Rabbi Pekarsky uh, perhaps proposed to Mr. Strauss, would you care to speak on this or something? And the fact that Strauss did and repeated and repeated again tells you that he clearly enjoyed it. Not that Strauss had time on his hands. He obviously thought or was made to believe that it would be helpful and valuable, and not least to, to Jewish students, we could say perplexed Jewish students, but to others as well. So these were real occasions. SRO. 
And I gather not just Jews who are attending. Oh, no. Well, I mean, that's even true in the seminar, that, that not just students attended. Frank Knight attended regularly some of those uh, seminars. Uh, Edward Schills. Edward Schills as well, right. They didn't come there to mock, though they, I'm sure they had reservations of plenty. And sometimes Knight would raise a question in the class, yeah. So I think that's the origin of those Hillel appearances. Speaking they were real events. Okay. Do you think that Strauss's Jewishness was relevant to his teaching, his teaching at the university, as opposed to his lectures at Hillel House? Did it matter that he was a Jew? Well, in Hillel, I would say quite obviously, the very formulation, why we remain Jews, I suppose that's not a question posed by someone who is <laughs> secure in his Jewishness. <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what, it wouldn't be a problem. You know, it, it couldn't be a why question. So that already suggests a stance or a platform from the outside looking in. On the other hand, the whole tenor of the argument is one of quiet pride in uh, the Jewish heritage, which is not only the law and all that, but fortitude under persecution, which is presented as honorable in and of itself. I remember a line from one of those. After all, he said, we are not gypsies. In other words, we come with something. This is a politically incorrect remark. Mm -hmm. uh, we come with a heritage of which we can rightly be proud mm -hmm. and in defense of which we need offer no apologies. Mm -hmm. It's not quite what Disraeli said in the House of Commons when attacked for being Jewish. Of course, it, he'd been converted as a child by his father. When my ancestors officiated as high priests in the temple in Jerusalem, your ancestors were wearing red paint and going around in animal skins. <laughs> it's not quite that. In a way, you've answered this question, but let me ask it. Did it matter to his Jewish students that Strauss was Jewish? Did his Jewishness matter to them? He didn't conceal it. I mean, you didn't have to uh, infer it from his surname or something like that. But of course, his seminars were not taught from the standpoint of being Jewish. Why do you think he wanted to move from the new school to here, to the University of Chicago? Better job. Probably better students. More money. Right. The new school, all honor to it, mm -hmm. was a special place. These were people who uh, had been set adrift by terrible developments and found a resting place. Whether it was a home, I don't know. And here, in effect, when the president of the university makes a direct appointment to a department, I don't know whether the, the extent to which he did or did not consult with whoever was the chairman of the political science department at that mm -hmm. time. That's big. It's meant to be a compliment, and I'm sure Strauss took it as such. Remembering, you know, that he was uh, a stateless intellectual for whom the market demand is very slight. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of it that way, but okay. After Strauss gave his lectures on natural right and history, and particularly after publishing the article Epilogue, he had not pulled his punches. Mm. Uh, he had staked out a strong, no holds barred criticism of the dominant school of thought in this political science department and other political science departments. In the profession, you can in say. In the profession. How did his relationships inside the department fare over the years? I mean, was there a, a counter movement against Leo Strauss here at the Department of Political Science among the faculty because uh, they, they didn't like this criticism? Now, what does that mean, the counter-movement? You want like, to, to expel him to well, uh, Berkeley or somewhere? Or to, to not want to have him around, to consider him perhaps a, a brilliant but troublesome nuisance. Oh, I don't know. You know I mean, my view of that world uh, was that of Euclidean geometry, <laughs> namely an earthworm. I, I wouldn't have known about that. That there were people in the department and some who became chairman who really viewed it as, uh, I don't know, I suppose with some measure of contempt and alarm, certainly didn't like the message, so to speak, the whole stance. That's a certainty. On the other hand, he attracted students, and there was no game saying uh, his intellectual vigor. And, mm -hmm. uh, and in all these matters, Strauss was uh, the model of a good citizen. You know, when I, I spoke, you might have thought slightingly of his adherence to the bourgeois proprieties. Uh, no, I mean, that's what you do. You remain on good terms 
-hmm. with everyone on, with whom you have to be on some kind of term. Okay. Uh, you, you don't needlessly affront people and all that. The essays on the scientific study of politics edited by Herbert Storing, with these essays by various hands and ending with the epilogue by Strauss. That set out to be a critical, but it was expected that it should be a fair-minded assessment of the work of these leading figures, most of whom were still alive. Arthur Bentley was not, but Laswell and... Uh, Simon, and, and, and so forth and so on. And I think a special effort was made not to diminish or patronize those authors, but to, to take them seriously, and figuratively speaking, to hold their feet to the fire. So it was a collection of essays that were critical in a very good sense, but the emphasis was on their shortcomings of, of these different approaches. But it wasn't snide or disdainful in any way. It elicited a most extraordinary review by Sheldon Wallen and John Shar. Very long, taking up, you know, the different essays and so on, and uh, sticking it to them. And the editor of the APSR at the time invited a response. So altogether, you're getting a review and a response to review that probably added up to 50 pages, right. maybe more. And that whole thing, I mean, those are the drawing of battle lines. Mm -hmm. Finesse and politesse almost get lost in the clashes here. So that made a big stir, a really big stir. The book itself, the review, and the response to the review. So uh, this was not passive obedience or, or something like that. I'm sure that heightened tensions. But it wouldn't have occasioned uh, Strauss being expelled or something. But whether it had some bearing on how much of a guarantee the university was willing to give him that he would be employed beyond his retirement age, which at that time was 65 years, it might have. And it certainly had a bearing on Strauss deciding to leave the university after a couple of years beyond the retirement, I guess, because he wanted, he didn't want to have that insecurity. So that his decision to move to Claremont was partly he didn't want to be left at the pleasure of yeah. the departmental chair. Yeah, yeah. and probably I mean, some combination of good sense and vanity. Not that he found happiness, but that's, uh, that's another issue. <laughs> Let me take you back to your thesis, your dissertation thesis. Strauss proposed the topic of political Zionism and then showed you the way to Maimonides, and then that led to part of your career. You spent most of your, much of your life studying Maimonides. Nibbling at the edges. Okay. Did Strauss do more than just, I mean, with, let me try and make this question clear. If, for instance, you had been interested in Machiavelli, then in Strauss's lectures, then he worked out a full interpretation of Machiavelli, depending upon which courses you're talking about. But he did give one or two courses here in Chicago on Machiavelli. I remember one of those. Yeah. yeah. But if you're interested in Maimonides, there was no such full architecture of how to approach this author. Did he, in your conversations with him, did he lead you along an approach to interpreting Maimonides or how to think about him or simply give you an appreciation for the greatness of this figure? Had, had you been aware of who Maimonides even was before you began this work with him? Well, I knew something from Hebrew school because our composition notebooks had a, obviously a, a fictional portrait of Maimonides, okay, but I certainly hadn't read anything of his. I mean, Strauss didn't draw my attention to what he had already written on Maimonides. Quite a bit. He had already written quite a bit in French and in German and, of course, in English. No, he said enough for me to believe, one, which was easy to believe, for me to believe, there was pay dirt there. And two, I might be able to dig a little out for myself. So it wasn't a question of, um, it wasn't presented as this. In fact, I would say, just about any of us, and now I don't mean Jewish students, students generally of Strauss, who come to a subject that he's treated, I would say we should be happy if we found something interstitially that we can work out. I remember a review, a very witty review, that uh, Harvey Mansfield wrote about someone's treatment of Machiavelli. 
And he said, you know, wherever you go on this island and you're checking out here and there, suddenly there appears a little coin box and it says, deposit <laughs> coin here. Uh, uh, Leo Strauss was here. Uh, that puts it uh, beautifully. Okay. So then as I worked on things of my own, I would give them to him for criticism. It didn't matter that I wasn't uh, uh, enrolled in a course, I mean, mm -hmm. needless to say. And he would read them with obvious intention and with enormous capacity for seeing where I was struggling to go and help me. And I would say the most extreme form of that was when I was working on a translation of Averroes' uh, paraphrase of Plato's Republic. Very difficult Hebrew of a missing Arabic original. And I sent him my draft translation with hundreds of queries embedded in the text that had remained uncertain or highly problematic after I had consulted on those very points with Muhsin Mahdi and Shlomo Penis. And he had to have spent many hours going over that manuscript and checking it against the Hebrew. And I was blown away by what he had invested in. And this is when he's ready close to the end of his life and weak, all kinds of physical conditions, and probably hustling as much as he can to finish work he has in hand. I know I wrote to him in a very different tone that a, that a teacher would write to his teacher. And I think that letter he kept, it may be in, in the archives. So he was generous. He was certainly generous to me. And, you know, I wasn't his most promising student or the one on whom he placed the, the greatest hopes. But he gave of himself. I suppose some element of affection might have been involved, but, you know, I was one to tell. Leo Strauss, in giving you your dissertation topic, showed you its connection to deeper things, in particular uh, Maimonides' thought, and gave you an idea of what that thought might really be, and that there was a place for you there. Yeah, and as a political thinker. And that then, after you began tilling that acreage, you found over the course of your career that there were not only writings by his that were helpful, but that he would respond as you had queries and you were working and give you feedback. Yes, mm -hmm. emphatically yes. Yeah. The other great theme of your career has been the American political thought, American mm -hmm. founding, and Tocqueville. Did you ever discuss those topics with Professor Strauss? Well, I'd been interested in constitutional law, the way it used to be taught in those days. I can't recall that. Certainly, there were among Mr. Strauss's students those who worked in the American field. I already mentioned Herbert Storing and Walter Burns and, of course, Harry Jaffa. Martin Diamond. And Martin Diamond, right. So I detected nothing remotely resembling, well, these are guys who were, I mean... They're not slumming. They're doing this because that's about all they can do. Uh, it's not that at all. It was regarded, I think, as respectable, more than respectable work to be done by someone who was trained with an awareness of the larger context of thinking about political things. I did send him my writings uh, mm -hmm. on that, but you know, I wasn't pestering him to help me work out some of the perplexities of American government policy toward Indians and stuff like that. You were letting him know the itinerary of your trip, but not asking for guidance about where to go. Right. A remarkable thing, it seems to me, is that with you and Herbert Storing and Martin Diamond and Harry Jaffa... And um, Walter Burns. And Walter Burns, you had a real significant contribution to the understanding of America and American thought. And all of you were students of Leo Strauss, but Strauss never taught American things. It's not clear to me that he really had much to say about these figures. Was there a connection between studying with Leo Strauss and your reading of Tocqueville or your work on the Founder's Constitution? It's hard for me to say. Walter might have another response to that because he probably had Strauss as his dissertation supervisor, or one of them. Probably the first one was C. Herman Pritchett or Robert Horn. Mm -hmm. Wonderful teacher. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. This only expresses my awareness, but it may be an inadequate appreciation of the things that studying with Strauss brought to my study of American things. I would say the person who had most influence on me in thinking about American things was Marvin Myers, who was in some odd way a kind of fellow traveler 
of the Straussians, with Straussians, without <laughs> being one of them. He was an extremely perceptive and subtle thinker, a one-book man, okay? And I studied his way of looking at things quite intensely for a number of years. But as I say, I, I, I sent Strauss everything I wrote. I sent Strauss everything I wrote. I sent Strauss everything I wrote. I'm sitting in the study of Professor Emeritus David Lowenthal. This is Monday, January 21st, 2013. David, thank you for having me here. How did you first come to know of Leo Strauss? By complete accident. I was waiting to get into the Yale Graduate History Department and biding time. And I heard that the New School was an interesting place. So I registered there as a student, not intending to stay. And by complete accident, took a course with a man named Leo Strauss, whom I knew nothing about. That's how I took my first course with him. And do you remember what class that was? I think it was a lecture course devoted to three small platonic dialogues, what did the uh, Apology and the Euthyphro, and it was run pretty much as a lecture course and had, by my memory, quite a few students in it. And that was the beginning of my studying with Leo Strauss. And how did he teach that course? By reading through the dialogue, so, you know, line by line. And he had the English text and the Greek text, and he would correct the text occasionally. And then, having read a few lines, he would try to show what they meant and open up the argument, and it really became an argument. So he was reading Plato in the spirit of Plato, in the Socratic spirit, and that was it. It was most impressive because, again, to me, it was an entirely refreshing experience as a student. I had had some very fine teachers, particularly history teachers, at Brooklyn College. But this was more than teaching in the ordinary sense of conveying information and analyzing it. It was sort of thinking along with Plato and reasoning. And I remember just being overwhelmed by the sense that for the first time, I've been introduced to reasoning thinking out alternatives. And from that point on, well, naturally, I was going to take as much with Strauss as I could. This is a remarkable thing. You were waiting for admission to a graduate program. You'd had great teachers, but you'd never seen reasoning in a classroom before. That really is true. It sounds like a stupid thing to say, because after all, what does education consist of except reasoning? But for the most part, normal education is exposition, it's giving you facts and thinking about them, and the causes of things. But in this case, taking a human problem, we all sense directly is a, an important human problem, and sort of laying open the possibilities bit by bit, step by step, and thinking about them and using illustrations from ordinary life. Strauss was wonderful at that. Occasionally, he'd use illustrations from movies. He uh, liked to stay up late at night uh, watching westerns. I'm told this, naturally, by hearsay. And every so often, he'd break into an expression that you'd find from the movies, but to illustrate something that was in the text. So Plato was coming alive. I mean, it was like sitting with Socrates. That would be probably the best way of putting it. So that just, uh, as an educational experience, in a way, you said to yourself, gee, your education is just beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, here you are, you know, in a way, an advanced graduate student, but your education is just beginning. What year, approximately, do you think this course would have taken, when you your first college course with them? Well, that would have been in 1945-46, um, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. I had been with the Air Force on uh, the Mariana Islands, on Tinian. I had actually seen on the other end of the airfield the Enola Gay Park without our knowing it was <laughs> the Enola Gay or knowing what it was there for. But the Japanese war was over. And our unit had transferred to the Philippines after that. And it was shortly after that that I returned home. And shortly after that, they wanted to get into graduate school. And so probably 1946 would come closer to it. And I would guess that the records of the new school might still indicate what it was that he was teaching at the time. But right. again, those, I the, didn't know him at all. Those are available. Yeah. You know, in the transcripts of his courses at Chicago, 
the first one is from 1954 and then 56. He began teaching there in 49. But you can see in the transcripts that he had a relatively standard approach, that typically he would have a general introduction about the significance of the work and its context, and then he would begin by having short passages read aloud, and he would comment on each passage, and he would invite questions as he was going through the text. And it sounds like in this so-called lecture course in 1945 on these short platonic dialogues, he was doing something very similar already. Well, I was too much of a beginner to fully appreciate what his approach was. But I know after that, I took seminars with him, smaller groups and closer up. And I remember very well how he ran the seminars, which was pretty much the way you mentioned. Quite often, a student would report on the reading for the day, mm -hmm. you know, Spinoza mm -hmm. or whatever it was. So the student would report. Strauss would make some comments on that report. And then he would turn to... He had scribbled out on some notes, on some paper, a pad. He'd have his own little notes, which he would then refer to just to make sure they was covering things. Mm -hmm. And he would go through things bit by bit, bringing up things, not so much from the report, but from the text. In a way, he would sort of start over again. The student would lay the thing out, he would comment, and then he would in a way, start over again on the text and try to bring out its meaning, quoting from it whenever that was important. And, of course, questions could be asked, and there was a lot of exchange. I remember asking some very foolish questions myself. How did he respond to your foolish questions? He was always very kind and sometimes uh, humorous. You might remember from Aristotle, the best age for the marriage of the man is rather advanced. You know, it's not in the 20s. It's actually, I think, at the end of his 30s that he's the best age. So I once asked what he was expected to do before then. <laughs> and I got an answer, which I'm afraid I can't, which I remember, but I cannot <laughs> tell you. And uh, it wasn't a lewd answer, but it was an, an answer which was rather humorous. And I thought at the time, rather shocking. But he'd sometimes, you know, you'd ask him a funny question. He would never make fun of you. He never, never would make fun of the person asking. There was... Even sometimes he would be faced with a militant relativist, militant or <clears throat> modernist, and he would always keep at him. The man would say, well, make some sort of rejoinder, and Strauss would simply sort of keep going with him, mm -hmm. and uh, never in an overbearing way, which was always very impressive to me. Mm -hmm. It was like his writings where Strauss would make a better case for his opposition than the opposition could make for himself. <laughs> you know, that was very common because he wasn't simply eager to win an, an argument over this person. He wanted to win the argument, the, the facing up to a certain opinion. So once or twice over many courses, Strauss would come into class and say that he wanted to correct something from the previous time, that he had pushed a certain idea too hard and on reflection, wanted to go over it with us. Again, a, a correction of himself. Very rare to my memory, and of course all the more impressive, that he would have given consideration to it. We would never think that he had pushed something too hard, but in his own opinion, he had pressed a point beyond what it really deserved. And of course, he would often begin, as you mentioned, by speaking of the two giant opinions that he had to cope with, historicism, relativism, and in a way, positivism. But, and of course, to us, they were uh, kind of living things. I mean, I came out of college as a relativist. You know, I would cite, uh, I remember citing the example of the Pacific Islanders, and uh, they had different mores and so on. And Strauss, would, his response was so, and afterwards it was so obvious, but at the time it was sort of shocking. He said, well, what conclusion do you draw from the fact that these mores are different? Isn't it possible that some are better than others? Yeah, some are more appropriate to human beings than others. Well, you know, how about cannibalism? Would you want to consider that as a real possibility? Um, no. So pretty soon, 
the people who are capable of learning found that they could not defend their own ideas. But mm-hmm. everybody who entered his course began as a historicist mm-hmm. and a uh, relativist, you know, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that was the reigning opinion. And finding somebody who didn't accept that opinion and was willing to show you the weakness in that opinion, that was at first shocking. But on reflection, you couldn't do anything. You know, he kind of had you. You, you. Uh, so that, and I think that experience, the refutation of historicism, certainly in its crude form, everybody felt when they heard that. You know, they asked themselves, why have I believed this for so long? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. when, when there's this really this sound answer to it. But anyway, he would often begin his courses, and I think you had mentioned that with the laying out of the problems of the age, really, and then go into the thing itself. And in the years that you took courses with him, that would be from approximately 45 to 49? To the point when he left. To Chicago. Yeah, I accompanied his dog to the train. He, he had a dog? Schwulch. Is that right? Yes. In uh, Chicago, I, think I don't it think... means smoke or, or smoky <laughs> or foggy. or Yeah, he had a dog, Schwulch. I and uh, sure, by that point, I had you know, gotten to know him better naturally. But it was my experience with him was only what uh, two or three years before mm-hmm. he left. But I t- took all the courses I could. And in those courses, in those days, would students who attend the courses regularly challenge him along these same lines? That students would speak up and say, "Well, how can you say that values are not relativistic?" Or, oh yes, the. Courses would consist of two sets of people, the newcomers and the old-timers. And the old-timers, by that point, had been convinced and would sort of look on this combat as something they had been through themselves. But the newcomers would always do that. Yeah, they often not in a martial way, you know, a bellicose way, but simply expressing the, their view, the, you know, Professor, how can you possibly b- believe that there's an absolute standard? And he would patiently mm-hmm. try to convince them at least to start looking at something else. And uh, usually, I mean, I can only think of one case where a student really took a long time. No, this happened to a friend of mine at Chicago, I'm told. Have you heard of Leo Weinstein? No, I I I didn't know. I think Leo may have passed away a few years ago. He taught at Smith College. Leo was a crackerjack. First, I should say that I knew him from way back. Uh, He lived in Coney Island, which was right near Bensonhurst, where I lived in Brooklyn. And he was a crackerjack biologist and a full believer in the, the full panoply of modern science. And I'm told that when he got to Chicago, And Strauss had these doubts about modern science. Leo really regarded him as an enemy, you know, as somebody to be fought. Jaffra was sort of along with Strauss at the time, as somebody equally to be fought. But finally, a couple of years maybe, or at least a full year, he finally saw, you know, there was something to this. And at the end, he became a full-fledged follower. He was this very strange character, maybe a more natural character. He didn't write. If you were going to look for articles and things, books by him, you're not going to find them. But he was one of the most thoughtful people you could meet and very up in all of the important things to read, the text, and wonderful to talk to. But there was something that stilled his writing hand. And as usually the case, I think, I think it was because just a guess, but a sense of perfection that he felt he didn't have it. He could not fully understand something, then he wasn't going to write about it. <laughs> it reminds me of something in my relations to Strauss. I once wrote an essay on Nietzsche's work, The Use and Abuse of History, and I sent it to Strauss, and this is what he wrote back. He said, this is the best thing I've ever read on this subject, but don't publish it. Meaning, there were still things about it that I didn't understand, and I never did publish it. And I think that was uh, Leo's native tendency. So the resistance, since you asked whether this kept happening, in a few cases, 
the resistance lasted. But I don't know of a single case where a person sat in several Strauss classes and ended up not being convinced, you know, that he was right. I say I personally don't know such mm -hmm. a thing. How did Strauss view his students at the New School? What were they like and how did he relate to them? Well, the New School could have older students and younger students. Mm -hmm. It was a sort of peculiar place. People would sort of come back to graduate school. Now we're talking about the graduate school and not the adult education center. Mm -hmm. They come back to graduate school after experience doing something else. And so they could be older people, or at least people who were not immediately out of undergraduate college. I do remember that he liked uh, and thought very highly of both Joe Cropsey and Harry Jaffa. But you know, I was relatively young at the time myself and didn't know, I certainly didn't know much about their class, which was a class before me, but I didn't even know much about my own class because of this. I, and suddenly Dick Kennington was a fellow student of mine. Oh, really? Yeah, we would sit in certain classes together and exchange views. But there was a sense in which the New School, in a way, didn't exist. It existed only in its classes, but the whole group of people who were studying at a certain time, they didn't live together. Mm -hmm. you know, th there wasn't any common kind of locus that kept them steadily together where they can identify themselves and say, you know, I was a member of this class, the class mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. 47 or 48 or whatever. Right. So we we're in a way a bunch of individuals. Mm -hmm. And then you'd know a few of the individuals, but not much else. I, I never did know how many people were in my own mm -hmm. class, you mm -hmm. know, group, the year. I still don't know. But I did know a few people that I was friendly with, and Dick Kennington was one of them. And we had a course with Riesler together, and we had a course with Strauss together. So my impression was Strauss treated everybody in a friendly, not intimate way. Nobody called him Strauss. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, even Mr. Strauss. Nobody would ever think of calling him Leo. No mm -hmm. one could conceive of his asking people to, to <laughs> call him, you know, like an American professor, you know, call me Joe. No, he wouldn't do that. But friendly. And then on occasion, maybe with a few, just as a sort of friendship might develop, he would come closer to certain students. Um, I know at Chicago, the letter they wrote about Faulkner and Brule showed that they were particularly kids, mm -hmm. students who he liked very, very much and mm -hmm. was closer to. So I'm sure that would happen. At the New School, I think it was harder to happen because it didn't have the coherence of the University of Chicago itself. So we hardly knew where people lived. I was at the Strauss apartment, but only because I got to know them a little bit better. But mm -hmm. you, you had no idea people could sort of be living all over the city. I did want to tell you about an institution that the New School had where I saw Strauss also in action. And that was something called the General Seminar. It was a seminar only in a peculiar sense. It was a monthly meeting of the graduate faculty, the whole graduate faculty was invited. And a talk would be given either by a member of the faculty or by some outsider, some prominent person. And while not every member of the graduate faculty would attend these things, quite a few did. And outsiders were not only invited to talk, to give a talk, but the faculties of other institutions were invited. So you would often find somebody from NYU, from Columbia, sitting in the audience and sometimes participating. So there was one spectacular time when there was some speaker, I don't remember exactly who it was, and Strauss did not normally say a lot at these sessions, but there would be a question and answer after the talk. And in this particular talk, Strauss got up and he was really very angry and very indignant. And he was correcting the speaker, trying to tell the speaker that he seems to have forgotten what the experience of Nazi, of the existence of Nazi Germany meant. And his words were really to that effect, something like, I didn't think it would be necessary for me to stand up and remind you 
of what the Nazis meant for Germany and really put himself into it. I don't recall the other occasions when he spoke because those would be sort of the normal give and take of kind of academic life. But his points, he didn't ever get up to just to talk. If he thought a point was important, then he'd make it. And as far as I can tell, his relations with the rest of the faculty were good, but it's very hard to know that from the outside. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I know that Eric Hula was a very good friend, and Kurt Rissler was a very good friend of his, so, you know, the sort of cluster of the, of the Germans. But apart from that, it was hard to say. Strauss was a scholar, and, you know, I mean, he was a, a philosopher who sort of turned into a scholar and spent most of his time really at home thinking and writing. And I do remember a couple of things. I don't know whether you would have any interest in these, but he once told me how he falls asleep. And I was interested because I knew it, it would never happen to me. He would fall asleep, he said, thinking of Plato's cave and the divided line and trying to understand it fully starting from his sense that he really didn't understand it and trying to sort of work out the details and then he would fall, <laughs> fall asleep doing it. It was another occasion, again, this is um, just because it's so unusual, I'll mention it. Uh, we were going up the stairs at the new school. He didn't like to take the elevators because he said it, it was good for his heart to take the stairs. And he confessed to loving ice cream very much and he said he had to counteract the effect of the ice cream by going up the stairs physically. <laughs> so about to mount some stairs, and I asked him, because of the you know, matter that was on my mind, whether he believed in the theory of evolution. And of course, expecting him to say that, of course he did. Well, he said the opposite. He said, of course not. And I remember being so shocked by that that I didn't follow up. I didn't say, well, you know, why not? I, w I was really uh, staggered. It's the only person I ever met, you know, a person of advanced education, of mm -hmm. advanced knowledge, who said that he didn't believe in the theory of evolution. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, I, I want to get his opinion, but I didn't expect it. I expected he would say, yes, of course I do. So now in later years, I, you know, he never discussed things like that in my experience in mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. Things which in a way were sort of prominent examples of modern science that you might think that he would discuss in class. At least I don't remember. There might have been a remark or two about the difficulty of deriving the higher from the lower and the, the human being from the ape. but not a general assessment. And I think that he wanted to make his points of a more general nature. And so he avoided getting into the details. But I did learn that he followed a lot of this. He had his favorite biologist. It was a German whose name will come to me as soon as you leave. <laughs> but there was a German, a very well-known German, who had written a lot about animals and had studied animals and written about animals. And he was a favorite of his. You could see that he followed certain kinds of issues without introducing them in any prominent way into his discussions in class. But I think one can see that. I think he never regarded himself as sufficiently advanced in mathematics in the mm -hmm. things that you do need to study modern science seriously. I think he relied on Jacob Klein, but didn't think that he himself could do that. How did you happen to become familiar with him over those four years? I mean, that you... Well, I should mention another occasion when uh, he told me that he and Mrs. Strauss were going to be vacationing out on Cape Cod. And I forget the year, it might have been uh, 47, summer of 47. But Harvey Mansfield and I went out to visit him and were treated very well. He referred to, you know, his term of familiarity for Mrs. Strauss was Mama. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, and of course, he was always very, very nice to her. He, he never addressed her in any imperious way, you know, as a superior. My impression was that he was either an equal or an inferior when it came to his relation with Mrs. Strauss. And she was very nice and very quiet. 
Harvey and I, I think we took some pictures at the time. And uh, Harvey might actually have some of those. But his name for Harvey, he had a pet name for Harvey. It was Rabbit. <laughs> in those days, he was the recipient of the Jefferson Award. But in those days, Harvey was very reticent and very quiet. And hence the name. But when we got together, we were in a very friendly way. And I remember they were serving a little lunch. And on those occasions, Strauss could talk about anything. In other words, things that didn't enter into the classroom, like he'd rarely talk about current events. He'd rarely talk about politics, including American politics, very rarely. But at home, in an informal atmosphere, anything, you could talk about other scholars, you know, he'd, he'd make fun of this and that. And almost anything could come up and, and did. Jokes about colleagues and so on. So I don't remember much beyond that. But how did I couldn't even describe it to you. But sometimes I think the student has to sort of show a particular interest or kind of wanting to help out or is it available at a certain point. And uh, you sort of, you know, bit by bit, you got to know him a little bit better, sort of personally. But apart from that, I'm not quite sure. And he, with respect to other scholars, he could sometimes be very biting. You know, if, uh, I don't know if it was the German way or what, but uh, thought they were real fools. Uh, again, this is a sort of personal conversation. He didn't treat students that way. Don't ever remember. There was nothing nasty in him when it came to students. Whereas I wouldn't say the same when it came to every human being. I mean, he had very high standards for personal conduct. And if he thought that you were in violation of those standards, he would not have much patience with you. But apart from that, his students were his students, like his uh, children. And you know, some would be more brilliant than others. Uh, in my experience, from my observation, I should say, and certainly I should tell you that I didn't always do as well as I thought I should do in a course with Strauss. I did very well in most courses, but I think I did get either a B or B plus in one course. And I was <laughs> kind of chagrined and <laughs> wondered how I could possibly be so stupid. But nevertheless, he just had some brilliant students and Benedetti, I mean, some are gone. Was, he was, at, was, Benedetti was in Chicago. And he came back to, to teach at the new school right, right. and NYU. But you know, Benedetti was sort of, you know, he had some students which are just so outstanding, you know, mm -hmm. such marvels. Jaffa revolutionized the study of American things, and particularly Lincoln, but he was kind of an idol of mine. And you can go through a, just a, a bunch of things in Harvey. And so he attracted students who were at the very height of their abilities and who were in a way looking for something and most of the time wouldn't have found it and then so of Strauss that's why Chicago was really so important right in the center of the country outstanding reputation as an institution generally and by its nature attracting good students and then starting to attract them from all parts of the country and probably of the world. I don't know Strauss's worldwide. Right now, I think it is worldwide. But at the New School, his students were mainly American, with an occasional variation on that. But sort of mainly, the ones that I remember anyhow were mainly American. And suddenly here, you know, in this little place in Manhattan, you know, suddenly you find this sort of gem and without ever knowing it was there. Mm -hmm. At Chicago was already different. And mm -hmm. the, their reputation and the place and everything else. Mm -hmm. And it was for him, I think, the ideal thing. It was lucky that he had mm -hmm. somehow rather come to the attention of Robert Maynard Hutchins. Mm -hmm. And then he got the, the kind of thing he deserved. I want to mention for you a kind of reflection which undoubtedly has occurred to you as well. And that is, you know, in, in his writings, Strauss speaks of the philosopher. The philosopher is, is this kind of person, says this or does this. 
I think the fact of the matter is that there isn't anything like that abstractly considered. There is the Platonic Aristotelian philosopher, but then there's Heidegger. And philosophy in the 20th century can say this, I mean philosophy in the full and best sense of the term. It had one very great representative, and that was Leo Strauss. But think of the other guys, Heidegger, a Nazi, Kojève, a tool of the communists, of Stalin, proven to be. That's still philosophy. They were admired by Strauss for the depth of their intellect, but look what happened to them. And Strauss, I think, was the only one who really upheld philosophy mm -hmm. in the sense where he himself would use the term, the mm -hmm. philosopher. He was the philosopher. These other people, whatever the depth of their knowledge in certain ways, turn out to be terribly faulty in other ways. And as advertisements for philosophy <laughs> have to be found wanting, you know, more to be worried about than to be admired and praised. Uh, so, sideline. That's very interesting, thank you. Do you think Strauss had, he worked very hard at his teaching. I mean, he spent a lot of time yeah. in the classroom. What was he about? What was he trying to accomplish through his teaching? Well, to find, if he could, philosophers or young philosophers, and to cultivate the intellect and the sensibilities and the, the character of all the others to the greatest degree possible. I think he put himself, he was pretty much in the position of Socrates with the young people around him. With this exception that Strauss had women in his classes, whereas <laughs> Socrates did not have any uh, women surrounding him. Although I guess in the Xenophon Symposium, he goes out and visits some women, but still he didn't have women students. And I think Strauss really approached things that way to to help them become practitioners to the degree possible of a very thoughtful life, you know, mm -hmm. a life devoted to serious things, which included devotion to their country. Yeah, that was never included. I mean, the study of political life. I remember there was such a flood of students who wanted to become, get into political philosophy. And his warning was always, don't do it. Uh, follow your natural bent. If it's American politics, that's your field. Bring in political philosophy where it's appropriate mm -hmm. to your field, but don't abandon your field. Stick to the things that you, in a way, know natively and are most interested in. Don't all try to become students of the text, mm -hmm. you know, as your livelihood. And I think that was very important for him. But to encourage, I mean, it was the, sort of the old object of the liberal arts. He wanted to make thoughtful people, philosophers in the best case, but thoughtful people who were also gentlemen. I mm -hmm. mean, there was a, not an intentional cultivation of gentlemanliness, but the byproduct of what he wanted people to do and mm -hmm. of the works that we were studying was to cultivate a kind of high-mindedness. You're not really won over by the usual attractions of the money or prestige. But again, I've never heard him talk about it, but I've seen his writings on liberal education, mm -hmm. and it's that kind of thing. In the best case, the great books, I've kind of made fun of that in a way, by saying, well, what about the not-so-great books? And I'm sure that Strauss would agree that not everybody can appreciate Kant's works on metaphysics. But everybody should have a better appreciation of Dostoevsky, or mm -hmm. the, incidentally, things that Strauss would mention in lectures, mm -hmm. the works of great writers. I mean, he didn't make a practice of it, but they would simply come up. And so the great works are for the, the, the minds that are most capable of following them. His great admirer of Shakespeare, of course. And he had his favorites among all of the, uh, the modern authors. And I think some of his students sort of followed hints that we got from him. I mentioned a general seminar before at the New School, and one time I heard a lecture by Howard White, who was a student of Strauss's, on Shakespeare's, I think it was Henry V. It was one of the greatest lectures I'd ever heard, because it was performed from beginning to end without a single note. Continuous flow of words and thought. 
mm -hmm. for an hour. And in a way, that sort of made me a student of Shakespeare. But White, and of course Strauss had mentioned Shakespeare in class here and there, but White had followed some suggestions from Strauss and enlarged on them and it sort of you know, made them a, a substantial part of his studies. And I think in that way, Jaffa probably heard some hints about, or might have heard some hints about Lincoln from, mm -hmm. from Strauss that sort of developed, sort of kindled something in Harry and off he went. But it was that kind of thing that works which he would not consider to be works of the very highest intellectual order were still important works. And that's why I sort of jokingly said they're not so great works, but they're important too. And in the average really good education, you would expect that the not so great work would be a very formidable part. You know, Aristotle's ethics and politics, well, everybody can absorb those. But Heidegger's being in time, how many people can really read that and understand it? And for such people to go down a notch may be the best they can do, but it's still very, very good. And we sort of don't want it to mean the writer's Goethe was a person that Strauss admired. Of course, Lessing was one of his great, great uh, teachers, but there were, what was amazing, it, I don't know whether to uh, mention this as a public thing, but I'll make it public through you, but you be careful with it or uh, treat it well, well, tenderly. Well, we can consult about it later, but let's go ahead and get it out. <laughs> well, this is, this is a funny story. At Harvard, C.J. Friedrich was another German refugee mm -hmm. and very well known in the field of political theory, maybe not philosophy. And when I was hired at uh, Chicago, he knew that I had background with Strauss. And he would often make slighting remarks about Strauss in my presence, and I would not try to correct him. But one of the things he said about Strauss was that he was a person of very limited experience and very limited interest. In other words, that he was just studying the great texts and, and doing nothing but that. Now, that is just not true. Strauss had a very extensive knowledge of literature and a very extensive knowledge of history. With respect to the Second World War, he used to recommend books that he thought were really first-rate treatments of the military aspects of the war. But it's very hard for me to think of somebody who had interests as extensive as Strauss's. And yet, you know, this professor at Harvard could say, uh, speak about how narrow his, his interests were and how far from, from ordinary experience. If there was ever a teacher who dwelled on ordinary experience and made them see their importance, it was Leo Strauss, mm -hmm. nobody else that his bringing ordinary experience to life in that way, that might strike many auditors as somehow not fitting in with your picture of him as a philosopher. I mean, if philosophers talk about difficult, abstruse things, and he's talking about ordinary things in yeah. a compelling way. Yeah, it's because we've inherited this narrow view of philosophy, allowing the social sciences to sort of take over this whole domain. But people forget the great tradition of philosophy or political philosophy, going back to Socrates. And a great example would be Aristotle's ethics and politics. In the ethics, there are so many examples from ordinary life of the virtues and the vices and mm -hmm. what to do and what not to do. The very same man wrote the metaphysics. He wrote De Caelo on the heavens. He, he wrote on the logic. He wrote on all these abstract subjects, but he wrote on human subjects. He wrote on the poem, the work on poetics. So that we've forgotten or kind of shunted to the side the fact that philosophy had some of its great roots, perhaps its most central root, in moral and political philosophy. That was the area where it first showed itself. And to the degree that Socrates is this sort of the beginner of this whole development, which today is taken up by things like social sciences and history and, mm -hmm. and all the rest. But it began as an element or as a vital, perhaps central element of philosophy. So it's just a mistake. And thinking about ordinary things, Strauss used to say, the surface of things is what you have to look at. 
And that's where you're going to find the deepest elements of the thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that this has been true of my own work, that just sort of getting your impression of the thing and the appearance of the thing is the way in which you get started looking into the thing. So ordinary life, I mean, this is why Strauss was so interested in, for relaxation, he'd be watching Westerns. Well, why? Well, Westerns, because they're kind of testing people. You know, there's the bad guys and the good guys, and the characters of people are sort of displayed, displayed rather openly. Today in the movies, uh, there's so much violence that everybody gets in engulfed in this killing. But in the Westerns, it was sort of the buildup. The bad guys have taken over. What are the good guys going to do? And how are they going to cope with them? And just from this experience, in a way, it's sort of a basic human experience. The camaraderie, but the hostility, the combination of the two. So right in front of our eyes, I mean, you might say the American public has... In a way, the movies have given us a false image of what life is like by nature, sort of naturally. Mm -hmm. And we've become so bound in by our own images that we don't know what life we're leading, whether it's a life in terms of the movies or life itself. And uh, you might say that saving life itself, the pre-movies, um, pre-technological life, is always very, very important, particularly as we make inroads and all over the Caribbean and elsewhere in the world. In the most remote part, you see these skyscrapers and ads for commodities, <laughs> you know, things like that, that kind of Americanized and preserving that sense of the beginnings or the, the simple elements of life is really important. And I think Strauss did that all the time. So his courses, even if they rose to elements where you have to explain the divided line in Plato or the full metaphor of the cave in Plato, it becomes difficult, more abstract, but it begins from the simple experience that we all have. And you can understand why we're prisoners in that cave and in what cave we are prisoners. You can understand that. So he caused the rebirth of moral and political philosophy by going through the same process that the originators of that philosophy went through in thinking about things. And so Strauss kind of relives, and everything he does is a reliving of the original experience of life, of ordinary things in life. And so by this account, if he had some type of project or goal for his teaching, it would emerge out of this rediscovery of the natural order of things, the natural. Yeah. I think to keep human life in its fullness, preserved and continuing and vigorous to the greatest degree that he could was what his object was. And that could take the form of citizenship, of being an active person, of helping your own country. But still, to have all the ingredients of a full human life and to preserve it in an age when it, it can almost disappear before your eyes. You know, how, how long did it take the Nazis to convert this the most cultured nation? What, four years and they, they were in a mass army thinking of nothing but war. It didn't take very long. So in a way there's a certain fragility in civilization that you have to be aware of. And I think Strauss was fully conscious of this, and just by nature, by nature of being a philosopher who loved philosophy and loved to convey it, loved to see the eyes light up in his students. I think he, I wouldn't simply say he did his share. He did more than any other writer that I know of, any other thinker, to accomplish that. That's why it's so cruel to have things written about him that are so entirely false that he's a follower of Hitler, and he's this, and he's that, and he's against democracy and all the rest. He's a fascist. These are so cruel, and in a way how low our intellectual life is sunk that we are willing to just because he's a critic. You see, for all our talk about openness and all the rest, down deep, we down deep is the fanatic, and that fanatic is still around. So, but it, it's a terrible fate for the man that you could say has rescued 
Western civilization and rescued its religious part as well. We haven't said a word about that. And in class, it wasn't always in the forefront of his teaching. But still, he, in a way, made greater arguments for the religious point of view than any, anyone else, really. So, But in your view, Strauss succeeded in rescuing Western civilization. To the degree that somebody can. It's hard to know whether to be a full pessimist, a partial pessimist, a neutral with respect to the destiny of mankind. I think he himself must have been very worried about our destiny, not only because of the atom bomb, which is still a very, very active problem with us, but culturally what happens in a mass society. And he must have sensed very much the dangers that are involved and did what a great man would do. He was going to do his best to keep alive the flame of human excellence, really. And I share that same kind of doubt. You don't like to think that we were entering a kind of dark age, and maybe we're not. Maybe something will save us. But uh, things don't look great, let's put it that <laughs> way. And despite momentary victories here and there, and they're very important victories, and you, you have to fight those things. But still, I saw a recent example. In this country, we have a massacre down in Newtown, Connecticut. And one of the things mentioned is the effect of videos and movies on certain kinds of young people. And in ordinary common sense, if you ask yourself, well, is this really possible? And you looked at the stuff that we expose young people to, well, older people too, but constantly, on a regular basis. And you ask, well, uh, isn't it obvious that this is having a bad effect? Well, no, it's not obvious, and it's not even part of what the president recommends. There's a shying away from the deeper problems and a treating of the superficial ones. And as you do that, and you don't realize that things are getting worse in certain respects, why you, they are getting worse. So you don't realize what they're getting worse. By attending to them, you could sort of improve them a lot, is anybody's guess, but still, you can't, it's very hard to be a complete optimist in the sense in which you could be in the 19th century where things really did look as if life was improving in so many ways. And today it's very hard to have that same confidence. And I think Strauss, understood that probably better than anyone, and worried about it, and always had in mind just keeping the ideal of human excellence alive, keeping it going. And I think we don't appreciate how difficult it was for him to do what he did. You know, the sort of redoing of the entire history of philosophy, the redoing of it, I still have textbooks in political theory. There's an old one by George Sabin. And you, you look at those textbooks, and they tell you what every thinker thought, but in the most superficial way, and, and always with the caveat that, well, you know, that, that guy was under the influence of his own time, of his own, his own day. And Strauss sort of undid that entire opinion and sort of made the whole thing come alive. With studies of each thinker, you want to know why. I was once talking to a student of Strauss's, and I said, well, what was Strauss? And he said he was a historian and a scholar, and I said, no, he was a philosopher. No, he was a historian and scholar. Look at his works. Well, they all look like historical works, and that's about all they are. But why did he do it? Well, every thinker had to be made to come alive. Every thinker had to be made to cope with serious problems and giving his answer to it. And Strauss was able to do that. And with one thinker, and not just with one, but with one, two, three, four, five of the greatest minds. So I think his, and he knew that's what he had to do in order to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. In a way, get people thinking again. That's what I wanted to. Was Strauss your thesis advisor? He would have been, but as it turned out, it was a combination of Howard White and Kurt Riesler. And I had the fortune or misfortune of having my first draft entirely rejected by Riesler. And I remember what he wrote. He said Strauss would not have approved of this. Strauss, I don't think, ever saw it, but Strauss would not have approved of this. 
And I could see why, that I had made Montesquieu into more of a classical thinker than he was, using certain things in him that did sound as if he was a classical thinker. And then I kind of thought it out again, and then it got accepted. But he would have been, but wasn't. I see, I see. In your career, you published a book on Shakespeare, a book on the First Amendment, your, your translation of Montesquieu's decadence, greatness and decadence of the Romans. Were you in touch with Strauss when you worked on those projects? Let's see. Last February, the Lincoln book came out. This is a, uh, The Mind and Art of Abraham Lincoln, philosopher, statesman. And it's a treatment of 20 speeches of Lincoln's, one after the other, with a text of the speech and a commentary on the speech. So, um, and I was all inspired by Jaffer, even though I don't think he's going to like some of it, but still. Now, as to being in touch with Strauss, on the First Amendment book, he knew I was interested in this question. And I had written something earlier that had to do with Lady Chatterley's Lover, the D.H. Lawrence book. And the D.H. Lawrence book uh, was tried in England as obscene literature. And I compared it with the trial of Madame Bovary in France. And he knew of that and he liked it. But that isn't what ultimately got published <laughs> on the First Amendment. It became an ingredient of that in treating what the First Amendment was, what it really covered and didn't cover. So he was aware of my interest in it and liked my approach. But as to the book, no, he didn't know about it. The Shakespeare was largely conceived after Strauss's death and so with Lincoln, so that he didn't know about those at all. He knew about the translation, but he may have suggested my name to uh, Alan Bloom, because Alan was the editor of the series. The, the chorus series. Yeah. yeah, and Alan was very helpful to me. He knew, knew French really better than I did. So he was aware of that. So of the first two, he was somewhat aware, but of the last two, he was not. It's a remarkable thing among Strauss's students that Many of his students went on to concentrate in and do remarkable work in on subjects or fields or authors that Strauss never taught. Yeah. And I guess the question is, when you have done your work on Shakespeare or Lincoln or the First Amendment, did you have the feeling that you were acting out of an impulse somehow that came from your... Studying absolutely. with Strauss? Oh, absolutely. How does that work? It was a, an impulse to write on Shakespeare when Strauss uh, he referred respectfully to Shakespeare, but he never taught Shakespeare. That's true. But in studying, uh, well, uh, the first Strauss students to write on Shakespeare were Harry Jaffa and Alan Bloom. And at almost the same time, Howard White came out with a whole book on Shakespeare of his own. And the Jaffa and Bloom book, uh, Shakespeare's Politics, uh, they did jointly. Mm -hmm. But I think only one chapter might have been from Jaffa. And, right, and, and King Lear, and, yeah. And, right, and, and most of it from Allen. And the notion that you had such a thing as a philosopher poet, whereas in the Republic, the philosophers and the poets are opposed to each other. Mm -hmm. And here you have philosopher poets. Well, that was the whole point of Alan's introduction to their uh, his joint work with Harry. Mm -hmm. And Harry had approached uh, King Lear in the same way. So I was inspired by Strauss through people who were already inspired by him in their work. But I did think of myself because uh, Shakespeare conceals his thought. I wouldn't say much in the same way that the great philosophers conceal their thought. Mm -hmm. But it's an act of concealment anyhow. And you sort of have to think about it and worry about it. But I was always thinking of Strauss in the background. And so with respect to the First Amendment, I, while Strauss, to the best of my knowledge, never said anything about the First Amendment, nevertheless, I thought to myself, well, what do these guys really mean? Mm -hmm. you know, what they mean by saying, Congress shall make no law. So the inspiration was, what did they really mean? Just as his inspiration was, what did this philosopher mean? So I always was thinking, in that respect, I was sort of picturing myself as thinking as Strauss 
would have wanted me to think about this kind of thing. So while the inspiration was directed, it certainly was indirect. And the same held with Lincoln. But there, the way had been cleared by Harry Jaffa with his Christ of the House Divided. But I wanted to sort of continue that work and in a way correct certain things in Jaffa. But the pioneer work had been done by Jaffa. Mm -hmm. And I kind of considered myself as continuing or plotting behind Jaffa, but in the same direction. So Jaffa's inspiration for that, whether that came from Strauss or not, I don't know, but the same thing. What did Lincoln really mean by the Gettysburg Address? You know, read it all the way through, try to figure out the meaning. And then it turns out that the things that Jaff had studied, the first two addresses, the first the perpetuation speech and then the temperance address, it turns out that they really are philosophic documents. I mean, they're very thoughtful, very complicated, and deep, you know, really deep. And so the sense that this is what Strauss would have wanted you to do was always present. Once you see the importance of that point of view, you never lose it. I feel the same way. I read the Constitution and I see that the oath of the president is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't say the United States. It says the Constitution of the United States. Why preserve, protect, and defend? Are these different words? That kind of interest, just in the words, now I feel came from Strauss, and it always pays off because then you take them seriously rather than just sort of read them. I think the Congress and everyone else, uh, according to the Constitution, they just take an oath to defend and support. There's an entirely different oath to protect, preserve, and defend. And well, why? Why? So again, once you, it's funny that in ordinary life, sometimes I'll read something and instead of reading it carefully, I don't read it carefully. So it doesn't always pull over into ordinary life. But when you're doing something serious, that, that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you want to try to be thoughtful about it. So if you're reading somebody like Hawthorne or reading uh, Melville or Twain, but you're reading them, you want to sort of think about them and piece them together, and, and you start with a surface meaning. So that idea, that general idea, once you can grasp it from Strauss, that stays with you all the time. Well, in hearing you give this account, you're taking me back to your account of your first class with him, that you'd never seen someone reason in a class before. Yeah. And if I were to summarize, if someone were to ask me, What's the connection between David Lowenthal's book on Shakespeare and Strauss? If someone were to ask me that question, and now having heard this answer, I would say, well, Professor Lowenthal learned from Strauss that it was possible to understand things. And he was given an example, and he wanted to live up to that example, and he had the desire to do that. And so when he picks up something, he's been given by Strauss the form and the means, and he wants to apply those things. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's uh, perfectly true. And there are so many things to apply it to. Everybody's heard of the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe. Naturally, you've studied with Strauss, but you would want to do this anyway, but you wonder, what is this Big Bang and how they come to it? And then you see the evidence, and the evidence goes all the way back about 14 they say 12 or 14 billion years to the beginning of the universe. And that's how they talk, the universe. Well, what happened before then? They won't say. It all began at that point. But how is it possible? Again, you remember uh, Strauss used to like to quote ex nihil fit, this whole Latin proverb, from nothing, nothing comes and nothing is made. And they seem to have forgotten it. So they're willing to say the universe began 14 years ago. The whole universe. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened before then? Did it come out of nothing? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, I came across one scientist who said it did come out of nothing. So they're kind of driven back by that. Okay, what preceded it? Well, something. What kind of something? Why did it just start there? If it had all that time to develop, why then? There are questions that you would start putting uh, not just out of natural curiosity, but you want to know, well, what's this, the meaning of the Big Bang? And so the application of the idea, take the words seriously mm -hmm. and see what they mean. 
that's just a sort of a general thing. But you would be absolutely right. You want to understand and understand as deeply as possible. But you would just begin from the world as it appears. And this desire to understand in your account of Strauss is something that had to be recovered and made possible again through, yeah. through Strauss's teaching and through his writing. Yeah, I think so. If you, let's say you open up Heidegger's Being in Time, you have all these strange words and these strange experiences that are sort of very general. But where are the trees? Where are the animals? Where, <laughs> where are the things of ordinary life? Well, they're not there. There's no accounting for them. You start from human experience in an abstract way. So the human experience gets developed in such a manner that what we ordinarily see around us sort of disappears. It's not there. So, and that's real, I think, the very great virtue of the ancients. And while Heidegger tries to get under that and go deeper than sense perception, but in order to see what we experience. But in the process, the whole world disappears. <laughs> Everything that's out there, nature, the nature uh, that's out there is no longer a subject. So not only in Heidegger is ethics and politics not a subject, but nature itself isn't a subject and disappears. It's just a kind of generalized human experience. So, yeah, you start from what you ordinarily see in the world but with the different kinds of things that you see in the world. And that's your beginning point. So once you see that frogs and trees and things like that, they're out there, and then you never give it up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's rather important. The beginning of giving it up, I think, starts with Descartes, where you still look inside, I think, therefore I am. And the whole world, you have to sort of build up the whole world from that. Well, if you start that way, then it's very hard to build up the world because you're starting just from the inner context of human experience. And the classical way is, is so much better. And you really don't start by looking within you. There's a world out there and you're part of it. That's a simple beginning and that's where you stay, but you don't, you don't forget that. And so the line from Descartes to Heidegger is fairly direct. And I think they knew that, you know, they right. sense that. Strauss came to the United States as you told me over lunch, as a rescue project by this remarkable president of the New School. I've forgotten this. What was his Alvin name? Johnson. Alvin Johnson. Yeah. That he, Strauss and Rietzler and other emigres were rescued from the terrible darkness descending on Europe. You could imagine another history in which Strauss could have, say, remained in Germany, been a German prof professor in a German university. I wonder if that Strauss, if such a thing had been possible, if there would have been any significant differences between that Strauss and the Strauss we know, did his experience of the United States change anything for him? Did it matter to him that he was here in the United States, besides the fact that it was a safe place and a place where he could flourish and prosper? Those are wonderful things. But did the experience of the United States change anything for him? That's an excellent question. Well, let's just sort of begin from this observation that in class, he rarely commented on anything going on in the country, politics particularly, very, very rarely. He might do it in a private conversation, but in class, no. Not only that, but in class, he rarely drew on his own experiences in Europe. You know, what life was like under the Nazis, as he experienced it, or when he went to England, or what things were. Well, I never heard anything like that. You know, the American professor blurts everything out. You know, he tells you all about himself and his experiences. And that isn't true of Strauss. It was a very uh, disciplined approach to the text as a kind of eternal text where you don't matter. <laughs> You're not going to say much about your own kind of narrow mm -hmm. personal experience. Whether he learned something about or experienced something about things that from his coming to America? That's really a very good question. There's always a difference between reading about a place and experiencing it firsthand. My impression is that he enjoyed life in America with all of its pitfalls and its problems. As for pitfalls, you had to be worried about people trying to sell things to you. So his wife, according to one story, Mrs. Strauss came home with a dress 
saying how much the salesman thought it looked well on her. And Strauss rejoined, well, don't you realize that the salesman is your natural enemy, <laughs> not, not your friend? But there's this other story about Strauss himself. Do you know the story of Strauss and the zoot suit? No. Again, it's just a story that I've been told. Uh, Strauss goes out by himself to buy a suit. Yes. <laughs> and unbeknownst then, actually ends up buying a zoot suit. You know what a zoot suit is? You know, they tail it in a certain way. I know, I've seen pictures long ago. I mean, there was no such thing when I came up. That no, was, of course, right, from... right. But uh, they had sort of narrowly tailored pants. I mean, there were certain flares about a zoot suit that made it unmistakably a zoot suit. Mm -hmm. And without realizing it, he had actually fallen prey to a salesman himself <laughs> and came out, and was, he, of course, had to return it. But he, um, oh, and there's so many stories about Strauss and the difficulties of living in America. Um, Harry Jaff is loaded with them. You know the stories of Strauss being in a motel. And I guess Harry must have been in a room in the same motel. And Harry gets a phone call from Strauss, say, come over, Mr. Jaffer, come over, I need your help. And the, it was exceedingly hot in the place, and a window needed to be raised. And Strauss didn't know how to raise that window. And do you, you hear the story? I've heard other versions of it, but go ahead. A lot of, and then they're changing light bulbs and things yeah. like that. You talk about the perplexities of American life, things that wouldn't be difficult for the ordinary American, for Strauss, who wasn't handy in any way, they did pose difficulties. Apart from that, I don't know how to answer your question, because it's a very good question, and I'd have to know something better about what he thought of us beforehand, and then how life here had an effect on him, and I don't quite know how to do it. That he appreciated the, for all of its turmoil and so on, but but that he appreciated being in a democracy. I don't think there's any question about that. But just how it affected his thinking about us. Or I just, have to or, think more or about generally. it. His thinking yeah. about us or generally. Yeah. You know, he had to experience life, academic life for one, which is very different in this country from Germany or Europe. And, and then not having had enough daily conversation where you find out what he thinks of this and that as these things transpire. Appreciative, you mentioned before, and we're kind of assuming that, but appreciative, very much so. And unlike so many refugees who come here and then spout off about American life, he didn't feel entitled to do that. He didn't feel entitled to speak publicly about any problems that he thought might exist in this country. Well, and what I've read, what's striking is that when he does mention in the United States or democracy, it's to express gratitude. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, he was saved, and so many others were saved. And I think he appreciated the history of the country as being a place of refuge, which mm -hmm. it really was. And particularly at this time, he was a great admirer, I don't know if you knew this, a great admirer of Dwight Eisenhower. He admired him for harnessing together the energies of the Allies in World War II. Not so much for his own military capacity, but for getting the Americans and the British particularly to work together in a harmonious way, with help from the French, but still. And he expressed that openly, that kind of admiration. He was critical of every effort, including you know, some by Roosevelt, to kind of compromise with Stalinist Russia, but again, not openly, not publicly. He you know, might say that in private. But again, I was just a student. I was not an equal, so there were undoubtedly all kinds of subjects that he felt that he couldn't really express to me or in my presence. So uh, I find it hard to answer that question. It's a very good question, though. During Strauss's lifetime, towards the end of his life, he would have had the remarkable experience of seeing his name become a category, that there was a, such a thing as a Straussian. Yeah. And not only that, but he would have seen the beginnings of controversies among his students about 
who is and who isn't a Straussian, controversy about who is the best heir of the legacy, and those types of things. What do you think he made of that? Do you have any sense of that? Very good question. You've run across the name of Ernest Fortin? Sure. Okay. Well, Ernest was a good friend of mine, and he taught at Assumption College down in Worcester and got me involved in the affairs of Assumption College on the Board of Trustees. So he kind of inveigled me into joining the board. I was really glad of. And Ernest has this wonderful passage in one of his books, a collection where he speaks about the variety of Straussians. Mm -hmm. Are you acquainted with this passage? The Ralph, East Coast, the West Coast, and then oh, there. Oh, oh, Ralph Lerner is an admirer of this passage, 114 varieties of Straussians. Yeah, right. Strauss, he speaks of sectarianism himself. When you get certain they have, have a solution rather than the problem. I don't know, first I, I have to say directly first that I have no first-hand information whatsoever as to any remarks by Strauss mm -hmm. about this kind of thing. He must have thought it likely that there would be, you know, since he had written so much on difficult subjects, that there would be some divergence of opinion among his students. Whether he realized that these divergences could become as sharp as they sometimes did, occasionally did, I don't know. But he must have realized that. But the question is, could he have avoided it? Was there anything in his writings that would naturally draw people into sectarianism. And the one thing, the one outstanding thing, is that it was a superior thing, that it was better than the all-present approaches put together, this sort of approach to philosophy and to the text of philosophy. And it was better. And that sense of superiority is what engendered some of this. They want to be the heir of the right interpretation of this superior approach, and they want to exemplify it. So that caused some nasty feuds to break out. But generally, I, you see, the thing that submerged those feuds to some extent and kind of lessened their impact was the general admiration for Strauss expressed by all sides. All of his direct students were great admirers. The only question is, what were they admiring? And if you look at the general picture, I would say some of this was to be expected, but there isn't that much of it. You know, the Western Straussians hold against the Eastern Straussians that they're not political enough. But is it really true? Some of these are kind of, um, some of the antagonism, and then some are rather personal. So, as a general matter, I don't know whether Strauss, looking back, if he were smiling down on us, would say, gee, what I started has been driven with... I don't think you really do find heavily contesting sectarianism. So, but as to direct expressions by him, I don't know of any. Uh, he may have uh, expressed something. Uh, how great his concern was, again, I don't know. I have never worried about it. I sort of <laughs> thought, you know, it's a great man, there's going to be some difference of opinion. I would sometimes not have expressed those differences in the way in which they were expressed in a kind of too strongly personal manner. But nevertheless, as a general matter, I would say overall, it isn't bad. As a matter of fact, I think the picture is pretty good. That they, um, And in a way, why not? Uh, aren't there different versions of Hegel and different versions of this or that philosopher? So I don't think, this is a sort of conclusion of the matter, I don't think Strauss would have thought, one, that, that it was avoidable, or two, that it was terrible. Well, and I still don't know, I, since I don't try to keep track of these things, who's not talking to who, I don't I have <laughs> no idea. But you know, they're all good people. And I once had a, I, I wrote a report I wrote an article for a book, and it was studies in political philosophy. It was Strauss's own stuff. And I had to take up the antagonism that had sprung up between Tom Pangle and Harry Jaffa. And I tried to kind of, you know, conciliate them and show how much they had in common. And then on one point, I took uh, the, the side of one. On another point, I took the side of the other. 
and ended up with something like what King Edward was saying to his family <laughs> before he died, which is not quite getting it everybody to kiss each other, but to treat each other in a friendly way. And I don't know whether it had much good effect, but, and this was after Strauss's death. So I was aware of these things, but never did take them so seriously. Every so often I'd hear that Harry had been insulting to this or that person. As so many of these stories, I'm afraid, revolve around Harry. <laughs> and then finally, even Harvey Mansfield was not treated properly by Harry and so on and so on. But to me, they weren't major things. Well, the other side of this story about the emergence of a Straussian or Straussianism is that certainly in the beginning, sometime in the 60s, there was uh, maybe as early as the 50s, there was a skepticism, if not right, hostility among many in the political science profession towards what was identified as Straussianism. And yeah. so... On the one hand, there were students of Strauss who began referring to themselves as Straussians. On the other hand, the profession began referring to students of Strauss as, as Straussians. Do you have any inkling about whether Strauss thought this was a good or a bad thing, necessary, well, that's a very unavoidable? Good yeah, that's a very nice question. I, first of all, I don't. I myself have not done it. I've not done it for a lot of reasons. First, I didn't want to float on somebody else's reputation. But secondly, I didn't want to tarnish that reputation in case I wasn't very good. I didn't want people to think, well, he's from Strauss and mm -hmm. he stinks, so Strauss must stink. <laughs> no, but there were several reasons. Now, on the other side, I do know where a lot of friends of mine not only didn't hide the fact that they studied with Strauss, but spoke of it openly and several times. And I must say, I always felt a little, it was misgivings as to the degree to which one should do that. Avoiding doing it looks as if you're hiding. So it looks as if you're either ashamed or you're hiding. And that certainly is a consideration. But doing it also has the other tendency that you are resting on his supposed greatness and you don't want to do that either. So... It's a very good question because it is something which varies very much in the practice of Straussians. The word Straussian itself I hardly ever use. I refer to Strauss often when I'm teaching, you know, the great benefactor of us all. You had to do that. But in the writings, again, I favored the quiet side. I worry about the other side only because it just seems slightly pretentious to say, well, I studied with Strauss. And at the same time, that whatever defect you have could easily be rubbed off on him or attributed to him. So leave it at that. I hate to decide. After all, they're all friends of mine one way or the other. And to say that the one is doing well and the other side not doing well is... A little hard to say, but you can't help but having a kind of feeling about it. And my feeling is to understate it, to go easy on it, and to make your reputation on your own. Let it stand. And there were times when I was sorely tempted to do it. In the introduction to the Shakespeare book, particularly since I trace Shakespeare's general philosophy back to Plato and Aristotle, which is mm -hmm. astounding to present day scholars. But at that point, I was sorely tempted to speak of the person who knows that better than anyone else, you know, about that kind of thing, but I didn't do it. And so I'm on one side of that. Okay, good. It's not a terrible answer. No, no. I, I'd have to see what this looks like in print, you know, throw it away. We can do that. Too. Yeah. When you were a young man, Strauss took a shine to you to some extent. Yeah, I, I guess that's true, yeah. yeah. And sometimes it took the form of offering to help, even carry books or do some special thing. And I remember I was not a very outgoing person, and I became better at that as I grew older. So in graduate school, I was not terribly outgoing, but I do remember even in college, there were certain teachers I just took a liking to, and I'd kind of hang around more mm -hmm. with them and just try to talk to them and... I think that happened with Strauss as well, and somehow or other it 
click and I like dogs, he liked dogs, and other, <laughs> so a lot of things in common and he liked my family and I, I liked his to the degree that I, I knew it. And he'd always sign his letters with affectionate regards to your family because I also signed my letters that way. And I didn't know Mrs. Strauss that well by any means, but still what I knew about him, I did like very much. And she was very solicitous, very quiet. Do you have you heard much about Mrs. Strauss? And well, only a few of scattered remarks. Yeah, and that's about all I could really give you either, except for his nickname for her, which was really in a way very touching. <laughs> he was a very great man. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like Socrates' in relation to his wife, you remember, mm -hmm. which is quite the opposite. But because Mrs. Strauss was really not that, that way at all. But it was really very endearing. So. Did you consider, do you consider Strauss to be your friend? When he was alive, yes, I would say so. He did write. I was always sort of looking for help from a foundation or improving my position. And he was always very helpful and mm -hmm. said, of course you can use my name and of course you can do this and that. And so while I wasn't a friend on the level of a Riesler or Eric Hula or these intellectual giants, but considered in my limited role, yeah, I did consider myself a friend. And I was given the privilege of leading his dog at the <laughs> railroad station. You must look him up, Schwulch. I hesitate to try to spell it for you, but Schwulch. You say it means smoky. I think it did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back now, you know, it's been oh, 40 years since Strauss died. Looking back now, what are your thoughts of Leo Strauss in retrospect? You know, it said at the end of the Phaedo about Socrates, the best and the wisest. I think it would be something like that. And I think if history or events unfold as they should unfold, <laughs> As Strauss will be, should be, regarded as the, the greatest thinker of the 20th century. And I hate to even limit that way, because he's you know, a very great man. And certainly in his practical judgments, I thought he was very good. We haven't spoken about that at all. But as his practical judgments, his political judgments, from the degree to which I knew them, even military judgments, he was very, very wise. You know, he, he was a very... Well, he was really the best, the best in thought, and I thought uh, as a human being, from what I knew, he was the best. He was a great husband, the degree which he was my friend, he was a fine friend, and as a teacher, by far, no, nobody, they just weren't in the same league, you know, it wasn't just that he was better than they were in, in a certain progression, so he was just an extraordinary human being. Well, I think it's wonderful that you recall that line from the Fida with regard to Strauss. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground. I want to thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I hope some of this is useful to you, and your project, I think, is a wonderful project. Wonderful project. Wonderful project. Wonderful project. Wonderful project.